The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Terry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. Now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who we find covered with oil and grease, having just finished fixing Bertie's sewing machine. Well, your sewing machine is all fixed now, Bertie. You should hear that singer hum. Oh, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Is it all right to use now? Oh, yes, indeed, Bertie. Go right ahead. No reason now why you can't sew on the little so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Now I can run up my new summer uniform for the mysterious and bewildering order of the Daughters of Cleopatra. Oh, yes. Yeah. What kind of a summer uniform? Oh, we just switch from the heavy to the lightweight veil. <laughs> Hi, Uncle Morse. Hi. Hello, Bertie. Hello. Say, so, Unc, how'd you get all that oil on your hands and face? You look like you've been playing post office in a grease pit. Yeah. Post office in a grease pit? Well, I never played post office there. Though I never mind the frantic antics of my youth. I look this way because I just finished fixing Bertie's machine. Yes, and now I just puts my foot on the pedal and away it goes. Yeah. Couldn't have been a better job done if a real mechanic done did it. Yes, of course not. I'm an expert. Don't forget, I had hundreds of them at the Gildersleeve Girdle Works. Anytime... <laughs> anytime we had a breakdown, I'd bounce right out of my office and fix the trouble before the motor had a chance to slow down. Gee, I never knew that. Why, well, I, I could take a machine like Bertie's apart... And put it together again in the dark in less time than it take the average mechanic in broad daylight. And another thing, a bell. Oh, my goodness. A visitor mustn't see me in this disgraceful condition. I hope there's plenty of hot water for me. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Oh, hello, Miss Banks. Come right in. Thanks, Bertie. Oh, my, Penny Banks is here. My, my, that ain't the snappiest uniform I ever did see. What, you supposed to be a lady general? <laughs> no, Bertie, this is the Red Cross Motor Corps uniform. Well, what do you folks do, doctor sick automobiles? No, but we're supposed to know how to fix our own cars. Well, I have to get back in the kitchen before Leroy hollers at his feeling holler. <laughs> Here's my news, Betty. Oh, sorry to catch you waiting, darling. Well, you needn't have hurried. I don't think we'll be able to start the motor mechanics course this afternoon after all. We won't? Why not? Well, Mr. Cobb, who was supposed to show us how to tear down a motor, can't be there. Oh, that's too bad. Gee, it'll be almost impossible to reach the girls and tell them not to come. Yeah. I don't know what we can do. Oh, gee, why don't you ask Uncle Mort to teach you? Does he know anything about automobile motors? Oh, sure, he's a whiz. He can take whole cars apart and put them together blindfolded in the dark. Well, I never knew that, Leroy. <laughs> well, I, I didn't either up until a few minutes ago. But he's fixed up Bertie's old jalopy so that she just puts her foot down on a pedal and away she goes. Oh, no, Leroy. No one could repair that coffee grinder. Well, Uncle Mort did. He used to fix all the trucks at his girdle works himself. Before they could even come to a stop. <laughs> well, it sounds like your uncle can save the day for us, Marjorie. Shall we ask him? Well, this is all news to me, but why not? Oh, Uncle Mort. Uh, yes, Marjorie? Can you come here for a moment? Oh, I certainly. What is it, my dear? Uh, hello there, Penny. Hello. Oh, uh, well, my, you look attractive in that outfit. <laughs> hey, by the way, what outfit is that outfit for? <laughs> Why, it's the Red Cross. And we need your help. Why, certainly. How much, my oh, dear? Just a couple of your hours, hours of your time, Uncle. Huh? We'd like to have you come over to headquarters and show us how to take apart and put together a motor. Like you did for Bertie, Unc. Oh, yes, Bertie is, of course. The Red Cross used a lot of them. When do you want me? Oh, this afternoon, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, come, come, Penny. Don't be formal. Just call me Uncle Mort. Uh, well, 
Will you, Uncle Morris? Oh, well, I'm sure you could get somebody, well, somebody better qualified. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh now, don't be modest, Uncle. Uh, You'd be I'm wonderful nervous. for this. Uh? Besides, the man we wanted couldn't show up. Oh, uh, well, I don't know. Oh, I... you wouldn't want to disappoint all those pretty girls. Oh, uh, pretty girls. Well, <laughs> of course, if you put it that way, <laughs> I'll come. <laughs> oh, fine. Uh? And you better make your talk fairly simple. Some of our girls don't know the difference between a hose connection and a garter. Oh, they don't, eh? Well, I'd have a hard time telling them apart myself. <laughs> Of course, that's stretching it a little bit. <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, always joking. Oh, uh... <laughs> Tell the truth, I'm not so sure about several things myself. Now, take the differential. Uh, no, thank you. If I did, I wouldn't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now, be serious, Uncle Mort. Uh? You sound uh... as if you didn't know a thing about cars. I don't. But I know sewing machines from bobbin to shovel. Oh, sewing machine? Oh, Uncle. <laughs> really, Marjorie, your uncle says the most amusing thing. Well, I don't see why you have to go into stitches about sewing machines. <laughs> oh, he's just no kidder. Uh, glad you like it. <laughs> well, let's get going now. Oh, come on. Oh, be down at headquarters at two, please, Uncle Morris. Uh, goodbye, Leroy. Bye. Don't be late, Uncle. Uh, goodbye, girls. Uh, Leroy. What's so funny about sewing machines? Were they giving me the needle? <laughs> I don't know. You were the one who brought them up. Well, I did not. They asked me to come to Red Cross headquarters and show the girls how to take care of them, didn't they? Oh, no, no. Not sewing machines. Automobiles, Unc. If what? Oh, but I never... Oh, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Gee, what's wrong, Unc? I don't know anything about automotors, Leroy. Why, on half of the new cars, I don't even know how to raise the hood. Mort, I didn't mean to get you in this jam. Where are we going? To find the mechanic to fix my lecture. <laughs> now, uh, this garage we're coming to, Mike. No, dear. no, no soap, Unc. Look, this shop closed Saturday afternoons. Oh, leaping lima beans. Come on, Leroy. <laughs> What a town this is. So far, only one mechanic who works on Saturday afternoons, and he can't speak English. Well, cheer up, Unc. Maybe there's one here. I hope so. I'm getting corns on my bunions. Well, uh, now that I've explained the whole thing to you, mister, how about coming with me? Who, me? Oh, I ain't no mechanic. You're not? Then what are you doing in this garage wearing overalls and carrying a wrench? Oh, I'm the plumber. Yeah. Come on, come on. Let's go inside. You're 30 minutes late already. Good. Maybe the girls have all gone home by now. No. No, they've waited. They have? There's a whole gang of them inside. Boy, are they keen lookers. They look like a bunch of magazine covers. Yeah, well, this is the first time I'd rather be looking at popular mechanics. <laughs> Oh, come on now, Uncle Mort. Give me the old line. Yeah, and he'll take the old line and hang me with it. Oh, well, there's Marge, and she sees us. Yeah. We can't back out now. No. Oh, come in, Uncle Mort. Oh, uh, thank you, Marjorie. Uh, sorry we're late. <laughs> Hello, Leroy. I didn't know you were coming along, too. Oh, I figured if I came and listened to Uncle Mort, I'd hear things I never knew before. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Penny. Penny, it's Uncle Mort now. Oh, at last. Uh, girls... Girls, here's a man who can tear a motor down and put it back together again, blindfolded, just as easily as he can with his eyes open. Oh, well, that's no lie. Shh, Leroy. <laughs> girls, I want you to meet Mr. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Yes. Hello, girls. <laughs> Hi, Hi, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, come, come. Don't call me Mr. Gildersleeve. It just call me Uncle Moore. Oh, and this is Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell, Uncle Moore. Oh, yes. Now, how do you do? Uh, <laughs> uh, charmed, Mrs. Twitchell. The pleasure's all mine. I dare say you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Twitchell's been kind enough to lend us her station wagon, Uncle. And you're sure, Mr. Gildersleeve, that you're an expert in these matters? Oh, don't worry about your benzene buggy, Mrs. Twitchy. <laughs> You'd be surprised at just how much I know. <laughs> yeah, uh, if all you sweet young things will gather around, and uh, you too, Mrs. Twitchell, <laughs> I'll explain all the important features. Excuse me. 
excuse me. Mind if I come in and listen? Oh, hello, Judge Hooker. What are you doing here? Oh, I just came down to see you in action, Gildy, old pal. <laughs> Bertie told me where you were, and I figured I might learn something. <laughs> <laughs> The old goat. <laughs> hey, ladies, this is Judge Hooker. How do you do, ladies? Do you... Uh, a judge who never has to lay down the law, because after he's through with it, it lays down by itself. <laughs> now, now, Gildy, suppose you stop gassing and get started. Yes, all right. Uh, now, ladies, in studying the modern motor, uh, the first thing we encounter is the hood. Every car should have a hood. Uh, do I make myself clear? Oh, yes, Uncle Mowat. Uncle Mowat. <laughs> That's right. We're all one big family here, Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the hood uh, covers the motors, I said. Uh, uh, well, now that we've covered the motor... Uh... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, Uncle. Yes. Suppose you tell us what goes on under the hood when you start the motor. Oh, uh, uh, yes, uh... Uh, maybe you'd like to tell the girls, Judge. No, 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 no. I wouldn't rob you of the pleasure for anything. You just go right ahead. Yes, all right. And now, first you touch the starter. That starts the car. Unless, of course, you forget to turn on the ignition key. Well, uh, suppose you turn the key and step on the starter, but the battery is dead. Who is that? <laughs> oh, yes, I see you now, my dear. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, that brings us down to uh, dead batteries. Now a dead battery. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes. You aren't finished with the motor yet. In fact, you haven't started it. Well, how can I with a dead battery? <laughs> yes. Now, uh, to get back to the motor, or as we experts call it, the engine. Uh, uh, the strange thing about an engine is that it might be missing and still be right there. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, this happens when the spark plugs fail. Then the last of the gas is exhausted out of the exhaust. <laughs> well, that reminds me, I'm exhausted myself. Uh, here's a chair, Uncle Moore. Uh, thank you. It's nice going. Let's get out of here pretty soon. You're right. Well, uh, if it's all clear to you now, ladies... Oh, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sure the girls have loads and loads of questions for you. Yes, that's what I thought, you backseat driver. <laughs> all right, girl. Well, uh, isn't the muffler supposed to keep the motor warm? And how often do you oil the fan belt? If you have an electric heater, do you still need a radiator? Uh, well, yes and no. <laughs> if those are very good questions, girls. It shows you were paying attention. <laughs> now, suppose we take them up, say, uh, next week. Oh, let's finish them up now. The afternoon is still young. Yes, but I'm not. Oh. <laughs> relax, relax. I figured out a nice, simple way for you to answer all the girls' questions. Uh, what's that, Judge? Just show them everything you've been talking about by taking the motor all apart. Why, that's a splendid idea, Uncle Mort. Oh, Marjorie, my own flesh and blood, too. <laughs> oh, that should be very interesting, shouldn't it, girl? Uh, I think I I Don't you think so, Mrs. Twitchell? Well, I'm not sure. I know less about automobiles now than I knew when I came here. <laughs> It's beyond me how anyone who looks so simple can make everything look so complicated. <laughs> Go ahead, Gildersleeve. Uh, you double-crossing dodo. I'd be glad to do it, folks, only I didn't bring any tools. Oh, well, there's a complete set in the car, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, fine. Uh, too bad I'm wearing my best clothes, though, isn't it? What, that suit suit? Yep. <laughs> Coveralls, Uncle. Gee, I just found them. Yeah, coveralls. Well, well, isn't that just peachy? Your uncle's little helper, aren't you, Leroy? <laughs> yes, sir. There's a place over here where you can put them on, Uncle. Oh, well, after such a build-up, I guess I'll have to tear down the motor. Here, come on, Leroy. Here, hold my coat. Young man, what's the big idea? Uncle, I found an instruction book and a catalog of parts in that lady's car. It shows how to fix the motor, too. Oh, fix the motor? Oh, that's help. Where is it? I hid it in back of the water cooler out there. That way, every time you get stuck, just go over and take a drink. Then you can sneak a look at the book. Uh, sneak back and... Uh, you're a bright boy, Leroy. <laughs> you ready now, Uncle Moore? Uh, ready? Uh, not from a mechanical standpoint, Leroy, but let's go. Well, 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 here we are again. Well, uh, shall we begin? 
Oh, I see you've removed the hood, Judge Hooker. Yes, and here are your tools, Gildy. Now, quiet, girls, quiet. Yeah, quiet. Pay attention to Uncle Mort. As a mechanic, I'll bet he's a panic. Yes. <laughs> well, come on, girls. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Now, huh? <laughs> and don't crowd me so, girls. No, what am I saying? I don't mind the crowding a bit. <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, uh, what's that little round piece of machinery? Uh, where? Right there. Uh, oh, that. Well, that's the... Uh, let me see now. Um, well, that's funny. I'm a bit thirsty. Excuse me while I go get a drink of water. Oh, isn't he fascinating? I'm going to ask him what I should do about my clutch. <laughs> Just trim your nails, honey. <laughs> understand why one needs both a radiator and a heater. Uh, and now, my dears, uh, what was that question? Well, I just wanted to know what this little round dingus is. Oh, that. Uh, that's the generator. Number 4B3328 amps, sells for 895 FOB Detroit. <laughs> Thinks he's smart. Yeah. Now, you'll have to take it off before you can get the motor out, Gildy. Yeah, I knew that. Hand me the wrench, Leroy. Thanks. Now, all I have to do is... Oh! Uncle, are you all right? Uh, well, just a little shock, my dear. Uh, I'll be all right just as soon as I get another drink of water. I'll get it for you, Uncle. Uh, never mind. I'll feel better if I get it myself. I don't know. I, I should be so thirsty. Uh, something I had for lunch, no doubt. I'll be right back and dismantle the motor. According to my watch, it took you just two hours to take that motor apart. Well, Gildersleeve, I've got to hand it to you. In all my experience, I've never seen a man do so much work and drink so much water at the same time. <laughs> yes, I've been to the cooler more times than a patrol wagon. <laughs> Better sit down, Uncle. You look a little seasick. Yeah? It's not that, Leroy. It's just the tide coming in. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve has certainly revealed all the mysteries of a motor. But I still don't understand the difference between a heater and a radiator. Yes. Oh, Uncle Mort, I think you're just wonderful. And I think you're just... Uh, uh, thank you, my dear. <laughs> well, I don't think anyone was more amazed than I was. Oh, Marge, I know someone who was. Be quiet, Leroy. <laughs> Say, girls, I've got an idea. How about you being my guest for tea and sandwiches? Now, there's a nice little place right around the corner. Oh, Judge oh, oh, that's oh, very oh, kind oh, of you, Judge Hooker. Come on. Hey, all right, but I'll have to wash up first. Oh, no, you mustn't waste any time going to tea, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, why not, Mrs. Twitchell? Because you'll have to put my motor back together again. Oh. I'll need it to drive out to my country place later on. Oh, yes, I forgot all about your motor. Anyway, I'm so full of water, I couldn't have drunk tea anyway. I'll, I'll stay and help you, Uncle Mort. Uh, thanks, Leroy. Run along, girls, now. I don't mind. Go along, Go along Gildy, old chap. And I hope you know where to put all those parts. I know where everything should go, Judge, including you. <laughs> Leroy, I'm not a violent man, but someday I'm going to play soccer all day with that little all-day sucker. <laughs> oh, cheer up, Uncle Mort. I bet you can put this motor back together again even faster than... Oh. What's that? Uh, Marching. Oh! That is. Oh, look, the army's outside, Leroy. Excuse me, sir. I brought down a detachment of men from Fort Platt. We were told that there would be a group of Red Cross canteen hostesses here to meet the men. Oh, well, I don't know where they could be. Say, why, yes, that's what I'll do. How many soldiers have you got outside, Captain? 142. 142, splendid. If one of our public-spirited citizens just took the girls out for a snack. Now, I'm sure he'd love to have you join them. Just march your gang over to the tea shop around the corner and ask for Judge Hooker. He'd be tickled pink to see you. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. But right now, I guess most men will agree that nothing starts the day off right like a good hearty breakfast. Yes, give me sizzling hot eggs with plenty of toast. Or maybe some pancakes or waffles. And man alive, I'm about ready to lick the world. That's why grand-tasting parquet margarine deserves a mighty important place on the breakfast table. Yes, spread wholesome parquet margarine on waffles or pancakes or breakfast toast. You're sure to love its delicate, appetizing flavor. And as for those breakfast eggs, 
Try pan frying them in parquet. You'll find they're tastier. And you'll like using parquet because it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. Yes, and parquet margarine is grand for baking, too. Because unlike bland, tasteless fats, parquet is a real flavor shortening. And remember, parquet margarine is not only good tasting, it's good for you, too. Yes, wholesome parquet is a mighty nourishing energy food. And every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So, right now, put parquet margarine at the top of tomorrow's shopping list. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's made by Kraft. And now back to Gildersleeve and Leroy, who have succeeded in putting the motor back together again and have returned home. More fried onions, Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, no thanks, Lindy. I only ate these to get them out of my sight. They look like piston rings, and I never want to look a piston ring in the face again. <laughs> How about you, Leroy? Oh, nothing more, thanks. Well, I think I'll go to an early movie now. Yeah, maybe I'll go with you. Is there a Hopalong Cassidy playing around here anyplace? No, you've seen all the new Hopalongs. How about going to see an Eastern picture for a change? Yeah. Yeah, no, Leroy. When I go to a picture show, I want to hear a lot of shooting. It keeps me awake. Well, I'll run along now. I'll be back early. All right. A careful little dessert, Mr. Gillsleeve? Well, that depends on what you have to offer. Well, they have some custard and a slice of devil's food cake and some pie left over from yesterday. Or you can have some stewed fruit and icebox cookies. Or fix some fresh tapioca pudding. And, of course, there's still some of that strawberry ice cream. Oh, fine. That'll be just right for me. <laughs> you mean all of them? Oh, no, I wouldn't stuff myself with all of them. You can skip the stewed fruit. Oh. <laughs> okay. My, it takes a wide variety of desserts to make a wide variety of gentlemen. Yeah. Oh, never mind. I'll get that doorbell, Bertie. Hello, Gildersleeve. Can I see you a minute? Sure. Take a good look. <laughs> no, I want to talk to you, Throckmorton. What do you want, you little snake in the bush? I'm a snake. Say you just stuck me with 142 soldiers. Oh, yes, the army. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> well, what do you want, Judge? I seem to have lost my watch. Huh? The last I remember, I took it out and set it down to time you when we were at Red Cross headquarters. Oh, did you go back there and look for it? Yes, I was there just now, but I couldn't find hide nor hairspring of it. Yes, hairspring. Sure you didn't happen to pick it up? I'm not accustomed to picking up other people's watches, Hooker. It's a nasty habit that gets you into bad company. You start associating with judges and people like that. <laughs> Cut the comedy, you big clown. Yeah. Now let's try to figure out what's happened to that watch. Uh, was it valuable? I should say. Given to me by the grand jury after we indicted that fake jewelry racket mob. Oh, left over from the investigation, no doubt. <laughs> it was not. This watch cost a couple of hundred dollars. Oh, my goodness. Uh, what's worrying you, Hooker? I just remembered. I set the watch down on the engine block. Oh, well, that's funny. I didn't see it when we were putting the motor back together. Oh, maybe it's in one of the cylinders. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, well, that could have happened very easily, couldn't it? Yes, it could. Well, don't stand there. Do something. Help me. Why should I help you, you misguided little nincompoop? <laughs> That's no way to talk to your pal, Throcky. Your pal. Oh, come on, come on. We've got to rush down there and tear that motor apart again and rescue that watch before that woman drives it away. Oh, you mean Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. Eh? Sounds like a nervous hamburger. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The minute she starts that motor, my beautiful watch will be ground up into junk. Please, Gildersleeve, please. I'm sorry I was mean to you this afternoon. Well, all right. I'll come down and help you, baby. But first, I'm going to have a bit of dessert. You care to join me in a dish of custard, Judge? No. Come on. There isn't a moment to lose. No, no. All in good time. She won't start that car. Your watch is safe. What makes you think so? Because after Leroy and I had the motor all put together again, we found six or seven parts we forgot to put in. Oh. <laughs> Well, there's the station wagon, and it looks like the coast is clear. Yes, Judge, there doesn't seem to be any sign of that old battle axe. Uh, hello there, Mr. Switchell. <laughs> oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've just packed some boxes to be sent overseas. I wonder if you'd put them in the back of my car. Oh, Judge Hooker will only be too glad to do that, won't you, Judge? Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, oh, thank you. Well, they're right in here. Uh, Look, pal, I'll take Madam Hoity Toity out of here while you dig into that motor from my watch. Nothing doing, chum. I've been through that engine once today. I'll lure the old buffalo away. After all, I'm more of a lady killer than you are. Yeah, they look at you and laugh, laugh themselves to death. Yes. Okay, I'll resign. No, 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 I apologize. Yeah. 
See if you can get her away from here, and then I'll go to work. All right. I'll take her out somewhere for a little while. But remember, you're going to pay the expenses. Uh, yes. Uh, are these the packages, Mrs. Twitchell? Oh, yes. As soon as they're loaded, I'll take them down to the express office. Oh, incidentally, I hope I'll find my car in good condition. Oh, you'll find it all right. I mean, you'll find it all right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, after I overhauled it all, though, the, the judge called something to my attention. And what was that? Well, the judge is quite an expert. He seemed to think that there was a, well, a, a sort of a Swiss movement in the motor. Oh, he did. Yeah. He thought that if you didn't mind, he'd try to get it out. Oh, well, all right. I'll be in town again tomorrow. Oh, I think he'd rather have you do it, uh, do it right now. No. Yes, he feels that he could save time that way. <laughs> all right, if it won't take too long. Oh, it won't, it won't. Merely a minor adjustment. Uh, judge, uh, Mrs. Twitchell says it'll be all right. You mean for me to get the watch out? Uh, what's that? Uh, yeah, uh, be sure to watch out for trouble. Uh, take your time, Judge. Take your time. Uh, don't worry, he'll watch out. Uh, and while he's working, would you care to step out for a bit of sherbet? Oh, uh, no. No, I do. Oh, well, what's that? Uh, what's what? That. Uh, you must have very sharp ears. I can't hear a thing. <laughs> Would you like to go out for a banana split, Mrs. Twitchell? I know a place where they make the drippiest banana splits. Oh, no, no. I really don't... Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, surely you heard that. Oh, yes. Those chimes are certainly beautiful. <laughs> uh, that weren't chimes. Uh, those is my car. Uh, what's he doing to it? Uh, now, don't worry, Mrs. Twitchell. He's just tuning it up. <laughs> Sounds like wheeling steel makers tuning up. Yeah. Now, just compose yourself, my dear. The judge knows what he's doing. Uh, say, I know what you need. Uh, you do? What? A nice big bowl of chili con carne. Uh, come, come, Mrs. Twitchell. I know a place where they serve the hottest chili in town. With all the beans and onions you want thrown in free. <laughs> A consigned ding dang foo piece of machinery I ever had the misfortune to get up. Well, hello, Judgey. Wow, you certainly declared total war on that motor. It's all out. It... Find the watch? No, and I've done everything, even strained the oil. Oh. Say, where's Mrs. Twitchell? Well, I left her at the movies. I sneaked out while she wasn't looking. But you were supposed to stick with her. Well, I'd have done it, too, if Hopalong Cassidy was only there to help me. Oh, what's Hopalong Cassidy got to do with it? He keeps me awake. Anyhow, it's after ten, and she'll be back pretty soon. And, brother, if that car isn't all in one piece, you won't be either. Oh, when I look at all these parts scattered from one wall to the other, I don't think I'll ever get it back together again. <laughs> oh, come on, help me. Won't you give it a sleep? Well, I'll tell you what I'll do, Judge. I'll give you just as much help as you gave me this afternoon. No, 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 no. No, that isn't fair. Yeah, you bet it isn't. All the pretty girls have gone home. Okay, I'll do it myself. I always knew you'd turn out to be a fair-weather friend. Well, it's raining. Well... Judge Hooker. Say, Bertie told me you were here, so I hurried over just as soon as I got home. Leroy, what are you doing out so late? Oh, gee, I had to come. I clean forgot to tell Judge Hooker about his watch. What about my watch? Well, you left it on the engine and I picked it up. Here it is, Judge. What? And I did all this work for nothing? Oh, Judge Hooker, is my car already? Oh, jumping jeeps, Mrs. Twitchell. Come on, Leroy, quick. Let's duck out the back way. Goodbye, Judge. Goodbye, Judge. Goodbye, Judge. Goodbye, Judge. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, until you housewives have to be pretty wide awake in your food shopping these days. Yes, you have to buy wisely. Be sure the foods you get are nourishing, good tasting, and fit into your food budget, too. Well, that's where delicious parquet margarine can help out a lot. You see, parquet margarine, the wholesome modern margarine made by Kraft, just about fills all these requirements. It's nourishing, it's wonderfully good tasting... And Parquet Margarine's economy helps out a lot in making your food budget work. Yes, Parquet Margarine is a delicious, economical source of important food values. It's a wholesome, highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve at your table. Besides, every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. What's more, Parquet Margarine is so delightfully good tasting, it just can't be compared with old-time margarines. you like its delicate, appetizing flavor, whether you serve it as a spread for bread or use it for baking and pan frying. So if you're a wise food shopper, you'll certainly try delicious economical parquet margarine. Yes, tomorrow, sure, order parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. It's the margarine made by Kraft.
Ladies and gentlemen, from now on, we're going to be on wartime. And if time means money, wartime means that our country needs all the money we can spare. And when you invest in defense bonds and saving stamps, you all join in saying, You're a hard man, MacArthur. Good night. <laughs> Be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry of the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. And now let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve, as he prepares to have breakfast this morning with his niece and nephew, Marjorie and Leroy. Marjorie, my dear. Hello. Good morning, Leroy. Happy George Washington's birthday, Unc. If what? Oh, yes, of course. Today's the 22nd. Same to you, Leroy. Say, Bertie took something special for breakfast just because it's a holiday, Uncle Mort, so be sure and notice it. Oh, you can't help noticing her special fixes, Marjorie. You weren't here for dinner on St. Valentine's Day, but she served the liver in the shape of a heart. <laughs> Yeah, and on Lincoln's birthday, she piled the bacon and toast up like a log cabin. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but she takes such pains to make everything look so appropriate. I think she's coming now. Oh, yes. Morning, everybody. Oh, well, morning. well, good morning, Bertie. What's this? No prunes for breakfast? No, sir. I cannot tell a lie. Them's cherries. Oh, well, I see. <laughs> I suppose you'll bring in little hatchets to break the eggs. <laughs> no, sir, this morning we have an Lexington omelet. A Lexington omelet? What's mm-hmm. that? It's the kind you don't put on the fire till you see the whites of their eggs. <laughs> it's a sort of revolutionary dish. Oh, yeah. Well, sounds very good for the Constitution. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> Here's your napkin. Oh, how nice. A red napkin for Leroy, a white one for Uncle Mort, and a blue one for me. Gee, buddy, you certainly got the spirit of 76 today. I bet you baked the cake in the shape of Mount Vernon. No, I don't seem to be able to do that, so I made a Baltimore cake. Yeah, why Baltimore, Bertie? Because that's the closest I could get to Washington. I thought God, I don't see how I take all them things to you. <laughs> Well, it's too bad we aren't going to have a tea party today. You could fix a Boston cream pie for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Miss Gildersleeve, now you have fun with me. Oh, no. Now, you both go ahead, and I'll be right back with the cooked oats a la Paul Revere. Yes, yeah, Paul Revere. <laughs> Jeepers, I hope she don't come out riding a horse with a powdered wig. Yes. Yeah. Sam, do you know what Paul Revere said when he finished his ride? No, what'd he say? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's corny, but everybody bites. Yeah. Stop, Leroy. I think it's terribly nice of Brady to do all these things. Yes, Leroy. I, I don't know of a better way of digesting your history than eating it. Oh, that reminds me. Did you go down and see the dentist yesterday about your loose tooth, Leroy? Well, did you, young man? Who, oh, me? Well, seeing I'm not talking to myself and Marjorie isn't a young man named Leroy, yes, I meant you. Oh, I see. Well, did you? Did I what, Uncle Clark Morton? Did you see the dentist yesterday? The dentist? Oh, you mean Dr. Cottom? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I saw him. Well, what'd he say? He said hello. You? <laughs> I knew he'd say hello. What did he say should be done about your tooth? Oh, uh, he said absolutely nothing. Uh, that's strange. I thought it was ready to be pulled. Leroy, are you sure that young man, where are you going? Oh, I thought I'd go for a walk. Before you've eaten breakfast. Come back here, Leroy. Now tell me, did you go to Dr. Cottom's office yesterday? Who, oh, me? Let's not go through that routine again. <laughs> Now, did you or didn't you? Well, uh, I, I guess I didn't. But Leroy, you said you did, and he said there was absolutely nothing to be done. I did not. Uncle Mort asked me if I saw him. 
Well, I did on the street, and he said hello to me. And I never said that he said there was absolutely nothing to be done. Unc said, what else did he say? And I said, absolutely nothing. And that's just what he did. He said absolutely nothing. <laughs> now, see here, Leroy. <laughs> you stop trying to deceive me. That was just as bad as telling a deliberate falsehood. And on George Washington's birthday, too. He wouldn't have done a thing like that. No. Really, Leroy, I don't know where you pick up such bad habits. Goodness knows, I've tried hard enough to set you a good example. Well, how about last week when you told the cashier at the movies I wasn't 12 yet, so you'd only have to pay a dime? Yes, oh, well. <laughs> well, that was, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes even I need to be reminded. I'll remember that, Uncle. Yes, all right. And also remember that it always pays to tell the truth. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gilsley, but there's a gentleman here to see you. Oh, uh, a gentleman? Well, not exactly a gentleman. It's a policeman. A policeman? I can't imagine what in the world one of those dumb flat feet was. Well, hello, officer. What can I do for you? Excuse me for disturbing your breakfast, but do you know who owns that car that's been parked in front of your house all night? Uh, the car in front of this house? Uh, well, no, I can't imagine. You mean out there? Why, Uncle Mort, that's yours. It, it is? Oh, well, thank you for telling me, my boy. Yeah, I guess it's mine, officer. Don't you know it's against the law to leave a car parked in the streets all night, mister? Oh, I know. I never heard of such a law. But, Uncle George, yes. uh, I mean, Uncle Morris, yes? uh, only last week you warned me about leaving the car out. Oh, did I, my uh -huh. <laughs> By George. Uh, George. <laughs> That's right, my dear. <laughs> it just slipped my mind, officer. I won't forget it again. I'll say you won't, not after you pay a fine in traffic court. If... Just so you won't forget to show up, here's the summons. Goodbye. Oh, yeah. Well, what were we talking about? You were saying it always pays to tell the truth. Oh, yes. Now, furthermore, Leroy... Hey, yes, Leroy? Mr. Finch is here. Oh, yes. Come right in, Oscar. I hurried as fast as I could, Mr. Gildersleeve. Did you bring all the books? Good. Set them down right here on the desk. <sighs> there we are. You know, ever since you called me, I've been wondering why you want the Forrester estate accounts brought here on Sunday. It's Judge Hooker. He runs the probate court, and I have to account to him for Leroy and Marjorie's estate. And so he likes to snap the whip every so often. Oh, yes. I've met the judge. He's quite a whippersnapper. Uh, yes. <laughs> Oscar, he found out about the estate taking over Quiggs' drugstore, and he phoned a little while ago that he's coming over to question me about it. Oh, now I see why you wanted the books. Say, how did we do during the last month? Uh, Leroy, let me handle this. Uh, how did we do, Oscar? Oh, much better. We only lost $213. <laughs> Is that considered good? Oh, that's a decided improvement over the month before, when we lost $378. Oh, yeah. If this keeps up, maybe we'll get out of the red and be in the pink. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wish we never got mixed up with that drugstore. It's getting to be such a headache, it'll soon start to break even just from the aspirin I buy there. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I, I hate to say I told you so. Yeah, well, then don't. It's a profit, you're a total loss. I never wanted to operate that cut-rate medicine market in the first place, and you know that. Say, Uncle Mort, how did we get into the pharmacy business, anyhow? Uh, well, uh, the estate owns the building, Leroy. We rented the store to Mr. Quiggs. But he spent more time trying to train his cat to do tricks than he did taking care of his business. Finally, the cat got so good and business got so bad that he took the cat to Hollywood for a career and we took the drugstore for the rent. <laughs> Geez, does that mean I can have all the banana splits I want? It does not, young man. You think banana splits grow on trees? I have to account to Judge Hooker for every penny. Well, I thought you were the executioner of our state, Unc. It, it's executor, Leroy. An executioner is a man who kills off... Oh, that's what Judge Hooker will accuse me of doing. <laughs> now, don't you worry, Mr. Gildersleeve. The profits you made for the rest of the estate are far greater than any loss incurred at the drugstore. Yes, but that won't satisfy old Droop Snoot. Droop Snoot? Well, little pet name I have for Judge Hooker, Leroy. Skip it. Well... It's a good thing you're here, Oscar. You can explain everything to him. Oh, I, I don't think I'd be of any help, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, no, why not? Oh, the judge doesn't like me very much. So if he's coming, I'd better go. Uh, wait a minute. What's wrong between you and Judge Hooker? Well, when he ran for re-election last time, it just so happened that I was president of the Get the Hook for Hooker Club. Well, goodbye. <laughs> oh. Now, out with it. What's a big pill like you doing in the drugstore business? Well, it's like this, Hooker. Uh, uh, Leroy, uh, don't you want to run along outside while I talk to the judge? No, let the boy stay. After all, this concerns him, too. Sit down, Leroy. Uh, thanks, Judge. 
Say, Unc, can I call him by your pet name? Yeah, no, 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 no. Uh, quiet, Leroy. Yes, and don't interrupt, my boy. This is just the same as a court hearing. A court hearing? It, it is? Raise your right hand, Unc. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you? Sit down, Leroy. <laughs> Now, oh, look here, Judge. Can't we do this some other time? No, I'm too busy these days. Even have to work on George Washington's birthday. Well, speak up, Gildersleeve. Well, it's like this, Hooker, old pal. A now, business... cut out the old pal business, Gildersleeve. This is official. Oh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, the estate had a wonderful chance to pick up uh, this business for practically nothing. I see. Was it in good shape when you took it over? Well, it was a going concern. Oh, but Uncle Mort, would George have said that? If George? What George? Oh, yes, that George. <laughs> if I get you, Leroy, uh, well, uh, to be frank, Judge, it had been a going concern, but by the time we got it, it had went. <laughs> well, how did you happen to take it over in the first place? Well, it was this way. Uh, 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 Leroy, are you sure you don't want to go out for a walk or something? Gee, please, no, I don't want to go out for a walk or anything. I figure I'll have more fun here. Yeah, so I'm figuring, too. Well, Your Honor, we... Uh, we were dragged into this affair by a trained cat. What did he do? Sell it to you? Yep. No, he didn't sell it to me, you little know. You little know what, Gildersleeve? Oh, you little know what I was going to say, Judge. <laughs> now, get going. Come on, get going. Yes, all right, Judge. If the former owner of this pharmacy... Uh, I mean, the, the former owner of this pharmacy... <laughs> if, if the former owner of this pharmacy neglected his business and fell so far back in his rent that one day we found ourselves... In the bicarbonate of ice cream soda business. <laughs> well, how's it been doing? Oh, business is a good deal better now than at first. Yeah, Uncle Mort. Tell the judge how much more money you didn't lose this month than you did last. What's this? Losing money? Uh, you have no business risking the estate's funds like this, Gildersleeve? I want you to get rid of that place at once, or I'm going to get rid of you as executor faster than that. Do it quickly, Gildersleeve. Goodbye. Gee, Uncle, this looks serious. Yes, you don't realize how serious it is, Leroy. I've been trying to sell that place for months, but I can't get a decent offer. Why not? Because right now, pharmacies are a drug on the market. <laughs> we'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. Meantime, I think you'll all agree it's always mighty helpful to have a good reputation. Well, that's certainly true of parquet margarine, the delicious margarine made by Kraft. Lots of people first tried parquet margarine because it's made by Kraft. And just about everybody knows Kraft's reputation for wholesome, fine-tasting foods. You see, people figure that since Miracle Whip and the other Kraft products are outstandingly good, parquet margarine must be mighty good, too. But what makes people keep right on using parquet margarine is its delicious, appetizing flavor that makes it taste so good. Spread on bread or toast or rolls. Yes, and that goes for cooking, too. Parquet margarine is a real flavor shortening for baking. And you like it for pan frying because it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And remember, parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing energy food. And besides that, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So why not find out how good margarine can be by trying delicious parquet margarine tomorrow? Remember... Ask for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, made by Kraft. Now back to the great Gildersleeve. It's Monday morning and Uncle Mort is no closer to finding a buyer for the drugstore than he was yesterday. Oh, good morning, Uncle. Have a nice rest? I had no rest, my dear. I tossed and turned like a scow in a storm. And I finally dropped off to sleep at about 6 o'clock and had a nasty nightmare in Technicolor. Oh, that's too bad. Yes. All I can remember about it was that Judge Hooker was crossing the Delaware to buy a trained cat at a Hollywood drugstore, and I was doing the rowing. <laughs> oh, you, you take things too much to heart, Uncle. Yes. Yeah. Now forget about business for a while and relax. I wish I could, but I'm all strung up like a zither. Maybe today I can get a deal started for that high-priced, cut-rate drugstore. If I could get the judge off my neck and Leroy out of my graying hair. <laughs> What's Leroy got to do with it, Uncle? Well, you remember that Washington's birthday lecture about truth I gave him yesterday? Oh, yes. Well, he's appointed himself my personal censor. Oh. It's rather inconvenient when you're discussing business. And if I'm to get rid of that prescription parlor, well, 
Sometimes it's going to be necessary to... Uh... Morning, Marjorie. Yeah. Morning, Uncle Morris. What are we going to do today? Leroy, I don't know what I'm going to do, but you're going to school, aren't you? Oh, no. Today's a holiday, too. No school on Monday when Washington's birthday falls on Sunday. Hooray! Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Leroy, why don't you go to a nice movie today, huh? Several movies. I'll give you the price. Oh, no. I want to go down to the drugstore with you. I figured out a way to save a lot of money. How, Leroy? Well, I can work there after school on Saturdays as a soda jerker. I bet I'd make a swell banana splitter. <laughs> I could sell a lot of bananas. No, Leroy. We're trying to sell the whole thing at once. Not one banana at a time. <laughs> you better go to the movies if you know what's good for me. <laughs> but, Uncle Morris, why don't you get the city drug company to buy it? Uh, they own most all the other drug stores in town. Yeah, that's just it. They're too darn independent. I went to see the manager, and he said he'd take it up with the board of directors. You know, a big business brush-off. But, Uncle, don't you know? The City Drug Company is owned by the Summerfield Investment Corporation, and that's controlled by Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. Twitchell? I thought that old greyhound owned the bus line. (laughs) She does. (laughs) Also, the Twitchell Steam Laundry, the Merchants National Bank, and four or five apartment houses. Well, I'd underestimated Mrs. Twitchell. Gee, are you going to sell her the drugstore, Unc? I don't underestimate her that much, Leroy. But somebody sold her all those other things. Uh, yeah. Yes, they did, Uncle. Oh, I know. She'll be over at Red Cross headquarters this morning. Why don't you drive me down now and just sort of casually get into conversation with her? Uh, I don't think it'll do any good. Oh, go on. You've got a way with the ladies, Uncle. Yeah, if I have, then she's no lady. <laughs> I've just met her three times, and we already hate each other as if we'd been friends all our lives. Oh, but it won't do any harm to try. Huh? Besides, I need a ride down there. Yeah, me too. I'm going to a movie. Well, I don't know what to say. Uh, uh, excuse me, Mr. Gillsley, but there's a gentleman here to see you. Oh, great jumping jeeps. I forgot to put the car in the garage again last night. Uh, you hold him there, Bertie, while we sneak out to the back and drive away. But, gee whiz, huh? George Washington never did a thing like that. George Washington never got a traffic ticket either, you know, right? <laughs> Come on. Oh, wait a minute, Mr. Gilsley. This ain't no police. Oh, he isn't? Oh, well, in that case, <laughs> I was only joking, Leroy. Yeah. You what? Why, of course. I wouldn't do a thing like that on a legal holiday after George Washington's birthday, would I? Well, I wouldn't. <laughs> Bring the man in, Bertie. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, did he say who he was? He said he's from the city and about the drugstore and supposed to find out how much everything in it is worth. Oh, wait a minute, Bertie. Don't let him in. He must be from the assessor's office. I can't see him now. Well, why not, Uncle Moore? He'll ask a lot of questions I don't feel right about answering with uh, certain people around here. <laughs> Bertie, you tell him that I've gone. Yes, sir. But, Uncle Moore, you told me yesterday that we should always tell the truth. Yeah, that's right, Leroy. But we are gone. We will be by the time Bertie gets to the front door. Come on, children. We're sneaking out the back way. <laughs> at you before we go in to meet Mrs. Twitchell, Uncle Mort. Now, don't be nervous. I'm not a bit nervous, Marjorie. Uh, maybe I'd better throw away my cigar. Uh, now, what did I do with that cigar? You threw it away. What? Oh, yes. Now, let's not get excited. Uh, uh, how do I look, Marjorie? Oh, just fine. My, but you're a handsome man. Wait a minute, Marjorie. Remember what Uncle Mort said about telling the truth? <laughs> but I really think so, Leroy. Now, hold still, Uncle, while I pull the thread. Yeah. There. You're a slick-looking smoothie, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, you mean you are, my dear. Honest, I never saw two more active members of the I'll Scratch Your Back if you'll do the same for me, society. (laughs) How about saying something nice to me for a change? All right, Leroy. Goodbye and enjoy yourself at the movie. Okay, see you later. So long, Mark. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Well, maybe I'll be able to speak freely now. Ever since I talked against fibs and little white lies... Leroy has been an impediment in my speech. <laughs> well, let's go in now. And remember, just sort of get in the conversation with her casually and bring the subject of drugstores up in a very offhand manner. Oh, offhand, all right. They say it's lucky that we're meeting her here in the Red Cross Center in case I have any trouble with the old battle axe. Oh, oh don't think of it. Come on in now. Yeah, all right. Uh, keep your fingers crossed, T.P. Oh, hello, Edie. Hi, Henrietta. Oh, I'll be right there to help you, Ruth. Oh, Mrs. Twitchell. Oh, it's so nice seeing you again. Oh, how do, my dear? <laughs> well, goodbye, Uncle Mort. Thank you ever so much for bringing me down. Oh, by the way, you know Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell, don't you, Uncle Mort? Oh, uh, yes, of course. How are you this lovely morning, Mrs. Twitchell? 
Fine. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a, it's a mighty curious thing, Mrs. Twitchell, but I, I just discovered that we're business rivals. <laughs> I suppose you're talking about my laundry. What are you doing, taking in washing? <laughs> no, 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 nothing like that. Just a drugstore. Oh, drugstore. Oh, yes, you know, a place where they sell postage stamps, sandwiches, and once in a while a bottle of fly spray. I am aware of drugstores, Mr. Gildersleeve. I just don't happen to remember that I own any. Well, well, think of that, Marjorie. Mrs. Twitchell has so many drugstores, she doesn't know she owns any. Oh, well, I think my uncle meant the city drug chain, Mrs. Twitchell. Oh, yes, that, I see. Uh, well, you... Excuse me, Uncle Mort, can I see you a second? You forgot to give me the dough for the show. Oh, yeah, well, just as soon as I'm finished, Leroy, as I was saying, Mrs. Twitchell, we have acquired the ownership of Quigg's Drugstore. And while it's not what you might call real competition at present, we're considering branching out, and we may soon give you a run for your money. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yes. Uh, we've got plans to put a drugstore on every corner downtown. Oh, remember George Washington. George Washington? Uh, yes. We're going to call them the George Washington Drugstores. <laughs> Yes. However, Mrs. Twitchell, we might consider selling out, since we have so many other interests. That is a very good idea, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, do you think so? Yes, indeed. I had so many other interests myself. I sold all my drugstores to a New York chain last month. Goodbye. Oh, this is one of my bad days. <laughs> Yes, now maybe I'll get a little peace and quiet for a while. <laughs> then Leroy, he ain't with you, huh? No, he's gone to see a movie. I always enjoy the movie show Leroy sees. I can rest so nicely while he's there. <laughs> uh, excuse me for saying so, Mr. Gilfleet, but you seem to be acting kind of skitterish lately. Uh, skitterish? Oh, you mean nervous. <laughs> well, yes, if you prefer your language without any flavor to it. Yeah. <laughs> I suppose I have been a bit jumpy. Leroy has been trying to make another George Washington out of me, and I've been telling the truth until I'm red, white, and blue in the face. Well, what you need is a little rest. Yeah, that's right. And thank goodness you got rid of that tax assessor. Oh, but Mr. Gildersleeve... Can you imagine what a tax bill I'd have with Leroy around to gum up the works? <laughs> shh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Why should I shh, Mr. Gildersleeve? There's nothing to hear me here, is there? Yes, that supper man, he's right in the living room. The who? I couldn't get rid of him. Well, Oh, sometimes I'd like to be a hermit if I could find a nice warm cave. All right, Bertie, it isn't your fault. Well, well, I didn't know anybody was waiting for me. Uh, uh, how do you do, sir? Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, that's me. My name is Showers, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm from the city. Oh, yes, the maid told me. You want to get a valuation on that drugstore, we all. That's right. I've been down there several times and never could catch you in, so I came out here. Hope you don't mind. Oh, no, not at all. Pay your taxes and help smash the axes. That's my slogan. <laughs> Suppose we go down to the drugstore now so you can get a small idea of what to assess us. <laughs> Have you got a car? Oh, yes, but I'm saving rubber, so I left it home. You think that's a good idea? Oh, splendid idea. In fact, I like it so much, I'm going to leave mine home, too. Come on, we'll walk. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so far down here. Uh, neither did I. Remind me to treat you to a corn plaster. <laughs> well, let's get started. Just haul out your notebook and shoot the questions to me. All right. Suppose we begin with those neon signs outside, the ones that read Quig's Open All Night Pharmacy. Uh, what are they worth? Oh, about $25, 20 $15. <laughs> For the both of them, of course. They look like they cost a lot more. Yeah, that's true. But they haven't much resale value. Where are you going to find anyone named Quiggs who is not only a druggist, but also stays up nights? <laughs> yeah. No, on second thought, I don't think they're worth more than $10. Uh, signs, uh, $10. Yeah. Now, inside, how about the soda fountain? That looks very nice and new. Oh, the seats are pretty worn. I'll show you what I mean. Young man, I wonder if you mind standing up a minute. Oh, Leroy, what are you doing here? Oh, I'm having a double nut chocolate sundae with whipped cream and lemon phosphate to wash it down. Yeah. <laughs> What's the matter? Are you getting tired of banana splits? Yeah, I've had three of them already. You? 
What do you and that man doing, Unc? Nothing that need concern you, my boy. Uh, excuse the interruption, Mr. Showers. Uh, now, what were we saying? How long have you had that soda fountain? Oh, uh, quite a long time. Oh, not this one, Uncle Ward. Don't you remember? Uh, you paid $3,000 for it right after the first of the year. Uh, $3,000, eh? Yeah. Isn't it lucky I have my little nephew here to remind me? <laughs> Say, do you want me to help you in case you forget anything else, Unc? No, Leroy. Uh, why don't you have some more nice ice cream? Uh, you're a growing boy, and you need the vitamins. Well, thanks, but I'll have to wait a little while before I can eat any more. Uh, I'll just tag along with you. Oh, that'll be Ducky. Yeah, Donald Ducky. <laughs> uh, now, uh, what is your next question, Mr. Showers? How about these other fixtures? The cigar counter, the perfume displays, and uh, these glass cabinets. Oh, well, to tell the truth, they're new, too. Yes, to tell the truth. If the bill for them came to $4,400. Well, that takes care of the fixtures. How about the merchandise? Have you got an inventory? What's an inventory, Unc? Something you invent? If, Leroy, please, I have enough headaches as it is. If an inventory is a list of all the things a drugstore has that are just as good as the things folks come in for that you're out of. <laughs> yes, I suppose you took one last month. I suppose we did. I'll have to ask the cashier. Oh, uh, Miss Capstaff? Yes? Oh, hello, Mr. Gildas, lady. A little nephew was just in here looking for you. Did you see him? Oh, of course you must have seen him, because here he is right beside you. Hello, Leroy. If... <laughs> if Miss Capstaff, would you please bring out the drug inventory we made last month? Yeah, and don't forget the one for cigars and candy and, and hardware and paint and powder, Uncle. Oh, yes, I was forgetting them, wasn't I? Bring them all here, Miss Capstaff. <laughs> all righty. I'll be right back. I know exactly where they are, either in a safe or far away or behind a prescription tag. While we're waiting, don't forget to tell the man about the big refrigerator we have downstairs. And that new dishwasher in the kitchen. Yeah, keep it up, Leroy, and you're going to be the new dishwasher in the kitchen. Uh, oh, yes, Mr. Showers, I'd forgotten about them. You see, they set us back somewhere in the neighborhood of... Uh... $837.21. Uh... Well, the boy has an uncanny knack for figures. He'll probably turn out to be an accountant when he grows up. If he grows up. <laughs> oh, well, here comes Miss Capsack, back with the inventory. Oh, here we are, Mr. Gildersleeve. I also found a list of all the merchandise we bought since the inventory was taken. Do you want that, too? Oh, yes, you might as well. Here you are, Mr. Showers. Is there anything else you'd like to know? There's a matter of goodwill and outstanding accounts. Oh, gee, we got a lot of goodwill on account of we got so many outstanding accounts. Yep. Leroy, that'll be all. Not another word out of you or... I won't say anything, Uncle. Uh, I, uh, I should judge that goodwill was worth about $1,500. And our accounts receivable. Oh, I was talking to Mr. Finch, the bookkeeper, about them only yesterday, and he says that they amount to around 1000 and he thinks that uh, you... Thank you, Miss Capstaff. That'll be all. Oh, are you sure there's nothing else? No, Miss Capstaff, you've done enough. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, now, Mr. Showers, have you got all the information you want? Yes, according to my figures, the valuation on this property will run to about uh, 28500 Oh, 28500 jumping jelly beans. How much of a tax will we have to pay on that? <laughs> <laughs> I might as well confess, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'm not the tax assessor. What? You're not? Then, then why, why did you say you were? I didn't. You just got that notion all by yourself. Well, you see, I figured I could get a pretty low, honest valuation on this store if I let you go ahead assuming that I was. But then, who are you? I'm an appraiser hired by the city drug chain. They're going to make you an offer to buy this place based on the figures I just got. Oh, gee, isn't that wonderful? Yes, my boy. I hope you've learned your lesson from this. Honesty always pays, Leroy. <laughs> <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, let me remind you mothers and housewives that these days call for energy. Every one of us is working harder than ever. That's why the energy-producing foods are so important. Foods like parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. It helps to refuel the body and replace energy used up in hard work or play. What's more, wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine is a dependable year-round source of vitamin A. Yes, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. Now, of course, food value is mighty important, but flavor is important, too. Well, parquet margarine is outstanding on both scores. Yes, whether you use parquet margarine as a spread for bread, a flavor shortening for baking, or for pan frying, 
you'll find it has a luscious, tempting flavor your family's sure to like. Best of all, parquet margarine is economical. It can save you money every day. So why not try it? Kraft's delicious, economical margarine called parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Well, we certainly put that deal across, didn't I, Unc? Yeah. Yeah. Leroy, and now that all, all I have to worry about is where to invest that money again. Oh, no, you don't, Uncle Moore. I know just where it'll be safest and do the most good. Oh, where's that, Leroy? Good old United States defense bonds. Oh, I, of course. Uncle Sam can put to work every dollar we can spare. Hey, good night, folks. <laughs> with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Terry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. And now let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve, who's at the Bundles for Blue Jackets Bazaar, preparing to do his bit by acting as the barker at the booth where the pretty girls are going to sell kisses. <laughs> So this is my booth, eh? You know, Marjorie, I think it's going to be fun selling kisses. This is the first time I've heard of it, Uncle Mort. Gee, who are you going to sell your kisses to? Yeah. Uncle Mort isn't going to do the kissing, Leroy. I thought I was wrong about that. Yeah. Yeah. There are going to be a dozen beautiful young ladies to do the work, Leroy. Uh, incidentally, Margie, to be a good salesman, a fellow should know about what he's talking about, you know. <laughs> now, don't you think there's a... No, I guess free samples are out. <laughs> yeah. Gee, why spend a buck for a wet smack when you can get just as daffy on a dime's worth of taffy? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Uncle Mort, that wasn't a bad idea of Leroy. About you kissing any of the ladies. We could charge a dollar a piece. Uh, no, my dear. Why not, Uncle? Because I'd pay a dollar myself not to kiss the type of woman who would pay a dollar to kiss me. <laughs> Oh, Miss Marge, I got your lemonade stand all fixed up for you. But if we get the big crowd, I don't think three lemons is going to be enough. Well, you better get some more, Bertie. They're going to open the doors in about an hour, and we're expecting a lot of people. Oh, yes. All the gentlemen in town want to patronize Mr. Gillsleeve's osculation station. Yes. Yeah, they do, huh? <laughs> yes, sir. They'll be buzzing around that kiss booth till them poor girls is all puckered out. Yes. <laughs> and all the ladies going to line up at that yogi man's tent to have their fortunes told. Oh, you mean Yogi Swamahandra? Oh, Penny Banks met him in New York, and he's marvelous. We're counting on him as our main attraction. Oh, there's Penny. Oh, Penny! Oh, okay, yeah. stop now, Marge. I just had the most terrible news. I don't know what to do. Yogi Swamahandra's missed his plane connections and won't be here in time. A uh, fine fortune teller. Why didn't he look in his crystal ball, see that he was going to miss the plane, and then see that he didn't? <laughs> well, we've depended on the yogi as our big money maker. Well, why don't you get a substitute? Uh, Leroy, do you think that yogis grow on bushes? I don't know. What is a yogi? Uh, a yogi is a man who tells you about your past and future for a present. <laughs> uh, Penny, isn't there any other one floating around who can pinch hit for this man? Oh, I don't know of any. Well, why don't you get somebody to dress up and play the part? Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, that would be deceiving the people. What do you think those fortune tellers do? When they look in a crystal ball, they don't see any newsreel, you know. Sure, all you need is a smooth talker with a gift of gab, like Uncle Mort here. Yeah, no, wait a minute, young man. Yes, Uncle, if you wore a costume and makeup and a beard. People would still recognize me. No, you could get away with it. It's dark in that tent. But I wouldn't know what to say. Well, we could help you by giving you the lowdown on the customers. Lowdown? But suppose they got the lowdown on me. Oh, they wouldn't if you changed your voice. Uh, oh, say yes, Uncle Moore. Oh, what am I getting myself into? I'm no fortune teller. And something tells me that instead of being in front of a crystal ball, I'm going to find myself behind an eight ball. <laughs> Stop 
for, Unc. The costume place is three blocks down the street. I know, Leroy, but read the sign. Oh. Have your past, present, and future revealed by a famous gypsy physique. Yes. That's psychic, Leroy. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. Madame Rosalie, the gypsy who reveals all. Gee, Gypsy Rosalie. I've heard of her. <laughs> Leroy, that's another one. I thought maybe I could pick up a few pointers on how to go about this fortune-telling business from this woman here. Okay, let's go in. No, Leroy, you'll have to wait here. I'll be right back. Good afternoon, sir. You have come to consult Madame Rosalie, the great seeress who sees everything, knows everything, and tells everybody. Yes. Why, yes, that is, if she isn't busy. I shall look in the crystal ball and see. No, I am not. Oh, uh, I see. It's you. Uh, you're free. Uh. No, it will be necessary to cross my palm with silver. Oh, yes, of course. How much? One dollar for three questions. A past, a present, and a future. All right, let me see. Give it here quick. Yes, don't grab, lady. Thank you. <laughs> Now, sit down and look deep into crystal balls. All right, I'm looking. It, what next? Ah, Excuse me, would you mind repeating that? That's what I thought you said. <laughs> I'll have to remember that. It, it, what does it mean? I am calling on the spirit of my forefathers. Yeah, they must have been tobacco auctioneers then. <laughs> Well, go right ahead, madam. First, for the past, I see not long ago trouble. Yes. There was smoke, a dark cloud behind you. Oh, yes, Bertie burned the toast at breakfast. Yeah, very good. <laughs> madame Rosalie, she never failed. Uh... And now for the present. Mmm, mm, you get into trouble because of man. Uh, what kind of a man? He is dark. Also heavy. Uh, does he have a black mustache? Sure, with black mustache. He gets you in trouble. You know him? Yeah, that's me. I'm my own worst enemy. <laughs> now, what about the future? Soon you will have loss, if not careful. Loss. Crystal balls say honey, terror, wagly, dora, blasto, mix, or blasto, plomene. If, what does that mean? Watch out. Uh, well, thank you very much. Is that all? Yes. Unless you wish to ask the two-dollar question. Oh, uh, I don't think I'll have the time. Let me see how late it is. Uh, by George, what did I do with my watch? I had it. For the I... time, she's now. No, see here, madam. Where's my watch? How should I be knowing? I thought you knew everything. I do not bother with trifles. This wasn't a trifle. It was an eighty-dollar watch. Sir, are you accusing me? Yes. Either I get my watch back or. Hey, I'll bet you put it in that drawer. No, no, you keep out of that. Is that so? I'm going to have a look. You stop that. It's none your business. Well, well, what's this? Madam, you've got enough watches here to start a hot shop. Oh. If, and here's mine. Well, thank you. I guess I'll go now. You, you, Hesni Malokarando, Sebabaninga, Crowny, Todo, Afnu, Dali. What does that mean? No, no, don't answer that. <laughs> So long, madam, and don't take any wooden watches. Nuts to you, Joe. <laughs> well, a debutante. <laughs> oh, well. Hey, hey, come on, Leroy. Uh, did you learn anything, Uncle Mort? I'll say I did. When a gypsy says watch out, she means you're going to be out of watch. What do you mean, Uncle? Well, you see this gold timepiece of mine? Yeah. Well, that gypsy tried to... Oh, my goodness, Leroy, this isn't my timepiece at all. Oh, well, wait a minute, Uncle Mort. Where are you going? I'm going back to get my watch from that gypsy woman. But she hasn't got it, Uncle. What do you mean? How do you know? You laid it down on the dining room table at lunchtime and left home without it. Oh, this is a fine mess. <laughs> The bazaar is in full blast. Yeah, not so fast, Leroy. Is everything all right with my costume? Yeah, how about the turban? Your laundry mark's showing. Yeah, well... There, that's better. Oh, thanks. How about this beard? Gee, your best friends won't tell you. From a Hindu, I mean. Yeah. Shh. There's Penny and Marjorie and Bertie. Let's see if we can fool them, huh? You pretend I'm the real yogi. All right. Uh, hey, Penny, uh, this gentleman was outside and said he wanted to see you. Uh, this is Miss Banks, Mr. Yogi. Hey, greetings, Mim Sahib. A thousand pardons if I'm late. Oh, Uncle Mort, you look cute. Yeah, what's the 
I'll never get away with this. Oh, yes, you can, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, sure, Uncle. You look just like you stepped out of Kipling. Doesn't he, Bertie? That's right. I'd say he's been Kipling all his life. <laughs> People are waiting there at the fortune store, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, here's what we'll do. Marge, you sell tickets. Okay. And, Bertie, you and I'll spot the customers and tell Leroy their names and all about them. Yes, ma'am. I know it's the lowdown on the high ups. Yes. And then, Leroy, you go around to the back of the tent. There's a hole there, and you whisper the information to your uncle. Well, how'll I know when Leroy's there? Uh, suppose I knock three times. Yeah, on a canvas tent? That's like knocking on a wet sponge. <laughs> how about whistling something? Huh? That's a good idea. What do I whistle? How about something boogie-woogie? Yes. No, Bertie, spare me the hot licks. <laughs> Why not something Indian? Oh, not by the waters of the Minnetonka? No, Marjorie, East Indian, like, uh... A pale hands I love beside the Shalimar. Wouldn't you rather hear deep in the heart of Texas? <laughs> no, Leroy. Pale hands, not clap hands. Uh, that should be easy to remember. Just look at your hands. Oh, just look at your hands. What's wrong with them, Mark? You better wash them. They're not pale enough. People are waiting, Mr. Gildersleeve. You better go in the tent and get started. Wait a minute, girls. I'm getting cold feet. Well, just fold them up underneath you and sit on them, Uncle. Uh, now, in you go. Hurry all up. right, if you insist. Careful there, Stoop. Leroy, what did you call me? Uh, Stoop, Uncle, you'll knock your turban off. Uh, oh, yes, of course. I thought you... Well, never mind what I thought you, you said. Get, com- get comfortable in there, Uncle Morton. We'll start sending in the victims. All right, whenever you're ready, just shoot the gulls to me, gals. <laughs> uh, now, let me see. Uh, how do you do this, Mahatma Gildersleeve? Oh, they must be ready to start. Where's that hole in the canvas? Ah, uh, yeah, this must be it. Is that you, Leroy? It ain't Carmen Lombardo. <laughs> get set now, won't you? I'm about to tell your first fortune. Believe me, I'd give a fortune to get out of here. Who is it? It's some man that none of us know. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> Can't you stall him off? They tried, but no soap. So you got to take him first. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, how do I look? Your laundry marker's showing again. If... Get back there. Here he comes. I wish I had a mirror in here. Uh, greetings and salutations, Saib. Hello. Uh, you have come to consult Yogi Swamahandra, the king of the Hindu mystics, no? No. No, oh, you didn't? <laughs> you didn't? Oh, well, then, then why did you come here? To ask you about Alice Higgins and Mrs. Belmont de Bercy and Marie King. If... What about them, Saeed? <laughs> As if you didn't know. As if I do. <laughs> come, come, sorry. If you care to gaze in the crystal ball, maybe I can locate these people. They sent me to locate you, Andrews. If Andrews? Uh, you are making some mistake. Yes, I, I am the Yogi Swamahandra. Sure, sure, I know that. Yogi Swamahandra. Alias William Andrews, alias Walter Bunker, alias Louis the Frost, alias Pete Brown. If who, me? Yes. And Detective Lieutenant Quinn from Chicago, where you wanted for jump with bail on bunco charges. If what? You're also wanted in Idaho for obtaining money under false pretenses, in Baton Rouge for running a confidence game, and in Florida for selling rubber plants guaranteed to grow white sidewall tires. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. Meantime, you mothers and wives of hearty eaters, does the way your food budget is going up ever get you down? If so, have you ever thought of serving parquet margarine made by Kraft? Because using parquet margarine is one sure way to economize and please your family, too. You see, parquet margarine is different from the margarines you may have tried a few years back. Parquet is the delicious, wholesome margarine that's made by Kraft. And like all the famous Kraft foods... It's mighty good tasting. But there's no need to take my word for it. Parquet costs so little, why not buy a pound tomorrow and try parquet yourself? I'll bet you agree parquet's delicate appetizing flavor is pretty hard to beat. Then, too, parquet margarine is a nourishing, wholesome food. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And to make it even better for you, Kraft adds vitamin A to parquet margarine. 9,000 units to every pound. So give the food budget a break. Order delicious parquet margarine tomorrow. Yes, ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet. The delicious margarine made by Kraft. Now back to the great Gildersleeve, who suddenly found himself a much-wanted man by the police of half a dozen cities. Now, that isn't oh, fair. 
Roy. You do do it for me. Just a second. Just a second. Hold it. Hold it. Quiet, please. Yes, quietly, Roy. I don't care what you people say. I came here to grab the yo guy, and he's going back to face trial. But, officer, you're making a mistake. This is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yes, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Boy, that's a phony alias if I ever heard one. <laughs> See, you can see he isn't a yogi. Uh, take your beard off again, Uncle. Yeah. Never mind, never mind. I know he's a fake yogi. His real name is Willie Andrews, and he's known as Willie the Tub. Yep. I am not a tub. It's just the way this coat buttons. <laughs> yeah, I knew that when I started to fool folks, I'd get into trouble. My mama done told me. But, but Lieutenant Quinn, if you take him away now, bundles of blue jackets will lose a lot of money. Why don't you wait till we close down tonight? Well, okay, miss, okay. I'll let this grafter operate for the balance of the show, but I'll be on guard right outside the tent. Is that understood? Oh, yes. uh, excuse me. Do you mind if I go home? I'm expecting a bad headache. Now, you, you stay right here, Uncle Mort. Uh, don't worry. We're going to get this all straightened out before the bazaar closes, Mr. Gildersleeve. Come on, let's let the yogi get to work. Come on, Lieutenant. Come on, Marjorie. Leroy. Okay, I'm coming. Uh, take it easy, Uncle Mort. Remember, keep a stiff upper turban. If... <laughs> How can I? I've been in hot water ever since I put on this Turkish towel. Well, we'll get you out of this, Uncle, if it takes us years. Yeah, and it looks like it will, too. Remember, Willie, no tricks now. Yeah. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> yes, Leroy. Who is it this time? The district attorney? You're getting warm, Unc. It's your old pal, Judge Hooker. What? Oh, well, that old crab wants his fortune told. <laughs> uh, this is the first pleasant thing that's happened to me all day. All right, Leroy, go on, go on, go on. This way you come to have your hand read? Uh, no, Saeed. The yogi, he does not work by the hand. He's the crystal ball player. <laughs> uh, please to take a seat down, Judge. Judge? Judge? Say, how do you know I'm a judge? You are speaking to Yogi Swamahandra, queen of the Hindu mystics. <laughs> it's a great soothsayer who sees all, knows all, and tells a little. Well, that was certainly good, guessing my profession. It's not necessary for me to guess, Judge Hooker. What? I know. Now it will be necessary to cross my palm with silver. But I paid my dollar outside. I have no contact with the outside. <laughs> That is separate business. The, the silver, please, in form of a $5 bill. I will not. No, sir, I will not. How about that $5 bill you won at poker last night? Say, how did you know that? Shh, don't worry. I shall not tell a soul you were supposed to draw one card and you picked up two. Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, Saeed. Now look deep into the crystal ball. Hello, Kantumula Hola do Hey, 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 what are you doing? I am calling on the spirit of my forefathers. But if you're going to tell my fortune, why don't you call on my forefathers? Because, Sahib, I cannot bark. <laughs> What's that? Wait, silence, please. I am gazing into your past. It is mighty murky. Well, what do you see? I see you have a friend. A dark man with mustache. Is he a fat fellow? No, not fat. Maybe a little plump. <laughs> but on him, he's look good. Yeah. He's handsome dog, no? I wouldn't call him handsome, but he's a dog, all right. <laughs> Enough. You are always abusing this friend fella, giving him the hot foot in his soul. Yeah, that is bad. For you, I mean. You think so? Yes. We. Oui. Da. <laughs> he said in my native tongue, Is that so? Say, what does it mean? It means be good to Gildersleeves or he give you coughing around, that's what. Say, you're a whiz. I'd like to put you to one last test, though. Yes. Now, this is a hard one. What's this friend's first name? I know it as well as I know my own. <laughs> He's a Throckmorton P. That's absolutely right. Mm. Say, Yogi, uh, elections are coming up pretty soon. Can you tell me if I'm going to win again? Uh, let me look in the crystal ball. Yeah. He, duh, I can see the day of election. You can? Yeah, lots of voters, in and out, all day long. Yes, yes, yes. Now it is late, twilight. 
They close the polls. I see. And then? They are counting the votes. Yes, yes. Go on. It's getting dark. They are adding up totals. I see. Well, what is it? I think I see. Uh, no, I can't. What's wrong? What's the trouble? It's so dark I cannot read results. <laughs> If Leroy, stop yelling uncle. All right, George, I'm ready to yell uncle myself. I've told about more fortunes this afternoon than Dunn and Bradstreet. Oh, cheer up, Uncle Mort. The next one is the last before dinner. Well, all right. Who is it now? Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. You, that mildewed old scorpion. <laughs> yeah, you know all about her. I've been a duck now. Yeah, I hope I can hold out. Ah, uh, madam, uh, Yogi Swamahandra welcomes you. Uh, Hello. First of all, Mr. Swami, or Yogi, or whatever you are, I want you to know that I don't believe in any of this nonsense. Why, of course not, Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. Oh, you know my name. Who told you? I am Yogi Swamahandra. I know everything. Well, I wager that you don't know everything. What was my maiden name? Excuse me, I got to look in the crystal ball. With this ball, I can even look that far back. <laughs> Oh, I got it. Madam, before you were married, your name he used to be McGillum Cuddy. Uh, babe McGillum Cuddy. Uh, uh, all right, uh, that's enough. You don't need to go on. Your father, she had farm, raised turnips. Oh, now that's where you're wrong. They were beets. Excuse, please. But beets look like turnips because this is not technicolor crystal ball. <laughs> I see many interesting things in your past, madam. Shall I tell you? Oh, uh, no, no. Uh, you know them, and so do I, so why bother? Ah, uh, you have led a very interesting life, madam. <laughs> <laughs> Would make wonderful movie. Uh, do you uh, think so, Joe? Sure. Me? With title, How Green Was My Mr. Twitchell? <laughs> Uh, tell me, madam, you still do not believe in my powers? Uh, no, I've, uh, I've changed my mind. You're positively uncanny. Uh, now, sir, I have a number of problems and I need your advice. Uh, suppose I tell you all about them. Uh, some other time, Mrs. Twitchell. Now I got to go eat dinner. Oh, of course. Uh, why don't you come out to my house? What? Oh, no, I got to relax. And besides, uh, I've already promised Miss Forrester I got to have dinner at her house. Oh, but I must talk to you some more. Uh, I know what. Oh, Marjorie. Uh, what you do? Uh, yes, my dear. I've become so fascinated with the yogi that I've insisted on his coming to dinner at my place. Uh, you must come, too, and bring your little brother and that uncle of yours, Mr. Gildersleeve. If not him, not Gildersleeve. If he comes along, I'll not be there. Oh, oh I'm getting to like you more every minute. Uh, very well. Uh, let's get out of this tent. Uh, my car is at the curb. Looks like we're stuck, Uncle. Shh. I've got reading out of my hand, Marjorie. I'm coming, Mrs. Twitchell. Hey, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Where do you think you're going? Shh. I'm going out to dinner. Not without me, you ain't. Oh, Yogi. Uh, who is this uh, gentleman? Uh, who? Oh, this. Uh, this is Mr. Quinn. He's, uh, he's trying to get me to do some work for the state. <laughs> <laughs> You, you might as well invite him to dinner, too, because he's going to come along anyway. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, uh, now, Yogi, uh, tell me something about India. Uh, India? Sure, Yogi, go ahead. You're an old Indian faker. Uh, I am Indian fake here. Well, there's no difference between the two, is there? Oh, no more than between a flat foot and a flat head. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, that's a hot one, Uncle Mort. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that's a hot one, uh, Uncle Mort would have said. Uh, Leroy, finish your spinach. Oh, gee, I bet they don't eat spinach in India, do they, Yogi? It's ah. Where I come from, they stuff children with spinach so they can't talk at dinner time. <laughs> Oh, uh, that reminds me, I've been meaning to ask. Uh, what part of India did you come from, Yogi? Eh, uh, all of me. <laughs> no, no, I mean, where were you born? Oh, born, now I grab you. Where was I born? 
uh, in my papa's house. Uh, my mama done told me. <laughs> well, I think it's time for me to return to the bazaar. Let me see. And uh, he's already 15 minutes coming to 8 o'clock. Oh, what a beautiful gold watch. Uh, Where did you get it, Yogi? It was given to me by Gypsy's woman. She thought I was a fellow named Joe. I must remember to mail it back to her. Excuse me, Yogi. Uh, yes? Your beard is coming off. Oh, my goodness. How's that? Oh, it's crooked. It points off to the left. Oh, how's it now? Any better? Yeah, but we better get out of here before it falls into your finger pole. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Twitchell, but now I must make the grand scrap. Yes, and after he finishes tonight, we've got to go on a little trip, don't we, Yogi? Oh, well, aren't you staying in town for a few days? No, no, we have a little legal business to attend to in Chicago. Yeah. Oh, well, that's too bad. Madame Twitchell, you said a mouseful. Well, take good care of the Yogi on the trip. Oh, sure, I won't let him out of my sight. In fact, I'm going to simply attach myself to him. Oh. Holy catfish. Uh, uh, what did you say, Yogi? Uh, uh, nothing, nothing, madam. I was only praying to the holy catfish of the Ganges River. Uh, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Twitchell. Come on, everybody. Oh, I hope this is over pretty soon. I'm plenty tired of tenting tonight on the old campground. If... Is that you, Leroy? No, sir, this is Bird. If... What are you doing whistling pale hands? Where's Leroy? It's late. He's gone home, and I'm on the swing shift. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, who's next, Birdie? There's a big gentleman with a dull red gleam in his eyes. Huh? Have y'all been telling some wife or husband's a philanthropist? Bertie, I've told so many different people so many different stories. I don't know what I said. I better get out of here. Bertie, you go out and stall him a little while, huh? Okay, but he ain't the type of stall good. Oh. Now, if I can crawl under the back of this tent and sneak out before that nosy detective from Chicago discovers it. Oh, hello, Lieutenant Quinn. Uh, what are you doing here? Get back in there, Tubby, before I take you to Chicago in a box. Yes, well, I, I was only after a breath of fresh air. You don't have to crawl out on your hands and knees after it. Now, get back in there, Willie. All right, and stop calling me Willie. Uh, man, Excuse get... me, but are you the man who calls himself Yogi Swamahandra? It uh, Have you got an appointment? No, I haven't. Then I can't read your fortune. Okay, then I will read yours. If... Take a good look in the crystal ball, Yogi. What do you see? Um, I see nothing. Well, I see something. I can see you tomorrow morning. You are waking up in a hospital bed. If, if what? Your jaw is fractured. Both of your eyes are black. Your nose is in splints. And your ribs are barbecued. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What are you talking about? And my predictions come true, my friend, and I'll make sure. Now, wait a minute. Who are you? I just got into town on a late plane, and I find my reputation is ruined. And you've got it, you faker. I am the real Yogi Swamahandra. Oh, you are. Well, I'm certainly glad to meet you. No, you won't be. I'm going to give your face a retread job. No, you don't. You keep away from me. Oh, Mr. Quinn. Oh, Mr. Quinn. Hey, what's the idea? Now, what are you up to? Hey, grab that man. There's your real yogi. Yeah. Do your duty, officer. Hey, come back here and fight. Uh, nuts for you, Joseph. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But first, are those Lenten meals becoming a problem to you homemakers? I mean, are you finding it hard to make them as tasty and appetizing as your regular meals? Well, if you do, here's a hint that may be mighty helpful. Yes, it's this. You can add rich extra flavor to all kinds of dishes by using plenty of parquet margarine made by Kraft. You see, the delicate, tempting flavor that makes parquet margarine a favorite spread for bread makes it grand for cooking, too. Parquet margarine is swell melted over hot vegetables. It's a real flavor shortening that adds delicate extra flavor to cookies and cakes and pie crust. Parquet makes pan-fried food tastier because it tastes so good itself. In fact, parquet margarine adds extra flavor to all kinds of dishes and the extra zest that makes your family ask for more. 
Best of all, using lots of parquet margarine is no extravagance. When you find how little it costs, you'll certainly agree to that. And remember, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious energy food that's a reliable year-round food source of important vitamin A. So right now, put delicious parquet margarine at the top of tomorrow's shopping list. Remember, it's parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. And there we were, Judge, me and Willie the Tub locked in mortal combat. But I subdued him by sheer brute strength. Well, seeing what you've done, I guess I'll have to forgive you for tricking me, Gildersleeve. Say, I just remembered. What did you do with my five bucks? Oh, that. <laughs> I did the best thing possible with a Judge. I've given it to the American Red Cross. Oh. I hope everyone who's listening in will find an extra five spot to turn over to the Red Cross this week, like I did. Huh? It's like you did, Judge. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> to come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Peary as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. Spring has come to a certain home in Summerfield. Spring with its bright colors and its new flowers. And here on his hands and knees in the hallway, tacking down a new bright colored flowered carpet, is our friend, the Great Gildersleeve. The moon shines bright, it's light all night, deep in the heart of Texas. I'm stuck, Leroy, because my boy, I'm short of carpet taxes. The coyote's wine takes some of mine, deep in the heart of Texas. Well, thank you, son, I'm almost done. Oh, What did you do? If I hit the wrong nail. Here, let me finish it for you. All right. There we are. Uh, thanks, Leroy. You certainly knock with the neck. <laughs> oh, I'm tired. Let's sit down on the steps for a while, huh? Oh! What's wrong, Uncle? I just discovered I wasn't out of taxes after all. <laughs> Carpet down, Uncle Mort, or is it getting you down? Yeah, hello, Marjorie. I, I had misplaced some tacks, and I had just found them the hard way. <laughs> you better take them out of your pocket before you ruin your trousers. Oh, this is really just an old pair, but I'll unload the tacks anyhow. Yeah, there. Oh, well, what do you know? What is it, Uncle? Why, here's my lucky half dollar. So that's where it was. No wonder I haven't been getting the Blake's breaks lately. <laughs> Yeah, but you watch. Things are going to be better now that I found it again. Really, Uncle, you believe in the most childish superstitions. Yeah. Oh, I'm different. Yeah. Uh, Excuse me, Mr. Gilsey, but here's a telegram that just came for you. Oh, thank you, Bertie. Yeah. Telegrams fascinate me. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen to this. Uh, dear Mr. Gildersleeve, congratulations. The Gentleman's Fashion Guild of New York has selected you as one of the ten best-dressed men in Summerfield. Well... Signed, J.C.B. Halchester, President. Why, Uncle, that coin does bring you luck. One of the ten best-dressed men. Why, George, I can hardly believe it. <laughs> <laughs> Neither can I, Mr. Gilbert. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, why not? Well, just look at yourself in them old work clothes. Huh? It's a good thing there ain't no television to telegraph. They'll say to elect you to ten worst-dressed men in town. Oh, Bertie. Bertie, it's ten o'clock. Someone had better remind Uncle Mort of his appointment downtown. Do you know where he is? 
He asked me to stand in front of the mirror in his room, no doubt, trying to decide which one of his neckties harmonizes best with the rest of his haberdashery. Oh, do you think so? <laughs> Undubitably. <laughs> He's been that way ever since he got that telegram. Oh, you mean the one from those fashion experts? That's right. And making him one of the best press men in town is making me one of the worst work women in town. I'm wearing myself down to a shadow. <laughs> Well, on you, it doesn't show. <laughs> In fact... Ah, good morning, Marjorie. Hello, Bertie. Say, how do I look? Does my cravat blend with the rest of my ensemble? Yes, sir. But I was sure you was going to ask us if your tie harmonized with the remainder of your clothes. Yeah. <laughs> Uncle, yeah. you look as if you just stepped out of a bandbox. Now, don't kid me, Marjorie. Whoever saw a bandbox big enough for me to step out of? <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going, Uncle? Well, Mr. Halchester's in town. He's invited me to meet him at the Ritz Summerfield. Oh, you mean the men's clothes designer? Yeah, I hope I look my best. Oh, you do. Uh, oh, that must be Judge Hooker. Send him right in, Bertie. We're saving rubber by riding downtown in his car. <laughs> Oh, good morning, Judge. Hey, look at those duds. You'd look like a tailor's dummy, Gildersleeve. You didn't talk so much. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry if my sartorial splendor disturbs you, Judge. But as one of the ten best-dressed men in Summerfield... Who, you? Who says so? The Gentleman's Fashion Guild of New York? Never heard of them. Yeah, from the looks of your clothes, you've never even heard of Gentleman's Fashions. <laughs> As Mr. Halchester said to me this morning... Who's Mr. Halchester? Mr. Halchester is a famous style authority. He's the man who picked me and the other nine snappiest dressers. How'd he do it? Over the telephone? Yeah, over the telephone. He's stopping at the Ritz Summerfield. I'm going down to meet him. Say, I'd like to meet him, too. You mind if I come along with you? Not at all. That suit of yours should give Mr. Halchester a good hearty laugh. <laughs> What's wrong with this suit? Oh, nothing that a rock, a rope, and a river couldn't cure. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, come in, come in. Oh, this is a pleasure indeed, Mr. Halchester. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Judge Horace Hooker, a uh, close friend. Uh, Judge, I want you to know Mr. Halchester. Oh, everybody knows Mr. Halchester. Glad to meet you, sir. Uh, I'd like both of you to meet Mr. Leslie, one of New York's leading tailors. How do you do? It's a pleasure. Me too. Uh, Mr. Leslie makes most of the clothing I design. Oh. Uh, Mr. Gildersleeve here was on our ten best list for Summerfield. Ah, uh, Yes. Excellent choice. And I think he has a very good chance of making our first team. Uh, you mean... Yes, the ten best-dressed men in America. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then, why not? It, how do you make your selection? Oh, on a number of counts. Huh? Taste, style, figure, carriage. Gildy could win on the last two. He's got a figure like a carriage, all right. <laughs> Ignore him, Mr. Halchester. He's just jealous. He's so skinny, his tailor has to put pads in his trousers so his knees will bag. <laughs> yeah, go on, sir. Well, another big point is extent of wardrobe. Oh. Gildy should win that one, too. His wardrobe extends farther out than... No, see here, Hooker. Are uh, nice clothes your hobby, sir? Oh, yes, uh, Mr. Leslie. It always has been. You see, I was elected the best-dressed fellow in my class at college. After I introduced peg-top pants and yellow-button shoes. <laughs> uh, I'd like to see uh, some of your ensembles, Mr. Gildersleeve. I suppose, of course, you have a country squire suit in Orkney Twist. In the... Uh, what? Orkney Twist. Oh. You know, that new hand-woven suiting? Very popular in New York this season. Yes. Uh, have you any of it with you, Leslie? Only that boat I was taking out to Hollywood. I I'll bring it in. He's a master with a needle, that Leslie. Oh, oh they're mad about him in Hollywood. Yeah. Well, uh, gentlemen, probably the last boat of Orkney Twist left in America. Pretty loud material, isn't it? That just shows your lack of taste, Judge Hooker. That orange diagonal stripe is just what the chocolate background needs to set off the little blue dots. <laughs> well, you're right, Mr. Gildersleeve. It's the rage. Yeah. Mr. Leslie, I just had an idea. How would it be if you made me a suit out of that uh, uh, Corkney Twist, huh? Don't be foolish, Gildersleeve. How can they get a suit for you out of that bolt? Because well, there can't be more than 12 or 13 yards there. Yep. Hooker, I only require five yards of cloth. But if you keep putting in, you're just going to need six feet of dirt, and that's all. <laughs> well, gentlemen, what do you say? I think it might be arranged. Oh, splendid. Gildy, are you sure you can afford it? Afford? Why, the question of payment doesn't enter into this, Judge Hooper. Hooker, 
<laughs> Thank you. Uh, if Mr. Gildersleeve is taken with this material and wishes a suit whipped up, he shall have it at no expense. What? Oh, that's wonderful. If, no, I couldn't let you do a thing like that. But, my dear man, we'd be delighted. Oh, no, at least let me pay the cost of the material. You needn't do anything of the sort. But I insist. Oh, well, all right, if it'll make you any happier. <laughs> I doubt it. Yeah. How much is the material? Oh, why, speak of it. I mean, uh, nothing. Huh? Uh, what is it, Leslie? Oh, it didn't cost us much, uh... Thirty-five, I think. Thirty-five dollars? Why, that's very reasonable. Yes. You require five yards, don't you? Yeah. Five yards at thirty-five a yard. That makes, a uh, hundred and seventy-five dollars, doesn't it? If it does. If nine goes into seven. Oh, my goodness, it does. <laughs> Mr. Halchester speaking. Hello. This is the man who was just up there with Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Judge Rucker. Hooker. Hooker, Mr. Halchester. I wonder if you could make me a suit just like Gildersleeve. You want the same suit? Yeah, but not the same size. Well, uh, I thought you didn't like that material. I didn't at first, but the colors sort of grow on you. Well, I'm not sure we have enough of that Orkney twist. But I don't take much. Only about two and a half yards. Say you'll do it, Mr. Halchester. I'm not going to take a back seat to Gildersleeve, that bold grumble with a big bumper. <laughs> well, um, maybe. You will? Oh, fine. When do you want to take my measurements? Uh, how about tomorrow morning? I'll be there. Meantime, I'll send a check right over to seal the bargain. Let me see, two and a half yards, $35. Uh, $87.50, isn't it? Yes, uh, eighty-seven fifty for the cloth and the same for the tailoring. Uh, comes to exactly $175. What? <laughs> Oh, the tailoring. Oh, I hadn't figured on that. Well, you didn't charge Gildersleeve anything for tailoring. Oh, that's true. But Mr. Gildersleeve is a prominent man with a style following. Poppycock. Who'd ever be dumb enough to follow that big buffalo style? Well, for one, um, you. Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> well, I'll send the check over this afternoon. And Mr. Alchester... Yes? Yeah. Have you selected anyone as the best-dressed judge in town yet? No. Well, I hope that my buying this suit won't influence your decision. <laughs> <laughs> Why, that old... Hey, Leslie. Yeah, what is it, Chesty? Another sucker just hooked himself. Yeah, who? That judge was here with a fat chump. That makes 11 best-dressed boobs we catch in this town. Chesty, I gotta hand it to you. This is the sweetest switch on the suit racket I ever heard of. It sure is. Now, uh... What size would you say we should get for the little squirt that just formed? Uh, he'd take about a 32 in a boy's suit. <laughs> okay, then. Wire Joe to air mail us one 32 boys and one big one. Say, um, uh, 48 stuff. Okay. Uh, and tell him to leave the seams open. Uh, sure. Say, what's the real name of this horse blanket material? You mean Orkney Twist? Yeah. At the factory, it's known as Backstretch Burlap. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. But first, I wonder how many of you good housewives indulge in that neighborly American pastime, the chat over the back fence. It's a swell way to swap cooking hints and recipes as well as other news. Well, we at Kraft certainly approve of the custom because it's one way the news gets around about parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, discovering a grand-tasting product like parquet margarine is the sort of thing you housewives like to brag a little about. Because it's smart to be wisely thrifty these days. And using parquet margarine makes you just that. Yes, parquet margarine is a wholesome spread for bread that tastes mighty good, yet costs very little. Why, that family of yours is sure to love its delicate, satisfying flavor. What's more, it's a wonderfully nutritious food. One of the best energy foods you can serve. And a reliable food source of important vitamin A. So I'll bet you'll want to brag a little, too, when you discover the economy of Parquet's delicious, wholesome goodness. But it's easy to find out. Tomorrow, just ask your dealer for Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Parquet Margarine, made by Kraft. Let's return to the great Gildersleeve, who is preparing to return to the Ritz Summerfield for his first fitting. Uh, hello, Pulteney. Now, if you want my opinion as a style expert, you should wear a white mess jacket. Yes, with a black bow tie. That's right. 
No, no trouble at all. Call me anytime you need sartorial guidance. Goodbye, Pulteney. Isn't it just a little too early to be wearing a white mess jacket, Uncle? No, not for Pulteney, my dear. He just got a job as a soda jerker. <laughs> well, I got to amble along now. By the way, what's the time? Well, haven't you got your watch? Uh, no, if I carried it in my vest pocket, the bulge might ruin my silhouette. <laughs> Isn't that silly? It certainly is. <laughs> yeah, I read it in the fashion magazine. I wonder if Bertie has pressed my top coat yet. Oh, Bertie! Yes, it's Mr. Gilsleeve. And I put a nice flower in the buttonhole, too. Oh, thanks. Uh, the geranium. <laughs> Well, that's better than no flower at all, or is it? <laughs> My Mr. Gilsey, it sure is a show balloting for you. Huh? But when I see you strutting down the street, I nudge it myself and I says, Bertie Lee Cargill, you may work hard, but the result is worth the effort. Oh, thank you, Bertie. And just to show my appreciation, here, you can have back the geranium. For me? Well, thank you. Hi, Uncle. Okay. Say, did you see the big write-up about you in the paper? Uh, you mean all about Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, the well-known businessman being selected by a famous New York fashion designer as one of the best-dressed men not only in Summerfield, but possibly in the entire country? Yeah, that was it. No, I didn't see it. <laughs> How do you know all about it, Uncle? Well, one of the reporters on the paper happened to be talking to me on the telephone, and I guess my clothes just this sort of crept into the conversation. <laughs> was that why you was trying to call the newspaper all morning? It's no, Bertie. I was... It was has anybody got the time? Yes, yeah, ten past one. Oh, I'll have to hurry right down and try on that new suit Mr. Halchester designed for me. Uh, goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. Goodbye. Everybody. I know it's going to look nice on you, Uncle. Yes, and lots of luck, Mr. Gill, please. Yeah, I hope you have a perfect fit, Uncle. Oh, yes. What? Oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> Hello. Who? Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, send him right up. Okay, let's trot out that 48 stub. I got it. Looks too big. Probably fit him like the skin on a raisin. <laughs> well, then you better do a good alteration job. Now, watch your step. And remember, you ain't back in the tailor shop at 11, what? Or else you will be. Oh, uh, come in, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hello, Mr. Halchester. Hello, Mr. Leslie. I hope I haven't put you two gentlemen to a lot of trouble. Oh, no. Mr. Leslie's a very fast worker. Oh. Why, he's practically made that suit fly. Oh, how nice. Could I try it on now, please? Of course. Just slip out of your coat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, slide into this one. <laughs> Thanks. I can hardly wait. Yeah. yeah. Now, button it. All right. <sighs> what do you think, Mr. Leslie? It fits him just like the skin on a grape. Oh. <laughs> yes, uh, you're going to get a lot of comments on that coat. Uh, don't you think it's a little too roomy? Well, for some people, maybe, uh, but not for you. Oh. Uh, you're the type that can stand a little room. Oh, can I? Well, uh, if, what do you think of the sleeves? Are they wearing sleeves over the knuckles this year? <laughs> oh. Well, uh, not quite. Oh. Uh, they should be taken in. Oh, and what about the lapels? Uh, if I move my head, the points tickle my ears. <laughs> well, uh, they should be taken in, too. Oh, uh, and uh, the way it droops, I mean drapes in front, <laughs> I can't tell whether it's a loose sack suit or a tight double breaster. Well, in that case, you should be taken in. Uh, I hope I'm not giving you too much trouble, Mr. Leslie. Oh, no, not at all. When I sized you up, I must have been using a rubber tape measure. Oh, very good. Uh, now, if you're ready to try on the trousers, Mr. Gildersleeve, here they are. Uh, just step into the next room. The trousers. All right, thank you. I'll be right back, gentlemen. Oh, brother. Gee, that's the worst-looking botch yet. I don't know how I'm going to fix that coat up. Now, don't worry. All we got to do is send to the factory for a 44 lawn. Yeah. And when it comes in, use the back of this one and the front of the new one. What do you mean? Well, this guy's got a tricky shape. He's a 48 stub in the back and a 44 long in the front. <laughs> okay. But aren't we taking a little loss that way? So what? These suits only cost us nine seventy five wholesale. I know, but why should we... Here he comes. Whatever you do, don't let him get a look at himself in a mirror. He'll jump out the window. <laughs> These trousers are a trifle too tight. Holy smoke, you gave him Judge Booker's pants. Uh, oh, come in. Come in. Yeah. I know, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, 
In fact, I'm a bit disappointed with the way the whole suit has come out. Oh. So I'm going to have Mr. Leslie recut the entire garment. Oh, say, I don't want you to go to all that trouble for nothing. Well, let's not say for nothing. Say for a slight alteration fee of uh, nine seventy-five. Oh, well, that's awfully nice of you. Oh, don't mention it. I always welcome the opportunity to make a little change whenever I can. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Is Mr. Gildersleeve home? Yes, um, and who is it to see him? I am. Excuse me, but who's you? Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. Oh, the Mrs. Twitchell. Well, come right in and rest your umbrella. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, I have the honor to announce the arrival of Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell. Who? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wonder what that old... Ah, Mrs. Twitchell. <laughs> I was just saying, I wonder what that old friend wanted. <laughs> Will you have a chair, Mrs. Twitchell? That isn't what I wanted, Mr. Gildersleeve. Huh? I'll explain my visit simply so you can grasp it without too much of a struggle. Oh, thanks. Uh, Mr. Hopalong Cassidy, the movie star, arrives in Summerfield in two hours to aid our big defense bond drive. He does? Why, he's my favorite movie star. I'd like to meet him. Uh, you will have that opportunity. One of the members of my welcoming committee dropped some milk on his foot and cannot attend. Uh, well, why should dropping a little milk on his foot keep him away? If I must go into detail, he's got a broken toe. The milk was condensed in cans and in a case. <laughs> Uh, therefore, Mr. Gildersleeve, in order that we are not faced with the situation of a welcoming committee consisting of 13 members... Uh, will you join us? Yes. Yes, gladly. Incidentally, whatever made you think of little me? <laughs> well, it was that story in the paper regarding your selection as one of the best-dressed men in town. Yeah. <laughs> Newspapers exaggerate so, don't they? Oh, well, if you mean this old smoking jacket, well, don't worry. You'll really be bowled over when you see my appearance at the station. <laughs> Mr. Cassidy's train arrives at 5.52. Now, please try to be there on time. And if any photographs are taken, kindly refrain from waving your handkerchief at the cameraman. Goodbye. Uh, well... <laughs> Uh, Here, come on. Uh, I couldn't help listening. Hop along, Cassidy. That's Bill Boyd. Yes. Can I come along and see him, huh? Can I? Why not? Uh, oh, I know why not. I have to stop at the hotel first and change into my new Orkney Twist Ensemble. But you aren't supposed to pick it up until tomorrow morning. Well, if they promise it for then, it's essential to be all ready now. And I needed to impress Hop along, Twitchell, and Mrs. Cat. I mean, vice versa. <laughs> well, why can't I just come along with you, huh? Oh, I guess you can at that. If you wait downstairs in the lobby. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> It's all right, Mr. Halchester, but don't you think the style is a little too juvenile for me? Oh, not at all, Judge Snooker. Hooker. <laughs> Hooker, sir. Pardon me. No, I purposely designed that suit along boyish lines to bring out the, uh, the Mickey Rooney in you. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Now, I hadn't pictured myself that way lately. <laughs> oh, you're the Mickey type, all right. <laughs> With this suit, I sort of feel like I should get a free baseball bat. <laughs> For the price I paid, you should throw in a pitcher from the Dodgers. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Yes? Who's on his way up? Mr. Gildersleeve. Huh? Thanks. Did I hear you say Gildersleeve is on his way up here? You heard the man. Oh, he mustn't find me here. I'm trying to surprise him. Can't I hide someplace until he leaves? Uh, why, yes, sir. Right in the next room. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me know. Let me know when he's gone. Hey, what's Fatcher doing coming around now? He isn't due till tomorrow. By then, we should be on our way to Florida. Oh, he don't worry me. But there's a guy from the Better Business Bureau waiting in the lobby. Uh-oh. Let's get out of here. Now, take it easy. We got our bags all packed. All we got to do is take an earlier train. What's that timetable? Here, I, I got it marked. This clean line will leave in 30 minutes. Can we make it? Yeah. Only what are we going to do with that judgy in there? Or pudgy out there. <laughs> now hide the judge's trousers in your suitcase. We'll work the old pants trick on both of them. Uh, enter, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, I hope you'll excuse me for coming so early, but I wonder if I could get my suit now. Oh, of course, Mr. Gildersleeve. 
Only uh, first, there's one little detail. Oh, yes. Uh, we'd like to compare the measurements of the trousers you're wearing uh, with the new ones. Of course, of course. Uh, would you mind taking them off? Oh, not at all, not at all. <laughs> you don't know how nice it is if you do this for me. <laughs> yeah, here you are. Uh, thank you. Now, if you'll kindly wait in the next room. Oh, anything to oblige. <laughs> Uh, just make yourself comfortable in there. Yeah, don't worry. I will. La di da di da di da di Deep in the... George Hooker! <laughs> what are you doing hiding in the corner and without your pants? Same thing as you are. Being fitted for one of those Orkney twisters. Oh, getting a suit behind my back, eh? That's pretty low, Judge. And by George, I'm going to complain. Uh, Mr. Halchester? Uh, Mr. Leslie? Yes. Uh, that's what you do. They're not here. Not only that, their bags and clothing aren't here either. What? Hey, I don't see my pants anywhere. My pants are gone, too. Yeah, this is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> uh, don't get in a panic, Gildy. Maybe they just stepped out into the hall. Come on, let's look. Yeah, let's look in the hall. Now you go first, Gildy. Okay, okay, you think it's going to be all right? <laughs> oh! <laughs> No, it isn't all right. <laughs> Judge, there's something awfully funny looking around here, and I don't mean us. How about phoning downstairs? No, I can't. The telephone wires have been cut. Look. No question about it, then. They were crooks, all right. Yes. Fine people you introduced me to, Gildersleeve. Yes, and a fine judge you are, Hooker. You can't even recognize a crook when he steals your own pants. <laughs> My goodness, my pocketbook was in my trousers. It was? <laughs> well, they never get mine. Look, <laughs> I always keep it in my coat. You old jumping jeeps, they did get my lucky half dollar. What's that? Hear that? Huh? Maybe it's all just a joke. Why, of course. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Come on in, boys. Yes, come on in. If Leroy, what are you doing here? Gee, I'm glad to see you, Unc. I was waiting in the lobby, and once the house Chester came down and checked out, I didn't know what to think. You checked out? Where'd he go? When he passed me, he was telling another man they'd have to go like 60 if they wanted to catch the Florida train. Say, where are your pants? On their way to Florida. <laughs> Judge, we've got to stop them before they pull out of town. How? We can't dash down to the station in our shorts? Uh, couldn't we pretend we're running in a marathon race? <laughs> Not me, brother. Oh, yeah. I got an idea, Unc. Just take the blankets off this bed, wrap one around each of you, and go to the station that way. Take the blankets off. You're a bright boy, Leroy. But we'd never get past the lobby. Well, how about sneaking down the fire escape? There's a taxi stand right below. A taxi? That's it. Come on, Hooker. Grab a blanket. But we can't get away with this. Sure we can. When we get to the railroad station, I'll pass you off as a couple of Indians looking for a Pullman reservation. <laughs> <laughs> It's not. It's for us. It's no use, Gildy. We'll never see our pants again. Yes, nor my lucky half dollar either. Well, what was lucky about it? Yes. Say, Unc, you better be careful. Your blanket's dragging. It is? Oh, <laughs> Yes, Gildy, you look like one of the ten best-dressed beds in town. Yes. <laughs> is that so? Why? Oh, hello, Mrs. Twitchell. <laughs> Fancy meeting you here. Don't speak to me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Just because we are here to welcome a cowboy star doesn't mean that you should come dressed as Sitting Bull. <laughs> I never did like come her. Come on, come on, let's get out of here before it's too late. Uh-oh, oh, oh it, it is too late. Uh, hello, officer. What are you guys doing running around here in blankets? Come on, get into the station master's office here before you attract the crowd. Yeah. But, officer, we were just chasing a couple of crooks who stole our pants. Oh, you know, there they are. Well, Mr. Halchester and Mr. Leslie, so they got you too, huh? Hello, Patso. Hiya, Judge Crooker. You poker! <laughs> Fine work, officer. I don't know what you're talking about. One of these birds tried to pass a counterfeit coin at the ticket window. Oh, but, officer, it wasn't mine. It belongs to this guy. You who, me? Is this yours, buddy? A counterfeit? Oh, my goodness, it's my lucky half dollar. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, what makes good cooks good? You know, I think it's their sense of flavor. They've learned the knack of preparing good food because they thoroughly enjoy eating it. Well, that's probably why so many really good cooks use parquet margarine these days. 
They found that parquet margarine's delicate, satisfying flavor is pretty hard to beat, and they certainly ought to know. You see, outstandingly good flavor is what makes parquet margarine so different from old-time margarine. Yes, spread parquet margarine on bread or toaster rolls, and one taste will tell you the big difference. And that goes for cooking, too. Parquet tastes so wonderfully good, it's a real flavor shortening for baking, and just about perfect for pan frying. But flavor isn't the whole story. Parquet margarine is a wholesome, highly nutritious food. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And if you're vitamin conscious, you'll be glad to know that every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So why not take a hint from the thousands of good cooks who use parquet margarine and try a pound or two yourself? Yes, tomorrow, sure, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Sorry, but our time's up. Good night, folks. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry is the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. And now let's visit our friend, the Great Gildersleeve, who has just returned home after a busy day at the office to find that some new neighbors are moving into the vacant house next door. Ah, good afternoon, Marjorie. Hello, Hello Bertie. Hello, Miss Gildersleeve. Well, I see the house next door has been rented at last. Have you any idea who the people are, my dear? No, Uncle Mort, but if that ghastly furniture is any indication, their name is Frankenstein. Oh, Marjorie, you mustn't judge the people by that purple horsehair sofa or the brass bed or that stuffed moose head. He has, a, he has an awful mean look in his eye, that moose head. <laughs> Must have gotten it from our new neighbor. There's a family resemblance there, all right. Oh, Marjorie, I'm sure they're nice people. You wait and see. Oh, they have a boy a little older than Leroy, haven't they? Uh huh. And a girl about seventeen or eighteen who talks faster than Walter Winchell. Oh dear. And they also got an awful uppity cook named Snowdrop Jefferson, yes. who has informed me over the back fence that she's the sole owner of five pair of rubber gloves. <laughs> Uh, Bertie, you'll have to cultivate her acquaintance. I'll cultivate her with a hoe if she keeps snooting me. <laughs> no, Bertie, don't you want to start off by planting your best foot forward? Oh, I do, Mr. Gillsleeve, believe me. And when I get through planting it where it'll do the most good, nothing will ever grow there no more. <laughs> now, Bertie, I won't have you starting a feud with the neighbors. A good neighbor is just like a cousin on the police force. They both come in handy in a pinch. <laughs> oh, look. Huh? They've been unpacking their boxes outside, and all the paper and trash is blowing over onto our lawn. Oh, so what, my dear? They're all finished, and the movers are leaving. Uh, they'll probably come over and clean it up. And suppose they don't. <laughs> well, you know, Uncle Mort, there are times when you surprise me. Oh, live and let live, my dear. That's my motto. By in all years I've lived in Wistful Vista, I always got along well with my neighbors. Oh! What's the matter? They're those movers. They backed into our driveway to turn around. So what? They crushed my azalea canadensis, and now they're backing into my ligistrum ibotta. Oh, there goes my Asculus Mastroscrocia. <laughs> Asculus Mastro, what's it? For heaven's sake, what's that? It's horse chestnuts. <laughs> Help me get the window up. I'll tell those oh, people. Oh, it's too late, Uncle. They're driving away. Well, it's lucky for them. Oh, look, that heavy, heavy truck has broken the concrete in our driveway. Of all the oh, people... Oh, here I... comes the girl from next door. Oh, probably coming over to apologize for the mess they made. Well, that's different. 
It's a mighty good thing, too. I'll take care of this myself, my dear. Uh, how do you do, young lady? Oh, hello. I'm the girl who just moved in next door, and my name is Dorothy Dobson. Only nobody ever calls me Dorothy, and I kind of that sounds so corny, and everybody calls me Dotty, so I Yes, I can see why. <laughs> so you're Dotty, are you? Oh, no, I'm not Dotty. I'm Dotty. No, Mama sometimes says she fails to see the difference, and we're such an uproar that we can't find a thing, so would you please let us have a can of tuna fish and some sliced pineapple and two cups of sugar? <laughs> Wouldn't you like a couple of inner tubes, too? Uh-huh. <laughs> Good morning, Uncle. Good morning, Sire. Bertie says your uh, hot cakes are getting cold and your orange juice is getting warm. Well, hello, Leroy. I'm looking for the morning paper. All over the world, hundreds of reporters risk their lives to get the news, and thousands of workers stay up all night long to print it. Then our delivery boy insists on hiding the paper in the bushes. Oh, you won't find it there, Uncle. The uh, dog that moved in next door took it. Uh, Leroy, you mustn't speak of our neighbor that way. I'm not talking about him. I mean their hound. Oh? He ran over here, grabbed it in his mouth, and scrammed back home again. See, he did it just like he was trained. Yes, he seems to have a nose for our news. <laughs> well, I'll just drop in on the Dobsons and explain the situation. Oh, I hope that dog hasn't chewed up Superman. <laughs> Of course you are. I recognize you right off, and you know why? Why? Because you look just like you did yesterday. The same suit, the same shirt, and the same tie. Isn't it awful monotonous? I'd just die if I had to wear the same dress every day, wouldn't you? If, yes. I mean, I don't wear dresses. I dropped over to tell you that your dog is taking the morning paper. Oh, how silly, taking the morning paper indeed. Why, even if he could read, he couldn't afford it. If... <laughs> Miss Dobson, please, let me finish. He's taking the morning paper off our lawn. It's our paper. Oh, so that's it, and Daddy thought it was a free sample. Uh, oh, Dobby! You call on me? Oh, who's a blister, sister? Go in the dining room. Huh? Go in the dining room and tell Daddy that paper belongs to the man next door, and he's here and he wants it back, so bring it right out, and if there's any egg on it, be sure and wipe it off. Okay, but I ain't seen it yet. Why do you have to come around now? Well, Chuffy will be right back, mister. Oh, incidentally, what do you think of the big news in the paper this morning? Isn't it thrilling, or haven't you read it yet? Oh, of course you haven't. Well, you certainly have a surprise in store, because you know what happened? Yeah, oh, excuse me, I didn't know you were going to stop. You didn't put your hand out. <laughs> Uh, no, what happened? Well, it was the most exciting thing. It seems... Oh, but here comes Tuffy. You can read it yourself. I wouldn't spoil it for anything. Here's your paper. Uh, so it is. Uh, thank you, Tuffy. You're welcome, Stuffy. you what? <laughs> All right, Bertie. Wheel in the breakfast. I'm hungry enough to eat off the tablecloth. You got your paper okay, Uncle? Oh, sure. No trouble at all. You don't have to, you know how to handle these neighbors. It's all right, Leroy, that's all. Yeah. Now to read the big news she was telling me about. Well, look at this. Roosevelt and Churchill meet in mid-ocean. What, again? <laughs> uh, Marjorie, Bertie, come here and listen to this. Washington, D.C., August the 4th. The August. <laughs> Never mind, go back. It's all a mistake. What is it, Uncle Mark? What happened? That kid next door slipped me a seven-month-old paper. <laughs> Throws one more tin can over this fence, she's going to be out. Here, here, Bertie, what are you muttering about? It's that cook next door. She's flirting with a face full of skillet. Yes. And I'm going to knock her block off and off her. It'll look good. <laughs> now, Bertie, remember our good neighbor policy. Oh, hello, Leroy. Hello, oh, good Yeah, Wait a minute, young man. Come back here. You're all mussed up. Tuck in your shirt tail. I can't. It, why not? It's been torn off. It, Leroy, have you been fighting? Well, not exactly. That kid next door took a couple of pokes at me, and, and then I took a few swings at him. Uh, what happened? I missed. <laughs> but he didn't. Yeah. Now, what were you two fighting about, Leroy? Oh, well, it's something he called you, Uncle Mort. Oh, you shouldn't have fought over that. I haven't the faintest concern what that twerp says about me. What did he say? He said you were a big, fat, stuffed shirt. Oh, he did, did he? And what did you say? I said you didn't have to stuff your shirt. Yeah. 
Well, I still don't think that's enough reason to start fighting, Leroy. Oh, I forgot to tell you. He was trying to rub my nose in the dirt at the same time. Oh. And look at how you skinned your knuckles. I'm going to get the eye down. Oh, no, I'll be all right. Yes, Leroy, you failed to clench your fist properly, my boy. Remind me sometime and I'll show you the correct procedure. Gee, Uncle, did you used to be a fighter? Yes, well, not professionally. But at college, I was considered quite a slugger. In fact, they call me Big Slug for short. <laughs> yeah. However, I don't think you should carry on a feud with a boy next door. I'm sure this can be cleared up if we go over there and all shake hands like little men. Not me. I'm not going to shake hands with that rat. If Leroy, you mustn't call him a rat. If you only try to understand... <laughs> what was that? If who threw that baseball? It was Tuffy. Look, this is his ball. You're Tuffy? Why, that little rat. I'm going to call his mother right now and tell her about this. I'd like to lay my hands on that little hoodlum, and you know where and how. Hello, is this Mrs. Dobson? Madam, your son Tuffy just threw his baseball through my window. Yes, I'm sure it's his baseball. What's that? If, what? If, hello? If, she hung up. What'd she say, Uncle? She said if I was sure it was her little boy's ball, I'd better return it at once or she'd call the police. <laughs> Uh, come on, Leroy. Where are you going, Unc? Outside to return this ball. Are you going over there, Unc? No, Leroy. I'm going to return it from here. You just watch this. It's headed for the telephone pole. Look, it's coming back. Oh! <laughs> there goes another one of our windows. <laughs> out the man from next door was here. Uh, Mr. Dobson, what did he want? He says he wants to take you apart and see what makes you think you is as tough as you think you is. Well, I don't understand. I never said anything to him. Well, uh, I guess I'd better be getting to bed. Uh, just a second, Leroy. Now, Bertie, what's it all about? You mean you didn't challenge Mr. Dobson to a fisticuffs, Franker? I've never even set eyes on the chap. Well, somebody told him something most disagreeable. It's, it's way past my bedtime, folks. Uh, <laughs> wait a minute, Leroy. Did you say anything to anyone next door that might have started this? Oh, no. Only I told that Tuffy that he better not monkey with me anymore, or you'd show his father what a big slug you are. Uh, yes. I'm not afraid of him. Why, Leroy, how can you talk that away? That Mr. Dobson's twice as big as your uncle and only half as fat. Yes, he... What? He is? Oh, Leroy, what are you doing to me? Why, that man's as tough as a 30 cent steak. Oh, oh, he's not so tough. Leroy, you better go to bed. Let's all go to bed. Okay, I'm good night. Oh, good morning. What, what are you going to do? Uh, now, don't worry, Marjorie. I'm sure we can settle the matter peaceably. However, just to be on the safe side, tomorrow <laughs> I better find some good gymnasium where I can brush up on my boxing before Brother Dobson mops up on me. <laughs> Be sure and let me know when you're tangled with Mr. Dobson. I wouldn't miss that for anything. Well, I would. <laughs> we'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. But first... Ever stop to think of the progress made in the last few years? Nowadays, we have planes that fly 400 miles an hour, automobiles that are marvels of speed and comfort, radios that are static-free. Yes, and there have been plenty of improvements in food-making, too. And one of the outstanding examples is parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Why, people who remember the margarines of a few years back are amazed when they discover how deliciously good parquet margarine is. You see, parquet is not an ordinary margarine. It's one of Kraft's fine foods, outstanding for its delicate, satisfying flavor. You only have to taste parquet margarine once, spread on bread or toast or rolls, to find out how deliciously different it really is. Another thing, parquet margarine is a wholesome, nourishing food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A, so get acquainted with this thrifty, nutritious food. Order a pound or two of delicious parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft.
After a restless night, the great Gildersleeve has taken his problem to Philadelphia Phil's Physical Culture Institute. We find him dressed in gym togs, ready for his first lesson from Phil himself. Well, mister, so they did find a pair of shorts big enough for you after all. Uh, yes, these shorts are a little tight. I only got them on by a great stretch of the imagination. <laughs> okay, uh, come over here, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Just call me Throckmorton. I want to keep it a secret. Of course. If my name was Throckmorton, I'd want to keep it a secret, too. Yes. No, no, I want to keep my visits here a secret. I'm having a little trouble with one of my neighbors, and I may have to slap him a few times to bring him to his senses. Yeah, I know how it is. Now, uh, what experience have you had as a fighter? Oh, very little, except what I picked up in college and at the YMCA. Well, you look as if the only thing you picked up at them places is yourself. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's why I came here. I need to improve my wind if I'm going to fight. Well, the best way to improve your wind is by doing a lot of running. Mister, if I could run, I wouldn't need to fight. <laughs> Well, the first thing we got to do is something about that sack of potatoes you're lugging around. If what sack of potatoes? Oh! <laughs> you mean this one? <laughs> yeah. Well, now, suppose we stop chewing the fat and start taking it off. Yeah. We'll begin with uh, some bending exercises. Yeah, bending exercises? But aren't you going to teach me how to punch? No, we'll get to the punch after we take care of the uh, punch. Oh. <clears throat> All right, now... Feet together, uh, arms overhead, and bend and touch the floor. No, oh, Doc Morton, lower. Come on, do it again. This time I'll make it easier. Feet together. Now bend and touch your ankles. No, no, Doc Morton, you still haven't got the idea. I've got the idea. The only thing is I've got much equipment. <laughs> well, feet together, arms overhead. Now bend. That's it. Way down. I'll bet you haven't seen your knees in ten years. <laughs> oh, I get well by George. What is it? <laughs> I've got dimples. Excuse me, champ. Uh, champ? Who, me? Oh, I'm sorry. You must have made a mistake. I'm not one of the... Uh, uh, maybe not, but... Uh, yeah, my card. Oh, thanks. Uh, everything from heavyweights to dog racing. <laughs> Oh. Uh, you got a terrific build for the job. Build? Yeah, and showmanship, too. Oh. You know, I've been watching you. Hey, the crowds will love you. Oh, I can't quite picture myself as a champion fighter. <laughs> fighter? Who said anything about being a fighter? You're going to be a wrestler. If a wrestler? <laughs> well, sure. With your figure and the way you grunt and roll your eyes, and with a full beard on your face, boy, you'll be terrific. Uh, hey. Can you groan? Can I? Oh, my goodness. Does that toughy next door murder that march all day long, Bertie? No, so when he gets out of bed, he sits down and beats his drums for a while. <laughs> well, George won't be long now before I go over there and beat his drum for him. Oh, I wish you'd do it pretty soon, Uncle Moore. I can't understand why you have so much patience. There are two kinds of patience, my dear, and it takes a lot of one kind to keep from being the other. <laughs> Someday he's going to hit the right note, and then they'll take that horn away from him. I don't see how his family can stand it. Yeah, they can't. They've just chased him out in the yard. Look, I wish he was my kid for an hour. A few quick tricks with my hand, and he wouldn't trumpet anymore. Oh, now he's right under our window. Yeah? There's only one thing left for me to do, Marjorie. Do you remember where I put that old BB gun of Leroy's? Oh, no, Uncle Lord. You mustn't shoot him. Huh? Why, someone might be mean enough to arrest you. I hadn't thought of shooting him, Marjorie. I was going to offer the gun to him as a bribe. <laughs> However, your suggestion does sound better. <laughs> Please, Uncle Lord, forget about the gun. Yeah, all right. I've got another idea. The next time he starts playing, I'm going... Oh, I'm going. Don't worry. I'll be right back, my dear. Uh-oh, your uncle, he's in an unmusical mood. Oh, hope uncle hasn't done anything reckless. Let's just hope he ain't done anything they can trace back to him. <laughs> Uh-oh, here he comes. Oh, Bertie, I'm afraid. Why? He's got such a pleased expression on his face. 
Well, that's the last of that, folks. I fixed it all up. Oh, well, how... Uh, what did you do, Uncle? Just use my brains, my dear. I gave Tuffy a $5 bill, and he promised he wouldn't play that trumpet again. <laughs> Pretty smart of me, huh? Oh. What's that? Oh, my goodness, he's got a saxophone, too. Okay, Rocky. We can stop now. Oh, thanks. How am I doing, Phil? Well, you've become pretty good with the punching bag. Now, uh, seeing as how this is your tenth and last lesson, I'm going to put you in the ring against a professional fighter. Oh, well, bring him on. The bigger they fall, the harder I am. Uh, well, you know what I mean, anyway. <laughs> well, I want to warn you. This guy's supposed to be good. That's all right. I feel pretty good myself. Uh, which one is he? Uh, the big guy there, shadow boxing in the ring. Yeah. Oh, yes. He throws a pretty big shadow, doesn't he? <laughs> now, come on over to the ring and... No, Throcky, no. You're going toward the dressing room. Yes, I thought I'd save you the trouble of carrying me in there later. <laughs> now, don't talk that way. You can take this guy. Yes, I can take him and I can leave him alone, too. <laughs> you kidding? I'm dead on the level. Oh, my goodness. Dead on the level. <laughs> <laughs> come on, get in the ring, Throcky. Hey, Barrelhouse. Yeah, what is it, Phil? I want you two boys to go three or four rounds together. Uh, shake hands with Battle and Throcky. Hi. Uh, hi, Barrel House. All right, boys. Now, I'll keep time, and you get in there and put up a real fight. And remember, no waltzing. Sure, sure, no waltzing. Uh, excuse me, is a little rumba permissible? <laughs> no. All right. Get going, boys. Get in there, Rocky, and try to punch it. I'm trying to pray, but he doesn't want to do business. Jab with your left, Rocky. Jab. Okay, now, back, back. I can't. Is the ropes are in my way. Jab with your left again. That's it. Keep jabbing. That's it. Now, bring up that right. Uh, right? Like this? Oh. <laughs> Oh, my yeah. goodness, Rocky. Yeah? You shouldn't have done that. You've knocked him out. I did? Rock Morton, that ain't playing the game. <laughs> oh, poor Barrel House. Quick, get me a glass of water. Oh. If you get two, I'm thirsty. Oh. <laughs> yeah, take it easy. Take it easy, Barrel House. I'll help you into the dressing room. Oh. Yeah, I'll take care of him. Huh? You get oh. your shower. And you can consider this knockout your diploma in pugilism. Oh. Oh, you certainly did well in your graduation exercises. Uh, thank you, Professor. I'll get going now. It's so long, Barrel House. Oh. Next time, don't try to chin yourself on my glove. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't wait till I get home and do the same to that next door neighbor of mine. Oh. How you feeling, Barrel House? Oh, terrible. I'm in awful pain. That big walrus stepped all over my tenderest corn. Honest, Phil, it was all I could do to restrain myself from hitting him. Dobson next door. Yeah, do I know that brat? Well, he kept picking on me today, so finally I just got good and mad, so I, I hauled off and I let him have it. Well, good for you. Yeah, I fought him clear from the corner into his backyard and up on the screen porch. You should have seen him along the milk bottles. <laughs> then his father came home and pulled me off of him. Oh, he did, did he? Yeah. Say, he's looking for you, Uncle. Oh, he is. Well, I'm looking for him. Come on. We're going visiting. Uh, this is going to be peachy fun. You mean you're going into Tuffy's house here? Yes, sir. Right now, I feel as if I can lick twice my weight in Dobson's. <laughs> well, I give that big tub a something. Oh, hello. Well, I suppose you came to apologize for what he really did to poor Tuffy. Well, it's a good thing you did because Papa's so mad. He yes, just simply... silence. You go tell your Papa that Mr. Gildersleeve is here from next door and wants to see him at once. Very well, though I warn you, that's not the tone of voice to take with Papa on account of his Go. Oh. All right, I'll tell him. Oh, Papa, there's a man Leroy, hey, could I trouble you to hold my coat for a few moments? I'm going to be a pleasure. Uh, there you are. Thank you, my boy. As soon as I roll up my sleeves here. Uh, I'm all ready now. Just let that be. Is there somebody out here says he wants to see Mr. Dobson? Oh, my goodness, it's Philadelphia Phil. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad days.
The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. Meantime, I've noticed that some women have a knack for being resourceful. They're always first with new recipes, always turning up clever ways to economize and please their families, too. These resourceful ladies are right in their element these days because now more than ever, it's smart to be wisely thrifty. And here's a discovery a lot of them are making, that parquet margarine is a wholesome spread for bread that tastes mighty good, yet costs very little. Yes, they found that serving parquet margarine makes a hit with the family because it's so downright delicious spread on bread or toast or rolls. They found that parquet margarine is a real flavor shortening for baking, that it adds delicate extra flavor to pan-fried foods. Yes, parquet margarine is one spread for bread that's so thrifty you can use all you want in cooking, too. Now, using parquet margarine is a wise economy because it's such a nutritious, wholesome food. Parquet helps provide pep and energy because it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And it's a reliable year-round food source of important vitamin A. So why not buy a pound or two of delicious parquet margarine tomorrow? Remember, it's parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. lessons for nothing. Oh, it wasn't altogether a waste, Leroy. They'll come in handy next Thursday evening. Oh, what are you doing then? I'm going to visit on Rudy Valley program. Yeah, they've matched me with battling John Barrymore. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Evans. On one of the nicest streets in the bustling city of Summerfield lives Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, a typical American uncle. Stout, jolly, faced with all the problems that the average uncle is faced with. He tries to guide his niece Marjorie and his nephew Leroy, always with the very best intentions and sometimes with the very worst results. And now the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Thanks for the lift home, Judge Hooker. You're welcome. Say, Gildersleeve, I hate to bring this up, but isn't it about time we used your car? All right, I'll drive my car down tomorrow. You know I don't go downtown tomorrow. Sure, that's why I'm going to drive my car down. <laughs> then it'll be your turn again to pick me up the day after, won't it? Yes. Hey, wait a minute. I'm getting gypped somewhere. Yep, see here, Hooker. If you're going to talk like that, I won't give you that spare inner tube. Oh, excuse me, guilty old pal. Yeah. Just forget it. I'll be here for you. Goodbye. Yeah. The old goat. <laughs> I better get that tube out of the safety deposit vault. <laughs> Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. You remember me, don't you? I'm Dottie from next door, and I just saw you driving up from behind our front curtains. I mean, I was behind them, not you, so I ran out to ask you a favor, and I'm sure you won't mind saying yes, because after all, there's nothing I want you to do, so you'll do it, won't you? Yes. <laughs> what? 
Five? You want me to say yes to something you don't want me to do? Well, yes, that's exactly correct. You hit the nail right on the thumb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it's, it's something I want to ask your niece Marjorie to do, and hasn't she got the loveliest red hair? See what kind of a rinse did she use to get at that shade, Mr. Gildersleeve? Young lady, Marjorie's hair is that way naturally. Well, naturally, that's what you would say. Well, the thing I wanted you to ask your niece to do for me is to take this list of soldier boys I promised the USO I'd write letters to and ask her if she'd mind writing instead on account of I hurt my hand and can't. Uh, what did you do? Put it in your mouth while you were talking? <laughs> oh, no. I folded it into a folding bed, and it wouldn't have been so bad, only I was in it myself at the time. Uh... <laughs> uh... Well, it was the most horrible experience. I couldn't talk for hours. You couldn't, no. It wasn't that too bad. <laughs> Well, you give this list to my G, won't you? I know she won't mind it. Just a few names. Well, goodbye now, Mr. Gildersleeve, and take my advice. Keep away from folding beds. Yes. When I get into a bed, it doesn't fold up. It just curls up. <laughs> Let me see that list. It, just a few names, eh? Wow. Her idea of a few names is like her idea of a few words. That family next door is beginning to get my goat. That's about the only thing they haven't been over to borrow so far, either. The next time they ask me for something, I'm going to say, Ah, oh, good afternoon, Marjorie. Hello, Uncle Moore. Marjorie, my dear, I have a little patriotic job for you to do. Oh, what is it, Uncle Moore? Uh, that girl next door, what's her name? Uh, Dilly or Daffy? Dottie? Uh, Dottie, that's her. Uh, she wants you to write letters to uh, this list of soldiers here. She can't because she had her hand squeezed in a folding bed. Oh, but Uncle Moore, I'm writing to so many soldiers already. It seems like I'm corresponding with half the army as it is. You are? But how did that happen? I was serving coffee to that troop train that was going to Cap Stover last week, and... One of the detachments adopted me. Uh, adopted you? <laughs> well, I'm not exactly clear whether they adopted me or I adopted them. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the daughter of the regiment or the Andy of the anti aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good. What happened? Well, they, they voted me their parachute girl. Yeah. What do they mean, parachute girl? They mean I'm the girl they'd like most to drop in on. It's... <laughs> And about 200 of them asked me to correspond with them. 200 letters? Couldn't you just write to them by squads? Uh, no, I guess not. There isn't much fun sharing a letter from a girl with 11 men and a corporal. <laughs> That's why I've been writing each of them personally. And is it a job? Oh, Uncle. Uh, I don't doubt it a bit, my dear. We should all do everything we can to make them happy, however. I wish there was some way I could help. Uh, do you think I could uh, bang out a few letters for you on the typewriter? Then you could sign your name? Well, I don't know. Would they look like a girl wrote them? Oh, of course. I'll type them very daintily. <laughs> <laughs> Say, we can put the whole family to work on this. Uh, Leroy? Uh, Bertie? Did you call me, Mr. Gill, please? Yes, where's Leroy? Here I am. What is it? Uh, look, look, everybody. Marjorie has more letters to write to the soldiers than she can shake a pen at. Now, the boys in camp always welcome a letter. But it means far more to them if it comes from a pretty girl. Oh, Mr. Gill, please. <laughs> Not you, Bertie. I'm talking about Marjorie. Oh. Yes. But now the rest of us will have to do a little ghost writing. Oh, excuse me, that lets me out. I ain't pale enough to do any ghost writing. <laughs> and besides, I got all I can handle writing to my own boyfriends in the service. Oh, well, all right, Bertie. Leroy, you'll help me, won't you? Each of us will take ten names and write letters as if we were Marjorie. Sure. I've always wanted to be one of those anyhow. You always wanted to be one of what, Leroy? A war correspondent, huh? <laughs> Well, that's finished. Private George Butcher, Camp Stover. Dear Butch, how are you? I am fine. I hope you are fine, too. How was the journey to Camp Stover? As the guy in school said when he stuck his foot out into the aisle when the teacher was passing, I hope you enjoyed your trip. Ha, ha, ha. Well, having nothing better to do, I wrote. And having nothing better to write, I will close. Tenderly yours, Marjorie Forrester P.S. If you have any empty rifle shells, please send them As my brother is making a collection Ah, uh, this looks like it's going to be the best one yet Let's see how it sounds Dear John. <laughs> I take my pen in hand to thank you and your friends for selecting little me as the girl you'd like to visit most. 
I am not unmindful of the honor bestowed upon me, but I won't let it turn my pretty little red head. <laughs> it is indeed unfortunate that you are stationed so far from Summerfield. Otherwise, you could all come to dinner at our house some night, as I love to bake and cook. You know how we girls are. <laughs> well, since the shades of night are drawing near, I'd better close. As my Uncle Throckmorton thinks it's time for me to go to bed, surely yours, Marjorie Forrester. Well, there we is. Dear Willie, I got your letter yesterday and hastens to inform you that the next time you send me a letter without any postage stamps on it, don't send it air mail special delivery. <laughs> I'm sorry the fudge and the fried chicken I sent you got all mixed up together, but it saves me sending you any chocolate eggs for Easter. <laughs> I'm knitting you another sweater to replace the one you says you lost at the target range. Only next time, kindly confine your shooting to rifle practice. <laughs> because you never was any good at Paducah Parcheesi. <laughs> Yours truly, your ever-loving, everlasting, one and only, Bertie Lee Coggins. <laughs> P.S. Please disregard them rumors about me going out with other fellas. That's just enemy propaganda. <laughs> The mail? Oh, of course, my dear. Let's see, this is the last of March. Oh, yes, that means the June magazines are due. Oh, hello, Mr. Mailman. Say, I must have 150 letters for you. What's your niece doing, running a contest? Uh, I'm becoming a regular beast of burden. Oh, the mail animal, eh? <laughs> oh, some more letters from the soldier boys, huh? Yes, and if this, those guys lick as many Japs as they do stamps, the war will be over Prado. <laughs> well, <laughs> goodbye, Mr. Gilbert. Uh, so long. Oh, Marjorie, hmm? here's some answers to the letters we wrote to the Army. Good heavens. All of those for me? Yeah. Yes. Let me see. Business is certainly good, sis. Oh, I'll never be able to answer all of these in a month. Oh, we'll help you, won't we, Leroy? Yeah, let's start opening them. Yeah, all right. Be careful there. Yeah, now. okay. Listen to this. Dear Snooky. Oh, wait a minute, brother. Give me that letter. That was not from the Army. Are you sure? <laughs> yes, that's, that's from a certain ensign in the Navy. And it's strictly personal. Oh, uh, yeah, I see. <laughs> well, we'll be true to the Army, won't we, Leroy? This one's from Camp Stover, all right. Let's see. Uh, dear Miss Forrester, thank you for that picture of your little brother. A picture of... What do you mean, picture of my little brother? Yeah, I ran out of snapshots of you, so I sent him one of me. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think he resembles you a bit. He sure is a funny-looking kid. What? <laughs> I'm sorry I can't send you any cartridge shells, which you asked for for his collection. What's this? Don't interrupt Uncle Morse. Yes, yes. But so far, I've been very busy here, acting as barber to a carload of raw potatoes. <laughs> Say, what kind of letters have you two been writing in my name? And now, Marjorie, don't fret. Look at all these letters. You can see we didn't use your name in vain. Why don't you run along downtown now like you intended? Sure, we can clean up all this correspondence. Well, all right. Only remember, if you read any letters that turn out to be personal or private... Don't open them up. Why, of course, my dear. You can depend on us. If, how are we going to do that? Oh, come on, Uncle. Let's not burn our bridges till we come to them. Yeah, you're a bright boy, Leroy. All right, here's another letter. Yeah? Dear Miss Forrester, uh, thanks for the wonderful map of the world you sent me. It comes in especially handy because current events is my hobby. Oh. Do you think girls are interested in the serious type of young man, such as I represent? Sincerely, Ernest Darling. Uh, I'll take care of Darling as soon as I've read this postcard. Uh, uh, hello, Red. Uh, thanks for the swell picture of yourself. It sure ghouled me, toots. Uh, <laughs> from now on, I'm going to devote my non-military career to whistling under your window. Do you think you could go for me in a big way? If yours with a jive, Mickey Conway. You still... Gee! I'll answer that one, too. As soon as I get the other one out of the way. The one to, uh, what's his name? You mean Ernest Darling? Yes. Now, what did he say? Uh, he thanks us for the map. All right. Uh, dear uh, Darling, I'm glad you like the map. Uh, uh, what next? 
Uh, current events is his hobby. Oh, yes. And I am happy to learn you have taken up uh, such a fascinating hobby. He wants to know our girls interested in the serious type. Oh. And in answer to your last question, darling, the answer is uh, most certainly yes. There. Take it, Leroy, and address an envelope. Yes, sir. Uh, and address another one to Mickey Conway. Uh, you better find an asbestos envelope. I'm going to send him a hen track hot foot. <laughs> Hello? Maine, 4181. Yes? One moment. Long distance is calling. Long distance. Go ahead, Camp Stover. Okay. Uh, hello. Is this Marge? No, it's her uncle. She's out at present. Gee, I just got three days leave and I was coming to see you tomorrow. I was going to show up about eight. Oh, well, she'll be here. Why don't you come earlier? Say about six. Oh, well, sure, okay. Uh, just tell her Mickey Conway's coming. All right, Mickey. <laughs> It's you, eh? Didn't you get Marjorie's letter? Sure. That's why I'm coming. Why, I even bought a ring. After that letter that I, uh, that she wrote? Sure. Why, that did the trick. I wrote thanking her for a picture. And she wrote back, Dear darling, I'm glad you liked the map. Oh, my goodness, Leroy got the envelopes mixed up. And, and when I said I'm going to make a career out of whistling under her window, she replies, I'm happy to learn... You've taken up such a fascinating hobby. Oh, I see it all now. <laughs> and here's the topper. I said, could you go for me in a big way? And she says, darling, darling the answer is, is yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, goodbye, Uncle. I'll be seeing you at six tomorrow. And to think that I am responsible for this one-sided romance. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. But first, I suppose you know that good nourishment isn't just a matter of eating a lot. Why, you can overeat and still be undernourished. That's why you should know the nutrition facts about the foods buy. So you can serve your family a balanced diet. So here are the nutrition facts about parquet margarine. The delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. First, parquet margarine is a wholesome vegetable margarine. Made of selected American farm products in Kraft's thick and span modern plants. That's important. You want to be sure the foods you serve are wholesome and of fine quality. Next, parquet margarine is a nourishing energy food. In fact, it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. That's important, too. Parquet helps give the pep and energy you need for hard work or play. Lastly, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. Yes, there are 9,000 units of this important vitamin in every single pound. So, next time you shop, remember that economical parquet margarine is as nutritious as it is delicious. Yes, parquet is well worth trying right away. So tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. And now back to the great Gildersleeve. At six o'clock the following morning, and our hero's fallen asleep at last after spending most of the night counting soldiers. Uh, dear General, won't you come over for dinner? Bring your Jeep along to... Respectably yours, Throckmorton P. Marjorie. <laughs> uh, 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 what's that? Uh, oh, time to get up already. Where is that alarm clock? Oh, there you are. What's the matter with this clock? It won't stop. Oh, it's a telephone. Oh. Ooh, that floor is cold. <laughs> Where are my slippers? Oh, the heck with them. All right, all right, I'm coming. Yes. I heard you, operator. I'm hurrying. Hello? Yes. Hello, anybody want me? Must be the wrong number. Somebody's got a lot of nerve not telephoning me at this time of the morning. Ooh, it's cold. Ew, which way is my bed? Hello? What is this, games? Hello, operator? Wait a minute, how can the bell ring with the receiver off the hook? Oh, I know, it's a doorbell. 
Hold your horses. I'm coming. Yes, what is it? Is this where Miss Marjorie Forrester lives? Uh, yes. Well, uh, I'm Private Mickey Conway, and I was told to be here at 6. At 6? Oh, my goodness, is it 6 p.m. already? No, sir, it's 6 o'clock in the morning. If... What? Who told you to come here at this hour? Uh, Marjorie's uncle. I'll break his... Oh, my goodness, that's me. <laughs> what did you say your name is? Uh, Mickey Conway. Yeah, I was afraid of that. You come on in, Mickey. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Yes, yeah, sit down. I'll see if Bertie, our cook, is up on the stove with a pot of coffee yet. <laughs> Make yourself comfortable. Good morning, Bertie. Hey, quick, some coffee. It's almost ready, Mr. Gilsey. What gets you up so early? A soldier who's fallen for Margie because of some letters I've written in her name. Oh, you better be careful. He'll sue you for the breaches of the promises. <laughs> this fellow got the wrong letter, that's all, Bertie. And now he's here to propose to Marjorie. But he can't do that now. She's sound asleep. If I won't let him do it if she wakes up, either. Well, what you gonna do, Mr. Gilsey? Well, it's too early in the morning for me to figure things out. I can't have an open mind without some good shut-eye. Then why don't you go on back to bed? That huh? soldier's probably tired, too. Let him take a nap in your den while you figure this whole thing out on your pillow. Well, Bertie, that's a wonderful idea. How did you ever come to think of it? <laughs> well, I could tell the truth. I need a little more beauty sleep myself. <laughs> <laughs> It's 10 o'clock, and Marjorie should be down soon. Now, remember, Leroy, and you too, Bertie, we mustn't leave those two alone together. But I still don't see why, If huh? we do, he'll start proposing to Marjorie. It'll be very embarrassing for all concerned. Yes, and especially for you. Yes. But wouldn't it be a lot simpler, Unc, if we were to tell Marjorie what it was all about? You mean how you put Private Darling's letter in Private Conway's envelope and vice versa? Well, on um, second thought, maybe your way is better, Unc. Yes. Well, gee, there's Hickam's Marjorie now. Good morning, everybody. Well, hello, my dear. How lovely you look this morning. Yeah, you look swell to me, too, sis. <laughs> That's right. And you certainly gonna look good to that soldier who came 300 miles just to pop the... Ixnay, Ernie Bay, Ixnay. Just to pop what, Bertie? Oh, nothing. Nothing at all, Miss Marge. But I'm interested. Pop what? Yes. Uh, well, that is... Uh, uh, if he walked 300 miles, he probably gonna pop his corn. <laughs> Seems to me you're all acting a little peculiar. Why the no, idea? I I sure, well, sure. maybe not, but you've got three of the fishiest looking pans I've seen outside of a seafood grotto. Oh. <laughs> Say, I had a small rest, Mr. Gil. Oops. Well, don't tell me this is Marge. Well, hi, you there, Red. Uh, hi. Who is it, Uncle Marge? Uh, why, Marjorie, you remember Private Mickey Conway, who wrote you all those nice letters. Who? Uh, Ouch. Oh. Oh. Oh, yes. How are you, Mr. Conway? Oh, now, baby, cut out that Mr. stuff. I'm just plain Mickey to you. Yes, he's just a plain Mickey to all of us. <laughs> why, he came all the way from Camp Stover to spend the day with you. Uh, with me. Uh, with us, I mean. <laughs> now, uh, what do we do first? Well, uh... Uh, first, I'd like to have a quiet little confidential talk with Marge here. Uh, oh, not on an empty stomach, Mickey. Where's your sense of romance? Oh, well, uh, all right. Uh, well, let's have some breakfast first. Yes. But uh, right after that, I got something to show her. What is it, Uncle Marge? Well, he wants to show you the town. I mean, uh, we want to show him the town, don't we, Marjorie? Oh, oh, yes, of course we do. Uh, Suppose I take him out for a ride this morning. Why, fine. We'll all take him for a ride. Say, uh, <laughs> Uh, would you uh, care to drive, Mickey? Huh, what a rabbit eat cabbage. Would, 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 oh, I see. Uh, very cute. <laughs> <laughs> you can drive our car, and I'll sit next to you, just to show you how the gears shift and where to put on the brakes. And uh, Marjorie, yes? you can sit in the back seat with Leroy. <laughs> Did y'all have a nice ride? Yes, we all did. That is all except Mickey and me. Well, that just leaves Mr. Gillsleeve and Leroy. You're right. We tried to leave them a dozen times. What's the matter? Did they chaperone you too vigorously? They didn't chaperone us, Bertie. They convoyed us. <laughs> Why, every time Mickey opened his mouth, Uncle Mort put his foot in. <laughs> what they doing now? Well, Uncle Mort showing Mickey our family album in the living room. Oh, great stars! Anything wrong? Oh, I'll say there is. I better get in there before they come to my baby pictures. <laughs> and this one is Marjorie at the age of one, I think. 
fat little rascal, wasn't she, Mickey? Oh, oh boy. Yeah, cute dimples, huh? <laughs> I'll say. Now, let me get a good look. Yeah. Boy, was she fat. <laughs> oh, don't you dare. Let me see that picture. Uh, oh, oh, well, that's all right. <laughs> Go right ahead. Uh, oh, then you don't mind? Not in the least. Only that isn't me. It isn't? Then who is it? It happens to be you, Uncle Moore. What? <laughs> Where's my mustache? Oh, well, that's right. <laughs> Say, uh, yeah. uh, Uncle Mort, if, huh? uh, if it's all the same to you, uh, could I have a minute alone with Red here? As if you uh, want to be alone? That's the general idea, General. Well, uh, how about it? Why, of course, I understand. <laughs> all right, but only a minute, mind you. Bertie, quit. Get in there and do something. Yeah, but what? Anything. Uh, don't leave them alone until someone relieves you. Just uh, move the piano, dust under the rug. <laughs> play the Star Spangled Banner. What does it matter? Yes, sir. Play what does it matter? <laughs> oh, how do I get myself into these messes? Oh, now there's somebody at the door. As if I didn't have enough to do already. Here's the mail, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've got a gob for Marjorie, too. No, thanks. She has a soldier in the living room already. <laughs> Dear, I'd better get Leroy warmed up to go in for Bertie. Leroy? Where is that boy? Leroy! Here I am, Uncle Boy. Look, Leroy, Bertie is in there pinch hitting for me. I don't know how soon she'll strike out, so you better be ready to go in there and see that Mickey doesn't get to first base. Well, uh, what about you, Uncle? I've got a telephone for reinforcements. Uh, I'm so desperate, I'm going to invite Judge Hooker to dinner. Gee, are things that bad? Yep. <laughs> Leroy, he'll just talk and talk and talk. If he runs down, you ask him what he did in the Spanish-American War. That's good for two hours. Yeah, but it's three hours till dinner. How do we hold out till then? That's the problem, my boy. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Are you home, Mr. Gildersleeve? Gee, that Gabby gal from next door. Yes, there's the answer to our problem. I am coming, Dotty. <laughs> Sorry I'm late for dinner. A yeah, fine time to come here for dinner, 8 o'clock. And you're a fine friend to depend on, Judge Hooker. Now, wait a minute. I won't wait another minute. We waited as long as we could, then we had our dinner. You mean you didn't wait for me? No, that girl from next door took your place, Judge. What delayed you? I had a puncture with that rubber strainer you gave me for an inner tube. <laughs> that wasn't a strainer. That tube was made out of the finest reclaimed Gildersleeve girdles. Why? <laughs> You, you big blowfish. What? And after I've been hauling you to town every day on my poor thin tires, I've got a good notion to punch you. Uh, Judge Hooker, you couldn't punch your way out of a bag of marshmallows. <laughs> Guess I'll have to show you. I'd polish you off with one uppercut, only I can't decide which chin to aim for. <laughs> oh, yes? Well, you twitch one eyebrow at me, Hooker, and the first aid girls won't know where to begin. Is that so? Yes, that's so. Well, I'll I'll stop it. Hooker, what's going on here? No, oh, your uncle swindled me out of a lot of free rides. Serves you right for standing me up when I needed you here to keep that soldier from posing to Marjorie. What? Yeah, she doesn't know. <laughs> and this is all your fault, Hooker. Marjorie, let me explain. If some letters were sent to the wrong soldiers, and he thought that you, uh, uh, Oh, it's too involved. Mickey wants to marry you. Oh, is that what he's been trying to say all day? Well, he had me worried. I thought he was trying to tell me that my slip was showing. <laughs> hey, Aunt, Mickey, I'd like to talk to you private. Oh, I might as well do the other half of the job. Send him in. Now, Judge, you and Marjorie go out the other door. Okay, Gildy. Come on, my dear. Do you think Bertie has anything left over from dinner? If she has, you'll have to fight the cat for it. <laughs> oh, hello, Mickey. Uh, gee, Mr. Gillisleeve, uh, this is awful embarrassing to say, but uh? do you mind not telling Marjorie about our engagement? Uh, what? Well, you see, <laughs> I guess I changed my mind. Now I'm nuts about this little dotty gal from next door. Uh, gee, she isn't as pretty as Marjorie, but I get a chance to talk to her. You do? Yeah, and she's such a wonderful conversationalist. I'll grant her that. Well, maybe it's all for the best, Mickey. You and Dottie run along now, and lots of luck. <laughs> You're going to need it. Oh, gee. Oh, thanks, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hey, Dottie, come on. Let's get out of this stuff. Well, yes. oh, Mickey, I have to know Yeah, well, I knew everything would come out all right. <laughs> Uncle, huh? look at this telegram that just came for me. It's from some um, 
Captain Earl Eby at Camp Stover. Oh, Captain Eby. Well, I've been corresponding with him. Oh, for you, of course. Uh, what does it say? Um, dear Marjorie, hooray, we are being transferred to Summerfield. Hmm? Since you frequently requested the pleasure of my company for dinner at your home, I'm happy to accept for tomorrow night on behalf of my entire company and myself. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad weeks. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. But right now, here's an experiment I wish every one of you would make. You see, I've been telling you how delicious parquet margarine is. But wouldn't it be better if you found it out yourself? So here goes. Next time you bake hot biscuits or rolls or make some toast, have a pound of parquet margarine handy. Then spread them while they're still piping hot with plenty of parquet. Now that's a real test for any spread because the heat brings out its flavor. Yes, you can tell right away how good parquet margarine is. Parquet's flavor is delicate, not strong. It's a tempting, satisfying flavor. Then try parquet margarine in your cooking, too. Use it for baking and pan frying. You'll find that a spread as delicious as parquet margarine makes cooked foods tastier, too. Remember, no matter how you use parquet margarine, you're serving your family a wholesome, nourishing, energy food. A food that's a reliable, year-round source of vitamin A. So why not try these simple tests and prove to yourself how deliciously good parquet margarine is? Yes, get a trial pound or two of economical parquet margarine tomorrow. But be sure to ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine. Made by Kraft. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish all of you would take a tip from your Uncle Mort and do something for your Uncle Sam. Buy more United States government bonds and stamps. There's no finer investment in the world today. For in every way, they protect our future. Our choice is clear. Which do we want? Our country's bonds or those of the Axis? Good night. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. <laughs> Now to visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's alternately looking at his watch, which says 315, and at a large, mysterious package, which says, Deliver to Leroy Forrester, Esquire. Uh, isn't Leroy ever going to get home from school, my dear? Now, Uncle Moore, you've been fussing over that package ever since it came. You shouldn't be so curious. I'm not in the least bit curious. I was just wondering what was inside. I think it contains magazines that says Leroy Forster, Esquire. Yes. Yes, no, Bertie. Uh, by the way, where's it from? Some place called Fragile. Yes, for... <laughs> no, no, the name on the other side. Oh, you mean... Oh, use no hooks. Yes. <laughs> use no hooks, Colorado, yeah. The name of the firm, Bertie. Turn it over. Oh, yes, the Metropolis Merchandise Company. Well, this has me worried. 
Uh, let me look at it once more, Bertie. Here it is, Mr. Gilfrey. Uh, thank you. Whoop. Oh, darn it, it almost flew open, <laughs> but not quite. <laughs> well, don't lift it by the string, Uncle. It'll break. Oh, yes, so it will. I mean, I'll try to be more careful, my dear. Uh, now, let me examine it. If you examine that box any more strenuously, it's going to fall apart. Yes, I hope you... I mean, I suppose you're right, Bertie. Well, this has gone on long enough. Bring me the scissors, please, Bertie. The scissors? Uncle, I don't think you should open Leroy's mail. Who's opening Leroy's mail? I just decided to cut the cuffs off my trousers and bring this suit back in style. <laughs> oh, that sounds like Leroy now. It can't be. He shut the door after himself. Oh, Bertie, I'm hungry. That's Leroy, all right. Was there any mail for me? Yeah, here it is. Gee, I can hardly wait. Good afternoon, Uncle Mort. Where is it? Hi, Marge. Oh, boy, what a big package. Yeah. Hello, Bertie. Anybody got a pair of scissors? Thanks, Uncle. Yes. Oh, dear. What? Why, it's garden seeds. Yeah, 300 packages of them. That's a good deal, Leroy. Sure, all I have to do is sell them at 10 cents a package and send back the $30. That's not such a good deal after all. <laughs> what do you get out of it, young man? Well, I'm not going to tell you now. I'm going to wait till I finish selling the whole slew and surprise you. Well, if you sell that many seeds, it's so going to surprise me. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I've got three surefire customers to begin with. Is that so? Who are they, my boy? You, Martin Bertie. Yes, <laughs> All right, step right up, folks. Get your nice fresh seed. Which kind do you want, Bertie? Well, let me see. Oh, you got flower seeds, too? Sure thing. Petunias, hollyhocks, cucumbers, onions. Yes. Yeah, and sweet William. Oh, that's what I'll have. There's a boy in the army named William. I sweet all. <laughs> okay, that'll be a dime, Bertie. How about you, Marge? You want to take something to remind you of that ensign in the Navy. You want any beans? <laughs> <laughs> No, Leroy. I'll remember him without beans. I'll take those forget me now. Uh, here's my dime, Leroy. I've taken some kohlrabi seeds. Kohlrabi? What's that? Uh, kohlrabi, Leroy, is cabbage trying to be cauliflower. <laughs> Leroy, don't you think 300 packages are too many for you to try to sell? Oh, no, sis. I am going to cover every backyard in town. And look how well I've done so far. In the first five minutes, I've already three down and only 297 yards to go. <laughs> Look, Piggy, why don't you buy your mother a package of flower seeds for Mother's Day? Yeah, but a package of seeds is a lot cheaper than a bouquet. No, I'm sorry, I can't trust you. Now, in the instructions, the company says they trust me, but I'm not supposed to trust anybody else. Well, at least think it over, will you? Okay, goodbye. Uh, by the way, Leroy, it's just a week since those seeds arrived. How many have you got left? 263. Yeah, no, Leroy. I don't mean the number of seats. I mean the number of packages. That's what I mean, too, Unc. Yes. Business would have been a lot better. Only half the kids in town are selling seeds. Oh, well, it's the best salesman who win out. Gee, Unc, you used to be a super salesman, didn't you? Well, yes. And I started selling the Gildersleeve girdle. I... <laughs> I developed some pretty snappy tricks, my boy. <laughs> but the principal thing to remember is politeness. Bear in mind that a polite approach will always get a polite response. Yeah, now, who's at that door? How do you do, sir? I hope I'm not intruding. You are. What do you want? Well, uh, I represent the Big Gem Encyclopedia Corporation of East St. Louis, Illinois. No, scram. But you haven't... Beat it. But you haven't even heard what I have to say. Well, I don't want any. Goodbye. Remember, Leroy, a polite approach will always get a polite response. <laughs> I'll always remember that. I'll bet a quarter that when you went out after a prospect, you brought him back on a dotted line, like Frank Burke. A buck. Okay, a buck, then. Yes, that's not bad. <laughs> However, I wager I could do such a good job selling your vegetable seeds that you could come along ten minutes later and sell the same people corned beef to go with the cabbages they'd expect to raise. Yeah, it's too bad you still can't do it, Uncle Mort. Yeah, who says I can't? Could you? Why, of course. Oh, gee, that's swell. Oh, Mort! Uncle Mort is going to show me how to sell the rest of my seeds. Now, hold on a minute. I didn't say... I'll go to my room and get my stock, Uncle. Oh, great jumping jeeps. I've been taken in again. Now, remember, Leroy... The important thing is to start talking first, and don't stop till your customer says yes. Understand? Yes. All right. Now watch me. 
Oh, Mrs. Dobson. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hello, Leroy. Is there anything I can do for you? Because Mama isn't home right now. She's downtown getting some burned-out electric bulbs in case you have another blackout. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> well, excuse me for cutting in, Dottie, but I'm helping Leroy sell these wonderful garden seeds, and I thought maybe you folks would like to buy some. Oh, garden seeds? Well, I don't know whether we're going to plant a garden or not. This year on a kind of, I tried one in 1941, but I didn't have a bit of luck. You didn't? What did you plant? Peanuts. I planted a whole bag of them, but nothing came up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, do you think the salt kept them from growing, Mr. Gildersleeve? You. Well, maybe I should try something else this year. Have you got any popcorn? And crazy about popcorn. If you have any, I'll take ten cents worth of it's hot. You know. <laughs> Dottie, I'm sorry. However, we have lettuce and spinach and eggplant and oyster plant. Oyster plant and eggplant? Oh, you can't fool me. Eggs come from nests and oysters don't grow on plants either. You catch them with a harpoon. You harpoon. <laughs> I think I'll just plant bird seed this year on it. Kind of the birds always get it anyhow. Well, goodbye now. <laughs> It's getting dark, Uncle Mort. Don't you think we'd better go home while we're just hungry and before we start starving? No, Leroy. I'd still like to show you how to make a sale. Now, I have a feeling that things are going to be different at this house. Okay, I'll ring the bell. Yeah. Now, observe the way I give them the uh, politeness approach. Yes, what is it? Oh, how do you do, sir? I'd like to sell you some wonderful garden seeds. They grow so quickly that all you have to do is stick them in the ground and jump back fast. <laughs> Say, uh, don't you live over on Parkside Avenue? Well, yes. How did you know? Don't you remember me? No, I can't say that I do. Well, I came to your door this afternoon selling encyclopedias. You did? Yes, I did. And do you remember what you did? No, what? <laughs> Yes, now I remember. Uncle Ward, can't we continue the salesmanship lesson tomorrow? No, after we sell some seeds to Mrs. Twitchell Leroy, I'm sure she's going to buy some anyway. Why not? She's been a pioneer in everything else. Uh, uh, what's keeping her? You'd think the old squaw would answer her door, but she's probably too la dee da, Mrs. Twitchell. <laughs> Oh, hello, Leroy. How do, Mr. Gildersleeve? What brings you here? It's these seeds of Leroy's. He had quite a lot of them, and I suggested to him that you might want some. Well, that's very thoughtful of you. I could plant some in my garden. You see, Leroy, your Uncle Mort knows. How about three or four packages of corn, Mrs. Twitchell? Um, are you sure you can spare it? Yes, sir. Oh, sure. We've got nine packages. Uh, would you like all nine of them? Uh, yes, I would. Oh, splendid. Now, how about some turnips and parsnips? Oh, do you think they'd be useful? Oh, surely. They're good for... Uh... What are they good for? Oh, yes, they make better mashed potatoes than lima beans do. <laughs> Here you are, six packages. Oh, uh, I would also like some beet seeds. Uh, how do they come? The beets? A to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of silly, isn't it? <laughs> we don't, we've struck a gold mine. Yes, yeah, you said it. Uh, now, Mrs. Twitchell, would you like some Brussels sprouts or okra or lettuce? Oh, no, no, no more, Mr. Gildersleeve. I already have more than I should have taken, and uh, really, it was most generous of you to come over with such lovely little gifts. Yes, gifts? Uh, thank you, and good night. Good night. <laughs> now, Judge Hooker, the first thing we want understood is that we're selling these seeds, not giving them away. I understand, Gildersleeve. You're no congressman. Yeah. <laughs> the reason you should buy these seeds is to start a victory garden, Judge. Yeah, everyone should have a victory garden. Right. Food will help win the war. Food is as important as ammunition. Yeah, and all the money we save raising our own food, we can put into war-saving stamps and bonds. Say, hey, that's a very good point, young man. Hey, yeah, and look at the exercise it'll give us. Sure, and that way you can get rid of that spare tire, Gildy. Well, I wasn't aware that I had any spare tire. Just look in any mirror, Gildersleeve. Oh, yes, the judge made a joke, Leroy. Let's laugh. <laughs> I'm glad you agree with us, though, Judge. How many packages of seeds do you want? None. If none? Why not? Well, I planted my garden a week ago. Gee, too late. You mean that pint-sized plot in your backyard? Well, you can't raise enough stuff there to feed your next-door neighbor's bantam chicken. Well, I haven't any more room here. If I had a place out in the country, I could sure go to town. Oh, out in the country. Oh, say, there's an acre that belongs to Marjorie and Leroy's estate right outside the city limits. There is? 
Well, uh, we'd let you plant a big garden out there if you bought your seeds from the right party. Uh, oh, an acre's too much for me to handle by myself. But I take half if you plant the other half, Gildy. That's an idea, Uncle Moore. Between the two of you, you'd use up all the seeds we haven't sold. Yes, well, I don't know. Remember, I... Gildersleeve, food is ammunition. Yes. Especially the food you'd grow. <laughs> We can use it to throw at the enemy. Yeah, that's all. Well, I'll show you. Leroy, how many packages of seeds have you got left? Twenty-three dollars worth. All right. That'll be eleven and a half from you, Judge, and the same amount from me. Now, how about making it a sporting proposition? I'll toss you to see who pays for the whole thing. Okay, he's going to toss me. <laughs> you call it, Hooker. Hey, ready? Head. It's a head, all right. Head, uh, I should have mine examined. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. But first, here's an interesting question a friend asked me, a question that certainly proves American housewives are nutrition conscious these days. It was about parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. This housewife said, I serve my family parquet margarine and they all like it, but does parquet provide them with the kind of nourishment I should expect from a spread for bread? Well, that's easy to answer. The answer is yes. Parquet margarine provides economically the important food elements that nutritional experts generally require of a spread for bread. Here they are. First, parquet margarine provides energy. In fact, it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. Second, parquet is nourishing because the wholesome American vegetable oils and farm products that go into parquet are nourishing in themselves. Third, parquet margarine is a reliable food source of vitamin A. Yes, summer and winter, every pound of parquet contains 9,000 units of this important vitamin. So, you see, thrifty parquet margarine provides the things a spread for bread should provide. And it tastes so deliciously good, your family is sure to like it. So why not try some tomorrow? Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. <laughs> Have you ever tried to locate a piece of property from the legal description on the deed? Well, that's what the great Gildersleeve and his nephew Leroy are attempting to do this morning before starting out to plant that victory garden. The uh, 200 northerly feet of the westerly half of Section 5 East, <laughs> sometimes known as the old Flugelhammer property. In track 207 and a half of the 1904 survey, as provided for in paragraph O of the treaty made by President Chester A. Arthur through the Kitsiku Indians. I still don't know where it is. Yes, neither do I. Too bad I never went out and looked at that property. Yeah, it might turn out to be in a swamp or under a lake. Well, in that case, we could raise ducks. Or rice. Or ducks and rice. <laughs> Imagine raising ducks already stuffed with wild rice. <laughs> Before you start selling any duck dinners, Unc, yes. don't you think we'd better go downtown and ask the county recorder where this property is located? That's a mighty good idea, my boy. Then we can go directly out there. Okay, start the car. Yeah, not so fast. What about our lunch? Oh, Bertie. I got the whole pack, Mr. Gill, please. Here he is. I fixed some new kind of sandwiches I hope you like. Oh, what are they, Bertie? I call them Bertie Burgers. Yes, Bertie Burgers. They consist of half a cold chicken between two slices of baked ham. Oh, boy. Come on, Uncle. Let's hurry out there so we can dig in. <coughs> to the sandwiches, I mean. Yeah. You're going to do a lot of other digging, young man, before we come to the birdie burgers. Are all the garden tools in the rear compartment, Leroy? Sure thing. Start them up, Uncle. It seems to me we've forgotten something. Uh, tools, lunch, old clothes. I guess we've got everything. Well, thank you, Bertie. Welcome. Now, take it easy the first day, and don't try to chew more than you can buy it all. Yeah, okay, Bertie. Have a good time while we're away. <laughs> yeah? You sure are sure the funniest looking farm I've ever seen. <laughs> well, so long, folks. Yeah, so long. Did you hear that, Leroy? Bertie says we're two of the funniest looking farmers he ever uh, uh, seen. Whoa! <laughs> Huh? Bertie just reminded me what I'd forgotten to take. All that seed. <laughs> this is 
certainly out in the country, all right, isn't it, my boy? I bet the Saturday evening post doesn't get out here till Saturday. <laughs> How did the estate ever happen to have property this far from town? Well, it was taken in on a bad debt that we were taken in on. Well, according to the directions, it runs 200 feet north from this marker. Well, which way is north? It's north. Let me see. If we had an oak tree, we could tell if it had moss on it. It moss grows on the north side. It, nor is it the south side. Well, it's one of the two, anyway. Well, how about asking that man over there? That man where? Over there with the mule. Oh, I thought that was a pair of mules. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you over there. And which way is north? What did you say? If I said which way is north. Huh? If which way is north. Don't know. I just work here. He <laughs> I could have gotten a more intelligent answer out of the other mule. Well, maybe we can figure it out by ourselves, Uncle. Huh? The sun should be in the east, shouldn't it? Yes, unless it's afternoon already. Well, then, if you face east, your left hand is toward the north, isn't it? Well, yes, you're a bright boy scout, Leroy. Now, all we have to do is measure off 200 feet towards our left. Uh-oh, we forgot to bring a yardstick. Yeah, one thing after another. And maybe that fellow over there has a yardstick. Hey, hey you! Hey, have you got a yardstick? What did you say? I said if you got a yardstick. Got a what? A yardstick. Don't know. I just worked here. <laughs> Never mind, Leroy. I'll just step off the 200 yards. That's well. How long a step do you take, Uncle? Huh? A step? Well, let's see. Somewhere between... Uh, oh, I forget. Or did I ever know? You better skip the stepping, Leroy. Have you got any other suggestions? Yeah, too bad Birdie isn't here. She wears a size 12 shoe. We can use it for a one-foot ruler. <laughs> How tall are you, Unc? That's all? I'm five feet ten. Why? Gee, if you were only six feet tall, you could lay down and be two yardsticks. <laughs> hey, that's a good idea, Leroy. I know what we'll do. Hey, bring that rake handle out of the back of the car, will you please? That's right. Yes, yes. Now, I'll lay down here like this. Here. Now, you mark the spot in the dust where my feet is. Okay, but what... You'll soon see, my boy. Yeah, now mark the top of my... where my head hits the ground there. Yeah, splendid. What's the idea, huh? Yes. Now add two inches. Add two inches? Get away, Bucky. I still don't get it. Just measure the distance from my head to my toes on that rake handle. Then add the two inches, and you'll have six feet. You know... Oh! 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 Get that towel away from here, Leroy. Get out of my bed. Oh. Yes, get out of here. Oh. Just quit swinging that tail in my eyes, madam. <laughs> she's gone, no. Oh, thank goodness she's gone. It helped me up, Leroy. My goodness. What does that farmer mean, letting a dangerous cow run around loose? If, hey, you! What did you say? Why did you leave that cow loose? Huh? What's that? If, what do you mean leaving that cow run around stepping on people? Who's what? Oh! <laughs> why is that cow allowed to run wild? Don't know. She just works here. <laughs> Keep it up, Uncle Mort. That's fine, Judge Hooker. This is our last row. Yeah, it's a mighty hard row to hoe, too. Oh, don't beak so much, you old mutton head. Doesn't this take you back to the days when you were a kid on the farm, Judge? What, Gildy, except for one thing. Yeah, what's that? I was never on the farm when I was a kid. Oh, I bet you never were a kid, either. You must have been born middle-aged. Was it fun on the farm, Uncle? I'll say. I used to go around barefooted. Oh, it was nice to bury my little pink toes in the cool, fresh air. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't mind doing that right now. That won't make you a kid again, Gildersleeve. Well, yeah, maybe not, but these shoes are awfully tight anyway. If no one minds, I'm going to take them off. <coughs> yeah, there's nothing like getting back to the soil, is there? Uh, certainly feels nice to scrunch the dirt between your toes, doesn't it? It does? Yeah. Come on, Judgy. You might as well be comfortable. <laughs> I believe I will try it. Uh, How about you, Leroy? Oh, thanks. I've outgrown that sort of thing long ago. <laughs> well, I got my shoes off, Gildy. <laughs> Feels mighty good. Yeah, it'd feel even better if you took your socks off, too. <laughs> Uh, oh, yes, yes, of course. 
<laughs> hey, what's wrong with you? I'm standing on a pussy willow. <laughs> planting your feet and finish planting the rest of these seeds, we'd be all through. Yes, you're right, Leroy. Come on, Judge. Quit clowning around and help Leroy and me. Well, what do you want me to do? Well, here's some seeds. Oh, you put two of these in each hole, and Judge Hooker, you cover them with dirt. Oh, that's easy now. Hey, you've got two different kinds of seeds in this bag, Leroy. Which do you want us to plant? One of each. That's unusual. What's the idea? Oh, it's an experiment I'm making. I'm mixing corn and lima bean seeds together to see if we can get a sucker tank plant. Yes, <laughs> Well, if this works, we can try planning a blue plate special. <laughs> hey, come on, Judge. I'll drop them in and you cover them up. Sure. Now, let's do it with teamwork and rhythm. Rhythm. Yeah, we'll count. One, two, three, four. Oh. On one and two, you drop in the seeds. And on three and four, I'll rake over the dirt. Yeah. Okay? Why not? Anything your little mind can think of, Judge. <laughs> yeah. Let's begin. One, a two. Three, four. If one, a two. Three, four. If one, a two. Three, four. It's corn, a bean. Rake, rake. It's corn, a bean. Rake. Oh, boom. Quit raking my big toe, you clumsy little fool. Oh, I never came anywhere near your big toe, you big ninny. Is that right? Well, look. Is that your big toe? <laughs> Why, I thought it was a lima bean. <laughs> Judge Hooker, lima beans don't quit. Now we can go home. Oh, at last. Hey, Judge, what'd you do with my shoes and stockings? I didn't do anything. Where are mine? Uh, that's kind of peculiar, isn't it? Well, Leroy. Yes, Uncle Mort. Did you pick up our shoes and stockings? No, I didn't touch them. But how could they possibly disappear right off a bare field with no one else around? I don't know. We can't pitter patter home in our bare feet like this. Hey, hey, I just figure out what happened. Huh? Come on, Uncle Mort. Come on, Judge. Let's get busy with our rakes and hose again. You planted your shoes and socks. Yo, this is going to be one of my bad days. Mr. Gillsleeve, how soon you expect to start harvesting the truck on your truck farm? Uh, well, any day now, Bertie. Ever since the last rain, everything is coming along swimmingly. Yeah, I tried some of the radishes yesterday, and they're coming up fine. Uh, Marjorie, you should come out someday and look our garden over. It's a vision of vitamins. Well, I'll ride out with you the next time you go. How are you getting along with Judge Hooker? Oh, all right, except for that dirty trick he pulled on us yesterday. What was that? Well, he was raking his half of the garden when he suddenly found out he'd lost his diamond ring. Yeah, and he offered a dollar reward to the one who found it. Yeah. So Leroy and I scratched through his whole patch. When we finished, he discovered that he hadn't worn the ring that day. It was all a scheme to get us to rake his rutabagas for him. Uncle Mort was so mad, he hit the judge over the head with a scarecrow. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Uncle. Yeah, I know it, my dear. I'm sorry I did it, too. Now we got to get a new scarecrow. <laughs> when are you going out there again, Uncle Mort? Well, uh, not till next week. Ain't you afraid the gophers will go for the plants? Uh, Are the weeds spring up and choke it? No, Bertie. I cleared the garden of all the weeds yesterday. Yeah, only some of the weeds turned out to be young carrots. Oh, that was too bad. Did you pull out many of them? Well, I must have ripped up 12 or 14 rows before I discovered what they were. <laughs> However, I had a lucky break, my dear. You did? Yes. I did all my pulling out on Judge Hooker's half. One more row and I would have started on our own carrots. <laughs> Uncle Mort, I've been amazed at what you've done with this bit of land. You really and truly have a green thumb. Yes, it matches the rest of his complexion. <laughs> now, I'll see here, Judge Hooker. You get over on your own side with your pumpkins and cabbages. That way you won't look so conspicuous. Oh, Mort, the judge was only having a little fun. Huh? He didn't mean it. Well, look now, but there's that man again. Yes. Oh, Mort. Oh, you mean the hired hand from the farm next door. Yes. Why did he lean over the fence and grin and laugh all the time? He's been doing that ever since we started this garden. He used to make us angry at first. Doesn't he give any explanation? Well, if you ask what it's all about, he just says... Don't no, no, I, I just work here. here. Yeah. Oh, I bet I could find out. Let me try, huh? That's not a bad idea, Marjorie. Go ahead. Let's just go over to I'd like to know what this is all about. Come on, man. Only let me do all the talking. 
Come on along, Uncle Moore. At first, I thought he was amused at our efforts to be farmers. But we've had such marvelous results, and he still gives us a horse laugh. Uh, good morning. <laughs> good morning, lady. Nice garden my uncle and my brother and Judge Hooker <laughs> fixed up, isn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, there's nothing wrong with the garden, is there? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> what's the big joke, huh? <laughs> oh, come on, tell me. It's the land. The garden is yours. <laughs> so what's wrong with that land? Nothing, only it ain't yours. You, what? You, what do you mean it isn't ours? The first day you come out here, you started measuring south from the second day in the woods. <laughs> what? Does that mean that we put in all that work for nothing and the crop is in ours? Oh, I had a feeling I was wrong, Judge. When did you get that feeling, Gildersleeve? Yes, this morning. A fine time. Yeah, so I went downtown and I found out that a Mr. Compton owned this property. Yeah, yeah that's the man I work for. Oh, no, no, you don't. Not anymore. I bought this property this morning, and you work for me now. By George, you don't either. You're fired. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. Meantime, I imagine you mothers and housewives are pretty busy these days, so I'm sure you're interested in ways of streamlining the preparing of meals and getting results that are mighty appetizing, too. Now, if you're used to running to the refrigerator for a dab of this for a shortening, a dab of that for pan frying, and something else for a spread for bread, here's a time-saving hint. Use parquet margarine for all these purposes. Yes, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. You see, the delicate appetizing flavor that makes parquet margarine such a delicious spread for bread makes it a favorite for cooking, too. Yes, parquet margarine is a real flavor shortening that makes all baked foods taste better. It's a swell seasoning for hot vegetables. Parquet margarine makes pan-fried foods tastier, too. And it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. So in one convenient package, you have a grand-tasting product for all these uses. And remember this. No matter how you use it, parquet margarine is a nourishing, wholesome energy food and a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. So tomorrow, sure, try economical parquet margarine. Remember, it's parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. Now it's time to join that busy businessman, that solid citizen, and that unctuous uncle, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, who's arrived home from the office an hour earlier than usual today because of a splitting headache. at this hour. Oh, good afternoon, Marjorie. I closed the office early on account of a splitting headache. Oh, that's too bad. How are you feeling? Just wonderful. Well, what about the headache? Oh, she went home. <laughs> she? Yes, I didn't have the headache. It was my secretary, Miss Rep Vogel. I kept telling the girl, the poor girl, to get glasses, but she thinks they'll spoil her good looks. Well, if that girl ever wore glasses, she could see that she hasn't any good looks. <laughs> that's probably why she doesn't wear them. 
Anyhow, after she left, I guess I got a touch of spring fever. Oh, you did? Yes, you know. In the spring, a young man's fancy uh, lightly turns uh, to thoughts. Uh, <laughs> that's from Loxley's Hall, Tennyson. Hey, Marge! Gee whiz, you can't imagine what wandered into our backyard just now. Hi, Uncle Morse. There's a goat in our backyard. Is a goat? Sure, a real live billy goat with all the accessories. A beard at one end and a tail at the other. Yes. And two horns. Uh, well, and a very good bumper, too, I'll bet. <laughs> What's it doing in our yard? Well, it pulled up some of those onions you planted, and right now it's having dinner. <gasps> onions? I never planted it. Oh, good heavens, those are my crocus bulbs. Yes, so. Oh, why didn't you stop him? Hey? Uncle Moore, please come along and help. Yes, certainly, my dear. Come along, Leroy. Oh, gee, crocus, do you think it'll croak the goat? Yes. <laughs> Leroy, I can see you don't know very much about a goat suggestion. <laughs> oh, now you get right out of my flower garden, you old devil. <laughs> Stop eating my flowers. Now tell him to quit. Yes, all right, my dear. No, see here. Uh, uh, what's the goat's name, Leroy? I don't know. We just can't call him anonymous. Oh, I know. Let's call him Horace after Judge Horace Hooker, eh? <laughs> There's quite a resemblance between those two old goats anyway. <laughs> Uncle Mort, you don't really mean that. No, Leroy. The goat's more intelligent looking. <laughs> oh, hurry, Uncle Mort. Well, you've been talking that goat's eating four crocuses, all the nasturtiums, and now he's started on my lilies. Lilies? He has, has he? <laughs> you get away from those lilies, Horace. Quickly now, before you wind up holding one of them. like Horace has been eating the radishes, too. <laughs> hey, come on, Leroy. Help me drag him out of there. Well, maybe I can handle him myself, Uncle Mort. Huh? Come on out of there, Horace, old boy. Yes. Nice little ghost. Come on, palsy wowsy. Atta boy, that's right. You see, all you have to do is treat him with kindness. Oh, look, Uncle Mort, he likes you. Well, isn't that cute? <laughs> Look out, Uncle Mort, he's chewing your sleeve. Yeah, he is. And stop that, Horace, let go. Unhand me, sir. <laughs> yes, Horace, don't chew on sleeve. You might choke on the buttons. <laughs> Be nice to your Uncle Mort. I'm not that goat's Uncle Mort. Now, Leroy, you take this silly Billy back to its owner. Mr. Jim, I don't know who he belongs to. Nobody around here keeps goats. He must have wandered in from out of town. Well, he can wander right back out again. You hear that goat? Beat it. Skidoo. They're vamoose. That's Spanish for scram, Leroy. Uh, vai para casa. What's that? That Portuguese for vamoose. <laughs> oh, jeepers, um, couldn't we keep him for just a little while? Leroy, we're not running a bite wee for belligerent billy goats. <laughs> but he'd make a keen pet. Young man, your pets have been my peeve. We've let you keep rabbits, turtles, and frogs, and chipmunks. But goats are more than I can stomach. And goodness knows I can stomach a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I agree, Uncle Mort. Now, how can we get rid of him? I'll uh, call the city hall. City hall? Yes, there must be some department down there that handles runaway goats. But, gee, Uncle, why can't we just keep him? I'll tell you why, my boy. In the first place, he doesn't belong to us. In the second place, whoever owns him might want him back. In the third place, I won't have him tearing up our place in the first place. <laughs> Quiet, you. Hello. Now, Uncle Moore, don't lose your temper. Why shouldn't I lose my temper? I've been on this telephone till I've gotten a cauliflower ear. Well, maybe no one that's down at City Hall wants a goat. There must be some department that handles them down there, Leroy. By George, what are we paying taxes for? <laughs> Operator, wake up. Good afternoon, City Hall. Oh, good afternoon, my dear. Did you have a nice nap? <laughs> what do you want, please? This is still Flockmorton P. Gildersleeve. Oh, yes, the goat man. <laughs> one moment, please. Uh, one moment, please. I'd like to see Hitler hold his breath for one of her moments. <laughs> Leroy, did you tie that goat to the tree like I told you to? Yes, I did, Uncle, and he chewed through the rope. Oh, dear, what's he doing now? Oh, nothing, just standing there eating the rest of the rope. <laughs> well, let's give him enough rope and maybe he'll operate her. Who are you waiting for, please? I want somebody to come and get my goat. Well, just hold on. Here you are. Oh, help the workman. Entwistle speaking. Oh, at last. Mr. Entwistle, I'm calling about a goat. Sorry, that's not my line. I don't handle 
little sick, Goat. It, but this goat isn't sick. Oh, then you want Percy Bodkin, just a second. Yeah. <laughs> hello, Bodkin speaking. Uh, hello, Mr. Bodkin. We've got a goat down at our house. Yeah, I know. It hasn't any nose. How does it smell? Terrible. I've heard that one. <laughs> No, no, no. This is a perfectly healthy goat. Are you sure? Has it had a physical lately? <laughs> uh, look, it's straight into our yard. We want you to come and take it away. But I'm just the inspector of goat's milk. <laughs> this isn't an anti goat, it's a Bill. Oh, Bill, he's out to lunch now. I'll have him call you when he gets back. <laughs> operator, operator. One moment, sir. I'm trying to help you. Here's Mr. McCorkle in Lost and Found. Go ahead, Mac. Hello. I understand you lost a coat. What kind? Overcoat, top coat, sport coat, or mackerel? <laughs> no, no, not a coat. Uh, a goat. Oh, a goat? Yeah. Here in the city hall? No, here at home. How could you lose a goat at home? You probably just mislaid it. Yes, miss. <laughs> I didn't mislaid it. I found it. Well, then if you found it, why are you bothering me? Because it isn't mine. But does the coat fit you? Yeah, it's not a coat. It's a goat. A G-O-T, goat. <laughs> oh, now I understand. I've switched you over to the park commission. They use them on the lake. Use what on the lake? Boats. Oh! <laughs> no, no, operator, operator. It's... Hello, city planning commission. I don't want the planning commission. I just want to find out how to get rid of a goat. Oh, yes, the phone girl told me. Well, all you have to do is come down here and sign a complaint. I'll be glad to. Then what happens? We'll send a policeman out and he'll arrest that man. He can't keep a goat in a residential zone. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Leroy, time for you to trot off to bed. Oh, but gee, it's early, huh? Can't I read to the end of the chapter? No, young man. Before you go to your room, I want you to go outside and chase that miserable goat out of our yard. You mean tonight? Right now. And lock the gate so he can't get back in again. Okay, but it's a pretty tough break for the old fella. No place to turn to late at night. I thought you just said it was early. Sure for me, but not for a goat. Yeah. It's pretty sad. Now, now, let's not get sentimental about a billy goat. Yeah, but how would you feel if it was a cold night and you were all alone in a strange city and you were a goat? Well, I'd feel... How do I know I'm not a goat? <laughs> well, Uncle Mort, just supposing you were, Horace. Uh, uh, Leroy, sit down. We're going to have a little man-to-man talk. Gee, like Andy Hardy? Just sit down, young man. Oh, I don't want to appear hard-hearted. But we've got to look at this entire goat problem from the practical standpoint. Understand? Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, first of all, am I this goat's keeper? Did I invite him to come here and live with us? No, but you never told him he couldn't come either, Unc. What's that got to do? Let's be calm about this, Leroy. <laughs> the trouble with you, young man, is that you're too impulsive. I am? Yes. You should carefully consider what you're jumping into and then don't jump. Why, what business would we have owning a goat? Oh, it's well business. We could rent him out to the neighbors as a lawnmower. Yes, a lawnmower. <laughs> That's not the point, Leroy. Let's get down to cold, bare facts. Sure. Poor old Horace is cold and bare, and that's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> and homeless and lonesome, too. But you've got to realize, my boy, that that isn't our fault. Oh, I do, Uncle. And I realize it wouldn't be our fault either if we threw him out and it started to rain and he caught cold and wound up with double pneumonia. Yes, double pneumonia. Oh, yes, that's perfectly true. If you think it's going to rain. What do we care if it does? I never heard of a goat catching double pneumonia before. Well, suppose he doesn't. Then he may starve to death or get run over by a truck. Oh, I'd hate to think that... Leroy, maybe I've been too impulsive. Oh, no, Unc. Well, I guess I'd better go out and chase Horace out of our backyard. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, you needn't bother, my boy. I'll uh, take care of those things myself. But you said that I was supposed uh, to... Never mind, Leroy. It might rain and... If that poor old goat hasn't got anywhere else to go, it won't hurt us if he spends the night under our mulberry bush. Gee, for something, we're going to keep him? There you go, acting impulsive again. Well, he hasn't given us any trouble since he had his dinner. Yeah, do you remember what he had for dinner? A delicious set of Grandma Gildersleeve's lace curtains. <laughs> but he won't do it again. I'll watch him, Uncle. How about it? Well, we'll see, Leroy. I'm going to see that you get straight to bed. Come on. Oh, I'm going. You don't need to come with me, Uncle. Yeah, I'm going to my room anyway. There's an old blanket in my closet I'm going to take outside for that goat. In case it gets cold tonight, or if he gets hungry. <laughs> oh, I don't think you need to bother us. He, he'll, he'll be just fine without that. Well, seeing that I'm the host, of course, I might as well. If, uh... <laughs> Leroy, what's going on in your room? Oh, no, 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 nothing, Oh, mm, nothing, eh? Well, let's take a look. <laughs> Leroy, look at your mattress. That's the last straw. <laughs> Do 
you think that was the last straw, Judge Hooker? No. I put that horse... Horace! Uh, uh, I mean that goat. <laughs> <laughs> I put him outside after that, and he spent the night bleeding his brains out. Well, what have you done about it today? Well, I placed an ad in the lost and found section of the newspaper. I oh, expected... Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hello, Judge Hooker. Have you two heard the latest news about the Gildersleeve goat? Of course you haven't. You haven't been home, I mean. Yes. Well, we haven't had so much excitement in the neighborhood since that donut truck ran over that coffee salesman. Yes, <laughs> My goodness, Dottie, what's happened now? Well, your goat has developed the worst habit. He's playing games with everybody. What sort of games? Well, there's one called Button, Button. Who's going to get the button? <laughs> Oh, my goodness. Yes, it usually starts with somebody playing drop the handkerchief, and then the goat plays hop, skip, and bump, and then bingo, you're it. Yes, Great jumping jeeps. Come on, Judge, let's go. And uh, thank you for telling us, Dottie. Well, that's all right. Well, the neighbors say they're going to sue you for damages, but for the life of me, I can't see why they want more damages. Uh, take a leg, Judge, before that goat busts me into bankruptcy. Ooh, by George, there he is now. <laughs> He's a cute-looking fella. Yes. Now, there are people who think you're cute-looking, too, Judge, and for the very same reason. <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, any similarity between you and that goat is purely coincidental. But there's still definitely a similarity. <laughs> uh, Bertie! Afternoon, Mr. Gill, please. Afternoon to you, too, Judge. I don't suppose the owner of that goat showed up. No, sir, he didn't. He's a powerful, smart man, that man is. However, there was another man around here looking for to buy that goat. Well, why didn't you sell it to him? Well, now, suppose I did, and the owner showed up. That's how people get themselves into pokey. In... <laughs> but we have a legal right to sell this animal now, haven't we, Judge? That's right. The decision was handed down in State of Nebraska versus two unclaimed guinea pigs, later amended to Nebraska versus unspecified number of guinea pigs. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine, Judge. Now, Bertie... Do you remember the name of the man who wanted to buy that goat? No, sir, I don't. Oh, what a pity. But he left his card. Here it is. Oh, his card. Good. Let's have it. Thanks. You? I'll pick it up. And never mind, Bertie. I'll get it. Look out, Gildy. Get up. Here comes that goat. What'd you say, Judge? No, Mr. Gildy, please. What's all the commode? <laughs> Here, let me help you up. You aren't hurt, are you, Gildy? No, no. Of course not, Judge. I'm just practicing forced landings. That's all. <laughs> Where is that goat? You better get rid of him, Mr. Gilsey. That's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell him right now. Where's that man's card I dropped? Well, it was on the grass a minute ago. Yes, it was right away. Oh, somebody stop that goat. Oh, it's too late. He just chewed up the card with the customer's name. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gilded Slave again in just a moment. But first, I want to spread the good news. All you busy homemakers will be tickled pink to know that there is a way to make delicious macaroni and cheese fast. In fact, you can make fluffy light macaroni drenched in cheese goodness in just seven minutes cooking time. The product called Kraft Dinner holds the secret of this speed. In every Kraft Dinner package, there's a quick cooking macaroni that needs no baking at all. Also, some Kraft grated that in a twinkling gives you grand cheese flavor through and through. Just seven minutes at the stove, and you have a marvelous main dish. Fluffy, tender macaroni, drenched in cheese goodness. The family will say Kraft Dinner is just about the best macaroni and cheese you ever made. And you'll say Kraft Dinner is a positive treasure. On days when you have to work fast to get luncheon on time. Or for dinners, when you've spent the afternoon shopping or working late on your defense job. So stock the emergency shelf tomorrow with several packages of Kraft Dinner. <laughs> return to the great Gildersleeve, who's putting the finishing touches on a temporary goat pen to hold Horace until he can be sold, given away, or just tied to some fence and ran from. Yeah. There we are, Leroy. And there you are, Mr. Goat. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but I'm tired. I'm going to take a nap in the hammock, Leroy. Okay, you take it easy. I'm going over to Piggy Bank's house and see if his mother will let him take Horace. All right. Only don't wake me up unless she's foolish enough to say yes. <laughs> Gee, poor Uncle Mort. He's getting to the age where he can't take these things. Oh, my gosh, James. Oh, there you are, Leroy. We've been looking for you, haven't we, girl? That's yes. right. He's just come from our first aid lesson, and we need a victim quick to practice on before we forget everything we learned just now. So come on, little man. Let us bandage you up. Nothing doing, Sally. The last time you guys wrapped up my leg, my foot was asleep all afternoon. <laughs> Besides, i got to see a lady about a goat. 
Well, it looks like we'll have to practice on each other. Oh, no. Let, let's see if Bertie's here. All right. Oh, Bertie, would you like to come out here and be a victim? A victim of what, Miss Marge? Circumstances? <laughs> no. <laughs> of a broken leg, brain, burns, everything. No, ma'am. I have absolutely no inclinations in that direction. <laughs> we just want to practice first aid on you. We're just going to pretend that you're hurt. Can't you do it just pretending I'm there, too? I've got a pressing engagement to press that dress she wants to wear tonight. But if you want me to leave, that's to go No, 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 Bertie, no. We'll, we'll find someone else. Oh, say, Mike, isn't that your uncle over there in the hammock? Yes. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he'd make an awfully jolly patient, wouldn't he? Oh, I don't know. You think we've got enough bandages to go around it? <laughs> <laughs> Listen over and ask him, huh? Come on, Gilbert. All right, well, let's be quiet. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Gillis, please. Do you mind if we use you as a dummy to practice our first aid on and the kind nobody else will, and you don't have to disturb yourself in the least because we can go right ahead just the way you are. <laughs> the shoe flies go away. <laughs> He's asleep. We shouldn't disturb him, Dottie. If Uncle Mort's asleep, I don't think even Dottie can disturb him. <laughs> yeah. Do you mean it's all right to proceed? Sure. Just as long as we don't treat him too roughly or push him out of the hammock. Oh, goody. I've just been waiting for a chance like this to practice my tourniquet. Now, just hold still, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> well, this would be a good time to work on chest bandages. No, I'm afraid we'd have to get him up for that. Well, couldn't I just roll the bandage around here and man the hammock? Oh, yes. Yes, that would seem logical. Well, what are you going to do, Margie? Oh, I think I'll work on that treatment for burns and rub some of this salve on Uncle's face. <laughs> You'd probably keep him from getting sunburned, too. Mm. Ooh, this salve is certainly strong. Mm. <laughs> My, your uncle is certainly a sound sleeper. Yes, just listen to that sound. I never thought it would take so many mat bandages to go around your uncle's circumference, Margaret. Yes, yeah. that takes in a lot of territory, doesn't it? Gosh, but this stuff is sticky. Anyone have an extra handkerchief? Mm-hmm. Just a second and I'll be through. Then... Oh! Dolly Dobson, what are you doing to my uncle? Well, I'm just tightening this tourniquet. But good heavens, Dolly, you never use a tourniquet on the neck. <laughs> Get up. Who tied me down here? <laughs> well, why'd you do it? <laughs> oh, it's you. It, what do you want? <laughs> You'll get away from me. Oh, but your nose is cold. <laughs> yep, they quit licking my face. <laughs> <laughs> Your beard tickles. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gilsey, don't you think you'd better figure out some way to get rid of that goat? Because the animosity against him on the outside is beginning to penetrate on the inside. If, uh, what do you mean, Bertie? Well, I happen to know a certain very reliable and capable cook who has been offered a most lucrative position in a completely goatless household. Or uh, should I be more pacific? If... No, no, no. I think I understand, Bertie. And I'm trying to get rid of Horace, too. Well, I sure hope you does. And instantaneously, too. I'm tired of flying a kite from the second floor every time I got clothes to dry and wearing a skillet whenever I have to bustle out into the yard. And you folks ain't had it so easy either, eating them buffet dinners every night standing up. Yeah. Well, let's not go into that, Bertie. It's a painful subject. Oh, excuse me, Uncle Mort. I didn't know you were here. Come here, young man. Who, oh, me, Uncle? Of course you. Leroy. Did you have anything to do with Horace chasing the postman down the street and then eating our morning mail? Well, only indirectly, Uncle Mort. Yeah? You see, I was trying to train him to fetch the mail inside every morning the way Piggy Bank's dog does. 
Well, he fetched it inside, all right. Maybe we ought to buy him a muzzle. Uh, what's the use? He'd eat that, too. What we should do is saw off his horns, trim off his beard, and then tip off the dog catcher. <laughs> can't do that, Uncle Mort. He likes you. Yes. Every time he sees you, a look steals into his great, big, beautiful blue eyes. Too bad I couldn't see that look when I was bending over to find the keyhole last night. <laughs> he knocked me clear into the sitting room. <laughs> yeah, now what? As if I didn't know. Mr. Gillsleeve? Yes, that's me. I'm from the city hall. Do you keep a goat on these premises in violation of the city's zoning code? Of course you do. I can see him from here. Do you have county license to conduct a goat dairy as provided for in the civil statutes of this state? I thought not. Has a foresaid goat proven a nuisance, disturber of the peace, and menace to life, limb, and real estate values? I thought as much. Better get rid of him at once, Gildersleeve. That goat is butting into everybody's business today. <laughs> All right, that's enough of me. Get your cap, Leroy, and come along. Okay. Where are we going, Uncle? You heard the man. We're going to take that backyard battering ram out to the country and get rid of it. Here, Horace. Come on, nice little goat. Here's your... You lead him around to the car, Leroy. All right. Careful, Uncle. You'll trip your shoelaces untied. Shoelaces untied? Oh, thank you. I've got to fix it now. Oh, we got on kick on cars. I don't see him. Where is he? Right back here. No, no, Horace. <laughs> I fooled him that time. How long? I'm wearing my air raid warden helmet where it'll do the most good. <laughs> That farmer? Oh, yes, but this is our eighth stop, Leroy. I never thought there were so many goat haters in this part of the country. Uh, hello there, neighbor. Well, hello there. Oh, uh, how would you like to buy a dandy goat at a cheap price? <laughs> no, no, thank you, gentlemen. Gee, why not? These goats are too stubborn. They're used like yak assassins. <laughs> <laughs> but, but just look at this animal. He's a genuine Jim. A genuine Jim? He looked more like a York by Indian. <laughs> you can have him for only two dollars. <laughs> no, no, too high. All right, I'm tired of hauling him around the countryside. You can have him for nothing. That's still too high. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, suppose I give you uh, three or four dollars. How about that? Oh, no, you're yoshing me. I'm not yoshing you. I'm joshing you. <laughs> well, what do you say? No. But why not? That goat is worth ten dollars for sure. If you ask less, something done wrong, Sure. You get along now. Get off my property. I don't want no dealings with hot goats. Well, for the hot goats. Uh oh, Horace, what have you done? Gee, Uncle, look at the upholstery in the back seat. The upholstery? Oh, where is it? I got the it. <laughs> All right, brother. This is the end of the line. What you gonna do, Uncle? Open that back door, Leroy. Uh, now, get out, Horace. Yeah, shut the door quickly, Leroy. All right. G goodbye, Horace. Yeah, goodbye, Horace. <laughs> well, let's get home, Leroy. Yes, it's... Yeah. Ah. Yeah. My goodness, look, we're out of gas, Leroy. Horace, get away from those tires. <laughs> It's 7 o'clock, Miss Marge. You still want to wait dinner for Mr. Gillsleeve and Leroy? Oh, yes, Bertie. Just a little while longer, anyhow. Oh, I do hope they come back without that goat. Yes, ma'am, and so does everybody else who's ever come in contact with him. <laughs> Going to give the devil his dues. That horse had the most personality I ever saw in a goat. Too bad it was all negative. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know what we'll do if they bring him back again. Do you think we could hide him someplace where the neighbors wouldn't find out? No, ma'am. They'd sure get the wind of it somehow. <laughs> I guess you're right. Well, here we are. Oh. Is it dinner ready, Bertie? Yes, sir. How about that horse goat? Oh, we found out who owned him and gave him back. You did? Who does he belong to? The uh, Summerfield Railroad Yard. The Railroad Yard? Well, I've heard of donkey engines and cow catchers, but what do goats do on the railroad? Well, that horse works down at the stockyards. 
He leads the sheep out of the pens and into the boxcars. Yeah, and when he ran away, they thought he'd been shipped somewhere by mistake. Yes, they were terribly glad to get him back again because it's practically impossible to move the sheep unless he leaves them. Oh, well, thank goodness that's all over. You said it. Well, now, if you folks get all cleaned up, I'll put dinner on right away. Oh, dinner, and have I got an appetite. Yeah, me too. Come on, Uncle Morton. Yes, yeah, sure. You don't know what a load this is off my shoulders. Why, I feel like if... Uh, I feel like something's wrong. What's that noise outside? Oh, I can't imagine. It sounds like... You better go to the door, Uncle. Yes, I'll soon find out. <laughs> oh, great jumping sheep. Horace has come back again, and he's brought all his little sheep friends with him. <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, I'd like to mention that macaroni and cheese is one of America's favorite dishes. And now Kraft makes it possible for you to prepare this favorite dish in only seven minutes. You do it with a product called Kraft Dinner. For Kraft Dinner gives you a special quick cooking macaroni that gets fluffy tender in boiling water in a hurry. No need to blanch and bake this macaroni. Also in the Kraft Dinner package is some Kraft grated that puts grand cheese flavor into the macaroni quick. You spend just seven minutes at the stove to get tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. It's a kitchen miracle that will thrill you and delight the whole family. Kraft Dinner is a main dish all by itself, four good servings in every box. If you serve it molded into a ring and filled with cream seafood, you have a real party dish in a jiffy. So don't bother with blanching and baking macaroni anymore. Don't fuss with grating cheese and making a cream sauce. Give them grand macaroni and cheese cooked in seven minutes. Stock up on Kraft Dinner tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, in this war that we're fighting... There are a million stirring stories of valor and endurance and personal sacrifice. At this very moment, on every ocean, men of our Navy are writing an heroic page in our history. And in order that they may fight with untroubled hearts, secure in the knowledge that their loved ones at home are not in distress, the Navy Relief Society is asking us to contribute a fund of $5 million. That's right, Marjorie. For 40 years, the men of our Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard have provided immediate direct relief for their dependents themselves. But now, since Pearl Harbor, the need has become much greater. And so all of us are going to have the privilege of helping. Give now, and give generously. Either to your local Navy Relief Drive, or to the Navy Relief Society, 730 Fifth Avenue, New York City. That's right, 730 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Thank you, and good night, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. From the new NBC studios in San Francisco, Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Terry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. Ladies and gentlemen, up and down the coast of America, the United States Maritime Commission is launching better than one new Liberty ship a day. Before the end of the year, they'll be turning out three a day. Did you ever wonder how they name all these ships? Well, one of them is about to be called the SS Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. So let's visit Uncle Mort, Leroy, and Marjorie and see what it's all about. <laughs> Leroy, 
Leroy, we just received a telegram from San Francisco. Yes, they're going to name a new naval vessel, the Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. After you, Unc? Gee, what is it, a tanker or a blimp? It's... <laughs> It's a liberty ship, my boy, and it's being named in the memory of our ancestor, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve the first. Oh, you mean the one who captured the pirates in the War of 1812? Yes, my great-grandfather. I've always been proud of the fact that I'm the son of a son of a son of a sea captain. <laughs> and listen to this, Leroy. Uh? When they lock this ship out near San Francisco, I'm going to be the sponsor. You are? What you going to advertise? If nothing, nothing. <laughs> Marjorie's going to break a bottle of champagne over the bow of the ship. From here? Oh, no, silly. We're all going out there. Jeepers, we are. I better start packing. How soon do we leave? Oh, boy, we'll see lots of Indians on the way, won't we? <laughs> well, let's get going. Whoa, there. Hold your horses, Buffalo Bill. We don't have to be there till May the 12th, so we'll leave next week. Oh, that means I'll have time to get three or four new outfits. Uh, so long a ship. Why don't you just wear a bathing suit in case you get splashed? <laughs> now, Leroy, if your sister wore a bathing suit, it would slow down and work on all the other ships. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> yeah. oh. oh, Bertie. Someone's at the door. I'll get it just as soon as I can find my cap. A cap? If you mean that silly little dab of white lace you wear on your head, you've got it on. It's over by your left ear there. Oh, my God, so it is. I just can't keep it from drifting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll save the left here today. Here I come. heard the thrilling news about you going all the way out to California to launch a great big boat. Yeah. And I understand that they're going to name the thing after you, Mr. Gillespie, because of what you did in the war of 18-something or other. <laughs> oh, no, no, Dottie, no, not Uncle Mort. It was our great-great-grandfather, the first Prop Morton P. Gildersleeve. Yes, I'm the fourth and last. Oh, you're the end of the line. <laughs> well, I want all of you to know that I'm just eager to help you get ready or drive you to the station because Mama said we should do everything we can to see that you folks leave town without any trouble. Yes, <laughs> Say, how did you and your Mama happen to know all about this? We just got the telegram a few moments ago ourselves. Oh, well, it was simple. They delivered it over to our house first by mistake, and so naturally we opened it by mistake, too. Yeah, yeah, so you did, huh? Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gillespie, but here's another telegram just come for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, oh, my dear, I wonder who this could be from. From the telegram company. I know that. Why, George, it is from the telegram company. What does it say, Uncle Moore? Uh, error in telegram from Richmond Shipbuilding Company. Line reading launching on May 12th. Should read May 2nd instead. May 2nd? Why, that's next Saturday. And this is Wednesday. We've got to leave here today. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad Wednesdays. <laughs> All right, children, I've got tickets on tonight's train. Let's hurry and pack. Oh, huh? Uncle Mort, how did you ever manage to get reservations so late? Really very simple, my dear. I have a friend who is related by marriage to a cousin of a young lady who went to school with the ticket agent's daughter. Oh, I see. Is that how you got them? No, the two girls aren't speaking to each other. <laughs> so I just stood in line like everybody else, and I didn't have a bit of trouble. <laughs> you to come down and see us off, Daddy. Yes, I, I appreciate your driving our car back to the house for us, my dear. Oh, well, I'm only too glad to. All I hope is that I remember which hand is for the brake and which is the clutch. Yes. Oh, but you don't have to worry. I know how to work the gears of my feet all right if I don't have to put it in reverse. Yes. Daddy, are you sure that you know how to drive a car? Oh, positively. I read all about it in a book. A book? Oh, maybe you'd better leave the car here and get someone else to take it home. Oh, now, don't worry. If I get stuck any place, like between two streetcars, I'll just call a tow car. Oh, my goodness. Attention, please. Waste found limited meeting immediately on this track for San Francisco. All aboard. Oh, good gravy. That's us. That's our train. Goodbye, Dottie. Hey, come on, Marjorie. Uh, Hurry up, Leroy. Oh, excuse me. Wait, wait for me. Is Bertie coming along, too? Bertie, what are you doing down here? You forgot this, Mr. Gillespie. Yeah, but, Bertie, I don't need this old vest. Oh, yes, you does. You can't go to the coast without it. Well, why can't I? Because your railroad tickets is in the pocket. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> Look, we got a 
the window, Unc. Is that an Indian? Indian? Where, Leroy? Standing in front of that cigar store. Oh, no, my boy. That was just a wooden statue of an Indian. Which Indian, Unc? A chief named Standing Pat. Who was he? Sitting Bull's brother. <laughs> Now, stop wiping your feet on that lady's dress and let me work on my speech for the christening. Oh, well, I don't mind him at all in the least. Such a sweet child. What's your name and mannequin? Leroy. Oh, Leroy. Do they ever call you Font Leroy? Oh, for corn's sake. <laughs> I think I'll go out on the observatory platform, Monk. Yes, where? Oh, yes, the observatory platform. And be careful and don't lean too far over. That's how we lost Grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my, what a dear boy. Yours? Uh, nephew. And as I look out over this vast sea of faces gathered around her... Uh, pardon me? Oh, excuse me, please. I'm working on my speech. Oh, well, excuse me, uh, Senator. If I don't happen to be a senator, madam, I'm just putting together a little talk for a ceremony that's going to take place on the West Coast. Oh, a wedding. Uh, well, no, but if you must know, it's a christening. You probably read about it in the newspapers. Uh, the naming of the new Gildersleeve. Oh, the new Gildersleeve. Is it a he or a she? It's a her. Oh, well, tell me all about it. Well, uh, we're representing the family, you see. They're going to give her the same name as I have, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Uh, they're going to call her uh, Throckmorton? Oh, yes, yes. It's an old family name. They're going to paint it right on her stern. <laughs> Uh, they are. Oh, yes, yes. I'm, I'm looking forward to the ceremony very eagerly. It's quite colorful. With the bands playing and the whistles blowing and the champagne flowing. Uh, well, now, I, I can't say that I approve of drinking champagne at a serious moment like that. Oh, uh, we wouldn't think of drinking it. We'd just smash the bottle across her nose. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, I, I hope you're joking. Uh, joking? That's the procedure, madam. Sock her with a quart and push her into the bay. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, won't she drown? Uh, oh, of course not. She floats. <laughs> but uh, the little thing is helpless. Uh, helpless? Not that baby. Did you ever see the engines on a Liberty ship? Uh, no. What's that got to do with a tiny infant? I don't know. Who's talking about infants? Why, you were. You were hitting little girls with champagne bottles and then drowning them and calling them throttled. Morton, Madam, I think your brains are playing hooky. Good day. <laughs> What's the matter with that woman? Sad case. Uh, oh, conductor. Yes, sir. I'm still trying to find an empty berth for your nephew and you. Say, I see on my list there's a Lieutenant Copeland who's occupying a drawing room all by himself. Oh. He's right up ahead in this car. Really? Uh, which room's he in? Drawing room D. Oh, that's fine. I'll ask him if we can move in. Uh, G... F E uh here we are D uh, maybe he isn't home. I better try the door to make sure. Ah! Oh, excuse me. Of oh, all the stupid train officials I ever ran into, this fellow. <laughs> now see here, conductor. Yeah. Why didn't you tell me that Lieutenant Copeland is the nurse in the medical corps? <laughs> Suffering swordfish. Eight o'clock in the morning, and I haven't had a wink of sleep all night. Come on, Leroy, wake up. Mm-hmm. Wake up, Leroy. Mm-hmm. Oh, good morning, Fomoy. Yeah? Did you have a nice rest? Young man, how could I rest squeezing an upper berth with you? Oh, gee, why not? Because you played baseball all night. <laughs> baseball? Yeah, all you do is pitch and toss and knock the covers off. <laughs> Oh, I, I didn't mean to, Unc. Yeah, all right, my boy. I know you didn't mean to. Now, let's get dressed, huh? Oh, great jumping jeeps. What's wrong? Look, our clothes fell out of the little green hammock. Yeah. They're spread all over the place. Oh, lift, uh, lift up your foot, Unc. Uh, my foot? All yeah. right, why? You were wearing your hat as a slipper. <laughs> Where'll I put it? Uh, let me see. I don't see any place to hang it. Uh, better hang it on my head. You see my shoes any place, my boy? No. Have you looked under your pillow? <laughs> Why, George, that's where they were. And I thought the mattress was lumpy. <laughs> I better put my trousers on first, huh? What's the trouble? The legs in these pants seem to have shrunk overnight. Oh, that's your coat. Well, what? <laughs> By Jupiter, the next time you and I sleep together in an upper berth, Leroy, we're going to do it in relays. Come on, we can finish dressing in the washroom. I'll get down first, and then you... Oh! <laughs> Did you accidentally bump your head, Unc? Oh, no, Leroy. I deliberately tried to push it through the roof so I could get a breath of fresh air. 
Uh, Porter! Yes, sir? Uh, will you bring your step ladder and put it here? It's right here, Bob. Oh, that's fine. Well, here I come. Oh. Uh, Leroy! Yes, sir? You better jump. I'll be down in a minute, Uncle. All right, bring the toothbrushes. Uh, well, Porter, where am I? Well, you're just out of Clinton, Iowa, and I'm just out of ladder. <laughs> Clinton, Iowa, yes. Are you sure? Yes, sir. We're just crossing the Mississippi River. And now about that ladder. Oh, Leroy, look, there's the Mississippi. Jeepers, what a mess of water. Yeah. Say, from now on, we ought to see a load of Indians, huh? Yeah, possibly, my boy, possibly. Now, come on, let's get washed up. Yeah, my ladder's washed up, Sean. Sure up. <laughs> What's he mumbling about? As soon as we pull into Clinton, we'll get Marjorie and take a nice brisk walk on the platform so we'll have an appetite for breakfast. I've got a swell appetite already. Yeah. Not so much noise, young man. What did you say, Unc? I said not so much noise. Okay. Yeah. Not to make uncouth noise. No, 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 sir. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Porter. Yes, sir. Come on, Leroy. I'll shave later. Oh, look. There's Marjorie. Marjorie. Oh, good morning, Uncle. Have a good night's rest? Leroy did. He slept like a log and rolled like one, too. <laughs> Come on, family. Let's stretch our legs, huh? Okay. Ah, uh, Clinton, Iowa. <coughs> oh, well, just two more days and we'll be in sunny California. Gee, Uncle, here's another train. That's the eastbound limited, my boy. Same as the one we're on, only going the other way. We'll ride on that on the way back. Yeah, I wonder if I have time to get some postage stamps. I think so, if we hurry. Oh, good Lord. Oh, I was wrong. Come on, children. Hop on quick. Here. I can't understand this. We were supposed to stop here ten minutes. Oh, well, the engineer's probably in a hurry to get home. Let's go into the diner. I'm awfully hungry. Yeah, yeah me too. That's an idea. Ah, good morning. Table for three. Right this way, please. Say, Uncle Mort, do you mind if I ask you a silly question? You better wait till I've had my breakfast. What is it? Does the Mississippi River run on both sides of Clinton, Iowa? Uh, why, of course not, my boy. What makes you think so? Well, just look out that window. There's Old Man River again. It, but that's impossible. But it's there, just the same. Well, I see it. But still, it can't be unless... Oh, Stuart! Uh, yes, sir? What train is this? The Eastbound Limited. Oh, my goodness, we're headed right back home again. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve again in just a moment. But first, a good word for all you thrifty women who are looking for a really economical main dish. The product called Kraft Dinner is just what you're searching for. At a very low price, it gives you delicious macaroni and cheese, enough for four. And with Kraft Dinner, you cook that macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes. You see, in every package of thrifty Kraft Dinner, there's a quick cooking macaroni and some Kraft grated that lets you add the cheese goodness with no extra work at all. Doesn't that give you a bright idea for luncheon on busy days and for dinners when you've shopped later, been detained by your own special wartime job? Now, the nice part of it is the whole family will love macaroni and cheese made the seven-minute Kraft Dinner way. So get some Kraft Dinner packages at your food dealers tomorrow. You'll be surprised to find how economical it is. And you'll be smart to stock the pantry shelf with plenty of Kraft Dinner. And now let's return to our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's making a long-distance telephone call to Summerfield from an airport somewhere in Illinois. If, if, hello, hello, uh, Bertie, are you there? No, sir, i Where's you, Miss Gildersleeve? I'm in Illinois, Bertie. We're flying to the coast. Flying and talking in the telephone at the same time? Mm-hmm. Well, let's think of next. No, Bertie, we're not flying now. We're about to take off. Take off what? It's... Never mind what. We've lost our baggage and we need some new clothes. Well, why did you take off the others? Uh, we didn't. We got off the train, but we forgot to take off our clothes. I was, uh, yes. And now we're ready to take off in an airplane. And, oh, good grief, Bertie, it's too complicated to explain at $3 a minute. Is everything all right at home? Oh, yes, it's just fine, except for your car. It, don't tell me Dottie's wrecked it. Oh, no, she didn't even move it. Oh, uh, then it's still at the station? Yes, but not at the railroad station. It's at the police station. <laughs> It, but why? The police don't think it's safe to drive. Why not? Well, how are you going to drive a car with the windshield all covered with stickers? It, my windshield was not covered with stickers. It is now. Traffic summonses. It, There's no parking garage. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Are the police angry? Oh, no. It's the fire department that's perturbed. 
Well, why are they mad? Uh, they couldn't find the fire plug until after the fire engine burned down. Oh, what's that got to do with my automobile? Oh, your car was hot in the plug. Oh, then why didn't Dottie drive it away in the first place? She just couldn't get it started. Why not? Because you took the keys along with you. Oh, now I see it all. Hurry up, Uncle Moore. All right. Hey, goodbye, Bertie. Goodbye. Just keep on having a nice time. Yeah. Gee, aren't this plane ride a super? Where are we now? I'm not sure, Leroy. We're either in South Dakota or else Colorado, or perhaps we're deep over the heart of Texas. Uh-oh, we're going to sit down. Leroy, we're already sitting down. No, that's an aeronautical expression, Uncle Mort, huh? meaning the plane is going to make a landing. Oh, it is? Well, I must remember that. Oh, that steward is. Yes, Mr. Gildas? I see that the plane is getting ready to take a seat. No, no, I'm sitting down. Oh, yeah, that's it. I got my aeronautical terms twisted. <laughs> when are we going to be seated, stewardess? We're making a landing near Blackfoot, Wyoming. Oh. Uh, oh, incidentally, Mr. Gildersleeve, you're going to be all right now, so you can let go of my hand. What? Oh. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Unfasten your safety belt. Unfasten your safety belt. I hope we aren't stranded again. We don't get to San Francisco by tomorrow morning. That ship's name won't be Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, and neither will mine. Come on, Uncle. We've landed. Let's get oh. out. Yeah, all right. I'm coming. Be careful. Now. Don't step on that land there. Uh, Marjorie, do you know why the plane had to squat down? Squat down? Yeah, sure. That's an aeronautical term. Well, I understand there's a group of flyers from the ferry command who have to travel in a hurry. Oh. So we're giving up our seats to them. Oh, well, I don't mind doing that, but when do we get another plane? Tomorrow morning. It, but we've got to be in California tomorrow morning. But how can we get there? Well, maybe if we could... If, Leroy, what's wrong with you, my boy? Gee, I haven't seen a single Indian. I don't want Indians. <laughs> I'm looking for some fast transportation. Say, there's a young fellow with an old cut-down jalopy. Where? Oh, yes. Come on quickly before any of the other passengers see him. Boy, look at that boat. Huh? Oh, say, mister. Hi, good looking. What's cooking? It... <laughs> Young man, how would you like to earn some money? Oh, you're rolling them down my alley. Just put me hip, cat. Yes. <laughs> Are those aeronautical terms too, Leroy? No, Unc, that's jive. He it... means that he's interested. Oh, good. Well, I'll have to go back to school again, I guess. <laughs> Young man, it, it, we want to get to the nearest city in the worst way which probably means traveling in that Blitzkrieg buggy of yours. Okay, fatso, just whistle your proposition. <laughs> whistle my what? Uh, dish out the deal, Uncle Dudley. Make him an offer, Uncle. Oh, make him an offer, yes. Uh, I'll give you $15 if you'll take us as far as Cheyenne. We should be able to get a train from there. Okay, Pappy. Climb in and I'll make with a motor. <laughs> we can. Oh, yeah, careful. Uh, uh, you comfortable, Marjorie? Mm -hmm. How about you, Leroy? Uncle Uncle, Unc. Huh? Oh, well, do go local, then. <laughs> uh, let's go, Mr. Um... Uh, my folks named me Chief Rain in the Face, but that's too corny. Just call me Drizzle Puss. <laughs> Gee, Unc, at last, I've met an Indian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, my goodness, now I know how a malted milk feels. Gosh, kids, I'm sorry my Jeep won't jive no more. It, what's the trouble, Driz? It can't this motorized churn take it? It just can't take you, puffy pants. <laughs> now, you've dragged the back seat so low it needs a wheel in the middle. Oh. Well, cheer up, Uncle Mort. At least he's delivered us near a railroad station. Yeah. Station? Why, that's just a water tank, Mort. Uh, yeah, and there's a westbound train watering up. Oh, what are we waiting for? Let's get out of this galvanized gaboon. Hey, uh, Jelly Pot, what about the old day? Uh, uh, the, uh, oh, I almost forgot. Well, here you are, Driz Puss. Uh, uh, five, ten, uh, fifteen uh, simoleons. Hey, wait for us. Uh, goodbye, Drip Pan. Uh, give us a rumble any time you make Summerfield. Hurry, Uncle. Yeah, I'm coming, my dear. Uh, thank goodness I made it. Are you two all right? Yeah. Let's get inside and find the conductor. I hope I have enough money to pay for our tickets. Oh, there he comes right now. Well, hello there, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hello, kids. Huh? Who have you fell folks been keeping yourself since Clinton, Iowa? Well, what do you know? We're back on the same old train. <laughs> I don't know, Leroy. Now, 
Please don't ask me any more questions. I'm rehearsing my speech for the launching today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I gaze out over this vast sea of faces... Gee, look, is that the ocean, Uncle? Uh, no, San Francisco Bay. As I look out over the vast sea of San Francisco Bay, uh, I recall the thrilling words of Captain Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, the first, when he said... Oh, boy, is that an orange tree? When he said, oh, boy, is that an orange tree? <laughs> no. But when he said, uh, millions for defense, but not one cent for tribute. And so I say to you... When do we get into Oakland? Yeah, when do we get into... Uh, <laughs> Leroy, I'm trying to concentrate. Oh, here's your sister. She can answer your questions. Hello, Alphamore. When do we get into Oakland? Yeah, what's the use? You better ask the porter, Marjorie. Oh, all right. Oh, George! Uh, Marjorie, never call a porter George. That's the sign of an inexperienced traveler. Watch me. Uh, porter? Yes, yeah, no. Uh, What's your name, Porter? It's George, sir. It is George. <laughs> George, how soon do we arrive in Oakland? Oh, we'll be at the 16th Street Station in 15 minutes, sir. Oh, what time is it now? It's uh, 10 after 10. Oh, jumping jelly beans. We arrive at 10.25. The launching takes place at 10.45. That only gives us 20 minutes to get over from Oakland over to the Richmond shipyards, uh, wherever they are. Do you think we can make it, Porter? You mean to the Richmond shipyards in Richmond? Yes, of course. Well, maybe, but it's an awfully funny thing. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, what's so funny? You remember that last station we just stopped at? Why, of course. Man, that was Richmond. <laughs> <laughs> Why did I ever make it? Uncle Mort, can't the driver go any faster? He probably could, my dear, but there's a company rule that he's got to stay with his taxi cab. <laughs> uh, how much farther, cabbie? Just a matter of minutes, folks. Take it easy. Why don't you turn on the radio? If, because there isn't enough room in here to dance. <laughs> turn on the radio, indeed. Gee, I'm hungry, Unc. What are we going to eat? It's right after the ceremony, my boy. They always have a beautiful big luncheon party for the launching party. <laughs> Oh, you know, I'm so nervous, I hope I don't miss the bottle with the boat. Huh? I mean, the box with the bottle. Well, I... I mean... Oh, now, now, relax, Marjorie. Look at me. I'm going to deliver a 20-minute oration. And I'm just as clam as a calm. Uh... <laughs> uh, just remember the motto of the Gildersleeves, my dear. Uh, uh, uh... What is it, Uncle Moore? In the excitement, I guess I've forgotten the motto. Here, here, here. What's the idea of stopping, driver? To get going, we haven't got any time to lose here. But, mister, we're at the gate of the Richmond shipyard. Oh, oh splendid. Uh, children, we made it with 17 seconds to spare. Mm, jeepers, look at the size of the place. Yeah. Leroy, this is one of the fastest shipbuilding plants in the world. Uh, well, uh, go ahead, driver. What's stopping you? That big gate. Oh, the big gate. <laughs> oh, pardon me, I forgot. Uh, Mr. Guard, it's all right. We're the Gildersleeve party. For the launching, you know. Can I see your invitation, please? Oh, of course, invitation. Uh, where did I leave it? Uh, let me see. Oh, Uncle Moore, don't tell me we have to go clear back to Summerfield for that invitation. <laughs> Take it easy, my dear. I've got it here someplace. Uh, it, uh, can't get in without an invitation. Huh? No, sir. Yeah, I see. Think, Throckmorton, think. Oh, I know, it's in the suitcase. Yes, yeah, it's a nervous I can't seem to... Uh, uh, there we are, it's open. Uh, Leroy, help me dump out these shirts and stuff. Huh? Okay, Uncle. Yes, uh, timetables, magazines, stationery, bedroom slippers, nightshirt. Have you looked in the drawers, Uncle? There aren't any drawers in there. <laughs> oh, I see what you mean. <laughs> yeah, well, here it is, right here. Uh, oh, here you are, sir. Okay. Drive right through, then straight down. Oh, guard, uh, have you seen anything of some people named Gildersleeve? Yes, Mr. Foley. Here they are. Oh, hello there. I'm Tom Foley, the superintendent. Well... Let's hurry. We're late. I'll just stand here on the running board. Straight ahead, driver. Thank you very much. Thank goodness, what happened to your baggage? Have you been in an accident? Uh, no, Brother Foley. We've been in trains, planes, cabs, cars, and wash tubs. But so far, no accidents. <laughs> oh, all right, driver. Go right into that parking place. Uh... Come on, Miss Forrester. We haven't a moment to lose. Up this stairway, you follow us, Mr. Gildersleeve. All right. Gee, I'll take a squint at all the ships. Yes, later, my boy, later. Uh, as I look at this vast sea of faces, I remember the words of the first rock Martin P. Gildersleeve, who said, uh, oh, what did he say? Uh, here are your flowers, Miss Forrester. Oh, they're beautiful. Oh, my goodness, I've forgotten something. I'll have to go back to town. What is it, Mr. Gildersleeve? I didn't get a bottle of champagne. Come back here. It's all set. Oh, that's what Now, let us through, please. Huh? Thank you. Uh -oh. Come on, right here now. Uh, stand side. Give me the bottle of champagne, Lloyd. Uh -oh. Thank you. <laughs> here you are, Miss Forrester. Uh -oh. 
Now, you know what to say, don't you? Yes. All right, just make it snappy. Now, quiet, please. Be quiet. I christen thee Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Oh, thank you. I guess it's my turn now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I look out on this vast sea of faces, I see this. Uh, hey, Bud, what? get down off that platform. We gotta move it. Move it? But my speech. We ain't got time for speeches. We gotta lay the keel for the next Liberty ship. Hurry, pal, there's a war going on. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few minutes. Meanwhile, I want to tell you how to cook one of America's favorite main dishes in seven minutes flat. Yes, you can make fluffy light macaroni with cheese goodness through and through that fast. Get a package of the product called Kraft Dinner. Take the special Kraft Dinner macaroni out of the package and cook it in boiling water not more than seven minutes by the clock. No need to bake or blanch this macaroni. Just drain it and lightly mix in a little butter and milk. Then with the Kraft grated that comes in every Kraft dinner package, you sprinkle in the cheese flavor. Pop that macaroni and cheese into a casserole, onto the table, your main dish is ready. And with Kraft dinner, your delicious macaroni and cheese is one of the most economical main dishes you can find. Doesn't Kraft dinner sound like what you've been looking for? For days when you're rushed to get luncheon or dinner, and to help out the budget, too. Well, get some tomorrow. Every Kraft Dinner package contains the makings for four servings of delicious macaroni and cheese. Better get several packages so that the pantry shelf will be all set for hurry-up meals. Remember the name, Kraft Dinner. Mr. Foley says they're building these liberty ships here in any day. Yes, Leroy. You can't beat American production methods. Why, these new boats are almost assembly jobs. What do you mean? Well, a ship is made up of thousands of items. They come from almost every city and state in our union. Engines from Denver, lifeboats from Kokomo, Indiana, wheels from Seattle, pine from Georgia, switchboards from Connecticut, uh, the manifolds from West Virginia, uh, patch covers from Maine. Every part of our nation is represented here. They're real liberty ships, my boy, built by liberty-loving men, so that liberty shall not perish from this earth. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randall. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This week's program was broadcast from the new NBC studios in San Francisco. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Terry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, a tip for you men folks who love macaroni and cheese. If you hanker for light macaroni with cheese goodness all through and through, better mention Kraft Dinner to the little woman. For with Kraft Dinner, she can make swell macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. 
You see, the Kraft dinner package holds a special kind of macaroni that cooks tender in seven minutes by the clock. And then you sprinkle the cheese goodness all through it with the Kraft grated that also comes in the Kraft dinner box. You're all set, ready to fork in. Sounds swell? It is. Just say to your wife, let's have that quick-made macaroni and cheese. Kraft dinner. Remind her to buy Kraft dinner tomorrow. And now let's join the great Gildersleeve, who's listening in the reception room at one of the Summerfield radio stations, while his friend Judge Hooker is finishing his regular daily talk on the child in the home and what to do about it. I always say the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. So in conclusion, remember all you dear mothers... Oh, hurry up, you old gas bag. (laughs) Remember that as the twig is bent, the tree is inclined. Now he's branching off into forestry. (laughs) Let us not forget that point in molding the little mind. You've certainly got a moldy little mind, (laughs) Judge. And now I see that my time is up. So, until you next gather around your radio... With an axe in your hand. <laughs> this is Judge Horace Hooker inviting you to send in your child problem. And you'll get a childish answer. <laughs> until then, good evening. Yes, maybe now we can get home and have some dinner. Imagine any silly woman listening to... Uh, uh, now you're going to have to excuse I must dash away. <laughs> it was so sweet of you to drop in. Yes, yeah, simply peachy. Come on, Judge. All right, Gilly. Goodbye, girls. Yeah. Goodbye. Goodbye, girls. Sometimes I don't understand women, and this is one of the times. Yes, what do you mean, Throckmorton? Well, how can they listen to advice on raising children from a crabby old goat who hasn't any kids of his own? What's that got to do with it? Just because a hen lays them doesn't mean she's a judge of eggs, does it? I don't know about that. You lay them, too, and you're certainly an egg judge. I know what's troubling you, Gildy. You're just jealous. Uh, Jealous? Me? Of what? Of the popularity I've achieved on the air. Uh... Every time you hear some woman praise my program, you look as green as a pickle and twice as sour. (laughs) I do not. I wouldn't be jealous of you even if you deserved all this silly attention you've been getting. Oh, now I don't deserve what I'm getting. No, and you're not getting what you deserve either. (laughs) Why, I'd bet $100 you wouldn't last a month if people had any other program to tune in on instead of yours. Oh, you would, would you? Are you talking through your hat, or do you mean that, Gildersleeve? Of course I mean it. Okay, put your money where your mouth is. (laughs) What money? You just bet me a hundred bucks I won't stay on the air a month. Now, wait a minute. That isn't what I said at all. Oh, crawling out of it, huh? Backwatering. Backwatering. George, I'm not. I'll go through with it. It's a bet. Okay, shake. No, sir. This is going to be a grudge bet. We'll seal the deal by not shaking hands. And the worst part about the whole bet, Leroy, is that I was so excited I forgot to ask for odds. Is that why you're writing all those letters to station WVU, telling them Judge Hooker should be playing snooker? It, but how else can I win? Why don't you get the station to put you on the air instead of the judge? Well, what could I do, my boy? Well, maybe you could tell jokes. Who? Me? Tell jokes on the radio? What do you think I am, Leroy? A comedian? <laughs> No, but, gee, there must be something you could do. You used to sing, didn't you, Uncle? Yes, in college. In fact, when I was young, I had operatic aspirations. You did? Did they hurt much, Uncle Moore? <laughs> Only the neighbors, my boy. <laughs> Although for a while I thought I was going to be another Caruso. You mean the neighbors wanted to put you on a desert island? Yes. <laughs> No, Leroy, not Robinson Crusoe, Enrico Caruso. He was a very famous tenor. Oh, what stopped you from being a famous tenor, Unc? I was a baritone. <laughs> you know, all this brings back memories of my old singing professor, Senor Tomás Volcón. Oh, a Spaniard? No, Leroy, he was Portuguese from Brazil. I still remember how he would talk to me. Rock Morton, he would say, if only Jew had less fortissimo in the pianissimo, your merendo wouldn't have so much crescendo. <laughs> What did he mean, Uncle? I never found out, but I think it was a Portuguese compliment. 
Uh, yeah, I'm convinced you're still a swell singer, Uncle Mort. You are? Well, when did you hear me sing? <laughs> well, every time you take a bath. Yes. Why, yesterday morning, Bertie stopped to listen to you, and she said she never heard anything like it. it... Say, why don't you sing on the air? Oh, Leroy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Do you really think I could? Sure. Why don't you try the rival radio station to WVU? Uh, you mean KQQQ? Well, I never thought of that. What would I sing? Well, if you want the ladies to listen to you instead of Judge Hooker, you better sing mushy love songs. Well, I I have got a romantic voice. When the boo-boo of the boo-boo. <laughs> I have got a romantic voice, all right. Too bad I haven't got the figure to go with it. <laughs> Say, Uncle Mort. Huh? Why don't you be a mystery man and, and, and wear a mask like the Lone Ranger? Oh, yes, a mask might help. <laughs> <laughs> and there's an evening cape somewhere around the house, too. Yeah, and you could pretend you're a Brazilian, or like your teacher, the senior. It, senor. <laughs> by George, this is beginning to look like a very good idea, my boy. Of course, we'll have to keep it all a secret. Uh, not very dignified of me, you know. Sure. Now, all you need is a different name. Something uh, Portugal and romantical. Uh, Portugal and romantical. Let me see. Uh, how about Ricardo? Ricardo? Yeah. It's not bad at all. Sounds like the name of a cigar. What do you think I'm smoking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does this hat look all right, Leroy? Sure, Uncle. It's a super duper. Yeah. Now, now wrap the cape around you closer so you don't look so spread out. Yeah. <laughs> How's that? That's swell. Now the mask. There. It's warm under here. I hope this doesn't slip down when I hear the high note. Eh, me, 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 me. Well, I guess it's all right. Now, now, don't forget your Brazilian accent, Uncle. Oh, no, my boy. Well, as they say in Portuguese, adeus, rapazinho. Gee, what does that mean? That's goodbye in Brazil. Oh, well, carbolic acid, Unc. <laughs> What's that, Leroy? That's goodbye in any language. <laughs> oh, for corn's sake, Leroy. <laughs> you go back and sit in the car, young man. Hello, KQQQ, the voice of Summerfield. One moment, madam. Hello, KQQQ. Ah, good evening, senorita. Oh. I am demanding to see the manager. Oh, my, my goodness, was this a hold-up? What do you mean? Uh, oh, the mask? Uh, no, senorita. I no hold up you, and don't you hold up me. <laughs> Where is the manager of this radio station? Mr. Newt Bauer is right in there in the studio. Ah, muchas gracias, senorita. Uh, manager Newt Bowser? Yeah? Senor, the time has come. From now on, today is pink letter day for the station KQQQ. And because it was the day Ricardo, the mysterious romantic Brazilian baritone, she's first made the show up to sing. Oh, you're a singer. Sure. I am the best baritone this side the Amazon River. And on the other side, she's no better also. <laughs> well, you'll have to give us an audition someday. Audition? Sure. No time like the president. Please to have a sit down and relax a minute, eh? I will play and sing for you like thank goodness you never heard up till lately. <laughs> Sweet girl of my dreams, hear my song, I implore you. Soul of my soul, hear my guest serenade. Deep. Oh, I can't stand it. It's too beautiful. <laughs> How you like, senor? Terrific, no? Say, that's wonderful. Who are you, anyway? I am not anyway. I am Ricardo. <laughs> The Ed is Nelson of South America. <laughs> Say, what are you doing here in Summerfield? Well, perhaps there is in this city a senorita for whom's my heart she beats put 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 put. Who should be telling? Oh, I see. Romance. I am not saying yes, and I'm not saying uh uh-uh. uh. <laughs> Do you want me on your station? Well, that depends on how much money you want. What I care for money. All I want is to sing every day from five story to six. Well, fine, but that's not such a good time. That's when Judge Hooker talks over WVU, the rival station. What I care for George Hooker. 
You wait and look. Once Ricardo starts singing, no one listen to George. This hooker, she will get the hook. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, tonight it is KQQQ's extreme pleasure to introduce for the first time on the air that sensational Brazilian baritone, the masked mystery of Melody Ricardo. Buenas noches, señores y señoritas. Para mi primera cantiga, y voy a cantar un balado delicado, which is meaning in plain English, ladies and girls, good night. <laughs> Greetings from Ricardo, the singing loafer. For my first song, I will murder you with a lovely ballad, La Rosita. <laughs> Sweet girl of my dreams, hear my song, I implore you. Soul of my soul, hear my gay serenade. I've been two clubs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, girls, did you hear that gorgeous you sing on KQQQ last night? Oh, you mean Ricardo. Oh, yes, he's simply divine. Everybody in town is talking about him, too, babe. Oh, yes, isn't he wonderful? And he's got the most romantic accent. I like it because it's so foreign. He's from Brazil, and I'm just too no Trump. <laughs> hey, have you heard him, Margie? No, no, I was out yesterday. Say, who is this Ricardo? You know, Miss Callahan? Well, I'm one of the owners of the station, but all I can find out is that he sneaks into the studio wearing a wide-brimmed hat down over his eyes and a black cloak up to his chin and a mask across his face. Sounds like a combination of Superman, the Shadow, and Red Rider. <laughs> oh, I mean, he's just that handsomest thing with great big brown eyes and long, long lashes, three no trunks. <laughs> <laughs> and a willowy figure. Oh, I heard he had blonde hair with blue eyes and the most athletic build. Well, Nancy Quinn, <laughs> he isn't really a real Brazilian. She claims he comes from someplace in South America for no trunks. Well, I certainly have to listen. What time is he on? At the same time as Judge Hooker, only from now on, I'm going to listen to Ricardo. Oh, so am I. Oh, me too. I just love to listen to his voice. It's got a quality in it that just makes my scalp tingle five no trump. <laughs> <laughs> my goodness, look at these cars. How did I ever get tricked into being five no trump? Oh, oh my God. God. I love the you, my Rosita. Adios, lovely ladies. I want to thank you for the fan letters, the telephone numbers, and everything. <laughs> Tomorrow, at the same time, I'll be with you again. Oh, how I'll be with you again. A sweet dream. <laughs> Cookies and donuts. Yeah, fan mail, my boy. He's all for Ricardo. Oh, can I have some Uncle Ricardo? Yeah, sh- Leroy, of course you can. Try that chocolate fudge cake, huh? Gee, did you see the card with it? Where? Uh, just to show you what a little oven can do little... from Miss Rosita Callahan. Little oven. Now, that old maid. <laughs> Say, she and her brother own that row of stores we've been trying to buy. Gosh, maybe now you can get it for a song, huh? No, Leroy. She wouldn't like it if she learned the truth. Oh, Mr. Gillespie, you've got visitors. Oh, uh, who is it, Bertie? There's a gentleman and also Judge Hooker. Yeah, I'll be right there. <laughs> uh, hide the pastry, my boy. Okay, I got a swell place to hide it, Unc. Here's where I collect a hundred bucks from Judge Hooker. Oh, hello, Judge. How's Mother's little helper these days? <laughs> I understand that since KQQ has had this wonderful new singer, you're getting about as much attention as father gets on Mother's Day. Gildy, we came to talk to you about that fella. Oh, you know Pat Callahan, don't you? Oh, hello, yes. Hello, hello, hello. We've had an important real estate deal pending you know, for a long time, haven't we, Callahan? Well, that can wait, Gildersleeve. We represent a group of substantial citizens who are fed up with this singer, Ricardo. Yes, we just like his effect on our women folks. All they do is listen to Ricardo and talk about Ricardo and dream about Ricardo. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. 
Man comes home from work tired and hungry. What does he get? Ricardo. Is that, uh, is that bad? <laughs> Terrible. Look at my sister. Just because her name's Rosita and this bum of a baritone sings a theme song called Rosita, she thinks he's warbling to her. As a result, what happens? I catch her baking cakes for this guy with sugar she got with my ration book. <laughs> But uh, ha- why have you boys come to me? Well, you haven't any women folk who'd put you in the doghouse if they found out what you'd done. Why don't you get Judge Hooker to do something? Oh, I'm in a peculiar position. Everybody would think I was jealous. Yes, and everybody would be right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm through horsing around, Gildersleeve. Do you still want to buy that property at your own price? Why, of course. Then first you've got to see that this wandering minstrel starts wandering again. Understand? Yes, I'm afraid so, but I really hate to do it. Why, Gildersleeve? Well, if I succeed in removing this wonderful artist with a golden voice from the radio, Good music in this country is going to be set back another ten years. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, let's consider that chicken or roast you had left over from dinner today. Not quite enough for dinner tomorrow? Well, let me tell you how to stretch and glamorize what is left into a thrifty main dish. Cream the leftover meat and serve it in a delicious ring of macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese that you cook in just seven minutes. You do it with a product called Kraft Dinner. In every box of Kraft Dinner, there's a special quick-cooking macaroni. Also, some Kraft grated that puts the cheese flavor through and through in a jiffy. Just seven minutes at the stove, and you have fluffy, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. For a smart macaroni ring, press the macaroni and cheese into a ring mold. Let it stand for a few minutes... Unmold on a platter and pour your cream meat into the center. A very exciting-looking, thrifty dish. Kraft Dinner itself costs very little, so stock up tomorrow on several packages of Kraft Dinner. And now back to Uncle Mort, who by now is about half dead from leading a double life. As Ricardo, the Romeo from Rio, he's got the wives of Summerfield throwing rocks at their husbands. And as Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, he's promised to run Ricardo out of town. But at the moment, Ricardo is still going to town. Deep in my heart, I will always adore you. I love but you, my Rosita. For and so once more, Ricardo, she's saying adios, caras lindas, which means in the language of my country, bye-bye, all you sweet ladies. My art and me, we stop beating each other till we meet again. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. I'm telling you, Ricardo, that program was absolutely top. It's tops? Oh, yes. Tops is yo-yos, what has been grounded. Yes. <laughs> Oh, it was wonderful. Uh, All the telephone lines are simply flooded with messages for you. Just messages? No more cookies? <laughs> oh, yes, lots of them, too. Uh, wait a minute, Ricky. Before you sneak out the back way again, I'd like to talk business with you. No, Mr. Newsbuzzer. Music and business is don't mix. So I am keeping the music and giving you the business. <laughs> no, hold on. Don't go. Huh? I'm not going to keep asking you to reveal your identity or even take off that mask. But I'm in a spot, and I need your help to get off it. Sorry, but Ricardo is not spot remover. No. <laughs> well, this is serious. One of our biggest stockholders phoned up and said that if I didn't arrange a meeting between the masked baritone and her, she'd fire me. Oh, what a gory trick. Uh, she's waiting to see you, Ricky. You'll go out and meet her, won't you? To save my job. Well, okay. But only because that's an awful dory trick on you. Oh, swell. Uh, the lady's name is Rosita Callahan. Rosita Callahan? <laughs> oh, that's an awful dory trick on me. Oh, yes? I am supposing to be having a disappointment with Senorita Rosita Callahan. <laughs> Are you him? Oh, yes. And you, oh, Ricardo. I recognize you immediately by your mask. Uh, oh, come in, come in. Well, what are you afraid of? We're all alone. That's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> oh, well, don't just stand there. Come in. Yeah, thank you. Oh, I've got a lovely dinner just for the two of us. 
I prepared it all with my own little hands. I'm very sorry, but I never eat such big dinners. Oh. <laughs> now, now, uh, won't you take off your hat and your cape and uh, your mask? Oh, no. We have such nice visitation, and I got to leave. As Shakespeare, he say, parting is such sweet sorrow. Goodbye, maybe I see you the day after tomorrow. <laughs> Don't leave so soon. But I got to go. It's not safe in this city. All the men are jealous. They are gunning for me with a rope. Uh, a rope? Certamente. They tell me if I'm not left Somerville by noon tomorrow, they'll all take me out to Lynch. <laughs> these men. The men are your brother, George Hooker, and lots of jealous fellows. Well, the women of this town will have something to say about that. Yeah. Oh, Regina, I came out early. Oh, oh my goodness. Well, that's my brother. He mustn't find you here. Lady Jo, I'm saying house for Oh, great. Now, uh, hide someplace. Uh, get under the sofa. Sofa? Madam, I am a singer, not a midget. <laughs> Which way is the back door? Out through the dining room. In a hurry. I'll try to divert his attention. Yeah. Uh, goodbye, Senorita. If I never see you some more, the pleasure is all mine. <laughs> Bertie, must you sing that song? Well, it ain't compulsory, Mr. Gilsey, but it's mighty pretty. That's the song that Ricardo boy used to sing. Oh, yes, Ricardo boy, huh? Uh-huh. He might have been a foreigner, but he sure had a nice domesticated voice. Any news in the paper? Uh, let's see. Uh, Brazilian baritone missing. Failed to appear on schedule program last evening. Foul play feared. Women storm City Hall. Police Chief Ken Dolan orders dragnet. Well, then he sure is a goner. Any time they orders a dragnet drug, that means the worst has already happened. Now, now, Bertie, don't let this thing upset you. After all, a man was just a gypsy who probably tired of Summerfield and merely rolled up his tent and stole away. <laughs> Well, he stole my pop away, too. Well, if you excuse me, I'll just finish my dusting later. Oh, my goodness, Bertie, too. Well, maybe I shouldn't have... Uh, do you mind seeing who that is, my boy? Where's your big fat? Oh, hello, Gildersleeve. <laughs> hey, congratulations. That was a swell job you did. The job? What do you mean? Getting rid of that soft soap artist who made all of the ladies neglect my nice educational program. Uh, hey, did you hear? I'm going back on the air. Yeah, I still collect on that bet, though. Okay. Well, I don't mind paying at all. I'll send you a check in the morning. Well, you better not forget. Or Ricardo might forget to stay away. How did you manage it, Gildy? No, no, no. Don't don't tell me. That'd make me an accessory. Yeah. Uh, Leroy! I'm getting Okay. Brock Morton, P. Gildersleeve live here. Well, of course he does. If you don't use your eyes, officer, you feel by the man. Oh, look who's with him. Judge Hooker. The one poor Ricardo told me had threatened him. What's that? They will proceed to Callahan. <laughs> oh, hello, Miss Callahan. Uh, to what do we owe the pleasure of this visit to us? Oh, don't you dare speak to me. I finally wormed the truth out of my brother. Oh, my goodness, you did? Yes. He told me how you threatened and intimidated my dear little Ricardo and probably did away with him, too. Officer, arrest that man for the murder of my fiancé, Ricardo. Yeah, now, just a second, Miss Callahan. We haven't any evidence. Yes, don't you go around accusing a man of being your fiancé unless you can back it up. <laughs> Quiet, you. <laughs> We're investigating the disappearance of that singer from KQQQ. Did you do it? Me? Why, I never even heard him sing over at KQQQQ. Have, have I, Leroy? Oh, no, you never heard him on the radio, huh? Yeah. Well, if that's true, lady, he hasn't got no motive for bumping the guy off. I tell you, my brother confessed the whole thing. It was a plot to keep me and my darling Ricardo apart. And Judge Hooker... Excuse me, I'm busy with an important case. So am I, Judge. Come on back here. Jim, one moment. You quit giving orders to my guest, officer. I know a little bit about law myself. If you haven't any evidence that a crime was committed, you can't come in barging in here bothering us. Guilty or right? Yeah, now drag those big flat feet of yours out of here. <laughs> and take Rosita with you. I'm telling them, on. Uh, come on, Miss Callahan, he's right. Hey, Kelly, how are you doing? Oh, that's my partner. Never mind coming in, Wally. We can't pin nothing on this guy. Oh, no? Well, look what I found out in this guy's garage, in the trunk of his car. <gasps> oh, it's Ricardo's cape and mask and hat. It's what? Okay, Gildersleeve. What did you do with the body? <laughs> you won't talk, huh? Why don't you tell him, Uncle? You quiet, young man. All right. 
We're dragging you and the kid down to headquarters. We got why you to making you guys talk. Come on. Yeah, this is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> It's almost supper time. They'll keep us here all night if you don't tell them the truth. If I ever told the truth, young man, I'd be the laughing stock of Summerfield. Besides, I'd never collect that hundred bucks from Judge Hooker. Yeah, but if you don't confess, they're going to hang you for bumping yourself off. They can't. <laughs> they can't do that. They haven't even got a dead body. They will have after they hang you. <laughs> if, shh, shh, here come the police back again. I don't know what's with this guy. Let's see what we can get out of him by throwing a scare into him. Huh? Yeah, sure, Terry. Okay, Gildersleeve, we're going to give you a little third degree. Teddy, you got the rubber hoses? Yeah, right here, Wally. Rubber hoses? Oh, great jumping, Jeeps. <laughs> All right, let's commence. Sure. Only suppose he starts yelling. Uh, we don't want any kickback. Turn on the radio real loud so nobody will hear us. Yeah, okay. You guys cut that out. Leave my uncle Mort alone. He never hurt anybody in his life. Don't you dare touch him. Hear my song, I implore you. All of my soul. Hey, wait a minute. That's him. That's the guy on the radio. Turn it off. Yeah, okay. Say, what's going on around here? I'll tell you what's going on. There'll be a suit for false arrest going on here if you don't let my nephew and me out of here right now. But I don't get it. You heard that fellow Ricardo singing on the radio just now, didn't you? Oh, yeah, but... He... Then how, you, how dare you hold me for his disappearance? Now open that door. Well, well sure, sure. Uh, no hard feelings, is there, Mr. Gildersleeve? No, none at all. But never do that to me again. <laughs> Come on, Leroy. Gee, I don't get it. I don't get it either, anymore. How can you be here with me and still sing from KQQQ at the same time? Shh, Leroy, let's hurry out of here before these policemen find out that they were listening to an electrical transcription. <laughs> Frankly, Marjorie, uh, what did you think of this, Ricardo? Oh, Uncle Mort, I thought you were just wonderful. Uh, so you knew it was me all along? But, but how did you know? That evening cake you were wearing all around town happened to be mine. What? Uh, good night. <laughs> <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Ever wonder about how to cut down the food budget these days? Well, most homemakers do, so here's a hint. You can economize and please your family, too, by serving them parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You'll find parquet margarine is a mighty good-tasting spread on bread or toast or rolls. Yes, and parquet is so economical, you can use all you want in cooking, too, to add that delicate extra flavor that only a delicious spread for bread can give. So get a pound or two of economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Remember, it's nourishing and wholesome, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, tomorrow, sure, ask for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, one of Kraft's fine foods. This program has come to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson.
We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, a tip for you men folks who love macaroni and cheese. If you hanker for light macaroni with cheese goodness all through and through, better mention Kraft Dinner to the little woman. For with Kraft Dinner, she can make swell macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, the Kraft Dinner package holds a special kind of macaroni that cooks tender in seven minutes by the clock. And then you sprinkle the cheese goodness all through it with the Kraft grated that also comes in the Kraft Dinner box. You're all set, ready to fork in. Sound swell? It is. Just say to your wife, let's have that quick-made macaroni and cheese. Kraft Dinner. Remind her to buy Kraft Dinner tomorrow. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's just arrived home in great humor. For the local paper contains a big write-up and picture of our hero. The latest in a series they've been running entitled, Men Who Have Pushed Summerfield Ahead. Number 89, Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Go ahead, read on, Marjorie. Mr. Gildersleeve gained his college education at Princeton, where he was a member of the class of 14. He was one of Princeton's star athletes and musicians, and was selected by his classmates as student most likely to weigh 200 pounds in 10 years. <laughs> oh, yes, dear old Princeton. Incidentally, Marjorie, do you like the picture of me the newspaper printed? Oh, yes, Uncle. You look positively handsome. Handsome? Oh, no. <laughs> If, what do you think of it, Bertie? Just like one of them movie stars, only you got a pretty mustache and he ain't. Oh, is that so? Hey, which star do you mean, Ronald Coleman? No. No? Are you positive? Well, definitely. Oh. Tyrone Power? No. Uh, Clark Gable? Uh, Frederick March? Uh, Robert Taylor? No. Mm-mm. Um, Cary Grant? Victor Mature? That's it. No, I remember. Uh, who? Victor Mature? No, sir. Costello of Abbott and Costello. <laughs> He only had a mustache like yours. Yeah, excuse me, I'll get it. Costello of Abbott and Costello. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Is this my old palsy Wellsy Gildy? Uh, this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Who's speaking, please? Now, brace yourself for a surprise. It's Brownie. It's Brownie? I don't know any brownies. Which brown are you? Your old pal, Bob Brown, who went to college with you. I just arrived in town for a few days. I thought I'd give you a ring. Well, that was mighty nice of you. If Bob Brown is. I still don't remember him. Well, uh, we'll have to get together is, is, is sometime. You bet you my life, old Keith. Uh, how about you coming right downtown and having dinner with me? Oh, I couldn't do that tonight, but uh, hold the line a minute, will you? If, old Bertie, it, would it be all right for me to invite a guest out for dinner? Yes, sir. The roast is a stretch. Are you sure that we have enough of everything now? Oh, indubitably. Only maybe you better ask him to bring his own sugar. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, Brown. Uh, say, I've got an idea. Why don't you come out and have dinner with us? Oh, no, I wouldn't dream of troubling you folks. Oh, that's quite all right. The roast will stretch. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, come on out. We're at 747 Parkside Avenue. Uh, 747 Parkside. I'll be there, kiddo. By Jiminy, I can hardly wait to see you again, Frocky old Socky. Uh, uh, goodbye. If Brown. If Bob Brown. I better get out the good linen. Incidentally, Miss Marge, is we them tassin and finger bowling tonight? <laughs> oh, yes, Bertie. <laughs> oh, Leroy, go comb your hair. We're having a guest for dinner. Jeepers, every time we have somebody for dinner, I gotta comb my hair. Who is it, Uncle Moore? Well, I can't quite remember, my boy. There were two Bobby Browns in my class at Princeton, and I don't know which one this is. Gee, when you were at Princeton, I bet you were the big noise around the campus, Unc. Uh, no, my boy. I didn't go out for cheerleader. He was more of the athletic type. Yeah. He was? What did you start in, Unc? Football? Uh, no, my boy. I was associated with the water polo team. Gee, how do you play that? Well, uh, water polo is a sort of a soggy version of soccer. <laughs> the team whose pole motor breaks down first is declared the loser. <laughs> And what position did you play, Unc? Well, I had a very important position. I was the assistant business manager. <laughs> it's all oh, great jumping jeeps. That must be him already. Uh, I'll answer it. Where did he phone from? The corner drugstore? 
Well, Gildy, you old coot, how's the kid? Oh, he's a... Oh, you mean me. Well, I'm just Brown Dandy. I mean, I'm Dandy Brown. <laughs> Come on in, won't you? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, hey, Cabby, just throw my luggage up on the porch. <laughs> well, Trocky, it's great to see you. Uh, uh, you, you, you. Yes, isn't it? Oh, you old rascal. You know you haven't changed a ton. I haven't? No, no, sir. <laughs> no, sir, Bob. Uh, some of your pompadours slipped down to your lower lip and some of your chest has slipped down to your belt, but I'd still know you anywhere. Uh, I wish I could say the same about you, Brownie, old fellow. Uh, come on in and meet the family. Uh, this is Leroy, my... Well, Leroy, you're certainly the image of your old man, aren't you? <laughs> Leroy happens to be my nephew. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> and uh, this is Marjorie. Hello. How do you do, Mr. Brown? Oh, reprobate. Congratulations. What a beautiful young wife. <laughs> Marjorie is my niece. Uh, your niece? Oh, yes, of course. Well, I, I was just kidding. Don't mind me, folks. Uh, dinner, sir. Oh, yes. And Mrs. Burke. Yeah, I know. You're made. Absolutely correct. Have a cigar, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Your Unky was one of our star athletes. Gee, Mr. Brown, tell us some more things that happened to you and Uncle Mort in college. Yeah, you seem to know so much that Uncle Mort has never even mentioned. Yeah, and so much that never even happened, too. <laughs> well, I'd love to, kiddies, but uh, I'd better get out town and register at one of the uh, <clears throat> hotels. But uh, co couldn't you stay with... Uh, you expect to be here long, Brown? Oh, just a day or two, then off again like a gypsy. Gee, I'd like to travel all the time. Oh, you'd soon get tired of it, my boy. Say, I'd give my eye teeth for a comfy home like this with a big fireplace, a couple of swell kids, and a little guest room in case an old friend should show up. <laughs> Uh, Couldn't uh, we... By the way, Brownie, uh, do you ever run into Eddie Maxwell or Bill Simmons or Clarence Benzer? No, can't say that I have, but I uh, saw Paul Green in New York last summer. Oh, good old Paul Green. <laughs> Don't believe I remember him. <laughs> oh, he was one of the boys. Now he's in the game game. The game game? Yes, he makes puzzles. Oh. Now, there's a great guy. You know, he insisted on me coming out to his Long Island place for the weekend. Uh, Uncle Mort, don't you think that we could... Oh, be... yes, Green, I remember him now. A stocky fellow with sort of sleepy eyes. Yeah, that's right. And talking about sleepy eyes, eyes sleepy. <laughs> yes, but uh, now it seems there's nothing to do but toddle along to a lonely room. Gee, Uncle, can't Mr. Brown stay overnight in our guest room? Uh, uh, what? Oh, why, of course, our guest room. I wonder why I didn't think of it myself. <laughs> you will stay, won't you, Mr. Brown? Oh, now, please, Margie, don't call me Mr. Brown. Just call me Uncle Bob. Yeah, Uncle Bob, you mean Uncle Boob. <laughs> no, you know, this is just too grand of you, Gildy. I'll just get my luggage. I think the driver left it on the porch. Oh, no, you just sit there, Uncle Bob. I'll go get it. Uh, now we'll have time for a few more yarns about college, eh, Trocky old socky? Huh? Oh. Oh, yes, of course, Brownie, old clowny. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I think of those ivy-clad walls... Hey, uh, wait a minute. Hold on there, Brown. There was no ivy on the walls at Princeton. No, but... Uh... Uh, when I think of those ivy-clad walls, I can't help remembering the days of the frost rush. Uh, uh, excuse me a moment, won't you? Yes, Leroy, what is it? Would you mind helping me, Unc? What's the trouble? Can't you handle Uncle Bob's luggage by yourself? Jeepers, no. Uncle Bob brought his trunk. What? <laughs> and then a voice from the coop replied, No, sir, there ain't nobody here except us chickens. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, brother, what a memory. <laughs> I'll be right back with a tray full of breakfast, Mr. Brown. <laughs> Mr. Gilsey, your friend show his pleasant company. Yes, pleasant and permanent. He's been here three days already. Bertie, did he give you any hint as to when he's leaving? Well, he did discuss plans for a picnic 4th of July. Now I got to fix him a nice poached egg for his breakfast. Hi, right, George, I'd like to fix him a nice poached Mickey. <laughs> 
Uncle Bob up yet? Uncle Bob, Leroy, Mr. Brown is not your Uncle Bob. I know, but he's such a swell guy. And he hasn't any nephews of his own, so I sort of adopted him. Ugh. Oh, Uncle Bob, is there something I can get for you? That guy gets more service around here than a cop in a kitchen. <laughs> Nobody ever feeds me poached eggs in bed. Oh, good morning, Uncle Mort. Oh, uh, hello, Marjorie. At least you're not going to neglect your uncle, I see. I should say not. How's he feeling this morning? Why, I... Uh, 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 who? <laughs> uncle Bob. Oh, so you've adopted him too, eh? Yes. He hasn't any nieces of his own, you know. That bird hasn't anything of his own but an appetite. <laughs> oh, yes. Isn't it a shame? That's why I've arranged a nice big formal dinner for tonight. Formal dinner? Do you mean I've got to put on soup and fish just to listen to that fish eat his soup? <laughs> Oh, now, Uncle, I've invited Judge Hooker and Rosita Callahan to meet Uncle Bob. You think he's Rosita's type? He wears pants, doesn't he? Oh, uh, What is it, Leroy? Uncle Bob asked me to tell you that he'll be ready to leave right after breakfast. Oh, he will? Splendid. I, I've been waiting for this. Yeah, can you have the car all ready then? Oh, with the doors open and the motor running. Good. He wants you to take him out for a long drive in the country. Uh, I should have known. <laughs> You can stop here, Gildersleeve. Uh, this is Hickory Hills, isn't it? Yes. Uh, during the last war, Camp Hickory was located here. I remember the rifle range was right over there. Hickory was one of the biggest training camps. Well, we've got bigger plans for it this time. Yes, uh, sir, sir, we have? Oh, not you. My associate and I. Hey, you know, Gildy, I haven't discussed my reason for being in Summerfield. Oh, there was a reason. Uh, oh, yes, yes, and it's very confidential. Yes. You see those hills? Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, our mining engineers report that they contain one of the richest deposits of manganese in the country. If manganese? It's not so loud. Yes, you uh, know what it is, of course. Oh, it's a very valuable mineral. It's used to toughen steel. Right. It's in great demand now for war production. You mean someone's finally found something of value in them bare hills? Gildersleeve, leave. There's millions in them there bare hills. This is a million. Uh, Brownie, old pal. <laughs> yes, Gildy. Uh, suppose we were to snoop around and find out who owns this land. Uh, don't you think we could uh, pick it up uh, pretty cheap? No, I'm afraid the owner wants a pretty stiff price, Gildy. Oh, you know who it is. Uh, I'll say I do. Uh, look here, Brownie, little chum. After all, we were schoolmates together at Princeton. Uh, do you mind telling me the owner's name? Uh, not at all, kid. Good. Then who is it? <laughs> it's me. <laughs> <laughs> Girl, Marjorie, hear my voice, I implore you. Oh, hello, Uncle Mort. Uh, hello. My, it's nice to have you so jolly again. You've been awfully grumpy the past few days. Well, that's all changed now, my dear. Oh, <laughs> Uh, now, run along and get into your tuxedo. Uh, the guests are due in half an hour. Oh, the guests, of course. Uh, deep in my heart, I... Well, hello, Leroy, my boy. Are you waiting to see me? Yeah, Unc. I sort of stumbled into something by accident this afternoon, and it's got me worried. It, what is it, my boy? This. I found it up in the attic. Why, that's my old college yearbook. Say, wait till I show this to Bob Brown. He'll get a terrific kick when he reads it. No, Unc. You'll give him a terrific kick when you read it. If... Leroy, why should I kick Uncle Bob? Because he isn't Uncle Bob. He's an impostorator. He's an impostorator? Impersonator? What do you mean? Look, this book's got pictures of your whole class, including the two Bob Browns who graduated with you. Uh, yes? And one of them was bald, so that couldn't be him. I remember now. Baldy Brown. He finally graduated. <laughs> uh, but couldn't uh, Brownie here have been the other one? No, look, the other one was an Indian. This... <laughs> Me... You think he scalped the first one? <laughs> Leroy, why couldn't you found all this out just a few hours earlier? Why, Uncle Mort? Because this humbug just took me out and showed me a reasonable facsimile of a manganese mine. See, he's a fakeroo, probably looking for a sucker. No, my boy, he isn't looking anymore. He just sold me a half interest in his manganese mine. <laughs> Greg Gildersleeve will be back with us again in just a few minutes. But first, a note to all you women who are on the alert for thrifty main dishes. You know that macaroni and cheese is a good one. 
But do you know that you can now make delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time? The magic lies in a product called Kraft Dinner. You see, every box of Kraft Dinner contains a special macaroni that cooks tender in boiling water in just seven minutes. No need to blanch or bake this Kraft Dinner macaroni. You just drain it, add a little butter and milk, and then sprinkle the cheese goodness through and through with the Kraft grated that also comes in every Kraft Dinner box. In a jiffy, you have fluffy, light macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. Dinner will be such a help with the budget, such a help with getting quick meals, you'd better stock the pantry shelf. Remember that tomorrow when you order. For delicious, quick-made macaroni and cheese, ask your food dealer for economical Kraft Dinner. Uncle Mort had to go through with the dinner in honor of his old college chum, Bob Brown. Right now, it's cigars, coffee, and conversation at ten paces in the living room. Yeah, look at him go oh, after my, my cigars. Really, Mr. Gildersleeve, it was the most charming dinner, and I think that Mr. Brown is most charming, too. Oh, yes, Miss Callahan. That fellow could charm a snake out of his skin. <laughs> if present company accepted, of course. Oh, he's led such an adventurous life. I understand that he was once an aviator. You're right. Sort of a fly-by night. <laughs> However, I have hopes that the government's going to step in and ground him for the duration. And then the judge turned to the prisoner and said, yes. You may be deaf now, but you'll get your hearing in the morning! <laughs> oh, for corn's sake. Yeah. Leroy, I don't blame you. I'd like to talk to you in a moment, too. Excuse us, won't you, Miss Callahan? Oh, yes, of course, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah. Yes, Unc, what is it? Leroy, do you want that brown chap to get wise that we suspect him? Gee, no, Unc. Then put away that junior G-man fingerprinting outfit. <laughs> but, but how else can I trap him? Look, I'm going to call in a mining engineer the first thing in the morning. We've got to be sure where we're stepping before we put our foot into it. Well, what do we do now? Well, uh, just keep our eyes open and pretend we're completely ignorant. In the way I let myself get swindled, I won't have to do much pretending either. <laughs> Uncle, here comes Judge Hooker. Yeah, what is that old hippo? Oh, Judge Hooker, how's things? <laughs> Say, Gildersleeve, I must admit that I was completely taken by your friend Brown. Uncle Mort was taken, too. Uh, Leroy, <laughs> uh, go away someplace and pass the after-dinner mints. Okay, Uncle. Maybe I can get some prints that way. Yeah, prints. <laughs> I was just thinking, Gildy, how nice it is to renew old friendships. Yes, very nice indeed. You know, I'd rather have an old friend than a million dollars, wouldn't you? Well, I suppose so. Although there seems to be some rule that you can't have both of them at the same time. <laughs> oh, now, Gildy, you mustn't be so hard-bitten. I can't help it. It's because I've bitten so hard. <laughs> Judge, there's something I better tell you, and quickly... Hey, Mr. Brown just left with Miss Callahan. He's taken her for a ride to the magnesium mine. Manganese mine. Yeah, he's got her interested too. Why, George, I've got to stop him before she does anything rash. Come on, Judge. Maybe you can help. Here, Uncle. Maybe this will help. No, Leroy, I've told you before. I don't want that fingerprint outfit. Slow down, Gildersleeve. There's Rosita's car. Parked up ahead. Huh? I wish I knew what this was all about. Yes. Oh, I hope I'm not too late. You divert Brown's attention, Judge, while I talk to her. Uh -huh. Rosita! Oh, Rosita! Uh, what? Oh, my, Mr. Gildersleeve, even Judge Hooker. Hey, what are you two doing here? Uh, Rosita, I must speak to you alone. Uh, Judge, you take care of Brownie. Oh, Mr. Gildersleeve, this has been the most delightful night. Now, what do you want with little me? Well, ex <laughs> excuse me for asking, Rosita, but why did uh, Bob Brown bring you out here? Well, I, I thought I had an idea, but I was wrong. <laughs> he uh, wanted me to buy a quarter interest in some perfectly wonderful mining property. Oh, my. And, uh, and did you? Well, it was like this. The moon was so beautiful, and he was so persuasive, and yeah. I'm so impulsive, I just couldn't say no. Oh, I never should have introduced you to... Gildersleeve! Yes, what is it, Judge? Gildersleeve, the most wonderful thing has just happened to me. You'll never guess. I bought a quarter interest in a manganese mine. <laughs> Oh, see here, Brown. 
I'm not going to beat around the bush any longer. You're a fraud and a fake, and I know it. Oh, you won't talk, eh? Well, I demand my money back. And right now, too. And if you don't... Excuse me, Mr. Gilsey, but is Mr. Brown in here? Uh, no, Bertie. I'm looking for him myself. Hello. Hello. I was just passing by, and I thought I heard someone paging me. Uh, uh, oh, yes, Brownie. Uh, there's a little matter I'd like to discuss, if you have a minute to spare. Always have a minute for my little bunkie. Uh, what is it, Maud? Uh, well, it's... Uh, excuse us for a moment, will you, Bertie? Yes, Mr. Gilsey. Uh, now, uh, what was it, pal? Well, I, uh, sort of been thinking over that mining deal of ours, Brownie, and, uh, I've come to the conclusion that it wasn't very fair of me to, uh, jip you out of a half interest for only $10,000. <laughs> so I was thinking... Well, if you're not satisfied, Gildy, I'll take the stock back. Sure, I'll give you back your check and a $500 profit. Is $500 profit? In, in cash? Surely. Uh, uh, now? Just as soon as you hand over your stock certificate. Uh, stay right there. Don't move. I'll be back in a flash for the cash. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Bertie. Get out of my way. <laughs> oh, uh, Bertie, you waiting to see me? Yes, sir. I drew all that money out of my building and loan like you done told me, Mr. Brown. Good. I have your stock certificate all ready for you. One thousand shares at fifty cents a share. <laughs> Here you are. Mm -hmm. What a beautiful certificate. And here's the five hundred dollars, Mr. Brown. Take good care of it now. Yes, don't worry. Now, remember, not a word of this to anyone. No. Mr. Gildersleeve would be awfully angry if he found out that I let you in on this, too. <laughs> Don't you worry, sir. My mouth is going to be a closed book. Good. Itch. Here he comes. Hide that certificate. Yes, sir. Yes, all right, Brown. Oh, Bertie, will you please excuse us again? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> oh, you brought your certificates. Good. Now, here's your check back and $500 in cash, old man. Let me have the stock. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, wait a minute, Brownie. Uh, don't rush me into this thing now. But that's what you wanted. Yes, but I if a shrewd operator like you is willing to pay me $500 profit on the deal, uh, there must be something to this little mine after all. But uh, Gildersleeve, we just made a bargain. We didn't shake hands on it. No, sir. You're not going to jip me out of my investment, Brownie. I wasn't born yesterday, you know. <laughs> I'm going to hold on to this stock. <laughs> Good afternoon, Margie, my dear. Uh, any mail or messages or uh, dividend checks for me? Mm, no, no mail, Uncle Mort. But there's been a Mr. Connolly phoning all afternoon. Oh, yes, Bill Connolly. He's the mining engineer I hired to give me a report on the manganese mine. It, what did he say? I don't know. Uncle Bob took the message. Oh, Uncle Bob did? Well, I'll have to go ask him. Oh, oh, wait a minute, I forgot. I've got some good news for you. Good news you have? Yes. You've been so anxious to get rid of Uncle Bob. Well, now he's left. He's left? Uh -huh. but, 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 my dear, I don't want him to go now. Are you sure he's gone for good? Oh, yes. Right after he spoke to Mr. Connolly, he phoned for a taxi, packed, and scooted right out. No, oh, great jumping jeeps. That can mean only one thing, my dear. Hand me the phone, Marjorie. Yes. Yeah. So, thank you very much. I've got to warn Judge Hooker that Brown is a phony. He's a what? I'll explain later. Judge Hooker's resident. Hello. Is Mr. Gil... I mean, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. Is he there? Oh, no, Mr. Gildersleeve. He's gone to the bank. Oh, the bank. Thanks. I'll try him there. But, Uncle Maud, I don't understand. I've been done brown by brown, my dear. He's a crook, a thief, a, a confidence man. Oh, confidence man. He never went to Princeton. Summerfield National Bank, Sheehan speaking. Oh, Mr. Sheehan. Uh, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. Is Judge Hooker there? Judge Hooker? Why, well, he just left. Oh, too bad. Uh, Mr. Sheehan, I want to stop a check that I wrote made out in favor of a Robert Brown. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, but Brown was just in here and cashed that check. <laughs> no, man. Are you sure? Uh, yes, Judge Hooker brought him over and introduced him. He cashed a number of checks. <laughs> Is there any message in case Mr. Brown comes back? If thanks just the same, Mr. Sheehan, but that bird will never come near your cage again. <laughs> You let me know just as soon as this Mr. Connolly, the, the expert, shows up. There may be a remote possibility that there actually is a manganese in those hills. <laughs> yes, Mr. Gilsey, I sure hope so. 
though. Yes. Now, don't take it so hard, Bertie. After all, you didn't lose any money. Yes, I did, too. All my building and loans is gone. Well, what? <laughs> and that Mr. Brown has said your honest face. Why, Bertie, how could you be so gullible? Oh, I guess it just runs in the family, Mr. Gilfleet. Yes. I takes after you. <laughs> Well, I, I'd like to lay my hands on that crook. Now, me, I'd just like to cook for him. <laughs> You'd like to cook for him, Bertie? Yes, sir. I'd just like to cook for him one day, that's all. <laughs> Ellis, are you home? Uh, oh, uh, there's Judge Hooker, uh, bellowing like a hook bull. <laughs> I'm in here, Judge. Come on, Miss Callahan. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, you certainly have fine friends who cheat a poor, innocent girl. Uh, what poor, innocent girl? What's her name? Oh, you. <laughs> well, I'm terribly sorry about the whole thing, Rosita. Well, you'll be a lot sorrier when I file a lawsuit against you. What? Judge Hooker, I'd like to sue him in your court. Can I make an appointment now? In his court? But, Mr. Callahan, Rosita, you know I tried to stop you. I... I'm getting in, Mr. Gill's sleeve. Yeah. Folks, that's probably the mining expert I hired. We might as well hear the sad news. Here's that Mr. Conley you've been waiting for. Oh, yeah. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, Conley, is there any manganese in Hickory Hills? Now, Mr. Gildersleeve, it's a well-known metallurgical fact that the presence of manganese in commercial quantities in this region is a geological impossibility. Does that mean I get my $500 back? No, Bertie, it means that we're all sunk. Very well, Mr. Gildersleeve. You shall hear from my lawyers. Gildersleeve, never speak to me again. Now, wait a minute. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry if I've upset you folks. Uh, by the way, I stumbled across a curious thing up there. It might interest you. You know where the Camp Hickory rifle range used to be during the last war, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's on my property. Well, what about it? Well, the hills in back are just chuck full of bullets. Must be two or 3,000 ton of pure lead just waiting to be dug up. Yes, sir. What? Does that mean we're going to make a profit after all? Uh, sure, Judge. Come on. All we got to do is get the lead out. <laughs> <laughs> Mort, it's wonderful. Not only is this a profitable business venture, but you're reclaiming vital metal for our war production effort. Yes, Marjorie. And here's some more good news. In order to dig those bullets out, we've got to level off those hills, which means they'll make dandy building lots after we've finished. <laughs> and more profit. Gee, aren't you a regular financial gizzard? Yes. <laughs> Leroy, my boy, that's the wrong word. Oh, oh my mistake, Hunk. You're a regular financial blizzard. Just let it go. Let it go. Good night, folks. <laughs> yeah. Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. E-L-L, Procter & Gamble's new Radiant Cream Shampoo in the handy tube. Prowl brings you the life of Riley. 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 Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, let's consider that great American dish, macaroni and cheese. Do your folks like it with the macaroni fluffy, light, and the cheese goodness all through and through? Well, I can tell you how to make it just that way. Cook it in only seven minutes. Get a thrifty box of the product called Kraft Dinner. In the package, you'll find a special quick-cooking macaroni. Also, there's an envelope of Kraft grated that puts cheese goodness on every tender morsel. All in all, you do just seven minutes cooking and get a swell, thrifty main dish. Now, particularly when you're watching the food bills, now when you're especially busy, Kraft Dinner is a big help. 
You'd better get several packages of Kraft dinner and be ready to make delicious macaroni and cheese whenever you're in a hurry. And once again, let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's not a happy man today. No, indeed, this is one of his bad days. Right now, he's telling his niece and nephew, Marjorie and Leroy, and Bertie, their cook, all about it. Yes, and there I was, peacefully driving along, when suddenly I heard a bang, and then a bumpity, bumpity, bump. At first, I hoped it was just the rear end falling out, but no such luck, it was a tire. Well, gee, Uncle Mort, what about the spare? Leroy, that was the spare. Can't you get a new tube anywhere? No, my dear, they they can't sell me one. But I thought when you went to buy a new tube, you could have it just as long as you brought your old one in. (laughs) Bertie, that's for toothpaste, not rubber. Oh, excuse me, I got my gums mixed up. (laughs) (laughs) Never mind, Leroy, I'll stand to the door. Oh, hello, Judge Hooker. Hey, Judge Hooker, what does that sawed-off Solomon want? Hello, Gildy. Hello, kids. Hello, Judge. Hello. Say, Gildersleeve, I saw you down on Center Street this afternoon with that flat tire, and she certainly looked bad. How dare you talk about Rosita Callahan? Oh! <laughs> you mean the flat tire on my car, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it looks like I'll have to learn to drive on three wheels, Judge. Oh, no, you won't. Here, take this. Gee, Unc, what's in the package? Huh? Well, it's... It feels like... Oh, I'm afraid to hope. By George, it's a girdle. Oh, no, it's an inner tube. Oh, judgy wudgy. Hey, keep him off me. Stop trying to kiss me, Gildy. Oh, I'm so happy I could dance. But he's a jolly good fellow. He's good and he's ripe and he's mellow. He's kind underneath his big bellow. And his heart is as big as his head. <laughs> Wahoo! Now, now, Strockmorton, control uh, yourself. Uh-huh. Yes, Uncle. Quit wearing that inner tube around your neck. Uh, oh, let him. It matches the one around his middle. Oh, <laughs> uh, you're a card judge. Say, how can I repay you? Hey, won't you stay for dinner? No, thanks. Hey, can, can I lend you any money, pal? If, how about taking a pound of sugar? No, Gildersleeve. I've been amply repaid just watching the way your big, fat, stupid face lights up. Uh, <laughs> what a sense of humor. <laughs> Hooker, you kill me. Hey, um, before you do anything rash, don't you think you should see if it'll fit your car first? Uh, Leroy, that isn't polite. Remember, you must never look a gift tube in the size. <clears throat> By the way, Judge, it is the right size, isn't it? Of course it is, you big blimp. Yeah, big blimp. <laughs> well, so long, folks. I've got to get back home now. Yes. Bye. 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 Leroy, there goes one of nature's noblemen. That isn't what you said about him yesterday, Uncle. What did I say? You said he was so stingy, he has his bubble gum retreaded. <laughs> Leroy, never repeat malicious gossip. Today we saw a new Judge Hooker. A kind, generous, thoughtful hooker. Yes. Yes. I gotta find some way to reciprocate for this beautiful tube. Well, he's running for re-election. Yeah, that's right. And next month he's going to observe his 20th anniversary as a judge. Say, hey, that'd make good publicity for his campaign. If we could celebrate by giving him a... Now, let me see. We could give him a... Dinner? Yes, we could give him a dinner. No! Uh, wait, why not? That's what we'll do. We'll organize a testimonial dinner and keep it a surprise from him. Yeah, and get him a present, too. You're a bright boy, my boy. Now, what kind of a present should we get Judge Hooker as a reward for sitting on the Superior Court bench for 20 years? I know it's Mr. Gilsley. What, Bertie? A big, soft, fluffy pillow. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Corbett. Uh, Gildersleeve speaking. Uh, we're holding a testimonial dinner for Judge Hooker, and I'm calling to see how many tickets you want. Now, now, Mr. Corbett, he always spoke well of you. Uh, don't you feel you owe the judge something? Uh, how? Why, during the last election campaign, didn't he kiss your baby? And right after that, didn't he come down with the mumps? <laughs> What's that? Oh, your baby got the mumps from him. Oh, excuse me. Goodbye. Say, maybe you shouldn't have brought that up, Uncle Mort. Mr. Corbett controls a lot of votes. Oh, Hooker's going to win in a walk, my dear. And a good thing, too. The little stiff is getting a little stiffer. Hey, Uncle, look, 
I printed all the tickets on my printing press. Oh, fine, my boy. Thank you. Uh, you owe me two dollars for paper. All right, here's one of the tickets. They're worth two dollars. Go out and sell it. <laughs> Jeepers, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. I'm getting you Mrs. Twitchell, Uncle. Oh, uh, thanks, Marjorie. <laughs> there she is. So, hello, Mrs. Twitchell. Uh, this is Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm on the Judge Hooker Testimonial Dinner Committee. You know the judge, don't you? Now, Mrs. Twitchell, he always spoke well of you. Oh, hello, Judge Hooker. Mr. Gilfrey's in the study. How many tickets do you want, Mrs. Twitchell? Uncle Mort, here comes the judge. Uh, oh, my goodness. Hide the tickets. Uh, quickly now. Yeah. Don't let that old baboon see him. Huh? No, no, not you, Mrs. Twitchell. He had a baboon. <laughs> hello, Gildersleeve. Who's a baboon? Uh, me. <laughs> uh, see you later, Mrs. Twitchell. Goodbye. A charming woman, that Mrs. Twitchell, isn't she? Only with snakes. He and her husband are still sore at me because of something that happened in my court years ago. What was that, Judge Hooker? I married them. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what are these tickets doing on the floor? Tickets? Oh, never mind, Hooker. I'll pick them up. Quit <laughs> <laughs> hitting me with that thick skull of yours, Gildy. Did you get them all right, Uncle? Uh, yes, I think so. What's so important about those tickets, Gildersleeve? What are you hiding them for? Uh, who, me? Hiding? Uh, 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 what pockets are you thinking about? The what? The ones you're stuffing in your pocket. Nothing against the law, are they? Oh, no, Judge. Quite the contrary. Yeah, that's right. They're for one of the most contrary... Uncle. Excuse him, Judge Hooker. He's just organized a benefit for a very deserving man. Yes, yeah, so there. Oh, poor fella. Anyone I know guilty? Uh, <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> Well, I'd be glad to buy a couple of tickets. Let's see them. Oh, I don't think they want you to buy any tickets for this, Judge. Oh, I see. I'm not good enough to go, huh? Uh, you just want to invite your Richie friends, is that it? Uh, All right. I know where I'm not wanted. All some people want out of you are your inner tubes. After they got them, they toss you aside like a worn-out casing. Uncle, your face is getting terribly red. Say something before your eyes pop out. Oh! The editor assigned one of the reporters to show us their files on Judge Hooker. Are you going to tell them you want the dope for your speech at the banquet? Oh, no, Lee. We don't want any publicity until it's all over. Shh, here he comes. Mr. Gildersleeve, my name is Duffy. Oh, hello, Mr. Duffy. I brought you our Hooker file. Oh, a whole envelope full of clippings. Suppose we spread them out right here. Huh? Okay. Let's see what we got here. Yeah. Look, huh? here's a picture of the judge when he was first sworn into office. Gee, I never knew he had hair. Yep, of course, my boy. <laughs> you think he was born bald? Well, wasn't he? <laughs> Quit changing the subject. Look at this. That's judge foils jailbreak by conking crook with gavel. Prisoner loses hearing. <laughs> and listen to this one. Taxi company defaults drunk driving suit as Hickey Hackey plays hooky from hooker. Uh, uh, oh, look at here. Here's a picture of him in army uniform. Corporal Hooker returns from guarding Niagara Falls as Spanish-American war ends. <laughs> Say, excuse me, but why all the interest in the judge? Well, uh, you see, Mr. Duffy, he's coming up for re-election, and I've got a little surprise for him, that's all. <laughs> Thanks for showing me these. Come on, Leroy. If we're going to make the judge's office, we'll have to run. Hmm. Run for office, huh? Hey, Toots, give me Mr. Cornell. Uh, boss, this is Duffy. Uh, you know that guy Gildersleeve... Well, after he dug around into Judge Hooker's past, I heard him say he's going to run for the judge's office. Now, look, we're out after Hooker, so what do you say we endorse Gildersleeve? Ah, <laughs> good. I've been gunning for that Hooker ever since he hit my brother over the head with his gavel. What? Just one ticket? No, see here. You're a lawyer, aren't you, Mr. Marks? And you practice in Judge Hooker's court, don't you? And you want to keep on winning cases, don't you? Huh? Well, how many tickets did you say? Six? Oh, well, that's better. Thank you, Mr. Marks. Goodbye. Good afternoon, Uncle Moore. How's the ticket sale going? Oh, splendidly, my dear. Although I'm afraid the speaker's table is going to be terribly unbalanced. Everybody is so eager to be on Judge Hooker's right side. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gilfrey, but the gentleman here to see you, only he ain't. Uh, ain't? What do you mean, Bertie? He ain't no gentleman. He looks tougher than 20 cents worth of gold meat. Oh, <laughs> Bertie. that's just your imagination. Show him in. Yeah. Okay, but when I point to the door, I'm going to have a meat cleaver in my hand. 
I wonder who it can be. Oh, probably some friend of Judge Hooker's. Mr. Beard, man of what? Well, well, well. Hello, Mr. Gillisleeve. Say, some joints you got here. Uh, yes, isn't it? Uh, what can I do for you, Mr. Beer Bucket? Uh, Bach is the name. Oh, yeah. Only my friends call me Beer Barrel for oblivious reasons. Oblivious. Uh, some of us boys was hearing about the speed you're throwing for old persimmon puss. Persimmon puss? The judge, the judge. Yeah. And uh, we wanted to be excluded, too. Yeah, we want to pay tribute to the old geezer. Oh, well, that's a very nice spirit, Mr. Barrel House. I'm sure the judge will appreciate it. I hope so. I've been trying to get to the judge for some time now. Say, if uh, we buy a hundred tickets, do you think that'd take care of the beef? Take care of the beef? That'd take care of the whole meal. <laughs> that'll cost you two hundred dollars. Two C's? Well, that's a mere bag of telly. Oh, bag of telly. Here are your tickets, Mr. Pilsner. And here's the dough. Well, so long. It's sure going to be a load off of me associates' minds now that we're palsy wowsy with old pickle pans. <laughs> pickle pan? Oh, yes, he means cucumber kisser. <laughs> Oh, that reminds me. Have you heard about my poem for the banquet, Marjorie? No, Uncle Mort. Well, it's called Poem on the Occasion of the Celebration of Judge Horace Hooker's 20th Anniversary of His Election to the State Superior Court Bench. Oh, that's just wonderful, Uncle. It, wait a minute. That was just the title. How does the poem go? Uh, I don't know. I haven't written it yet. <laughs> Where is it? Lead me to him. Oh, there you are. Gildersleeve, what is the meaning of this? Oh, hello, Judge. What's the meaning of what? This story in the political column of the Times. Rock Morton P. Gildersleeve to run against Judge Hooker. Dark horse enters race. It, who's a horse? It's a plot. A frame up to ruin me. Gildersleeve, you're going to pay for this. Yes, but Judge, uh, I just went there to put down that floor lamp, Hooker. I'll put it down on your head, you overstuffed double crosser. Uh, wait a minute. Is that paper lied. It, how can I run for a judge? I'm not even a lawyer. Say, that's right. Yes. I should have thought of that myself. But I'm all a bundle of nerves today. Huh? Got a mighty tricky trial on my hands, and I've got a right to be jittery. Is that so? What case is that, Judge? A gang of cutthroat racketeers. Whole slew of them. It's Beer Barrel Buck and his mob. <laughs> oh, my. Here we go again. Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, let me tell you how to perform a little kitchen magic. How to make delicious macaroni and cheese in only seven minutes cooking time. You do it with a product called Kraft Dinner. In every box of Kraft Dinner, there's a special macaroni. You plunge it into boiling water, cook it not more than seven minutes for the clock, and it's finished. Fluffy, tender as any macaroni you ever baked in your life. You drain the cooked macaroni... Whisk in a little milk and butter, and then sprinkle cheese goodness through and through with the Kraft grater that also comes in every Kraft dinner box. Isn't that easy? And wait till the folks taste this fluffy macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. Kraft dinner served as a main dish is downright thrifty. At your grocer's tomorrow, see that for yourself. And get several packages of Kraft dinner so you can stock the pantry shelf. <laughs> And now back to the great Gildersleeve, who's still determined to surprise Judge Hooker with a big testimonial dinner, even if it kills him, him being the judge. Oh, hello, Bertie. Good afternoon, Mr. Gildersleeve. I've just come from the Summerfield Biltmore. The chef and I arranged the menu for the banquet. Listen to this. At first, crab a la Judge Hooker. What's that? Oh, you know what a big crab the judge is. Well, these are even bigger. <laughs> Next, parole of mock turtle soup. Well, what's that parole mean? Fresh out of the can. <laughs> After that, Bertie, comes the fowl. The fowl what? It, Bertie, stop interrupting. We're having turkey a la Gildersleeve. Now, what can that be? Yeah, I'm not sure myself. The chef said something about it being stuffed with chestnuts. <laughs> <laughs> After that, uh, roast beef, baked potatoes, cream corn, and chocolate whipped cream pie. Mm, it all sounds mighty rich. Judge Hooker usually sucks on milk toast and a cup of hot water. Diluted. <laughs> Bertie, the only reason we're giving this dinner is so the judge can get a good square meal. Hello, Uncle Mort. 
Say, did you order a lot of flowers for the speaker's table at the banquet? Oh, well, yes, but why not? Well, doesn't Judge Hooker suffer from rose fever? It rose fever? Now, Marjorie, a few American beauties aren't going to hurt his Yankee noodle. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle Mort, you look worried. Yes, why not? All the details of that dinner on my shoulders, arranging for speakers, trying to find a suitable present for the guest of honor, worrying about that gangster and his mob showing up. You mean that fellow who came in and bought a hundred tickets? Yes. If Beer Barrel and his gang come, the decent people will think they're pals of hookers, and the judge will be washed up like seaweed. Well, why don't you give them their money back? Oh, Marjorie, I refuse to have any dealings with crooks. Besides, I've already spent the money for a string ensemble. String ensemble? Yeah. You mean a lynching party? Oh, <laughs> Well, the only thing to do is sell another hundred tickets and get the money back that way. Yeah, I thought of that. Only we've already sold almost 800 of them, and I just found out the banquet room only seats 250. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What are we going to do? <laughs> well, we can either feed them in relays, or else I can arrange a lap supper in the lobby. <laughs> <laughs> you spluttering spigots. That's beer barrel now. Hey, Bertie, don't let him in. Tell him I've gone away. Where to? To Shangri-La. Uncle, you'll never squeeze under that sofa. Hey, come in. Who wants the door? I'm coming, Leroy. Oh, get up, Uncle Mort. It's just Leroy. You don't have to hide. If who? If Leroy? If uh, who's hiding? I was just playing air raid shelter. <laughs> hey, Uncle, you don't have to worry about that big gangster anymore. Uh, how do you know? It says so right here in the paper. Look. Uh, let me see. Uh, Judge Hooker sentences Hoodlum Mob to 20 years apiece. Beer barrel bot dragged from courtroom, shrieking, I want my money back. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, old fella. No refunds. <laughs> Court will now take a recess for five minutes. That's what we've been waiting for, Leroy. Now, you you know what you're to do, don't you? Yes, yeah, sure, Uncle. We're going to up to talk to Judge Hooker, and when he isn't looking, I'm going to swipe his gravel. This is not gravel, my boy, gavel. Okay, I'll swipe his gavel, then. Yes, then. Not swipe, either. We simply want to borrow his gavel, so we can measure it and have an exact duplicate made in ivory and gold as an anniversary present. Well, why does it have to be so exact? Well, the judge is as temperamental about his gavel as a golf pro is about his clubs. You mean the judge uses it for a putter? Yes. No, my boy. He's just finicky about the size and weight. He never leaves it around. He probably takes it home nights to crack nuts. <laughs> oh, hello, Judge Hooker. Oh, yes. Hello, Judge Hooker. Hello, Leroy. Hello, Gildersleeve. What do you want? Oh, I just dropped in for a visit. How's your election campaign coming along, Judge? Badly. Very badly. I can't understand it at all. Three weeks ago, I was as good as re-elected. Today, I have a tough fight on my hands. Huh? Gildersleeve, I believe there's a conspiracy against me. No, who'd ever do such a dirty trick? Well, there's some sinister figure trying to cut my throat behind my back. Uh, you mean there's something underhanded is hanging over your head? I don't know what I mean. Half the crooks in town come up to me now and slap me on the shoulder and say, I'll be seeing you, judgy. People keep winking and whistling at me. I'm being persecuted, I tell you. Oh, no, maybe it's just some friends uh, planning a surprise, Judge. Friends? You mean fiends. Why, if I ever... Let me, Judge. Time to resume court. Thank you, Silsby. I'll be right there. Look, Gildersleeve. Huh? Keep your eyes and ears open. If you see or hear anything suspicious, please let me know. Oh, sure, Judge. Just leave everything to me. Hunk. It's coming, Leroy. Did you get it? Sure, and I drew an outline of it on paper, like you told me. Oh, fine. Let's slip the gavel back into place now, huh? Court will come to order, please. Just a second, Silsby. Where's my gavel? Uh-oh. Where's the judge's gavel? It was right there, Your Honor. Isn't here now. Someone must have stolen it during recess. Leroy, isn't it getting a little stuffy in this courtroom? Why, uh, yes, Uncle Throckmorton. Shall we get some fresh air? Well, is this a practical joke or a real theft? All right, Bailiff. Lock the doors. We'll search everyone in the courtroom till we find the culprit. <laughs> Leroy, get rid of that gavel. Don't worry, Unc, I did. It's splendid, my boy. Where'd you hide it? In your pocket, Unc. <laughs> Leroy, never do that again. The judge won't like me if he finds this. we got to get out of here. Oh, Judge Hooker, can I whisper something to you? What is it, Gildy? Uh, judge, I've got an important engagement with the governor. You wouldn't want to keep him waiting, would you? No, go ahead, go ahead. I've got enough trouble without you, you big buffalo. 
Beat it. Oh, thanks, Judge. Come on, Leroy. Silsby, let Mr. Gildersleeve leave. It's okay. All right, Judge. <sighs> Gee, Unc, that was fast thinking. What are you going to do with the gavel now? It's the gavel? Oh, I haven't got it anymore, Leroy. While we were talking, I stuck it into Judge Hooker's pocket. <laughs> I'm an extremely busy man, Mr. Gildersleeve. What can I do for you? Well, Governor, I hate to ask any favors, but after all, I voted for you the last three times you were elected. Thanks. However, this is my first term in office. Yes, it is? Oh. <laughs> Must have been two other governors. Please get to the point of your visit, Mr. Gildersleeve, if your visit has any point. Oh, it has, definitely. I, uh, I just want to invite you to be the principal speaker at a dinner we're giving for Judge Horace Hooker. Hooker? Why, that little... Uh, 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 Governor, he's always spoken well of you. No, he has, has he? Oh, absolutely. Except maybe when you pardon some crook he's just sent up the river, or pass some law that he has to declare unconstitutional, or to get involved in some shady deal with the forestry department. And what does he say then? Oh, he still sticks by it. He says our state has the best governor that money can buy. <laughs> See here, Gildersleeve, I didn't come to Summerfield to be insulted. I know it. Judge Hooker said you came here to make a couple of sharp horse trades so you can stay in office. Well, after that, I'm certainly not going to make a speech in favor of any political nincompoop. But I'm not asking you to talk about yourself, Governor. I wasn't talking about myself, Gildersleeve. I was referring to that miserable little travesty on justice. That anemic habeas corpuscle. That blithering judicial blunder named Judge Hooker. Did you get that? Uh, no, Governor. Would you mind repeating it again? There's a couple of dandies I'd like to remember. <laughs> Here's a flower for your buttonhole, Mr. Gill, please. My, but you look tough selecting me tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Bertie. Thank you. It's Leroy. Yes, Uncle. Stop shining your shoes on your stockings. <laughs> Harry Miser, we were going to be late. Oh, coming, Uncle Morse. Is that Joker here yet? No, but I'm expecting him at any moment. Has he found out about the surprise yet, Uncle? Uh, no, Leroy. Uh, it's been a terrible strain keeping it from him all these weeks. He thinks the four of us are going to the Summerfield Biltmore for a nice, quiet dinner. I can hardly wait to see his dyspeptic dial light up when he walks into the banquet room and sees all those people. <laughs> yep, that must be him now. I recognize the ring. I'll answer, Bertie. Well, well, come in, come in, come in, Judge. Killer Steve, on the way down here, I was stopped by a motorcycle officer. Oh, my goodness, that's too bad, Judge. Yeah, police department's in a perfectly rotten state. I agree with you. Imagine that cop. He offered me my choice. Either a $5 ticket for speeding, or else I could buy a ticket for some political shindig for $2. Uh, uh, a political shindig? Oh, well, I, I hope you took your medicine like a good citizen. I did. I gave him the two bucks. No. Didn't even look at the darn thing in the dark. I wonder what racket it is. Oh, well, there's no time to waste, Judge. Let's get going. And Marjorie, hurry up, Marjorie. Plenty of time, Gildy. Now, where did I put that ticket? Uh, Marjorie, hurry up. I found it. Watch this. Uh, Marjorie, never mind hurrying up. Testimonial dinner honoring 20th anniversary of Judge Horace Hooker. Entertainment music speakers. Uncle Mort Gildersleeve, chairman. It's Uncle Mort. Leroy, why did you do that? Gildersleeve, why did you do this? Oh, now the surprise is all spoiled. But I hate testimonial dinners. It's now, he tells me. Why couldn't you have mentioned it three weeks ago when you gave me that tube? You could have saved me all the time and trouble I put in. But no, you have to surprise me at the last moment. You've been working on this campaign clam bake that long? What do you mean, clam bake? This is the season's swankiest civic soiree. There's nut cups and everything. <laughs> but what's the idea of having cops flag people down and then hold them up? Hey, do I get my two bucks back? It's all in good time, Hooker. Let's wait and see if we have a deficit first. Well, I'm all ready. Come on, what are we waiting for? Oh, yeah, that's right. What are we waiting for? Let's hurry up. I wish I had known about this before. I'd have gotten a haircut. Come on. You haven't needed a haircut since you came back from Niagara Falls, Corporal. Hurry, everybody. Now, hurry. Mustn't keep the crowd waiting. All right. Yeah. Judge, when all those hundreds of people stand up and start cheering. Now, you've got to pretend that this is all a big surprise. Do you understand? Don't worry. I'll know what to do. Hey, I think I'm going to like this. Yeah? Well, you better like it after all the trouble. Oh, oh 
great jumping jeeps, what was that, as if I didn't know? What was it? What was it, Gildy? Remember the tube that brought on this little celebration? Yes. Well, it just had a blowout all of its own. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, life is just a football game, so let's keep Judge Hooker on the bench. We should also honor him for his military services to his country, a brave soldier in time of war, an officer beloved by all who served under him, and a gentleman who flinched not at his post. And it is with this thought in mind that I ask your indulgence while I read a little poem of my own composition. Especially written for this occasion as a tribute to that prince of good fellows, George Horace Hooker. <laughs> H is for honesty. You can see it in his mug. O is for offenders, who he puts right in the jug. O is also for the office he's held for 20 years. K is for the knowledge hidden between his ears. E is for the energy that always has been his. R is for re-election. Let's keep him where he is. Put them all together, they spell hooker, a name that fits him like a glove. <laughs> uh, yeah. And in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, if any of you have been lavish in your praise of Judge Horace Hooker, it's only right. Or remember, he always spoke well of you. <laughs> Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you, Leroy. <laughs> Too bad you printed the wrong date on the tickets, Leroy. Otherwise, we surely would have had a bigger crowd. <laughs> and now, Judge Hooker, won't you say a few words? Yes, quick. Get me some bicarbonate of soda. This dinner's killing me. This is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> Marjorie? Oh, he'll be up and around in a day or so. How are you feeling, Uncle Mort? Is that lump on your head any better? Uh, what happened? Last thing I remembered was presenting Judge Hooker with that gold and ivory gavel. What caused the blackout? Gee, Uncle, he presented it right back to you. He did? Good night. <laughs> The music heard in this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. We all want to eat the right foods these days, the nourishing foods that help give us energy and health. So it's good news that the right foods need not be expensive and that they can be mighty appetizing, too. Now, a good example is wholesome, nourishing parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, parquet is the margarine that tastes so wonderfully good. And it's an economical source of important food elements, too. Energy. Parquet is one of the best energy foods you can serve. Vitamin A. Winter and summer, there are 9,000 units in every pound. So you see, parquet margarine is as nutritious as it is delicious and economical. Now, if it isn't there already, put parquet margarine on tomorrow's shopping list. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levin. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, the good word for all you thrifty women who are looking for ways to cut food bills. The product called Kraft Dinner is just your dish. For Kraft Dinner gives you the economical way 
the quick way to make delicious macaroni and cheese, drenched with cheese goodness. With Kraft Dinner, you make fluffy, tender macaroni, drenched with cheese goodness, in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, every Kraft Dinner package contains a special quick cooking macaroni and an envelope of Kraft grated, so you can sprinkle in cheese goodness in a jiffy. Won't you try this economical, delicious macaroni and cheese tomorrow? A main dish ready in seven minutes is a big help on wash day. Tomorrow morning, ask your dealer for a package of Kraft Dinner. For the past few days, our friend Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve has been the victim of a baffling attack of the sneezes, and so far he hasn't found out the cause. Could it be some allergy, or is his mustache starting to back up on him? Come on, let's visit the great Gildersleeve and find out. And as I was saying, Marjorie, every time I... 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 Hey! Gesundheit. Eh, don't mention it. Every time you what, Uncle Moore? Every time I... 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 A button pops off my vest. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, you bet. I'm on my fourth vest now. Yeah, and that last sneeze broke, broke your shoelaces. Yeah? Oh, well, I've got to find some way of stopping this sneezing before I blow my blains out. Hey, <laughs> uh, uh, Hey... Oh, I didn't do it that time. Because <laughs> I'm dying. Yeah, well, no. you don't have to mention that. <laughs> no, Uncle Mort, I really think you should see a doctor. Now, this may be something serious. Sure, whatever it is, it's nothing to be sneezed at. Then why am I sneezing? Well, there must be something you're allergic to. Yeah, I know it. I'm allergic to sneezing. No, Uncle, something else is wrong. Now, why don't you go right downtown and see Dr. DePeister? Yeah, who in the name of the Mayo Brothers is Dr. DePeister? Well, I understand he's wonderful. Allergies are his specialty. Oh, you mean he's an anti-sneeze man? <laughs> yes. Florence Foreman told me he cured her. Found she was allergic to gasoline, so she sold her car. It, wasn't that a little drastic? Uh, oh, no. After she got Dr. DePeister's bill, she had to anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hate to blow in a lot of money on my nose, Marjorie. <laughs> I was just making up your room. And you know that little kitty of yours? Ah, you mean my itty-bitty pity kitty? Itty-bitty all for corn's sake. Yep. <laughs> What's he been up to now, Bertie? If that's what you making for that ensign in the Navy on a counter, he gave you that pussy cat? Don't tell me you found that. Yes, sir. The kitten got into knitting. <laughs> oh, that's a shame, Marjorie. Well, what did he try to do? Pull the wool over his eyes? Yep. <laughs> yeah, and on him it don't look good. <laughs> oh, dear. Did he do much damage, Bertie? Just look here. I brought the sweater in. What sweater? That thing is more snarls than a cage full of tigers. Why, it's he. Uh, oh. It's what, Uncle? Huh? It's you. Uh, ah! You! <laughs> Gee, Uncle, that one made the windows rattle. The windows, eh? Good. I thought it was my teeth. <laughs> really, Uncle Mort, you must go downtown and see Dr. DePice. Oh, nonsense, Marjorie. Why should I let a tribute? You, you, help you. Uh, well, maybe someday. So, help you. Come on, what are we waiting for? Where is that doctor? <laughs> But, Marjorie, I haven't sneezed once since we left home. Just my luck. When the doctor asks me how I do it, I won't be able to show him. Oh, now sit down, Uncle. Relax and look at a magazine. Magazine? Oh, all right. There's an article in the National Geographic for May 1916. I never did finish. <laughs> <laughs> Uncle, you won't find that here. Why not? This is a doctor's office, isn't it? Yes, but this is a young doctor. Makes no difference, my dear. When a boy decides on a medical career, what's the first thing he does? I don't know. What? He starts saving magazines. <laughs> That's one of the reasons he has to be an intern so long. <laughs> Just to age his National Geographic. <laughs> oh, Uncle. Well, why do they always have a National Geographic? Well, it's all about faraway places. Anybody who sits in a doctor's office would rather be someplace far away. <laughs> Are you Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, yes. Well, the doctor will see you now. This way, please. Yeah, what's he so cheerful about? <laughs> the way she chirped, she'd make Florence Nightingale sound like a mudlark. Now, you go right ahead, Uncle Moore. Well, all right, my dear, but I'm feeling dandy now. 
Oh, this is Mr. Gildersleeve, Doctor. How do you do, uh, Gildersleeve? Gildersleeve. Any relation to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve? Oh, yes, that's me. Oh, it is. Well, now, where'd I hear that name before? I phoned you an hour ago. That's where I heard it. Uh, I never forget a face. Uh, what seems to be your trouble? Uh, sneezing. Oh, you're having trouble sneezing? Oh, no, I'm not having trouble sneezing. I'm having trouble sneezing. For the past four or five days, that's all I've been doing. Yeah, monotonous, isn't it? <laughs> yes, I'm starting to get a permanent wave in my nose. Every morning I get up and sneeze all the cornflakes out of my bowl. Uh, I know what'll cure that. What was that? I say I know what'll cure that. What? Oatmeal. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you'd better remove your clothes, please. And while you're doing that, I'll ask you a few questions. Yeah. Uh, does anything you eat make your eyes water? Yeah, raw onions. <laughs> Any food cause violent sneezing? Well, black pepper does. Any favorite dish that causes spots to appear on you? Oh, yes, yes. I get spots from soft-boiled eggs. From eggs? Where? On my necktie. <laughs> but really, Doctor, I, I wish you could see me sneeze. My eyes pop out so far, it looks like I'm going to expel the pupils. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, suppose you show me how you do it. I can't. I haven't sneezed once since I left home. Most interesting. Eliminates one type of allergy that's very difficult to cure. Uh, what's that? Uh, the auto-infectious variety, when a person's allergic to himself. It, oh, well, <laughs> I couldn't have that. I like me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Your trouble seems to be localized somewhere at home. Uh, that makes the problem much simpler. Oh, of course. All I have to do is move. Well, goodbye, Doc. Ah, one second, please. We'll never find the trouble by moving away from it. I don't want to find it. I just want to lose it. Uh, <laughs> then we must conduct a series of tests. And I believe the best place to do that is in your home. Oh. Shouldn't take us long to locate the trouble, not more than a year. Yes, just a year? <laughs> yes, if we're lucky. And now, let me listen to your heart uh, quietly. Yeah, okay. Hmm, you must have a heart of oak. I'd better listen again. Most interesting. Excuse me, doctor, but somebody's at the door. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Uh, what is it? <laughs> It's time to take your pills, Doctor. No, I won't. I hate pills. Go away. <laughs> it, by the way, Doctor, how much is this going to cost? Oh, not much. Just $50 for each series of tests. It, why, that could run up into if five. Goes, oh, my goodness, it could, couldn't it? <laughs> That's true. But if we don't do that, you'll probably sneeze yourself into an early grave. Oh, Doctor, how soon are you coming over? Uh, how about Sunday afternoon? Yeah, I'll be waiting for you. Well, I better get going now. Oh, no, no, Mr. Gildersleeve. Don't go out that way. Why not? That's the way I came in. Oh, no, you didn't. When you came in, you had your clothes on. What? Oh! <laughs> Gee, we haven't any nails left. What are you going to do when we run out? Oh, we can pull some more at Uncle Mort's tires. Hi, Unc. Oh, hello, Leroy. Yeah, hello, Piggy. What did the doctor say, Unc? He said five dollars, please. Jeepers, Leroy, what's wrong? Unc suffers from the allergics. Yeah. Allergics? What's that? Oh, something rubs his nose the wrong way. <laughs> say, Unc, look what we're building. It, uh, yeah, I see. What's it supposed to be? It's a treehouse for our club, the Young MacArthur's. It, you're putting it in the wrong place, Leroy. You'll never get a MacArthur out on a limb. <laughs> Where are you going to put it? Well, as soon as we get it nailed together, we're going to haul it up on that oak where the branches spring. Uh, you know, prefabrication. If, if, oh, well, that's an idea, isn't did, it? Did you ever have a tree house, Mr. Gillisley? Well, I started to one time. I had a wonderful idea. A log house in a tree. But it didn't work out. Why not, Uncle? Well, we only had one tree in our backyard, and by the time I'd sawed enough logs for the house, there wasn't any tree left to put it in. <laughs> <laughs> Did you build a house anyway? Uh, no, my father found out what happened, and the logs and Pop and I all wound up in the woodshed. <laughs> oh, was that the time you wanted to run away and be a sailor, and he knocked the tar out of you? If... <laughs> no, Leroy, that was another whaling expedition. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Gillespie, will you help us build our clubhouse? Oh, of course. I'll pitch right in. Hand me the hammer, Leroy. Thank you. I just love to drive nails. <laughs> now watch me and learn, Leroy. Excuse me. Understand now, Leroy? No, I, I don't quite... Oh, but it's so simple. What's troubling you? Well, I'm wondering... 
wondering how you're going to get your necktie off now that you've nailed both ends to the plank. If, what do you mean? <laughs> if I see. Just fine up there, Leroy. Now nail down that little birdhouse. Birdhouse? Oh, you mean our mailbox. It, Leroy, who's going to deliver mail up in a tree 20 feet off the ground? Okay, it's a birdhouse. If... Oh, Leroy! Yes, buddy? I'd like you to come down out of that tree. It's time for lunch. And that reminds me, Mr. Gilsley, Judge Hooker just dropped in. Oh, he did, did he? That old goat always shows up at feeding time. <laughs> Tell him to come out here. I want him to see the house we built. Uh, yes, sir. And don't you dinner, Daddy Leroy. I won't, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I'm kidding the clubhouse swell. I just finished fixing my secret trapdoor on the roof. A secret trapdoor? Well, I wish I could see it. Must be very cozy inside. I'll say. Yeah, now you go in to lunch. And scrub your hands before you sit down at the table. Okay, but gee whiz, I bet Tarzan never has to wash before he eats. Yeah, of course not. Tarzan's in hot water all the time. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow. Hello, uh, Leroy. How are you feeling, Gildersleeve? Still sneezing your brains out, or have you run out of brains? Yeah. <laughs> no, Hooker, I haven't run out of brains. Would you like to borrow some? No, no. Wouldn't think of taking your last one. Yeah. <laughs> What's the big attraction out here? The attraction is that tree house the kids built. Like to go up there and look at it? No, thanks. I can see it well enough from here. Yeah, they have a secret trap door and a lot of other modern improvements. Come on, come on, let's go. Now, let's quit kidding ourselves, Rock Morton. We're too old to go traipsing up the side of a tree to peek at a packing box. Yeah, speak for yourself, you old foggy. <laughs> foggy! Okay, then you're an old foggy. Yeah. Why, why, you even get out of breath playing checkers. Thank goodness I'm different. Don't kid me, Trot Morton. If you aren't too old, you're too fat. Now forget about it. You're dizzy enough on the ground without climbing trees. Uh, in that case, I guess I'll have to show you, Judge Hooker. Here, hold my coat, Grandpa, and watch a man spread his stuff. Careful, Gildy. You'll get halfway up and then spread your stuff. <laughs> Don't worry about me, Judge. I come from a long line of tree climbers. That may be so, but remember, you haven't any tail. <laughs> If I stand on this box, I think I can reach that limb. Yeah, just watch me, Judge. Come on down from there, Gildersleeve, before you fall on that big fat neck. Yeah, just a little rusty, that's all. Oh, I never knew I weighed so much. You're building up to a terrible letdown, Humpty Dumpty. Oh, by George, I'm going to make it. And nobody's more surprised than I am. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, you made it, but you'll never get down again. Say, you ought to be up here, Judge. There's a beautiful view from here. There is? Uh-huh. On a clear day, I can see into every second-story window in the block. <laughs> what are you walking around on the roof for? The door isn't up there. I think it is. Leroy said something about a secret trap door somewhere. Oh! Excuse me, what happened? I found the trap door. <laughs> you better stop fooling around and come down. That's pretty dangerous. If you may be right. I'd better... Uh-oh. What's wrong now? But I got in here. I should be able to get out. Timothy, what's the trouble? I can't squeeze out of this door. But you just got in. Yeah, but I came in fast, and I'm stuck fast, too. <laughs> yeah, this is going to be one of my bad days. <laughs> Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a moment. Meanwhile, let me tell you how to be a speed artist at making grand macaroni and cheese. Get a package of the product called Kraft Dinner. Out of that package, take the special macaroni and cook it in salted boiling water not more than seven minutes to the clock. Then, just drain it well and lightly mix the fluffy macaroni with a little butter and milk. Next, take the envelope of Kraft grated from the Kraft Dinner box and sprinkle the cheese goodness through and through the macaroni. Turn the macaroni and cheese into a serving dish, and your dinner main dish is ready. Ready in double-quick time. A really thrifty main dish. And really delicious macaroni and cheese, too. Now, doesn't Kraft Dinner sound like a wonderful idea for busy days? Well, get some tomorrow. Every Kraft Dinner package contains the making for four servings of delicious macaroni and cheese. Better get several packages tomorrow and stock the pantry shelf. Your family will love Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese. And now let's 
return to the great Gildersleeve, whom we left stranded in a house in a tree in the backyard. As we find Uncle Mort again, he's still there, while below, Judge Hooker tries to comfort him with song. rock a bye Gildy, in the treetop. I'll kill that hooker. When the wind blows, hang on or you drop. Yeah, I'll drop on you. When the bow bends, it surely will break, and Gildy will hit just like an earthquake. <laughs> Hooker, stop that infernal nursery ride. Oh, you want something more modern, huh? All right, Gildy, I'll give you the number one song on the hit parade. Yo. Don't sit up in the apple tree with anyone else but me. Anyone else but me. Yes. Anyone else but me. No, no, no. <laughs> Do something. Get me out of here. This is a terrible predicament. <laughs> yes, this is it. <laughs> you just wait, Judge Hooker. I'm going to break every bone in your head. Now get me out of here. Hey, what's going on out here? Where's Uncle Mort, Judge? Uncle decided to visit your treehouse, Leroy. <laughs> See him? He became so absorbed in it, he can't tear himself away. Yeah. Oh, yeah, now I can see him. His head's sticking out of the secret top door. Oh, how do you like it up there? I'd like it a lot better up here if I were down there. <laughs> do you get anything wrong? Oh, no, nothing at all, Leroy. Except that I'm wearing your secret trap door as a girdle. <laughs> I'm stuck up here fast. You've got to do something. Leroy, what's all the shouting about? Keepers, Uncle Moore is up a tree. Look. Why, Uncle Moore? Yeah, hello, Marjorie. <laughs> what are you doing up there? I think he's looking for a bird's nest. He's been acting as if he's a little cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you egg me on, Hooker. Marjorie, I came up here to inspect Leroy's little shanty, but now I'm stuck. And frankly, I'm beginning to get bored with lodging here. Excuse me, folks, but where is Mr. Gildersleeve? Yeah, I'm right here, Bertie. Well, where's that voice coming from? He can't be in the trunk of the tree. His trunk's bigger than the tree. <laughs> I'm upstairs in the tree, Bertie. What is it? Oh, uh, there's a Dr. Dupike with the trunk of the tree. He says he's got an appointment. Oh, great jumping jeeps, the sneeze doctor. I forgot all about him. <laughs> Gee, Uncle, I don't think there's room enough for both of you out there. <laughs> Of course not, Leroy. And I won't have anyone see me in this ridiculous, undignified position. Bertie, tell him to come back later in the afternoon. And tell him I'm at a board meeting. But, Uncle, that wouldn't be telling the truth. Oh, yes, it would, my dear. Wherever I turn, I'm meeting a board. <laughs> well, I'll go tell him. And, Bertie, after he leaves, bring me something to eat. Yes, sir. Uh, slice up some of that tongue and make three or four sandwiches, huh? Yes. It's way past my lunchtime, and I feel as hollow as Judge Hooker's head. That's right, Gildersleeve. Go ahead and stuff yourself, then you'll never be able to get out of that box. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I never thought of that. It, just two tongue sandwiches, Bertie. Okay, but how about for the present? All cashews? Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I'm waiting to let the doctor come back here. I bet you he can get you out. Leroy, I don't need an allergy specialist. I need a tree surgeon. Well, he can put you on a reducing diet. Sorry, Leroy, but that wouldn't work. No matter how much your uncle reduced, he'd still be living on the fat of the land. Yeah. Hooker, why don't you go home? All right, all right, I can take a hint. I just hope you're stuck up there until your north side is covered with moss. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, Uncle Mort, I'm sorry this happened. Now that he's gone, don't you feel sort of empty inside? Well, I'll say I do. Where's Bertie with those tongue sandwiches? Oh, Bertie. Did you have some, Mr. Gill, please? I had some trouble with the cat. And that doctor man said he'll be back later, and he's still charging you for this visit. Yeah, well, never mind that now. What about my lunch? Didn't you bring me those sandwiches? No, sir. I'm awful sorry about that, but I can't. You can't? Why not? Because the cat got your tongue. <laughs> <laughs> Piggy, pull! No, Piggy, don't, don't pull. You're just taking the back right out of my shirt. It's no use, boys. Oh, why did you ever build this thing so solidly? Jeepers, you told us to, Mr. Gildersleeve. You're trapped by my own words. <laughs> you better climb down now, boys, and try to borrow a ladder and an axe someplace. Okay, Uncle. And remember, I don't want anyone in the neighborhood to know about this. I'd be the butt of too many jokes. You coming, Leroy? Scramble down now. I can see the girl next door in her room. I don't want to attract any attention. We'll, we'll be right back, Uncle. Yeah, okay. Me. Uh, hello, Dolly. How are you today? Oh, perfectly fine, except for a blister I picked up at tennis. It's been annoying me ever since. Isn't it terrible? Uh, heel? I'll say he is. He followed me all the way home. Uh, <laughs> say, how did you ever manage to get up so high? Is that a steam cabinet you're sitting in? What are you doing up in the tree? It, who, me? Oh, nothing. I'm uh, uh, just doing an important air raid defense job. You don't say. Well, what is it? You can trust me because you know I always keep my 
my mouth closed and everything I hear goes right in one ear and out the other and see, I wonder why that is. Well, what's there in between to stop it? <laughs> oh, oh. oh, well, then you'll tell me, huh? What is it? What is it? it oh, well, if you must know, I'm up here spotting airplanes. Spotting airplanes? Oh, how fascinating. Gee, I wish I could help you, only I wouldn't know what colors to spot them. Ew. <laughs> no, I don't suppose you would. If, shh. Hey, what's that noise? Oh, oh my goodness. There's a fire somewhere. Huh? Oh, I simply must go because I just love to curl up in front of a good fire. Uh. Well, goodbye, Mr. Gillespie. I hope you poke it out a lot of flames. Poke it out of... Just my luck to have a nice, exciting fire somewhere, and I can't go. Is that you down there, Leroy? Yes, sir. Uh, where's the fire? There isn't any help, Leroy. You told me to bottle a lot of water on a match, but not to tell the neighbors, so I just called the fire department. No. <laughs> Great jumping jeeps. Why did you do that? Oh, I won't have it. Look at all those people. Send them away. And tell them to stop coming. But Chief was up the board. Hello, kid. Is that him up there? Yeah, Chief, but he says that he don't want to... Bring a 30-footer, boys. It, go away. It, take those fire wagons out of our alley. Keep that crowd out of our yard. Oh, a little violent, huh? Yeah. Now take it easy, Tubby. We'll get you down. <laughs> I don't want to come down. I like it up here. Now, what is this guy, a squirrel? Don't no worry, Uncle Mort. He'll stop you out in no time. If keep those hatchet men away from me. I'm very comfortable up here, and I, I won't come down until I'm good and ready. As nutty as a fruitcake. Yes. He's jerky, that's all. Probably thinks he's Gerald Doolittle. Yes. Why don't you brave fire ladders just go back to your checker game? Now, see here, Fatso. We were called to take you down from there. Who called you? Did I call you? No, but some... You're paid for putting out fires, not for coming around annoying innocent people who are enjoying a nice uh, rest up a tree. Now, we're supposed to take... Oh, wasting the taxpayer's money, eh? Now, you get out of here before I pick up my phone and report this to the mayor. Come on, boys. Put that ladder back in the truck. Quinn, take this axe back. Yeah. Let's get out of here before I turn a hose on that big fat bolt alarm. <laughs> Yeah, I did. I guess I told him a thing or two. Gee, Uncle Mort, those guys could have gotten you out of there in a minute. Don't you want to come down? No, Leroy, I couldn't come down that ladder in front of that crowd. Why not? It, because there are a lot of nails up here, and I've torn a square foot out of the seat of my pants. <laughs> I cut down a tree once, and it takes days, Bertie. Say, Mr. Gildersleeve, I'll bet you'd get through if you got a can of grease and gave yourself a good lube job. If, thanks for the suggestion, Vicky, but I'll save that one until everything else fails. Oh, my Lord, here comes Dr. DePay, sir. Oh, I've forgotten all about him. Say, I just realized something. I haven't sneezed since I came up here, Marjorie. He'll probably want me to stay here the rest of my life. Is Mr. Gildersleeve back yet? Oh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm up here, Doctor. Where? Oh, there you are. Well, come down now. We'll get started with those tests. Uh, come down, eh? Yeah. I'm afraid I'll have to stay up here a while. Oh, now, Mr. Gildersleeve, you should have more confidence in your doctor. You mustn't run away, you know. I'm not going to run away, but why don't you? Run away and come back some other day. Hmm, that's a rather peculiar reaction. I'll have to write the medical journal about this. Oh. Really, doctor, you don't understand. Oh, oh, hey, keep away. Cut that out. What's wrong with you, please? The woodpeckers are trying to build a nest in my hair. <laughs> Poor Uncle Lloyd. Yeah, what's the matter? Is he allergic to woodpeckers? I am. Here's a policeman to see you. A policeman? What does he want? There have been a lot of complaints from this neighborhood about the peeping Tom. The peeping Tom. <laughs> oh, help! Hey, get off! You! Now the woodpeckers are dying! Bombing me! Are you warm? Get away from me, birds. You bother me. How's your sawing going on? Sawing? It, not so good. I'm getting too much attention from my little feathered friends. I've got an idea how we can scare off the birds. I'll be right back. All right. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Gillespie, but do you expect to be down for dinner? It, I hope so, Bertie. So do I, because I can't see how I'm going to serve your soup up there. Oh, well, that, that'd be simple. I could drink it through a straw. You want our steel soup? Yes, I'll serve. Here, Kitty, Kitty. Here, Kitty, Kitty. No, Kitty, come on now. Hey, look what I've got to drive the birds off. Oh, Marjorie's cat. Good. Send him right up here, Leroy. I'm afraid some bird's going to lay an egg on me any minute. <laughs> Yeah, here, kitty, 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 kitty. Oh, yes. Come on. Get, stay right up here near your Uncle Mort. Isn't he cute? It, Leroy, that was certainly a bright eye. I, 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 you. <laughs> Good time. Yeah, you're welcome, Bertie. 
Uh, hey, I didn't sneeze once since I came up here until that cat. Ca- 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 what is it on the wall? I just found out what I'm allergic to, Marjorie. It's that cat of yours. Oh, well, it saves me a lot of doctor bills and time and trouble. Why, I'm so happy. Uh, 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 <laughs> No, no, don't call him, Leroy. Looks like I'm going to sneeze my way out of here. Hey, come here, nice kitty. Uh, uh, I can't hear you, Leroy. On the counter, on the counter, on the counter, on the counter. Uh, oh. Right between the mashed potatoes and the split peas. Yep. Ladies and gentlemen, it's just six months since Pearl Harbor. Since then, this nation has leaped to arms with one idea in our minds and hearts. Victory. This summer, there'll be no slackening, no rest. The leading NBC shows are joining our government in bringing you the Victory Parade, a series of Sunday afternoon shows heard all through the summer in the Jack Benny Times. We urge you to listen. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. We all need extra vitality these days, the energy to help make our war machine hum. So you'll be glad to know that one of the best energy foods you can serve and one that's economical, too, is wholesome parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now, unlike some foods... Delicious parquet margarine is the kind you naturally serve at every meal. It's a wonderfully good-tasting spread for bread. It's a real flavor shortening for baking. It makes pan-fried foods tastier. Yes, you can use parquet margarine all these ways to help add extra nourishment and goodness to your meals. Another thing, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So for all these reasons, order a pound or two of economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Remember, it's parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents The Great Gildersleeve. (laughs) The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Evans. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, since all of you homemakers are extra busy these days with your victory gardens, first aid classes, and so on, I want to tell you about the speedy way to make a favorite American main dish. 
With the thrifty product called Kraft Dinner, you can make delicious macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. In every package of Kraft Dinner, you get a quick cooking macaroni that needs no baking at all. Also, there's some Kraft grated that puts the cheese goodness through and through the tender macaroni. You'll find Kraft Dinner a real lifesaver these busy days, so tomorrow, get several packages of it. Meet the mealtime emergencies at your house with Kraft Dinner's Grand Macaroni and Cheese. Did you ever lend an organization your living room for a meeting and then find that you weren't invited to attend? Well, that's what's happening to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. The Summerfield Little Theater Group is meeting to discuss plans for their summer barn season. And the great Gildersleeve is out in the hall complaining to Bertie the cook, who had nothing to do with the matter. Yes. It isn't as if they were anybody important, Bertie. After all, they're just going to put on a couple of stale dramas in somebody's barn. But what's the idea of giving the plays in a barn, Mr. Gilsey? Bertie, did you ever smell one of their plays? <laughs> oh, I guess they're all through. Well, good morning, it's all arranged. We're going to have our summer theater in Mrs. Guernsey's stable. Oh, well, but really, Mrs. Guernsey, don't you think this is the wrong time to go out of the livery stable business? Mr. Gildersleeve, we are referring to an old carriage house on my estate. Oh. Livery stable, indeed. Uh, now, Mrs. Guernsey, mustn't turn up your nose at livery stables these days. <laughs> and this is Mr. Bruce Burdock, our director. Charmed, simply charmed. Bruce was with Austin Wells. Oh, yes, one of the men from Mars, no doubt. <laughs> and, uh, and this is Charlie Robertson. Uh, Mr. Robertson, uh, the pleasure is all mine. No doubt. And now, we must start the ticket sale. Yeah. That means we must order oodles and oodles of tickets. Now, where does one get them? Uh, tickets? Oh, the best place I know is the World Ticket Printers of Chicago. Just mention my name. Well, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. You seem quite familiar with these details. Oh, yes. I've sent those people a lot of business. That was when I was the director of a well-known stage company. You were? Well, in that case, I simply insist that you attend our first rehearsals and lend your professional touch. Uh, but, but, but... Oh, I... no, 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 no. I won't take no for an answer. We'll hold our next... Next meeting here again on Tuesday. Come, boys. Time to go. Goodbye, right. boys. Well, goodbye, folks. Well, I always knew I'd have a chance to monkey with the stage. <laughs> My drama done told me. <laughs> but, Uncle Mort, I don't understand. Were you really a director of a well-known stage company once? Why, of course, my dear. When I was out west, I was on the board of directors of one of the biggest bus lines in Arizona. <laughs> Quiet, please. I think our first play should be something down to earth. Some show so simple that the most stupid person will understand. Understand? Oh, yes, Uncle Mort. Uh, yes. <laughs> I thought they would. <laughs> now, I just happened to dig up a beautifully written play that was a magnificent success at Princeton when I went there. In fact, the author had to take 22 curtain calls. My goodness, I couldn't straighten up for a week. <laughs> well, what was the name of your play, Uncle? Uh, Deep in the Heart of Maryland. Uh, would anyone like to hear the plot? You would? Well, okay. I'll play all the parts myself. The first act opens in the drawing room of ex-Governor Silsby's mansion, The Shingles. We discover an old southern mammy, Auntie Frisia, as she speaks. Well, here he is in the drawing room of ex-Governor Silsby's mansion, The Shingles. Things look mighty poorly for the old governor. She's interrupted by her husband, Uncle Rufus. The two of them do a very comical song, and then Uncle Rufus speaks. Yeah, Auntie Frisia, things do look mighty bad. And it's all on account of that no account name but Dalton Jackson who holds the mortgage. Then Andy Freesia says, Ain't it the truth? <coughs> sure looks like he's going to finally wind up with the shingles. <laughs> uh, then Dalton enters, a very mean character, lower than bunions on a snake. Dalton says, <laughs> I brought these flowers for Miss Lavinia. Please inform her of my presence. Then he comes down to the footlights and whispers, Little does the fair Lavinia suspect that I am a married man with a wife and seven children in Altoona, P.A. <laughs> Lavinia, thinking that the visitor is another, trips into the room. Oh, excuse me, she says. I didn't know it was you, Mr. Jackson. Ah, my proud beauty. You thought I was that young whelp, Crandall Berry, eh? Oh, no, I didn't. You did. I didn't. You did. You didn't. I did. You did. Did I? <laughs> 
But, but I could go on like this for hours, folks. It's simply chuck full of sparkling dialogue. Oh, but really, old fellow, this isn't our type of play. You're right, Brucey boy. Oh, oh I forgot to tell you, Brucey old boy. You play Crandall Berry, the hero. Oh, is that so? Uh-huh. And you're shot right smack in the middle of Act Second. <laughs> and really, you had no idea how I'm looking forward to your death scene. Yeah. You know, Charlie, on second thought, maybe it isn't such a bad choice after all. Uh, just, uh, what was... Uh, what yes, was and there's a fine part for you, Charlie. Will you wake up, please? You'll be ideal as Lavinia. <laughs> Don't go to sleep during the rehearsal. I didn't even hear you. You'll be ideal as Lavinia's weak-willed spineless brother, uh, Sibley Silsby. Oh, do you really think I'm the type, really? Yes, uh, really. But definitely, Charlie boy. Now, Marjorie, you can play Lavinia. Oh, that should be fun. Uh-huh. Dolly Dobson from next door can play the ingenue, and I think we'll try Judge Hooker as ex-Governor Sibley. And uh, the rest of the parts will be easy to catch. Uh, all except the southern mammy. Are you going to play that role yourself? Oh, uh, no, I've got somebody. Uh, Bertie! Oh, yes, sir? Uh, Bertie, have you ever had any ambition to go on the stage? Oh, undoubtedly. Oh. <laughs> then we've got a nice fat part for you in our new show. A fat part? Ping on me, that look good. No, no, Judge Hooker, that's terrible. All right, Bruce, give him his cue again. Oh, all right. But, Governor Silsby, you don't understand. I do understand. But the trouble is, you don't let me get a word in, Edgewise. (laughs) (laughs) Judge, try to get it right, or else on opening night, Hooker will get the hook. Go on. All right. My boy, I can remember when this plantation stretched as far as your eye could. See? Of all the sugar-cured, tenderized, corn-fed hickory hams, you take the lima beans, Judge. Well, how would you read that one? Uh, something like this. I can remember when this here plantation stretched as far as your eye could see. You see? Well, that gives me an idea. Yes, and it gives me an idea, too, Judge. What's that, Gildy? I think I'll play the part myself. But what about me? I bought tickets for all my friends already. Good. Now you'll be able to keep them. What, the tickets? No, your friends. <laughs> Well, in that case, I'm going to take all of my furniture out of Act One and go home. I forgot to tell you, Judge, that you've just been appointed stage manager. Stage manager? What are my duties? To get some decent-looking furniture for Act One. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Call the cast, Leroy. All right, everybody. On stage, please. Ready for dress rehearsal. On stage. Oh, Uncle Mort, I'm so excited. How's my makeup? Oh, fine. Only uh, don't blink those big eyelashes so fast, my dear. It sends a draft to the theater. (laughs) Where's Charlie Robertson? Where's what's-his-name, the fellow who plays the villain? Oh, you mean Mr. Updike? Haven't you heard what's happening to him? Uh, No, Mrs. Jersey. What's happening to Mr. Updike? Oh, his wife's having a baby. He had to rush her to the hospital. A baby? He can't do this to me. What does he mean, having a baby at a time like this? I tell you, I simply won't have it. But, Uncle Mort, who's going to read his lines? Uh, of course, I know him, but I'm doing the governor already. But I could do two parts for the dress rehearsal. However, Mr. Updike better cut out these monkey shines and be here for the opening tomorrow night. Ready, Uncle Mort? Uh, yes. Uh, places, please. Oh, there you are, Charlie. Yes, here I am, but I can't stay long. Why not? I've just been drafted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. I was sure the Army would skip you. <laughs> Well, the only thing we'll be able to do is open tomorrow night is the box office for refund. I have a wonderful idea. Charlie played your younger brother, didn't he, Marjorie? Yes. Then why not have your younger brother take Charlie's place? I can. I've got the candy concession out in the audience between acts. But, Leroy, you'll sell twice as much candy if the people can buy it from somebody in the cast. I know. When I was with Maxwell's comedians, I caused more broken hearts and decayed teeth than any other leading man in the tent show business. <laughs> Well, jeepers, I never thought of that. Okay, I'll do it. Fine, now we're all set. Let's get started. Hey, where's Bertie? Here I am, Miss Gildersleeve. Well, where's the fellow to play uh, Uncle Rufus? What fellow to play Uncle Rufus? Mr. Gildersleeve, you never assign that part to anyone. The great jumping jeeps. Do I have to do all the thinking around here? Do I have to do all the work myself? No, but it looks like you'll have to play all the parts yourself. You mean portray Uncle Rufus as well as Dalton Jackson, the menace, and Governor Salsby, the grandfather? Well, you can try, Uncle Mort. You're a big enough man to play all three. If, Marjorie, but how am I going to keep from bumping into myself coming in and going out? I'll be in a daze before the evening's over. Yeah, Punk, <laughs> it looks like this is going to be one of your bad dazes. Oh. 
The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a moment. Meanwhile, let's give a thought to that chicken or roast out there in the icebox. There isn't quite enough left over from today's dinner for tomorrow's meal. Well, let me tell you how to stretch and glamorize what is left into a thrifty main dish. Cream the leftover meat and serve it in a delicious ring of macaroni and cheese. Macaroni and cheese that you cook in just seven minutes. You do it for the product called Kraft Dinner. In every box of Kraft Dinner, there's a special quick-cooking macaroni. Also, some Kraft grated that lets you put the cheese flavor through and through in a jiffy. Just seven minutes at the stove, and you have fluffy, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. For a smart macaroni ring, press the macaroni and cheese into a ring mold. Let it stand a few minutes, unmold on a platter, and pour your cream meat into the center. Delicious. Of course, you can serve Kraft Dinner just in a serving dish. The family will love the macaroni and cheese made this thrifty seven-minute way. So have some tomorrow. Ask your dealer for Kraft Dinner. Now back to the Great Gildersleeve. It's the opening night of Deep in the Heart of Maryland, and Uncle Mort is still stuck with three parts. The audience is in their seats, the actors are in their places to say nothing of a dither. The stage manager, Judge Hooker, is ready to pull up the curtain, and the overture begins. of old Governor Sylvie's home to shingle. And things look mighty bad for the old Governor. I wonder where my husband, Uncle Rufus the Butler, is. Now, who can that be? Who's down a knocking at the door outside? Well, who's you expected? Send your joy and pride. Now, I can hear you grumbling, Mr. Rufus Brown. Just keep on a knocking, Ruth, you no good clown. Yeah, come on now, baby, won't you let me in? Has you been a gambling, honey? Did you win? No. What's that you mumbling? I just lost my shirt. Ruth, my shoes gone again. Hurt. Oh, now, Sugarfoot, wait a minute now. Ruth, a strap, just a strap. What you gonna do when the rent comes down? What am I gonna say? How am I gonna pay? What you gonna you know, I know that times are tough. Land I'm gonna take her off of the cup. The roof for fast and jump and brown. What, what are we, we gonna, gonna do when the red comes round? The roof for fast and jump and brown. What am I gonna do? What am I gonna say? How am I gonna pay? What am I gonna do? Gets come around. Well, I tell you, Mr. Gilsey, oh, I mean Rufus, yeah. Lesson, Miss Ben, Mad, Mr. Dalton Jackson, we's gonna be up against a stone wall. Yeah, but she loves Crandall Berry, a poor but honest aristocrat. All this wouldn't happen if Slibbly Slibbly, Miss Billy's near do well brother, hadn't lost the mortgage money playing AC Ducey with Dalton Jackson. <laughs> yes, and this is what caused old governor to go into the relapses. Yeah, but shh. Here comes Miss Lavinia, the prettiest gal in two upset township. Morning, Morning Miss Lavinia. Morning to you, too. Elias, dark days are indeed upon us. One bright ray alone shines through the clouds that obscure the horizon. Yeah, it did look like rain for a spell, but it's clearing up now. <laughs> no, Uncle Rufus. I'm referring to our beautiful coat, Shasta Gold. Which we hope will come home with a mortgage money when she runs into Freakness next Saturday. 
You mean Shasta go by faster Shasta ought to go jump? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The hoes that you've been a train and ever since that night, Mr. Crosby left him with us. <laughs> Hark! Do I hear the sound of horses' hoofs? <laughs> yes, Ruth, that's Dalton Jackson. Come to call on Miss Vinny. He seemed to be in a hurry. Ruth, go out and hold his horses. Yes, Missy, I'm going. Oh, Mr. Gibson. Mr. Gillespie, hurry. You'll have to play the villain after all. Yeah, but why, Mrs. Holstein? Where's Mr. Updike? Oh, he couldn't come tonight either. Last night he couldn't come because his wife was having a baby. What's it tonight? Twins. <laughs> <laughs> quick, oh, quick. Here's Dirty Dalton's coat and hat. Boy, and is it dirty. <laughs> How will I ever get this burnt cork off, Leroy? Oh, I know. Hooker, uh, lend me a clean handkerchief, will you? Surely. Here you are, Gildy. Thanks very much. Hey, what's the idea? Quiet, Judge. There's a show going on. There you are, Mr. Killersley. How soon do I go on? Uh, uh, not for another hour, Dottie. Oh, I'm so excited. I've been rehearsing my part for two weeks now, and I only hope I don't forget any of it. How many lines have you got? Well, only one. I went out and say, oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's sinking again. Or maybe I should say, oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's sinking again. Yes. Hurry, Unc, they need to go on stage. Marjorie's run out of dialogue, and she's stalling the audience. Yes. Have I got all the black off my face, Leroy? Yeah, but... Uh, give me the plug hat. Uh, here I come, Miss Vinny. But, Jeepers, Unc, you forgot to take the burnt cork off your hand. <laughs> oh, that's right. At last, Miss Vinny. Kindly excuse my hands. I've just been greasing my um, horse. <laughs> <laughs> to what are we indebted for this visit, Mark Jackson? Uh, Miss Lavinia, are we alone? Let me look. I feel a vague apprehension that the reddish glint in his eye bodes no good for me. Yes, we are alone, Martha Jackson. Eh, uh, good. At last, me sinister plans will bear fruit. I've been waiting for this moment. Now I have you in my clutches. No, no, I'll hand me. Ah! <laughs> Bring those foul fingers from that pair of form, you cur. Ah! Tis Crandall Berry, the poor but honest young aristocrat. He whom I love. Uh, curses foiled again. <laughs> Be gone, black god, and remember, he who, uh, he who, he who, <laughs> he who harms one hair of yon fair head must answer to Crandall Berry. Oh, thanks. Yes, he who harms one head of yon fair hair must answer to me. <laughs> I go now, my proud beauty, but I'll return on Saturday to foreclose the mortgage. <laughs> Here you are, Uncle. It's Governor's costume. Come on, will you? Thanks, Leroy. Now give me the goatee and the white mustache and some glue, will you? Oh, take it now, Mr. Gillespie. Not now, Dottie. All right, but should I read it? Oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's thinking again? <laughs> no, Dottie. Now the wig, Leroy. Hold that mirror up. There. I gotta go now, my public wig. Why, Vinny, you're crying. I just can't help it, Grandpapa. I'm so unhappy. Well, you come and sit down inside your grandpappy, and he'll all tell your story to cheer you up. Yes. Yes, Grandpapa. And this story took place when I was a youngin'. That was when the plantation stretched as far as your eye could. See? <laughs> <laughs> uh, the stable hands must be enjoying themselves. <laughs> well, anyway, this is the story of Bessie. Bessie and me, we roamed the hills together. She adored me, and I guess I kind of loved her, too. For years, we were constant companions, until one day, tragedy struck Bessie stumbled in a gopher hole and broke her leg. <laughs> there was nothing else to do but shoot poor Bessie. She's dead now, but there'll always be a warm spot in my heart for her. Was Bessie your favorite horse, Grandpapa? No, my child. Bessie was my first wife. <laughs> Now, 
Now tell me, Mr. Phelan, how do you like the play? Uh, quite amusing. Some of the actors are excellent. I like the old man, Governor Silsby, and also the Uncle Rufus character. They're both fine actors. But that guy who's playing the villain, he's terrible. at the racetrack on the afternoon of the big freakness handicap. And if that shaft to go, don't go today. We's gone tomorrow, that's all. Oh, Uncle Ruth, great news. Crandall Berry, my betrothed, has offered to ride our horse in the big race. But, Miss Vinny, has Mr. Crandall ever been a jockey before? No. <laughs> But Shasta Go has never been written before, so they're both starting off even. <laughs> Get him fast. Yeah, okay, I'll do this. <laughs> Quick, Hooker. Hooker, help me get this makeup off. Oh, please. Mr. Gillespie, now? No, Dottie, not now. Well, now, supposing I say, well, Vinny, your grandfather is thinking again. <laughs> no, Dottie, not now. Come on, Gildy. Crandall is waiting for you on stage. Okay, give me the blank pistol. Quick. Here you are. No, Uncle Wait. I haven't got time to wait, Leroy. Keepers, that wasn't a blank pistol. That was my funny tool. Aha, Barry. So we meet again. Yes, and to your sorrow, Dalton Jackson, for today I am riding Shasta Go in the Freakness. If what? Yes, and you cringe at the thought of me winning not only the race, but also the fair Lavinia and her old homestead from your vile clutches. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Little does he know that I have a revolver in my pocket. And ere I let him thwart me evil plans, I'll wait till his back is turned and send a bullet through his manly bosom. <laughs> ah, now's my chance. Uh, take that, Crandall Berry. Oh, I am shot. <laughs> oh, my goodness, I am shot. <laughs> yeah, nice acting there. Quick, quick, get a doctor. Oh. Now my horse will win the quickness, and I will win the divine Lavinia. <laughs> Help, is there a doctor in the house? What is this? My beloved, you are wounded. You're darn right I'm wounded. <laughs> oh, no, no, please don't turn me over on my back. Well, yeah, we are. Been at the racetrack. Only nice most time for the big race. Yeah, and nobody to ride shaft to go. Oh, misery, misery. Poor Crandall lying in a hospital bed on his stomach. <laughs> well, how did I know it was loaded? <laughs> and I go into the post. Every horse but chance to go. Oh, woe is me, and all is lost. Huh? I will ride chance to go. Simply, my ne'er to well, a brother. Yes. I who have brought naught but shame and sorrow to my dear sister and my poor ailing grandfather. I will ride fast go to victory. Oh, for corn's sake. <laughs> Come, there isn't a moment to lose. Quick, Sibley. Mount Shasta. Very well. Ah. Hasten, Sibley, dear. And remember, if you do not win the freakness... Just keep traveling, brother. <laughs> Don't worry. I shall win. Come, Shasta, go! Let us hasten to the rail for the start. Yes, sir. You coming, Ruth? No, I'm going to stand on this here box from which I can see the whole race. For I do dearly love to call the progress of the freakness a loud. Oh, oh Mr. Gillespie, now? No, Dottie, not now. Shaft to go, broke back, beautiful start. Now she's streaking in the turn. And it's Mel Fry first, down beat second, and Nancy Quinn third. Shaft to go is bringing up the rear. Now they're in the back stretch, and Shaft to go is running a beautiful race, folks. And at the half, it's Tangle Foot first. No, Dottie, not now, second. And Gaffer Dolan third. Shasta Go is doing a sweet job of bringing up the rear, folks. And it looks like, yes, it is. Donald Allen first, Gravel Eve second, and Philip L third. Shasta Go has finally brought the rear up. Tearing down home stretch, and heading for the finish, it's Philip L first, Gravel Eve second, and Robin Ann third. As they cross the finish line, it's Shasta Go, the winner. Oh, Uncle Ruth, isn't it wonderful? 
Now we can pay the mortgage. I can marry Crandall and Grandpapa will get better. And Grandpapa will get better. And Grandpapa will get better. Daddy, now. Oh, oh, Lavinia, your grandfather, he's thinking again. <laughs> Quick, Uncle Ruth, rush back to the shingles and tell Grandpapa how she has to go one. The good news may save his life. Oh, thank goodness. This will be over in about 20 minutes, Judge. I can't make any more of these quick changes. Speed it up, Gilly. Do you realize it's 12.30 already? 12.30? Great balls of fire. Is the drawing room set back in place? Yes, everything's ready to go. Uh, all set out there, Bertie? I think so, Miss Gilly. Okay, then. Flash the orchestra. Third act. On your toes, everybody. Curtain hooker, curtain. Well, yeah, he is in the drawing room of old Governor Silvis' home, the shingles. Yep. Hey, she isn't supposed to say that. No, that speech belongs to Act One at the very opening. Yes, so, Bertie, wrong line. And things look mighty bad for the old Governor. Oh, Bertie, you're starting the whole play all over again at half past twelve. <laughs> Oh, get her off. Somebody would be here till 4 o'clock in the morning. I wonder where my husband, Uncle Rufus, the butler is. Gildersleeve, the show must go on. You've got to get out there. No, no, I won't. Absolutely not. Now, who can that be? Who's that a knocking at the door outside? No, oh, I give in. Who are you expecting except your joy and pride? Here we go again. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve, this is Mr. Whalen, a talent scout from RKO Pictures. Oh, a talent scout. Uh, yes, I want to sign up a member of the cast. Oh, no. <laughs> not me. Oh, that's right, not you. <laughs> I've uh, got a contract for your horse. She has to go. The studio is running short of trucks. Yeah. Good night, folks. <laughs> Music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week at this same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. We Americans are mighty lucky. We have the right foods in abundance, the good nourishing foods that help make us strong. And here in America, the right foods need not be expensive. Take parquet margarine, for example, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is one of the right foods that help make America strong. Yet parquet is so downright economical, you'll feel free to use all you need. You see, parquet margarine is a highly nutritious food, one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. What's more, parquet is the margarine that tastes so deliciously good as a spread and used in cooking, too. So note it down. Order delicious, economical parquet margarine tomorrow. Just ask for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Terry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, let me pass along an economy tip to you housewives. You're trying to hold down the cost of your dinner main dishes. Well, 
You know macaroni and cheese is a fine, thrifty main dish. But do you know this? With a product called Kraft Dinner, you can make grand macaroni and cheese thriftily and make it in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, every package of thrifty Kraft Dinner contains a special quick-cooking macaroni. Also, some Kraft Grated, which lets you sprinkle the cheese goodness through and through the fluffy macaroni. In a jiffy, you have a delicious, economical main dish. When you're in the food store, it's smart to buy several packages of Kraft Dinner, for the family will want Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese often. Tomorrow, ask for Kraft Dinner. And now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's waded through his morning paper and his morning milk and is now struggling through his morning mail. Uh, bills, bills, nothing but bills. Well, here's a postcard. It says, uh, be thin as a leaf by boiling your beef. <laughs> from some dietetic advisor? You no, know, Marjorie, it's from the Sultan's Delight Turkish Baths. <laughs> well, well, a letter from the manager of my old rubber plant, the Gildersleeve Girdle Works. <laughs> what do you know? It's been converted into a factory to repair barrage balloons. <laughs> that certainly is a big change, isn't it, Uncle? Oh, not much, Leroy. After all, they're still putting blimps into shape again. <laughs> or am I stretching things a little? <laughs> what does he write, Uncle Moy? Uh, he says they've made the mistake of inflating a big balloon inside the factory. Jeepers, did it cause any trouble? I'll say it simply raised the roof. <laughs> oh, here's what I've been waiting for. It's from the State War Savings Administrator. The pins and the stickers I sent for. Uh, here are your pins, children. Oh, this is cute. Yeah, what's it for, Uncle? Well, I've been investing part of the income from your estate in war bonds. And doing the same with my income. Now, we're all full-fledged members of the 10% Club. The 10% Club? What kind of a club is that? Uh, Leroy, it's the club that's going to help give the Axis a beating. Look, they sent us stickers to put up in our front window, too. Oh, yes. We're buying at least 10%. Uh-huh. Uncle Mort, you have two stickers. Sure. <laughs> I forgot to tell you, we're investing 20%. <laughs> mm, well, this tin is certainly what the well-dressed American will wear this summer. Gee, Unc, you've got one left over. Can I have it for my pajamas at night? Yeah. No, Leroy, that one belongs to Bertie. Her 10% is deducted out of her paycheck each month. Oh, uh, Bertie! Yes, Mr. Gillsleeve. You want a spot of black coffee? Yeah, no, Bertie. I've got a spot of red, white, and blue for you. Here's your 10% club pin. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah, don't thank me. Thank Uncle Sam. Or rather, Uncle Sam thanks you. <laughs> no need to do that. I'd like to be over there playing the stars and stripes forever on that Hitler's head with a skillet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if I can, I'm going to use some of my dough for bomb dumplings to go with his cooked goose. <laughs> <laughs> That's the right spirit, Bertie. As I said to Judge Hooker, oh, my goodness, I'm late for the office. Where's my hat? Under your arm, Uncle. Oh, I see. Then where'd I put my briefcase? On your head. Oh. <laughs> and goodbye, everybody. And Bertie, don't forget to take this umbrella stand out of the hall. Because someday... <laughs> someday somebody liable to trip over it. So long. Oh, poor Uncle Mort. You better remove that stand, Bertie. You wouldn't want him to hurt himself. No, at least not until after Father's Day. What's that got to do with it? Well, gee, we bought him a super-duper present on account of he's been just like a father to us. Hey, Roy, that was to be a surprise. Oh, I forgot. Now, Bertie, you've got to promise you won't breathe a word about the present for the present. Well, I'll tell you what, I don't know what it is. Well, it's just what he's been wanting. A great big easy chair. Yes, sir, a green leather club chair. Oh, Marge, now you've given it away. Bertie, you've got to keep this in confidence. Oh, don't you worry. I'm the biggest confident woman you ever see. <laughs> Hello, Spencer. Oh, Slepperman. Uh, welcome to Slepperman's Overstuffed Furniture Store. And is this store over for stuff with furniture? <laughs> well, Sam, how are you? Physically, I'm in the pink. Financially, I'm even more so. I'm in the red. Yeah. <laughs> but 
can I do for you if I'm not being too continental? Oh, really nothing. I just thought I'd drop in and browse around. Oh, go right ahead. Everybody's doing it. Business has been very browsy lately. <laughs> and if you don't see what you want, just remember, can I help it if my stock is monotonous? <laughs> I saw a nice display of leather club chairs in the window. That's why I came in, Sam. I was sort of daydreaming, you know, with Father's Day on Sunday... Wouldn't it be nice if I were a father? Yeah, that's a little short notice. I don't think you can make it. <laughs> yeah, I know that slept. Marjorie and Leroy are fine children, but isn't it too bad I haven't any children of my own to buy me one of those chairs? I suppose your kids are pretty good to you. Oh, sure. All eight of them. <laughs> They're so good to me on Father's Day that I'm broke for the rest of the month. <laughs> You mean they buy you a present and then charge it to you? Oh, no. They buy the money from me beforehand. Yeah. <laughs> Look, Guilty, if you had kids, they do the same thing. So why don't you pretend you have a son and that you're him and he wants to buy you a nice chair? Go on. Don't be stingy with the boy. <laughs> now, don't you go to work on me, Slepperman. I already have a soft spot for that brown leather club chair. Yes, and the vice is versa. It, what do you mean? That chair has a soft spot for you. It was just made for you. Look, extra wide seat, big soft cushion, heavy legs. You, are you describing the chair? <laughs> I'm not so foolish I should insult a customer. <laughs> Go on, sit in at once. It's free. Yeah, all right, Sam. Yeah, that certainly looks cozy. Yeah. Uh, this is like floating in the ocean, only not so wet. <laughs> How much do you want for this chair? Uh, Sixty-seven fifty, and that's my rocky bottom price. <laughs> but Sam, this chair hasn't got a rocky bottom. You got me. Sixty-five. <laughs> uh, fifty-five. Oh no, you can have one of the red ones or a green one for fifty-five. But the brown one costs me more. But why is that? The manufacturer has a whim. Yeah. But I don't like green or red chairs. They remind me of traffic signals, and that makes me mad. Okay, guilty old pal. I'll let you have the brown one for $60. Yeah, $60, eh? All right. They send it up to my house tomorrow. If I'm not, say, I just remembered. There's a chair exactly like this one in the window for $60. Sure, guilty. 60 is the ceiling price. And how can I cover my overhead if I don't hit the ceiling? You got me. <laughs> Please. Well, hello, Judge Hooker. This is my sister, Amelia. Amelia, this is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Oh, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, this is a pleasure indeed, Miss Hooker. I'm quite surprised to see how attractive your sister is, Judge. The way you always talk, I thought she... By the way, Gildersleeve, I'm glad I ran into you today. I've been meaning to find out when you intend returning that umbrella I loaned you around Christmas time. Yeah, just as soon as you return that copy of No by George Waite. I never borrowed your copy of No by George Wade. I remember now. It wasn't a book. It was an umbrella you borrowed for me. Long after I returned yours. I borrowed one from you? You're full of balloon juice. Oh, now, Horace, I'm sure you're mistaken. You keep out of this, Amelia. Yes, you keep... Hooker, don't talk that way to your sister. She's my sister. I'll talk to her any way I please. Not when there's a gentleman around. Maybe not, but until one comes along, I'll talk to her any way I please. <laughs> Are you hinting that I'm no gentleman? I'm hinting that you're a big fat fool. Uh, judge, now you're hinting below the belt. <laughs> uh, really, Miss Amelia, I never expected you to be so attractive with such an insignificant... And look. stop making Google eyes at her. Well, uh, I'm not making Google eyes at her. That's just the victim of tour in me coming out. <laughs> and am I glad to get rid of it? <laughs> Goodbye, Miss Amelia. I hope I see you in better company the next time. You better return my umbrella, you deadbeat. Oh, sh quiet, Horace. My goodness, let that nice Mr. Gildersleeve keep it. You've got two umbrellas in the closet downstairs. Oh, no. Oh, yes. One with a gold handle and the other with a broken rib. Oh, great Scott. Well, what's wrong? That broken one is Gildersleeve's. And the gold handle one is the one I loaned him. Well, Horace Hooker, shame on you. 
Now, you must do something to make up for the way you've insulted Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, maybe I'll buy him something for his birthday. It's the 21st. The 21st? Well, that's Sunday. Okay, then I'll send him a postal card. Special delivery. You'll do nothing of the sort. Now, you come with me. Where are you going? Over to Obler's department store to buy Mr. Gildersleeve a birthday present. I saw the most comfy red leather club chair in the window this morning. Mars. Hello, me, Roy. Hiya, Bertie. Uncle Mort home yet? No, but his chair is. Oh, dear. The salesman at Phelps and Fowler's promised they wouldn't deliver it until tomorrow morning. Well, let's hide it someplace till then. How about your room, Bertie? My room? Why, it's so small, I have to do my setting up exercises sitting down. <laughs> Even have to open the window to throw my chest out. <laughs> well, let's see the chair. <gasps> Oh, that's not the right one. No, this one's brown. And we bought a green one. Oh, Jiggles, Uncle Morton, dear, what do we do? I'll sit down on a chair, and you children sit on me, and that'll hide it. <laughs> Is anybody home? Well, do Mother to answer if you're not. Oh, there you are. Oh, hello, Dottie. We thought you were Uncle Mort. Oh, how could you make a mistake like that? I don't look anything like your Uncle Mort, even in these slacks. Or do I? Well, look at that pretty chair. Yeah, we bought it for Uncle Moore for Father's Day, and it came a day too soon, and it's the wrong color. I'm, pre- I'm just petrified that he'll come home any minute and find it. Well, then, look, why don't you bring it over to my house and keep it there until you can change it? Oh, well, thank you, Daddy. I'll phone Phelps and Fowler from there and ask him to bring the green one. Come on, Leroy, let's, let's take it out of the black chair. That must be your uncle now. Now, you folks hurry. I'm coming. Save the electricity. How do? I'm from Phelps and Fowler. I got a green leather chair for Mr. Gildersleeve. Man, that's very good. Sit it right here in the hallway. Okay. <laughs> Will you sign for it, please? Can I just initial it? Certainly. All right. B L C. That stands for Bertie Lee Coggins. I better write that underneath. Now you go over to the Dobson's house next door and pick up that brown chair that was brought over there by mistake. Well, this is the first I've ever heard of a. Uh-oh, here comes trouble. Oh, good afternoon, Bertie. Uh, hello, Mr. Gilsley. Uh, excuse me a moment. I'm just going to show this gentleman where the Dobsons live. Just walk this way, mister. Sure. Uh, he couldn't walk the way Bertie does to save his life. <laughs> now, what's this blocky dish? Why, it's my chair. Oh, that Slepperman. I told him I didn't want a green chair. Wait till I get hold of him. Of all the stupid mistakes, sending me a green chair when I distinctly said hello. Is this Slepperman? It ain't Tom Lewis. <laughs> Sam, this is Gildersleeve. You know that brown chair you sold me? Yes. I just arrived home and found it here, and it's green. There must be some mistake. Yeah, I'll say it. You better come right over and correct it. Okay, guilty old friend. I'll be there in three sakes of a jiffy. But I can't understand it. That chair is not supposed to turn green until next spring. <laughs> The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, let me tell you homemakers how to do a little sleight-of-hand performance in the kitchen. It's how to make delicious macaroni and cheese with magic speed. You do it with a product called Kraft Dinner. Out of the Kraft Dinner box, take the special Kraft Dinner macaroni and cook it in boiling water not more than seven minutes. Then drain off the water, add a little butter and milk. And with the Kraft grated that also comes in every Kraft Dinner package, sprinkle the cheese flavor through and through. In as little time as it takes you to make the coffee, you have a grand money-saving main dish ready. Macaroni and cheese that the whole family will go for, cooked in only seven minutes. It does seem like a sleight of hand trick, doesn't it? Well, get set to do this kitchen magic real soon. Tomorrow, ask your food dealer for Kraft Dinner. Better get several packages, because the folks will love Kraft Dinner Macaroni and Cheese. And now let's return to the great Gildersleeve, who's taking a short nap, completely unaware of the fact that Mr. Schlepperman has come with another brown chair and taken back the green one that Marjorie and Leroy brought for Father's Day. Right now, his niece and nephew are returning from Dottie's house. I sure hope Uncle Mort likes the chair we picked out. Oh, I'm positive that he will. Oh, I can just see him now, stretched out on that comfy green leather. 
smoking a cigar. And spilling the ashes all over his vest. <laughs> well, we'll get him an ashtray. One of the... Leroy! Do you see what I see? You mean that brown leather chair. We just got through hauling it over to Dottie's. And then I saw the delivery man take it away. Well, he must have brought it right back here. Well, let's get it back to Dottie's before Uncle Mort sees it. Oh, that's the front doorbell. Oh, come on, brother. Out through the kitchen. Bertie, someone's ringing the bell. If this keeps up, I'm going to be worn down to a shadow. Five forty-two. <laughs> Hello there, Bertie. Hello, Judge Hooker. I've got a little surprise for Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, what, you do? Yes, look. You mean that that red leather chair? Yes. Now, I don't want you to breathe a word about it to a soul. Who, me? <laughs> don't you worry. Long side of me, the Sphinx is just another Gracie Allen. <laughs> Help me carry it in. Now, just put it in the living room for Gilly. And don't tell him who it's from. Let him guess a while. But Judge Hooker. <laughs> I wonder what he'll say when he finds out. <laughs> I know. He'll say, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Yes, well, well, goodbye. And remember, mum's the word. Yes, sir. Mum's the word for Father's Day. Green chairs, red chairs, brown chairs. Where are we going to put them all? <laughs> Bernie, did a man bring a chair while I was asleep? Yes, sir, frequently. <laughs> oh, well, at last, now I'll... <laughs> Bertie, am I seeing red? I don't know, but you sure is turning red. <laughs> this is the last straw. I told that slipperman to take his green chair back and bring me my brown one. And now it turns out to be red. <laughs> Give me that telephone. Thank you, Bertie. Do you know anything about this? Oh, me? <laughs> no, sir. I was just an innocent byproduct. <laughs> I'm going to get to the bottom of this chair business, right down to the seat of the trouble, or my name isn't... Slapperman Studio Fine Furniture, Sam Slapperman, soul prop speaking. I'm going to knock that prop out from under his soul. <laughs> Hello, this is Gildersleeve again. Hello, Gildy, did you find your chair? Yeah, I found the chair all right. Low, wide, and handsome, ain't it? <laughs> yes, and it's also red. <laughs> Who read it? <laughs> no, the color is red. I feel the funniest sensation in my ears, as if you said the color is red. <laughs> That's what I did say. A tricky boy, I personally delivered to your house one genuine brown leather chair. Not khaki, not mocha, coca, or karaoke, <laughs> but brown, B-R-O-W, and so forth. I'm looking at it right now, and it's red. Say, it's undressed leather. Maybe it's blushing. <laughs> Well, this time I'm going to make sure there's no mistake. Oh. I'm going to load this chair on my rumble seat and bring it over to your store. And if I don't get a brown chair this time, I'm going to buy a war bond with the money and sit on that for the next ten years. How come you bringing back this chair? Lady, when I took this brown chair back to Phelps and Fowler, the boss told me it ain't our chair at all. Well, then leave it here, mister. Chairs has been floating in and out this house like a flood in a furniture factory. Okay. Yeah, there you are. Bye. What we ought to do is give them all to the government. Three chairs for the red, white, and blue. Bertie, I just found I made a mistake. Mr. Gildersleeve's birthday is July 21st, not June 21st. Yeah, but you need to rush back to tell me. I knew that all the time. No, no, I came back to get that chair. I'll just take it home and keep it there for a month. Well, you might as well, because chairs is the most thing we got plenty of. <laughs> Thanks. Now, remember, we're still going to keep it all secret. Don't worry, I'll zip my lip. Thank you. I've got to hurry so I won't run into Gildersleeve. Honey... I guess my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. I swear this leather looks a lot more brown than it does red. Honest, guilty, I still insist that this is the third brown leather chair I'm bringing into this house today. But what about the green one and the red one? They ain't mine. That's why I brought them along in the back of the trunk. You can have them. It, no, thanks. All I want is the brown one you sold me. Now help me carry it in the house, Sam. All right. Follow me. I know the way blindfolded already. <laughs> Just look at that letter. It comes from only the most contented cows. 
I suppose the springs are very helpful, too. Oh. Careful going around the umbrella stand, Guilty. Yeah, I know. I've been here before. All right, you can set it down now, Sam. Mm. See? I'm a little tired. And why not? It's pretty hot for July, isn't it? it it's still June, Slepperman. I know it, but it's even hot for July. <laughs> You care for a bottle of uh, root beer? I don't mind if you'll be so kindly. Yeah, come on in the kitchen. We'll get it ourselves. Gee, where is everybody today? Seems as though. Oh, for Pete's sake, how'd that brown chair get back in here again? (laughs) I bet that old Dottie hasn't sense enough to leave it over at her house. Well, there's nothing for me to do but drag it back next door again. Next time I'm going to attach an outboard motor to it. Come on, Cher, let's go. No, no, Sam, I keep telling you, those red and green chairs are not mine. But guilty, what happened to the two other brown ones? I don't know. You can see for yourself that I've only got that... (laughs) Where's the chair we brought in here just now? Why ask me? I was in the kitchen with you drinking. Root beer, remember? <laughs> That's right. Let's look around. It couldn't have walked off, could it? I don't know. Maybe it was a discontented cow after all. <laughs> By George, I've heard of disappearing beds and fading wallpaper. But this is the first time I've ever seen a vanishing club chair. I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. And now that I don't see it, I still don't believe it. <laughs> it's nowhere around here. There's only one thing to do. Hand me that telephone. Here you are. What are you going to do? Call the police. A good idea. The low life who did this should get the chair. Should. He did. <laughs> Come on out here, Sam. Here comes a couple of plain clothes men now. You stay where you are, Gus. I won't be long. Okay, Lieutenant. I'm in no hurry. Uh, are you from uh, headquarters? Yes. Which one of you gents is Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve? A fine detective. Him, of course. Oh. Well, I'm Lieutenant Miller of the burglary squad. I was on my way to the station when I got a radio call to stop here. What's the trouble? The great big leather chairs. They do tricks. Yeah. Tricks? What kind of tricks? They keep changing colors. Rushing in and out of here. Disappearing into thin air. Yeah, look, mister, you don't need a detective. You need glasses. Oh, no, no. He's had a couple of glasses already. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. But it was only root beer. No. Hey, Lieutenant, you don't understand. If somebody stole a chair right from out under our noses while our backs were turned. Yeah, it sounds impossible. Maybe, but this is a case where the truth is more than fiction, stranger. Can you describe this chair? Uh, let me see. It had a zoot seat. With a sack back. And a stuffed tuft. And it sold for 60 bucks. Now, <laughs> oh, come on. Cut out the horseplay. What was the style, color, material, and size? It was a brown leather club chair. The same size as me. A 48 stub. <laughs> well, if someone walked out with it, we shouldn't have any trouble tracing it. Have you asked the neighbors if they saw anything suspicious? Oh, no, no, I haven't. Well, suppose we try a few. All right, we'll ask the neighbors. Uh, let's start with the Dobsons next door, huh? Say, Guilty, this is exciting. Don't you feel just like the Tin Man? No, I guess you don't. <laughs> do you think we should look for a footprints, Lieutenant? You mean on the sidewalk? What do you think this is, Grawman's Chinese? Yeah. My, <laughs> my, my, he's a regular salary queen. And now remember... <laughs> Are you sure you let me do the question? Yeah, all right. Come on, come on. I have an all day. Oh, oh, uh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, hello, Dottie. This is Lieutenant Miller from the police department and Mr. Slepperman. From the furniture department. <laughs> have a guard. We're investigating a chair which disappeared from our house. Oh, well, do you mean a big brown leather club chair that was delivered there just this afternoon? Well, no, I haven't even heard about it. What does it look like? Well, um, it looks like, uh, let me see. It looks exactly like both of those brown chairs in your hallway. Oh? All right, young lady. Start talking. Oh, no, Lieutenant, don't get her started talking. <laughs> Once I kept talking to a streetcar motorman, yeah. and he ran to the end of the line. 
Get quiet, please. I wish they'd ration her gas. <laughs> I tell you, I still don't get it. I tell you, quiet, please. I can't understand you people when you talk one at a time, let alone like this. Now, who's Marjorie? That's me. Now, if you had to buy your uncle something for Father's Day, why didn't you just get him a necktie? How do you like that? Trying to ruin the furniture business. <laughs> Bertie will tell you that we bought the green chair. Now, won't you, Bertie? No, ma'am. Why not? Because I ain't no stool pigeon. <laughs> hey, Uncle, look out the window. Somebody's sneaking up to our house in the brown chair. Why, George, you're right. There's the thief, Lieutenant. Come on, let's get it. All right, come on. Stop. Drop that chair or I'll shoot. Hey, what's the idea? Put down that gun. Put down that chair first. Judge Hooker, what are you doing? Oh, I was trying to keep it a secret, Gildy. <laughs> I took the wrong chair. Oh, at last, a confession. Yes. Who's confessing to what? I just made a mistake, that's all. Yes, Judge, a fatal mistake. When you stole that chair, you dragged yourself off the bench. You don't understand. I bought you a chair for your birthday. A likely story. My birthday is a month off, and you're too cheap to return an umbrella, let alone buy me an expensive present. Officer, arrest that man. If you do, I'll sue you for false arrest, illegal incarceration, <laughs> malicious persecution, criminal libel, slander, and, and... Well, you'll be sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to take any chances. Load all the chairs and slip them and struck. I'm going to haul all the evidence and all the witnesses down to headquarters. Before I go, I insist on phoning the chief of police. Oh, okay. Come on into the house with me. Uh, the chief of police is a drunk or something. They slip them did you hear what the lieutenant told us to do? Sure, it's easy. I've already got the red and green ones on. Also the two brown ones from Miss Daddy's house. All I got to do is lift up the one the judge lifted. Uh, I go like this. And we're ready to go. Oh, uh, say, Mr. Gillisleeve. Huh? Oh, oh yes, you're Gus, the lieutenant's partner, aren't you? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. If he's going to take you all down in a squad car, I'd better take the truck and drive the evidence down to headquarters. That's an excellent idea. Hey, Slepperman, give the officer your keys. All right. Be careful with the clutch. It grabs. I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah, I'd certainly be glad when we can get this all unraveled. and I can find a seat, I can call my own. You said it, guilty boy. This has been a most hectic day. Yeah. Oh, well, here comes the lieutenant and Hooker now. Well, Mr. Gildersleeve, I just had a little talk with the chief. He says for the lieutenant to forget the whole matter. So all you people get in a huddle and divide up those chairs among you. Say, where's Gus? You mean your partner? He drove the truck to the chairs down to police headquarters. My partner? That wasn't my partner. That was Gus Burns, a crook that I was taking to jail. <laughs> Oh, my chairs. Oh, Lieutenant, what I can't understand is that you letting that chair snatcher sit in that squad car unguarded. Well, I had him handcuffed to the wheel. I can't imagine how he got away. Did he ask anyone here to give him a key or a file? No, well, no, no, I said no. No, sir. The only thing the man asked me for was a hairpin. Oh! <laughs> Good night, folks. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by William Randall. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft 
Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Peary as the Great Gildersleeve, written by Leonard L. Levinson. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But if tomorrow's wash day and you homemakers are bound to be hurried getting lunch, let me give you a tip. Serve the folks macaroni and cheese. Do you say you haven't time to bake macaroni and cheese on wash day? Well, of course you don't. But haven't you heard of Kraft Dinner? With Kraft Dinner, you can make grand macaroni and cheese in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, you don't bake Kraft Dinner macaroni. You don't fuss with grating cheese because each package of Kraft Dinner contains an envelope of Kraft grated, all ready to sprinkle in. With Kraft Dinner, you get fluffy, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness, and you cook it in seven minutes flat. See for yourself tomorrow. Ask your food dealer for Kraft Dinner. And now let's visit our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's been long noted for his easygoing disposition. In fact, his disposition was so easygoing, it finally went. Uncle Mort's face has been getting longer and his temper shorter. And he's starting to throw his weight around with unpleasant results everywhere it's landed. Oh, my goodness, Marjorie. I'm late to the office again. Oh, good morning, Uncle Mort. Hey, good morning. All right, I'm, am I supposed to starve around here? Where's breakfast? Bertie, breakfast. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh, what do you start off with? Grapefruit, cantaloupe, strawberries, orange juice. What's the trouble? Don't the stores still sell prunes? Oh, I thought you were sick and tired of prunes. Whatever gave you that idea? Oh, yesterday morning you flung yourself out of the house saying you're fed up, and I asked Leroy what the trouble was, and he says you're full of prunes. Oh! <laughs> uh, excuse me, folks, i got to hurry to school. Yeah, come back here, young man. School doesn't begin again until next September. Just my luck. Oh, what am I saying? <laughs> now, Uncle, why don't you sit down and eat the nice egg Bertie's fried for you? That's what I'm trying to do. Bertie, what is this, a fried egg or the stopper out of the kitchen sink? It's an egg, Mr. Gill, and it was cooked, Bertie. It wasn't cooked, Bertie. It was vulcanized. <laughs> I give up. Just wrap it up, and on my way downtown, I'll drop it on a scrap rubber pile. <laughs> By George, I'd like to slap a Jap in the map with this scrap. <laughs> and there's going to be a war in this house, unless I start getting fed properly around here. My, my, he's worse today than he was yesterday when he poured the coffee in his lap and then spilled the cream on his vest, thus dissolving the sugar in his pocket. <laughs> yeah, I wonder what's wrong with Uncle lately. He's been as jumpy as a kangaroo on a pogo stick. Yes. Poor Uncle Mort. You mean poor us. We're the one he's doing his jumping on. You know, I think I have an idea what's troubling him. Gee, what is it, sis? Uncle Mort hasn't any... Love life. Oh, for corn's sake. Be serious, can't you, Marge? But I am serious. If he could only get excited about some woman, it might calm him down. Oh, you mean he ought to give unto himself a wife? What does he want a wife for? He's got Marge to sew on his buttons, and you to cook for him, and Judge Hooker to fight with. What more could a guy want? <laughs> I don't necessarily mean a wife, Leroy, but some attractive woman he could get interested in. Then he wouldn't have time to be irritable or critical. At least we could experiment. Okay. But who will we get to turn on the glamour? Well, how about Mrs. Salisbury Twitchell? Nope. Her face has had too many retreads. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you say to Miss Rosita Callahan? Oh, she's got a pen like a rabbit. Now, wait a minute, brother. Who's going to fall in love with this girl, you or Uncle Mort? Well, Gio was just giving you a man's viewpoint. Well, who would you pick up? What about Amelia Hooker? Judge Hooker's sister? Sure. She's awfully nice and jolly, and she makes the swellest cakes and candy. Yes. She's a high school teacher. Is that so? What does she teach? Oh, she teaches girls domestic silence. (laughs) (laughs) Gee, this will be a cinch. I don't know about that. You can't make a silk purse in a pig's eye. (laughs) Now, building up a romance for your Uncle Martin ain't going to be no picnic. Picnic? That's it. We'll have a picnic on Sunday and invite Judge Hooker and his sister. Uh-huh. Now, make some of my famous potato salad. That ought to bring Judge Hooker. And I'll ask Amelia to bake one of her luscious cakes. That should bring Uncle. Yeah, and it'll probably bring all the ants, too. <laughs> no, my 
me, this is Sunday. The day I rest my feet. I refuse to go on your picnic. But why not, Uncle Mort? Well, you've heard about nature lovers, haven't you? Of course. Well, I'm a nature hater. <laughs> Rocks, skunks, snakes, bees, swamps, mosquitoes. You can take all of them and give them back to the Boy Scouts and tell them to give them back to the Indians. <laughs> oh, but Uncle Mort, think of all the fun we'll have at Underwood Falls. It, what fun? Grinding the rubber off our tires? No, we're saving rubber. We're taking the excursion train. We? If, who all's going on this pickle and potato salad promenade? <laughs> well, there's Leroy and me and Judge Hooker and his sister. Judge Hooker, yeah. Is Amelia Hooker going to? Mm-hmm. And she's baked the most delicious devil food cake. For you, incidentally. For me? But why devil's food? <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's because she thinks you're such a handsome devil. Yeah, uh, handsome devil, uh, who, me? Oh. <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, that's the first time you've laughed in a week. Huh? Now, come on along. You'll have fun. It's Marjorie, I told you how I feel about picnics. Well, strange. I mean, you thought you were an outdoor man. She said that you remind her of... <laughs> Gary Cooper. <laughs> What's so funny about that? Amelia's entitled to her opinion. <laughs> Gary Cooper, eh? Gosh, I don't know what to say. It, hmm, Gary Cooper, huh? Well, I don't know. Oh, why don't you join us, Uncle? We're leaving on the 10 o'clock. Gary Cooper, huh? It, excuse me, partner, would you mind stepping away from that there mirror? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I see what she means by Gary Cooper. Amelia was talking about the wide open spaces. <laughs> Beautiful. Mighty pretty country hereabouts, ma'am. The air is so fine and clear. <laughs> yes. You just say the word, Miss Amelia, and I'll climb that var tree and bring you down some eagle eggs. Oh, no, thank you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, then, can I fetch you some more uh, tater salad? Oh, no, not another thing, Mr. Gildersleeve. Now, Miss Amelia, no need to be formal. Just call me Throckmorton. Well, all right, Throckmorton. Sounds mighty like music here, and you say it, ma'am. Uh, mind if I sit alongside you here? Uh, no. Oh, well, that's all right. Don't move. <clears throat> Yeah. Excuse me, Miss Amelia, but where, boss, did you put that devil's food cake? Well, I put it right where you... Never mind. Marjorie, have you got a nice wet cloth? Oh, Rock Morton, what a shame. Yeah, that was a darn good cake. Why can't you be more careful where you put your circumference, you, <laughs> you big pudding punch? Now, Horace Hooker, stop insulting Throckmorton. Oh, I don't mind. Come, Miss Amelia. Let's wander down to the pond and look at the water lilies. Be careful, Amelia. Don't let the big bullfrog sit on the lily pad. <laughs> Why, that little uh, uh, joker. Oh, look. Aren't they pretty? Would you like some? I'll wait out and get them for you. Oh, no, Throckmorton. You'll get your shoes wet. Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> I'll just take them off and, and my socks and roll up my trousers. Now, be careful, Uncle Mort. Yeah, don't worry. Ooh, the water's cold, isn't it? <laughs> no, Daniel Boone, it's just your feet that are cold. I'll show you, Hooker. In just a second, Amelia. I'll have your bouquet in just a... Oh! <laughs> Morton, say something. Yeah, probably has a frog in his throat. <laughs> Look, it's the Panama hat come to the surface. It's drifting away. That's all right. He's probably weaving another one underwater. <laughs> oh, here he comes. Well, thank goodness. <laughs> Who put that hole there? <laughs> oh, my goodness, I've ruined all my cigars. We'll help him out, Horace. Look at the big flounder flounder. <laughs> Here, Gildy, take my hand. Yeah, thanks. Is it very wet in there? <laughs> oh, no, Judge. Come on in. The water's fine. Hey, let go. Ooh. <laughs> You're telling me. Oh, now, boys, that's enough 
have fun for one day. Come on now. Yeah, I'm glad you need it. Sit down here, Uncle. Yeah? Well, one thing good. It's worse the cake icing off your trousers. Uh, Gee, there must be an easier way of doing it than that. <laughs> here, Leroy, please dry off my watch. Okay, I'll wring it out. Yes. Oh, my goodness, give me a towel, someone. Why don't you just shake yourself, you little Airedale? <laughs> Look at me, I'm a mess. Yeah, you haven't changed a bit, Judge. <laughs> Here's a watch, Junk. Cheapers, look at the time. Oh, it's almost time for our train. And the station's a mile away. Oh, gather up the picnic things, Leroy. Oh, where's your coat, Clark Morton? Throat coat? I hung it on a limb of a tree while we were playing baseball. Oh, yes, there it is. Well, I'll get it for you. Then we must hurry up. Oh. What's the matter, Amelia? Look, a bird. It's building a nest in your coat pocket. What's that? <laughs> Let me see. Oh, uh, look, everybody. A bird's building its nest in my coat pocket. Oh, uh, how sweet. Well, what a pity we have to dispossess her after all her work. Well, what are we supposed to be, the FHA? <laughs> Shoo her away and let's get going. Oh, Horace, you're too cruel. I am not. Well, what are you going to do? Leave your coat here? Yes, by George. That's exactly what I'm going to do. But, Uncle, you'll catch cold. No, I won't, my dear. The memory of that little mother bird's gratitude will keep me warm. Gee, Aunt, that's the only bird in the country with a double-breasted bungalow. <laughs> Sir Walter Galahad, come on or we miss the train. Help me with our stuff, Amelia. Yes, yes, coming, Horace. Uh, that was a very sweet gesture, Scott Morton. I, I like that very much. Now, now, Amelia. It's nothing that Gary Cooper wouldn't have done. Can you carry the big basket on? Yeah, sure. Jesus, why are you leaving your coat here? Well, my boy, in the first place, it's made a wonderful impression on Amelia. In the second place, the rest of the suit was ruined anyway. And in the third place, that bird that was building the nest was a woodpecker. And I never argue with woodpeckers in the first place. <laughs> the great Gilder Slave will be with us again in just a few minutes. Meanwhile, a suggestion about getting your food budget to balance. You're on the lookout for economical main dishes, I know. Well, let me point out the thrifty product called Kraft Dinner. For Kraft Dinner not only gives you grand macaroni and cheese in a jiffy, it's very economical, too. To make this delicious Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese, you simply cook the special Kraft Dinner macaroni in boiling water. You cook it not more than seven minutes and drain off the water. Add a little butter and milk. Then, with the Kraft grated that comes in every package, you sprinkle the cheese flavor through and through the fluffy macaroni. In as little time as it takes the coffee to perk, you have a grand money-saving main dish ready. Macaroni and cheese that the whole family will love. Many smart homemakers are never without Kraft Dinner on the pantry shelf. So tomorrow, why don't you get your pantry set for delicious macaroni and cheese that you make in seven minutes. Get several packages of Kraft Dinner. Love like mumps and measles hits awfully hard when it hits late in life, and Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve has it bad. For the past week, Uncle Mort has been wooing and wowing Amelia Hooker. It's reached the stage where he's writing poetry. Now we find the Summerfield Shelley reciting a sonnet written especially for the fair Amelia. If this were in the days of old, and I a knight so brave and bold, I'd storm your castle, Miss Amelia, and on my charger I would steal you. <laughs> you like that one? Oh, I'm dubitably, Mr. Gilfleet. Yeah, thanks, Bertie. Or do you think she'd like this one better? <clears throat> Two eyes of blue, cheeks soft as silk, a skin as white as grade A milk. A neck as graceful as a swan, a step as dainty as a fawn. The girl I mean is quite a looker. Her name is Miss Amelia Hooker. <laughs> <laughs> Please, it's hard to choose between the two of them. You sure is some versifier. It, do you mean versifier? No, it's a fire on account of that hot poetry you write. <laughs> I bet you could get a job poetizing greeting cards. Oh, I suppose I could, but I don't want to lose my immature standing. <laughs> Incidentally, Bertie, don't mention a word about this to anybody, will you please? Oh, no, sir. Uh, I wanted to get your reaction, because I'm going to take Miss Amelia for a stroll through the park tonight and read her 15 or 20 of the poems I've written. <laughs> There's going to be a wee fiddle moon. <laughs> On account of the fellow she's calling on me tonight is such a drip. Oh, come on, Mr. Gildersleeve. How's the big romance between you and Amelia coming along? What are you referring to, Dottie? Oh, 
I heard all about your big moment. It's all over town like a newspaper and I win. Where did you hear this rumor? Well, the operator at the beauty parlor told me, and she had it from one of her customers whose sister-in-law has a maid that works next door to the judge's law clerk, and she got a straight out of Erskine Stars column in the afternoon paper. Did what? Mm-hmm. It said, what big businessman, size 48 stub, is, is that way about the charming sister of a prominent jurist? It looks like a romance of April and November. Oh, boo! Uh, what are you thinking about, Throckmorton? Those crickets, Amelia. Listen to them. It's hard to believe that they can do that just by rubbing their hind legs together. <laughs> oh, dear. Is that what you were really thinking about? No, Amelia. I was thinking of your lips. Like twin petals of a dewy rose. They, they, Amelia, there's something I must ask you. Yes. It, would you give me a... Yes. Would you... Have you got a match? My cigar's gone out. <laughs> oh, really, Brock Morton, you shouldn't smoke so much. I know it, but when I look at you, my heart's on fire, and I just can't help smoking a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, Amelia, I wrote a poem this afternoon. Would you like to hear it? Oh, yes, I'd be glad to. All right. It goes something like this. If this were in the days of old, and I a knight so brave and bold... <laughs> Well, what do you want? Excuse me, buddy, but have you got a dime? It, no, beat it. Can't you see I'm busy? Oh, excuse me. I didn't know you were engaged. We're not engaged. We're just good friends. Go on, scram. But all I asked for was a dime. Uh, Amelia, do you happen to have change for a quarter? Oh, no. No, I don't want a dime. I, I want the dime. Uh, Throckmorton, I think the gentleman has a cold and is asking for the time. Yeah, that's it. Oh, excuse me. Let's see. It's in 942. Oh, thank you, Throckmorton. Nine forty-two. Huh? That means I've got plenty of time. By the way, I sit here for a few minutes. It... No, you can have the whole bench. I'm a wet here anyway. Come on, Amelia. Let's stroll across the grass. I still think he's trying to borrow a dime. Oh, now let's forget everything else. It's a grand night for a walk, and uh, you were starting to recite a poem. Oh yes, but I had such bad luck with the last one. I think I'll try another verse. <laughs> and since I met you, I've lost all care. I feel like I'm walking on the air. You're not walking on the air, Mister. You're walking on the grass. It... So what? I'm a park policeman, seeing it's against the law to trample on the turf, lounge on the lawn, or gamble on the green. Who's gambling? Oh, now, officer, it was purely unintentional. Uh, oh, excuse me, I didn't see you, girlie. Well, run along, and from now on, try to keep your father on the straight and narrow path. <laughs> <laughs> Why, that flat-headed flat-foot... Why can't people let people own when people are trying to recite poetry to people? Oh, come on off the grass, Throckmorton. Do let me hear your poem. Yeah, all right, Amelia. I'll try another one. Let me see. Oh, yes. It, two eyes of blue, cheeks soft as silk, a skin as white as grade A milk. Well, well, well. Fancy meeting you two in the park. I wonder if Shakespeare had to go through what I have to go through. <laughs> Good evening, Horace. Well, go on with your conversation, Gildy. Don't let me interrupt you. Oh, what's the use? If you'll excuse me, Amelia, I'll run along home now. Oh, but Throckmorton, I wanted to hear the rest of the, uh, you know. Uh, I know. I'm going to lock myself in my room and telephone it to you. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> Never felt better, my dear. Why are you making those painful noises? I'm practicing some singing exercises. Don't tell anybody, but tonight I'm going to serenade Honey Bun. Uh, I mean, Miss Hooker. Oh, you've certainly been in there pitching the woo, Uncle. Uh, pitching the what? The woo. Singing a line. Making with a heart throb. It, if you're referring to my tender passion for Miss Hooker, Marjorie, yes, I've been giving Cupid the jibe. <laughs> How's everything going? Not so well. Last night I hit a snag. You did? Uh-huh. The snag's name was Judge Hooker. You didn't actually hit him, did you, Uncle Moore? If, if I didn't, then why is my mandolin all caved in? <laughs> I smacked him right in the middle of his veranda. But, but why, Uncle Moore? Well, he made a big fuss just because I was strumming a few tunes to Amelia. Not that it was very late at night. Couldn't have been much later than three. <laughs> and he came barging out of the house in his nightgown, demanding that I hand over my mandolin. He kept yelling, give it to me, give it to me. So I finally did. You shouldn't have done that, Uncle. I know it. Now he's refused to let me visit his sister. Reminds you of Romeo and Juliet, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. 
But if the judge has forbidden you to see Amelia, how are you going to serenade her? Well, tonight's his lodge night. He belongs to the Summerfield's Nest of the International Order of Hoot Owls. <laughs> In fact, he's the Grand Screech. <laughs> so he should be gone by 8 o'clock. Well, have you phoned to see if Amelia will be home tonight? No, every time I call up, Hooker answers the phone. I'm going to try it again right now. Maybe he's gone out somewhere. But suppose he hasn't. Oh, I've got a scheme. I'll disguise my voice so he won't recognize me. Uh-oh. Hello? Uh, hello? Uh, what number is this, please? Judge Hooker's residence. Oh, Georgia Hooky Pleasanton, huh? <laughs> no, this is Judge Horace Hooker. Oh, you hooking horsey, huh? <laughs> no good. Uh, no, no, no. This is Judge Hooker. Now, who's this? You, George Hooky. See me, Sammy. <laughs> no, no. Who are you? Oh, me know that long time. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name and what do you want? Uh, me, Lee Lee. Only Lee Lee hand on Lee. No, thanks. We wash our own hands. <laughs> oh, for corn's sake. I said very smelly. <laughs> what are you calling about? Missy Hooky. She home, huh? No, she isn't. Is there any message I can take? No, Judge. Just skip it. Gildersleeve! <laughs> now what are you going to do, Uncle Moore? I don't give up very easily, Marjorie. Remember, love laughs at locksmiths and jeers at jugheads like the judge. I'm going to send Amelia a box of candy with a message inside. I read that someplace. That should do the trick. Hey, Bertie. Was you calling me, Mr. Gilsey? Yes, Bertie. Are, are you finished with the dishes yet? I've done the dunking, but the wife is waiting. I want you to take a package over to Miss Amelia for me. Smuggle it in so her brother doesn't find it, see? Now, do you think you can act as Cupid's messenger in this case? Oh, certainly, Mr. Gilsey. I'm the Cupidest messenger in town. <laughs> I'm coming, Ralph. After all, they can't start until the Grand Screech arrives. No, oh, but if you're late, they're liable to elect a new one before you get there. Oh, they couldn't do that. Oh, no. If I remember correctly, that's how you were elected. Yeah, but the first thing I did was to change that rule. Yeah. Well, hop in. Wait a second. Someone's coming to the house, I think. Oh, hello, Bertie. Oh, uh, hello, Judge. What have you got there? Something for me? Uh, no, no, sir. Then it must be for Miss Amelia. Yeah, that's it. It's for Miss Amelia. Fine. Just give it to me and I'll take it into her. But I've had strict instructions to put it right in my own hand. Well, she's upstairs. There's no use making her come down to answer the door. I'll take it. I don't know whether that's right for me to do it. But just give me one reason why not. Okay, I'll give you a reason, but I have to go home to get it. Fine. Now, just a second. There's no use you lugging that package all the way home and then back here again. Just leave it with me until you come back. All right, so here it is. Thanks, Bertie. I'll take good care of it. That's mighty considerate of you, Judge. <laughs> hey, what's the idea? That's Gildersleeve's cook. I've forbidden him to see my sister, and dollars to donuts, this package is something he sent her. What are you doing? Boiling big Gildersleeve. <laughs> well, 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 chocolates. Huh. Have some, Ralph. Thanks. Hey. Oh, look, a note. Let me see. Listen to this. Dearest darling Moonflower, I've phoned and called to see you all day long. Ah, but in vain. And who has so cruelly kept us apart? Your brother, the little tinker. (laughs) Something's wrong with the S on his typewriter. (laughs) I'll fool him. Tonight, when old Sour Puss is playing Hoot Owl, I'll glide beneath your window and let the golden notes of song pour out of my throat. Your fluffums waffums. <laughs> Say, Judge, what are you going to do? First, we're going to finish eating this candy. Then I'm going to get Amelia out of the house on some pretext or other. Then you and I are going upstairs and fill every pot, pitcher, and bucket in the house with water. Why? Well, when fluffums waffums pours the golden notes of song out of his throat, we're going to pour the water out of the window. <laughs> If, for goodness sakes, quiet, you musicians. This is supposed to be a serenade, not a stampede. Yeah, quiet, fellas. Yeah. Now, you boys hide in the bushes while I tiptoe up in the porch. You get it? And I'll let you know when I'm ready. Okay, Mr. Gildersleeve. Come on, boys. Yeah. Now, take it easy and be quiet, boys. Ah, oh, Amelia, light of my life, listen to my song of love. <laughs> Just a little love, a little tea. Just an hour that holds a world of bliss. Eyes that tremble like the stars above. 
name of Jupiter Pluvius is a big idea. <laughs> it's me, Gildy. Yeah. I hope you're dripping wet, you great big drip. <laughs> is that so? Well, you never touched me. I was here in the porch swing all the time. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you got the whole band. We're all doused. <laughs> the amateur and the fellas right to make all that noise. Well, by the way, Hooker, that's the policeman's band. What? <laughs> Fix yourself up pretty, Judge. You're about to have visitors. I don't care. <laughs> At least my sister never got to hear you. Oh, no? Who do you think this is sitting in the porch swing with me? Rudy Valley? <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been our last broadcast before our summer vacation. Before we go, I'd like to express my sincere appreciation to the Kraft Cheese Company for a most pleasant year. Also, my deep thanks to our writer, Leonard Levinson, and to the members of the cast for their able assistance. Walter Tetley, who plays Leroy, my nephew, Lorene Tuttle, my niece, Marjorie, Lillian Randolph, who's Bertie, Earl Ross as Judge Hooker, Paula Winslow as Dottie Dobson, and William Randolph Mills, our musical director, and Cecil Underwood, our producer. I am proud to announce that during the eight weeks we'll be off the air, the United States government will take over our half hour to bring you the Victory Parade. Each of the top NBC shows is contributing one program to this series, so be sure to listen in. I hope you all have a pleasant summer, and now, good night. <laughs> program was composed and conducted by William Randolph. This is Jim Bannon speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again August 30th at the same time for the further adventures of The Great Gildersleeve. Right now, you American homemakers are more nutrition conscious than ever before. You know that wholesome, nourishing food will help make strong Americans. Yes, and you're finding out that the right foods aren't necessarily expensive. Certainly a good example of that is nutritious parquet margarine, the wholesome, delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. You see, parquet margarine is an economical source of important food value. Why, nourishing parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yet for all its goodness, it's thrifty, too. Now, once you've tasted parquet's delicate, appetizing flavor, you'll agree it deserves a place on your table morning, noon, and night. So tomorrow, order a pound or two of delicious, nutritious parquet margarine. Just ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> That presents the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the makers of Fabstead present each week at this time Harold Perry as the great Gildersleeve, written by John Whedon. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, are uh, some of the foods you usually serve hard to get these days? Well, don't think that means your meals have to be monotonous, because there's a plentiful food that gives appetizing variety to menus in a hundred different ways, 
and is mighty easy to use, too. I'm talking about Pabst Et, the delicious golden cheese food that comes in the familiar round package. It spreads easily to make tasty, nutritious sandwiches. Pabst Et also slices neatly to serve with apple pie or fruit. And it's no trick at all to make smooth cheese sauces with Pabst Et to pour over hot vegetables, hard-cooked eggs, fish, or chicken dishes. Yes, and Pabst Et makes smooth, tempting rarebits, light, fluffy souffles. And it's a sure hit, melted on toast in the broiler. By all in all, you could count at least 100 different ways to turn everyday foods into exciting treats with Pabst Et. Another thing, Pabst Et is easy to digest, too, and wholesome and nourishing, a favorite with the youngsters. So serve Pabst Et often. Ask your grocer for Pabst Et tomorrow. You'll recognize it by its distinctive round flat package. Remember, it's Pat's Pet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. And now, let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who seems to have been overdoing a bit lately. His legal counsel, Judge Hooker, has persuaded him to drop in on Doc Pettibone for a checkup. And while the judge stands by, the good doctor goes over the great man with a stethoscope. You know, doctor, this is a lot of nonsense. I feel fine. Oh, quiet, please, Mr. Gildersleeve. I want to listen to that heart of yours. Yeah, we take you now to Gildersleeve's heart. <laughs> take it away, Doc. Yes, Mr. What is it? Why do you look like that? What is it, Doc? What have you found? Don't tell me you found a heart. <laughs> you keep out of this, Hooker. This is serious. I'd like you to listen to this, Judge. Put this stethoscope on. That's right. Now hold the other end up to his chest. <laughs> Stand still. It tickles. Well, Stand still. There. Now listen. What do you hear? Sort of a rustling noise. Sort of a what? Sounds like a troop of boy scouts coming through the underbrush. <laughs> oh, no, no. That's the hair on his chest. <laughs> You're in the wrong place. Hold it lower. Hold it still. Hold Gildersleeve still. Oh, no, cut that out, Hooker. I can't stand the suspense. The dark. Doc, am I... am I going to die? No, no, no. Take it easy. Don't spare me, Doc. I'm a sick man. I know it. Don't try to fool me. If my time is up, I want you to tell me. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Mr. Gildersleeve, but you are not going to die. No? No. <laughs> Did you hear that, Hooker? You're not going to die, but with that blood pressure of yours, if you don't do what I tell you, you're going to blow up. Oh, my <laughs> Oh, my goodness. I'll do it, Doctor. I'll do anything you say. You name it, and I'll do it. Well, I want you to get some rest. Uh, rest, yeah. Fly low. Take it easy. Above all, don't get excited. Don't get excited. Maybe you ought to go away for a few days. That's what I keep telling him. Go away. Go away. <laughs> Listen, you meddlesome old goat. Well, the judge is right. Yeah. Why don't you close up the house and take the kids and go fishing? Say, you know, I haven't been fishing in 20 years. Best thing in the world for the nerves, isn't it, Doc? Nothing like it. Yes, sir. I used to be quite a flycaster in my day. A regular Isaac Walpole. <laughs> well, then the place for you is Lake Heckmatack. Heck? You can rent a little cabin up there and... Jump. Are there any fish? Are there any fish? You know that big trout that hangs over the sideboard in my dining room? Yes. Lake Heckmatack. Yes, Say, one of those wouldn't look bad in my den. By George, I'll do it. I'll take Marjorie and Leroy, and we'll start the first thing in the morning. Come on, Judge. Mr. Gildersleeve, just a minute. Yes? There's one more thing. If What's that, Doc? Five dollars, please. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Five dollars. <laughs> Kitchen. You've gone and messed up every coffee bottle I got. Look at that floor. Uh, good evening, Bertie. Evening, Miss Gilsey. My, something smells mighty good. It smells all right, but it ain't good. <laughs> Leroy, what's going on here? What on earth are you doing with all those bottles? Just making a little root beer. It, a little root beer? He's made 14 gallons. Well, that's how much it makes. You can see for yourself, Unc. It says here on the bottle. This extract is sufficient to make 14 gallons of genuine root beer. 
Don't you think you're getting into this thing a little deep, Leroy? Fourteen gallons. That's an awful lot of burps. Yeah, and he's used up... <laughs> he's used up every bottle and cork I got, and the wash tub still half full. It washed tub? Oh, you don't understand, Uncle Mort. I'm not going to drink it. I'm going to sell it. Leroy, did you ever hear of the Pure Food and Drug Act? No. Well, you will. <laughs> and you're going to hear the riot act if you don't get that stuff out of Bertie's kitchen. Where's Marjorie, Bertie? She's out back, Mr. Gilsleeve. She's been laying in a hammer crying her eyes out. Crying? Say, we'll have to see about this. Yeah, nothing but trouble in this house. The doctor's right. I've got to get out of here. You too, Leroy. Come on. You ought to know better than to muss up. Why, Marjorie? What's the matter, honey? Nothing. It's Doug. He was supposed to take him to the movies tonight, and he's standing her up. He is not. I'm standing him up. Huh? Wait a minute. Let me get this thing straight. He stood me up last night, so... So I'm standing him up tonight. Well, darling, if you're standing him up, what are you crying about? <laughs> it's Doug who should feel badly. I know. But he doesn't. <laughs> He's going to take that Helen Gibson out. Well, you told him to take her out. I heard you. Yes, but he's going to do it. <laughs> oh, that's women for you. Take my advice. I'll never have anything to do with it. Yes, all right. Lisa. Take it from me. The more you do for them, the less they appreciate it. I know, I know. Read them rough and tell them nothing. That's my method. Take my advice. Leroy, why don't you start a column? <laughs> you tend to your root beer and lay off your sister. Now, Marjorie, I wouldn't waste any tears on a fellow like Doug. He's nothing don't but... Don't you a... dare say anything against Doug. <laughs> Stick around, Leroy. I may need you after all. Remember, Marjorie... There's better fish than duck. Do right in Lake Hackmatack. Say, how'd you like to go to Hackmatack for a couple of weeks, huh? And we'll rent a little camp, and we'll do nothing but lie around in the sun all day and fish. What do you say? Fish? Yippee! If I wasn't asking you, Leroy, it Marjorie? Well, if there's going to be any fishing, there's one thing I'd like to know first. Oh, what's that? Who cleans the fish? Uh, yes, there is that. <laughs> Leroy, you're getting to be a big boy now. Well, what's the matter with you cleaning the fish, Unc? Uh, well, I'll tell you. Funny thing about me and fish. I'm not a squeamish man, but if there's one thing I can't stand, it's cleaning fish. But we haven't caught any fish yet. Yeah, wait a minute. I've got it. Hey, Bertie. Oh, Bertie. Yes, Mr. Gilbert. Bertie, how would you like to go away with us tomorrow for a nice vacation? <laughs> Get going. It's 10.30, and we were going to start at 8 o'clock. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, we're coming, Uncle Mort. Well, then what's holding us up? We're just packing the lunch. For goodness sake, we just finished breakfast. Now, you'd be the first to holler, Mr. Gilsleeve, if there wasn't any lunch. We'll be done as soon as we finish these deviled eggs. Yeah, I don't know why it is every time we go anyplace, all the women in the house have to start deviling eggs. Have you got the thermos bottle? Yes. Have you got the steamer rug? Yes, yes. <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, why don't you just leave the packing to us? We can do it much quicker if you'll just let us alone. Well, I'm just trying to help, for heaven's sake. Of course, if I'm not wanted here, far be it from me. Why don't you go get the car out? A yeah, man tries to offer his services around here, and he gets his head taken off. Come on, Leroy. Hey, Uncle, can I back the car out? No, you may not. Why oh, not, Uncle Moore? Piggy Banks backs his car out. I can do it on it. You heard me. I said no. Well, why not? I've told you before, young man, you're too young. You're much too young to understand about cars. Oh. Yeah, now, get off the running board. I'm going to start it up. Yeah. Have you been fooling with this car, young man? No, sir. But may I make a suggestion? No, you may not. What is it? <laughs> Why don't you turn on the ignition? Turn on the... <laughs> yeah. It's a funny thing. I've been trying to start it that way for years. It's never worked yet. <laughs> Yang Wei! What are you trying to do, Throckmorton? Run over me? No, Judge, but it's a nice idea. <laughs> That's gratitude. An old friend comes over to say goodbye to you, and you try to run him down. Here's a lunch basket, Miss Gilfreeze. Uh, oh, Leroy, uh, while you're resting, uh, go get that, will you? I'll open the trunk. Uh, one side, please, Judge. Leroy, what's all this in here? 
That's my root beer. Well, get it out of there. Oh, long. Um. We've got to have room for the baggage. We can't take all this. Oh, well, gee, can't I take some of it? You can take six bottles. That's all we'll have room for. That's all you'll have room for, too. Okay. <laughs> the idea. I've never seen it. Good morning, Judge Rucker. Good morning, Marjorie. Well, it looks as if you had a fine day for a trip. Looks like a scorcher, if you ask me. I'm dying already. Yeah, it is a little hot. It's a lucky thing it's not far to hack tack. I don't like the looks of that left rear tire there. Oh, I wouldn't worry about that. It's still got a lot of fabric left. It's still got a lot of fabric left. Leroy, come get these bags, will you? Uh, yes, Leroy, while you're resting. Seems like I have to do all the work around here. <laughs> By the way, Throckmorton, I'll be glad to sort of keep an eye on the house for you while you're away. Oh, the house is locked, Judge. I don't think there's anything to keep an eye on, really. Now, you can't tell. A couple of houses have been broken into around here lately, you know. Is that so? I hadn't heard about that. Yes, so if you'd like to leave your key with me, I'll be glad to drop around once in a while and see that everything's all right. Well, that's mighty nice of you, Judge. Mighty nice of you. Here. There's the front door key. Thank you. Leroy, have you got those bags in back there? Yes, everything's in. Yeah. Bertie, suppose you and Leroy ride in the back. Marjorie, you sit up here in front with me. Huh? Now, are we all set? Everything in? Have we forgotten anything? Let's see. Doors locked. Lights out. Bags in. <laughs> Leroy, did you... Yes, Uncle. Good. Well, we're off. <laughs> Goodbye, Judge. Bye, Rocky. Hope you'll like that. If we don't, you'll hear from us. Bye, Marjorie. Leroy. Goodbye, Judge. Goodbye. 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 Good old hooker. You know, this whole trip was really his idea, Marjorie. He's a sweet old thing, really. Yeah, he's a sweet old thing. I'm going to miss the sweet old goat. (laughs) Well, ought to be a nice trip. Ooh. Hey, Unc, what was that? Sounded like a blowout. I knew it. It's that left rear tire. Hey, oh. there goes another. Oh, there goes our trip. Can you beat it? You work hard all year. You save your money. You mind your business. You try to take a well-earned break. Oh, no. <laughs> That's four of them. Oh, the spare. How do you like that? You get out, Leroy. I'm afraid to look. <laughs> I've seen some bad breaks in my time, but I'll be a... Lord? I mean, I'm, I'm a patient man, but good gracious to Betsy. <laughs> well, that's life, I guess. Bertie, did you ever change a tire? <laughs> hey, Uncle, what do you think? Don't tell me. Let me guess. The tires are okay. All of them. Leroy, this is no time for joking. I'm not joking. They're okay. Leroy, I distinctly heard something blow. So did I. I'll tell you what blew. It was Leroy's root beer. That what blew. <laughs> I told him he put too much yeast in that stuff. Root beer. Oh, this is going to be one of my bad The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Everybody knows that fresh vegetables are good for you. But do you know the trick that makes practically any vegetable dish a real taste treat? Well, the answer is, serve hot vegetables with smooth cheese sauce poured over them. You'll make them even better tasting, even more nutritious, too. It's easy if you use Pap Set, the delicious golden cheese food that comes in a handy round flat package. All you do is melt Pap Set... In a double boiler, stir in a little milk and season. Presto, you have a grand smooth cheese sauce, not only for vegetables, but for fish and chicken dishes, macaroni, rarebits, any number of foods. You'd be surprised how a luscious golden cheese sauce, the kind Pabst Et makes so easily, adds sparkle to everyday dishes. Gives them appetizing variety that just calls for second helping. Yes, and Pabst Et spreads so smoothly slices so neatly, you'll find a hundred delightful ways to serve Papstet, both by itself and to add cheese goodness to other foods. It pays to serve Papstet often because it's so nourishing, a fine energy food, rich in milk protein, and it gives you vitamins A as well as the milk minerals calcium and phosphorus. 
So ask your grocer for Pabst Et tomorrow. Remember, Pabst Et, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. And now, let's get back to the great guild of sleep. It seems that left rear tire held out. Whereas the morning mist roll across Lake Hackmatack, we find the mighty angler seated in the stern of a little rowboat with his niece in the bow and his nephew at the oars. Uh, steady, Leroy. Steady as she goes. Leroy! That went right in my lap. I can't help it. It's these darn oars. Uh, it's about far enough, I think, Leroy. Yeah, let her coast. That's it. Now hand me that rod. Rod, Marge. Oh, here, Uncle, you want a worm? Forget the worms. A true sportsman, Leroy, would rather die than use a worm. Well, then how do you catch the fish? Ah, uh, you'll see. Uh, young man, you're about to be initiated into the gentle art of fly casting. You see that little doohickey there that covers the hook? You mean that tassel? It, it's not a tassel, young man. That's the fly. You see, it's very delicate. The finest ones are so delicate, they're made of hummingbird feathers. Do the fairies make them, Uncle Moore? Oh, shut up. <laughs> There's a lot of angles with this young man, so watch carefully and don't be so smart. I'm watching. Yeah. Now, this is how your true angler tempts the finny tribe. It's all done with the wrist, see? And the secret is in getting the rhythm. One, you cast it. Two, you jerk it back. You see? One, two. One, two. One, two. One, two, one. Two, one, two, one, two. It's all done with the wrist, you see? One. You've been saying that for three days now, Unc. When do you catch the fish? The fish are secondary, young man. The sport is the thing. One, two, one. One, two, one. Hey, uh, no kidding. How long does this go on? Yes, really, Uncle Mort. All right, Leroy. Pass me the worm. <laughs> Tell me something, Uncle Mort. What makes you think there are any fish in this lake? I've seen them. Where? In Judge Hooker's dining room. <laughs> now, what are we doing here? Judge Hooker has a stuffed trout over his sideboard that long. And by George, I'm not leaving here till I catch something. Can you beat it? Five days, not a single bite. Not even from a mosquito. Not one. Remember, Uncle Mort, the sport is the thing. The fish are secondary. Yeah. Give me those worms. I've tried dry flies, wet flies. I've tried casting, trolling. If this doesn't work, so help me. I'll go in after him with a club. <laughs> hey, Uncle. Look, look down there. What? Where? Down in the weeds there. Huh? See him? Ooh, yeah, and a fat one, too. <laughs> Be quiet, everybody. Be very quiet now. <gasps> If I can just lower the hook down there without scaring him. Easy. It, it don't move. What's that, a mosquito? It's an airplane. Well, keep it quiet. <laughs> Remember now, fish are jittery. Easy now. Nice fishy. Come and bite the little worm. That plane's coming this way, Uncle. Go away, plane. He's diving. It's a power dive. Look at that crazy clown. Oh, the crazy fool. Look out, everybody. Duck. your jokes now, young man. You come out of there. I'm okay, Uncle. This is no time to guard. <laughs> Everybody all right? That's right, Marjorie. You, you grab hold of the boat. Oh. <coughs> yes. Leroy, you grab hold of me. Oh, yeah. I'll grab. Hey, look what I grabbed. The fish. I got the little son of a gun. I got him barehanded. <laughs> oh, he's slippery. Uh, put him down the front of your sweater. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank heaven. Now we can go home.
summer feel. Mr. Gilsey, you sang a mouthful. Yeah. I sure am glad to get away from that lake where I have razzmatazz, would it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, with any luck, we ought to be home by dark, but... Yeah, be sure and take good care of that fish back there. Maybe. Oh, don't you worry about that fish. He can take care of himself. That's the powerfulest fish I ever smelled. Well, <laughs> uh, some fish are gamier than others. <laughs> sort of have to expect that of a trout. That ain't no trout, Mr. Gill, please. Uh, what do you mean? That trout's a flounder. Yeah, don't you talk that way about my trout. Well, whatever it is, it's getting higher than a goat. Why, Marjorie, I don't smell anything. Oh, of course you don't with those cigars. <laughs> If you don't stop smoking those things, this fish is going to be kippered before you get him home. <laughs> so are we. Uh, no fooling, Mr. Gilsey. Don't you think we ought to stop somewhere and give him a decent burial? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing doing. That fish is all I got to show for a misspent week. If he bothers you, you can hang him out the window or something. Hey, that's an idea. Hang him on the fishing rod and stick him out back. Here, I'll do it. Now, don't let him get away. What are you expecting to do? Found his way back to Lake Hack Yeah, that'll air him out a little. Yeah. Well, what's that guy honking about? All right, brother, come on, if you're going to pass. Well, come on. Ready? What do you want? You've got a fish. <laughs> I know you got a fish, you big dodo. I think the man had never seen a fish before. Mr. Gilsey. Uh, what is it, Bertie? I ain't sure, Mr. Gilsey, but it looks like there's some seagulls following us. <laughs> oh, fine. Yep, that's what this. is. They're after your fish, Uncle. They're after Junior. Yep. Step on it, Mr. Gilsey. Yeah, pull in your line, Leroy. Pull in your line. Play him, boy. Play him. I have more trouble with birds. Oh, go away, birds. Go away. <laughs> Uh, home at last. Come on. Let's get this stuff out of here before it gets any darker. Don't forget that fish. As if we could. Yes. I got the lunch basket. Who's going to carry in all these bags? Thanks. Uh, Leroy, while you're resting, old man. Yeah. Watch your step, Marjorie. It's pretty dark. You? Oh, the Lord. Are you all right? Something's grabbed me. Leroy, what did I tell you about those croquet wickets? I thought I'd put them away. I'm gonna. Yeah. Look out for that mole trap there, folks. Gosh, feel that grass. I bet it's grown eight inches since we've been away. Leroy, first thing tomorrow morning. I know, while I'm resting. Yeah. <laughs> hey, somebody left a light on upstairs. Where? In my bathroom. Bertie, has that been burning all the time we've been away? It wasn't me, Miss Gilsey. Well, who was it then? I don't know, Miss Gilsey, but it's in your bathroom. Yeah, well, that's right. Well, come on, bring the bag, folks. Boy, oh, it's stuffy in this house. Don't forget to put that fish in the icebox, Bertie. The icebox isn't built that could hold that fish. Uh, Miss Gilsey, Miss Gilsey, somebody's been in the kitchen. Yeah, what do you mean? Tramps or gypsies or somebody. How do you know, Brady? There's dirty dishes all over the place. Miss Gilsey, you don't think maybe it's been the b b b burglars? Yes, it's the b burglars. Well, uh, we have to see about this, Brady. Uh, Miss Marjorie, you and me better go count that silver. Shh. Listen. Huh? What is it? It's your shower, Uncle Mort. Shower? You didn't go off and leave it running. Certainly not. I always turn that lip. What? <gasps> There's somebody in it. Somebody up there right now. How do you like that for nerve? Takes a sour before he robs the joint. Quick, I'll call the police. It's no use, Leroy. The wires are cut. How do you know? They always are. It's the first thing robbers do. Oh, but you can't wait for the police, Uncle Mort. You've got to go up there and get him. You're right, Marjorie. Is who, me? I'll guard the back stairs, Mr. Gilsey. And if he comes down that way, I'll part his scalp with this meat chopper. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you do that, Bertie, but uh, do it quietly. And you go up the front stairs. Yes, yeah. wait a minute. Maybe we better think this over a little first. A lot of angles to this. Leroy, you stand by. Okay, Uncle, I've got my baseball back. Marjorie, you sneak out and run for the cops. Well, here I go, if nobody stops me. Be careful, Uncle Moore. Yeah, yeah. How? It quit this pushing, Leroy. I wish it wasn't so dark. I don't dare turn on a light. I'm a little vulnerable in the light. Well, here I go. To oh, those squeaky stairs. It's probably these six dollar shoes. 
I mustn't get excited. The doctor said I mustn't get excited. I'll bet he'd get excited, though. Well, now that I'm here, I want... Oh, I can see you moving around behind the shower curtain. What do I do now? Remember what the coach used to say, Gildy? Get him below the knees, boy. I wish I'd never broken training. Come on, Gildersleeve, give him what you gave Harvard. 29, 33, 76, hit him! Yeah. Let go, Let go. Now, police, police, Hooker, what are you doing here? Well, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm taking your shower. Any objections? Yes. What are you doing in my house? Well, the painters are working on mine, so I thought I'd just move over here for a few days. I didn't think you'd mind. Matter of fact, I didn't expect you back so soon. I'll bet you didn't. Hooker, you knew you were going to move in here the minute you got me out of town. That's why you suggested that trip. Why, Throckmorton, I'm hurt that you'd say a thing like that. Come clean, Hooker. You just had a bath. You knew it all the time. Well, I... <laughs> had to have the house painted. You know that. It was a disgrace. Yeah. I can't stand the smell of paint. It gives me colic. You wouldn't want me to go... No, I wouldn't want you to have colic. Anything I have is yours, Judge. You know that. Move in any time. Make yourself at home. Wreck the joint. There's one little thing, Judgey, about Lake Hackmatack. Lovely spot. Yes, lovely. But there's no trout there. You know it. Now, there you're wrong, Morton. You just didn't try the right place. Don't tell me. I combed that lake from one end to the other. Well, no wonder. You should have tried the place where I got mine. Where was that? At the Hackmatack Souvenir Shop. <laughs> Let's let bygones be bygones, huh? Let's be friends. You mean that, Throckmorton? You mean you forgive me? Certainly, I mean it. There's my hand on it. Gildy, my friend, I take back everything I've ever said about you. Uh, seems to me this calls for a little drink, huh, Judge? Bertie, bring the judge a bottle of that special root beer. You may think you've tasted root beer, Judge, but you're going to get an awful bang out of this. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Conducted by Billy Mills. This is Dan Alexander speaking for the makers of Tap Step and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> Tap Step presents. The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. The makers of Pap Step present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. But first, do you housewives find it difficult sometimes to get meals in a hurry these busy days? Yes, and make them as tempting and nutritious as your hard-working family deserves? Well, that problem is much simpler if you have a package or two of Papstet on hand. Because Papstet is the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred different uses. Papstet spreads easily to make tasty, appetite-satisfying sandwiches. It slices neatly to serve with apple pie or fruit. 
It's easy to make smooth cheese sauces with Papstet to pour over hot vegetables and other foods. Yes, and there are any number of main dinner dishes you can make in a jiffy. Why, in no time at all, you'll discover a hundred or more ways to give tempting variety to everyday meals with Papstead. So keep Papstead on hand. Remember, it's easy to digest. A fine energy food that's wholesome and nourishing. Yes, ask your grocer tomorrow for Papstead in the distinctive round, flat package. Remember, it's Papstead. P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T. The delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. And now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who's brushing up on his golf game in preparation for the finals of the annual Labor Day tournament at the Summerfield Country Club. On the eve of the great event, we find him in his living room, behind the sofa, addressing the ball with a mashie. Well, now, let me see. This is a very difficult shot. It's healthy. It's quiet, Bertie. Never talk to anybody when they're making a golf shot. Yes, excuse me. Yeah, now watch this. If you ever get in a trap, Bertie, there's just one thing to remember. Oh, I keep out of traps. Yes, the thing is, you want to get under the ball and give it plenty of backspin. Now watch this. This is what we call a chip shot. <laughs> chip shot, huh? What do we do with the chips? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. What's Miss Marjorie going to say when she sees what's happened to her face? Well, those things shouldn't be left lying around on mantles. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I know something that'll look a lot better up there anyway. What's that? A nice big silver cup with my name on it. Oh, yes, yeah, so that would go good. Oh, by the way, Mr. Gilsey, Miss Marjorie said to tell you we're putting you in the sewing room tonight. It's the sewing room? Why? What have I done? She said she's going to put Mr. Ferris in your room. Who's Mr. Ferris? I don't know, but he's a gentleman who's going to sleep in your room. Where am I expected to sleep? On the floor? Oh, no, you're going to have Leroy's camp car, the one that folds up. It folds up. <laughs> Suppose you get the broom and uh, sweep up these uh, divots, Bertie. How soon is dinner? I'm starving. Oh, any time now, Mr. Gill, please. We're just waiting for Mr. Paris. Yeah, uh, Mr. Paris again. Well, I'm hungry enough to eat a horse. What are we having, Bertie? Oh, we're having calf's liver. Y- have we come to that? And mashed potatoes and fried eggplant. Fried eggplant. Yes. Sir. You know I can't stand eggplant, Bertie. It, it, it makes me break out. Yes, I know it, but Miss Marjorie said Mr. Ferris just dotes on eggplant. Well, I don't dote on Mr. Ferris. You can tell him that, whoever he is. Yes, I'll do that. Excuse me now, Miss Gilsley. I got to see what's cooking. <laughs> Whatever you do, don't let anything happen to that eggplant. Eggplant, sewing room. I don't know why we have a sewing room anyway. There hasn't been any sewing done in this house for 20 years. Uh, that you, Marjorie? Good evening, Mr. Moore. Listen, what's this thing all about... Say, hey, you're really done up tonight, aren't you? <laughs> you like it? Yeah? I got it for the dance. It only costs $10 more than my allowance, especially reduced. Yeah. But you haven't told me whether you like it. Well, you haven't given me a chance. Eh? Turn around, my dear. <laughs> well? Marjorie, come kiss your dear old uncle. Uh, mm-hmm. You do like it, then? Honey, you look like a million dollars, especially reduced. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad. There's only one thing. If you don't think that dress is a little... Uh, uh, oh, uh, don't be old-fashioned, Uncle Morris. Uh, I bet probably every girl at the dance will be wearing a dress like this. Mm, maybe I'll change my mind and go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please do. It's going to be such fun. No, no, my dear. I've got to get my sleep. i got to be in the pink tomorrow. Oh, come on. No, you and Doug go ahead and have a good time. Oh, I'm not going to the dance with Doug. If you're not? No. Why not? Well, Doug and I have just had an understanding, that's all. You uh, mean you're not speaking? No, it's all perfectly friendly. Oh, brother, that's worse. <laughs> well, that, who is taking you to the dance? I'm going with Leroy. Leroy? You didn't buy that dress with all those to go to the dance with Leroy. And another thing, since when does Leroy go to dances at night? I don't ever... Leroy! Oh, hello, Uncle. Come back here, young man. Yes, Uncle 
Uncle Mort. Where did you get that necktie? Uh, upstairs. Uh, no, I thought so. Suppose you take it right back upstairs. Yes, sir. Oh, by the way, Uncle, can I go to the dance tonight? Yes. What do you mean, by the way? I mean, can I? Why do you ask me? You seem to be going. Oh, gee, thanks, Uncle. I'll sweep out the whole garage tomorrow. Well, see that you get back here by 10.30. Oh, Okay. I'll sweep out the tool shed. <laughs> oh, say, I forgot to ask you how you came out in the tournament today, Uncle Moore. Oh, the tournament? Oh, I'm doing pretty well. I I played Judge Hooker in the finals tomorrow. Judge Hooker? Yeah. Well, the judge must have improved his game. No, uh, he's improved his handicap. I think they added in his age or a social security number or something. <laughs> oh, you can beat him. Uh, Why don't you come to the dance? After all, he's coming. I don't trust that old goat. He's just the type who would sneak home early and go to sleep. Besides, we got a good bet on this game. Two dollars. <laughs> well, you're going to miss the best dance the club's ever had. That's right, Unc. And you know all the trouble we had over the band. Well, guess who we finally got? I don't know. Who? They got Bill Farris. No. Yes. Who's Bill Farris? Margie, tell them who Bill Farris is. He's a band leader. He plays the trumpet. Yes. Just probably the greatest trumpet player in the world, that's all. Next to Maury Haynes. I never heard of him either. Oh, you have too, Uncle Mort. You know that record, I Don't Want to Walk Without You, Baby? My auto, you played it night and day for three months. <laughs> well, that's Maury Haynes on the trumpet. Bill Farris plays a lot like him. Keep him away from here, then. Oh, don't be a Nicky, Uncle Mort. Nicky. As a matter of fact, he happens to be coming here to dinner tonight. We're putting him up for the weekend. Oh, he's the one who's sleeping in my little bed, huh? Oh, we couldn't ask a guest to sleep on a cot. He's the gent who's ordering the meals around here now, huh? Bill Farris. I put up with a lot of things, my dear, but this is the first time I've ever had to play second fiddle to a cornet player. <laughs> It's been that so long now, it's curling up at the edges. Well, I'm curling up at the edges, too, Bertie. We've waited long enough for this star border of ours. Let's eat. Oh, I guess we'll have to. I told him 7 o'clock. There he is. That's him. I'll go, Bertie. Leroy, I'll go. Leroy. Oh, do let me go. Never mind looking in the mirror, Mark. The guy's waiting. Hiya, Shorty. Hiya, Bertie. Hiya, Bertie. Hiya, Bertie. Well, hello. She hadn't seen him since 4 o'clock this afternoon. <laughs> Come right in. I don't care if I do. Well, I do. Sorry I'm late. I had to stop off to close the deal. Say, this isn't a bad little dump you got here. Yeah, uh, thanks. Who's your fat friend? <laughs> oh, uh, this is Mr. Farrell. Just call me Bill. And this is my uncle, Mr. Gildersleeve. Hiya, Jack. Just call me Mr. He's a character, isn't he? Hey, hey, Marge. Oh, yes, and this is my little brother. Hiya, Slat. Uh, hi, Mr. Ferris. You know something? What? I think you've got a swell band. I listen to you every time you're on the radio. Well, that hardly comes under the heading of news, bud. They all listen to me. You listen to any of the bands today, Eddie Francis, Goonie Myers, Maury Haynes, they all steal from me. Oh, yeah. but I love Maury Haynes. Don't you? Maury Haynes, don't make me sick. What's that guy got? No talent? Nothing. Yeah. Well, I can blow more trumpet with my left ear than he can blow with his mouth. Maury Haynes. Well, I could have been right up where Maury Haynes is today, cleaning up. Then why aren't you? I'll tell you why, just to give you an idea of what you're up against in this business. Maury Haynes and I auditioned for the same radio program a while back. There's no question which is the better band, but it so happens that the sponsor's got a crutch on I Don't Want to Walk Without Your Baby. Well, I don't happen to have it in the books. Maury has. Oh, I love it, though. Well, I see. i got to educate you, sugar. I wouldn't be caught playing that tune in a dog fight. Uh, what's the matter with it? It's a lot of corn. That guy, Haynes. If it wasn't for that broken-down ballad, where would he be today? Well, I... I rather like it. Well, the more you always... I don't want to... I think it's got something. <laughs> well, don't sing it around me, brother. I can't take it. Excuse me, Miss Marjorie. Dinner's ready and then some. Oh, yeah, do you mind if we sit right down, Mr. Ferris? I'm afraid we'll be late for the day. Oh, I couldn't eat anything. Matter of fact, I got a little hungry, so I grabbed a bite on the way over. Oh, well, you don't mind if we grab a bite after, <laughs> after waiting for you for an hour. Oh, go ahead, Jack. Eat your head off. Don't mind me. Uh, murder. <laughs> well, come on, gorgeous. You don't want to eat now. I got the car waiting outside. If you get hungry, we'll stop at a bean wagon. Oh, that would be fun. If Uncle Mort doesn't mind. No, he doesn't mind. <laughs> Coming, Leroy? Okay. Hey, will you give me a lesson on the puppet, Mr. Farris? I can blow you go. Well, some other time. Hey, don't stay up too late, Pop. You pop? Jump this bag in my room when you go upstairs, will you? Oh! <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Uh, Hooker, watch this drive now. Head down, wrist lock, left arm stiff, come back slow, and... <laughs> 1,700 yards right to the pin. <laughs> now we come to the water hole. Watch me drive this one across the sleepy lagoon. Even the sleepy lagoon. Where's all that racket? What's going on out here? Oh, they must be back from the dance. This is a fine time for Sleepy Lagoon. I'll go down there and put that goon to sleep. Oh! He'll never get me in a folding cot again. <laughs> you know, where's that light switch? Oh, my poor little pinkies. Where's that door? It was here last night. Oh, Oh, I'm in the sewing room, yeah. Oh, here it is. Quiet down there, quiet! All right, if I gotta go out there. Boy, that was solid, Bill. Now let me try it. Okay, son, blow your brains out. Uh, remember, take the second valve on that highway. Fat, yeah, where'd you get the nightshirt? Yeah. Leroy, you skin right upstairs as fast as your little legs can carry you. I told you to be in bed by 10.30. Is it that way, Doc? It's 2.30 and you know it. Look at your eyes. They're popping out. Now, get up there. Yes, Uncle. Oh, well, I'm sorry, Uncle Mort, if we disturbed you. My window is right over the porch here. Okay, I won't play anymore. Go climb into your snuggle bunny. <laughs> snuggle bunny. <laughs> Why don't you take that sour cornet and turn it in for scrap? These fellas like you are holding up the war effort. <laughs> You better come up pretty soon, my dear. Right away, Uncle Morris. As soon as I turn out the light. Oh, what's your hurry? You can sleep any time. Now, let's park on the swing here and take a gander at the moon. Well, just for a minute. It's awfully late. Well, move over. Let's get acquainted. Well, I, uh, I really must go. Oh, nonsense. I don't come to town every day, you know. Say, I hope you're not one of those old-fashioned types. Well, no. Well, then move over. <laughs> yeah, that's better. <laughs> Take a look at that moon. You? you know, that moon was just made for you and me. You know, I really no, love No, don't say anything. Don't spoil it. <laughs> nice out here, isn't it? Uh-huh. You know, with so many foods becoming scarce these days, we're lucky there's an abundance of cheese. Cheese is so tasty, satisfying, so nourishing, too. And it's mighty easy to add luscious cheese goodness to all kinds of dishes when you use Papstep, the delicious golden cheese food in the handy round flat package. You see, Papstep is just right for cooked cheese dishes because it melts so smoothly without stringing. Why, making a grand-tasting smooth cheese sauce with Papstep is easy as one, two, three. All you do is melt Papstep in a double boiler, stir in a little milk, and season. Mmm, there's a real cheese sauce for hot vegetables, fish and chicken dishes, macaroni, any number of foods. Of course, you'll want to serve Papstep, too, in sandwiches, salads, with fruit and pie. Altogether, there are over 100 delicious ways Papstep can glamorize your meals. That's a good thing, because Papstep is so nutritious. It's an excellent energy food, rich in milk protein. And it gives you vitamin A and the important milk minerals, calcium and phosphorus. So you see, for many reasons, it's a good thing to have Papstep on hand. Stock up on Papstep tomorrow. Remember, Papstep, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. Now, let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. After a hard night in the sewing room, he comes down to breakfast with murder in his heart and circles under his eyes. Oh, what a night. I think I'll just have a poached egg this morning, Bertie. Yes, sir. Uncle Mort, I'm, 
I'm sorry about last night. Really, I am. I tried to... Yeah, think nothing of it, my dear. Think nothing of it. What's a mere golf trophy trophy compared to one night of giddy pleasure? Oh, Uncle Moore. Oh, well, I guess I'll just give up the game. It would have been nice to win a cup, though, just once before I die. Oh, Uncle Moore, don't talk like that. You're going to win. Anybody home? Oh, it's Judge Hooker. Come in, Judge. He always comes for breakfast. What does he want? I suppose he came over here to gloat. Oh, goat yourself. Morning, Marjorie. Why, Judge, what's the matter with your leg? Attack of gout. I've got it bad. Did you say gout? What'd you think I said? Can't you see it's killing me? Oh, Judgey, that's a shame. There's something I ate. It kept me awake the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's too bad. Hey, Bertie, cancel that egg. I think I'll have some hot cakes and sausages. Yes, sir. What'd you say, do it, egg? Yeah, cancel it. Oh, shucks, I went and posted. <laughs> Never mind, bring it on, I'll eat it anyway. Uh, care to join me in an egg, Judge? No, thanks. Oh, uh, it's too bad about your foot, Judge. That'll kind of spoil your game, won't it? Yes, I'm afraid we'll have to postpone the match, Morton. What do you mean, postpone it? You either play it or forfeit it. Now, Gildy, you wouldn't want to win that cup by default. Well, it's tough luck, Judge. You but... wouldn't want people saying you took advantage of a fellow when he ate a lobster. <laughs> You should have thought of that before you ate the lobster. Oh, have a heart, Gildy. You know I can't walk around that course. Hi, Jackson. Jackson. How's the kid? I'll just sleep. You've got the nerve to ask me that. Hi, you, Judge. What's the argument? Well, maybe you can settle it for us. You know anything about golf? Oh, oh, do I know anything about golf? Don't make me laugh. Well, I've got the gout. I can't play today, and Gildersleeve here claims I have to forfeit the match. Well, that's easy. I'll play it for you. If you? Oh, no, you won't. Why not, Gildy? It's better than a default. Oh, no, he's afraid, that's all. I am not afraid. I'll play this fellow if that's the way you want it. All right, Fatso, let's get going. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Ferris, this is our first tee. We're rather proud of this hole. Yes, it's 485 yards with a trap to the right of the green. <laughs> Better watch out for those woods at the left, too. Never mind the diagrams, Pop. Just show me the flag. Uh, Pop. Where's that driver? Well, keep your eyes peeled now. This one's going a long way. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Gee, that was a beaut, Bill. It must be 300 yards. 310. That's the longest drive in the history of this hole. It was just a lucky fluke, I hope. All right, Pop, I gave you something to shoot at there. Whip out the old pile driver and see if you can knock the ball off the tee. Don't worry about me, Ferris. I'll show you a drive. Hand me that club, Leroy. Here, Alan. And, and give me a ball. Here. You better give me the good ball. Oh. <laughs> there. Now stand back, son. I've got a lot of things to remember here. Uh, head down, wrists locked, left arm stiff, and come back slow. <laughs> you uh, forgot one thing, Pop. You forgot to hit the ball. <laughs> Leroy, remember you're tattying for me. You laugh at my jokes. Watch this now. <laughs> That's all I wanted to know. I'll see you boys in the clubhouse after the first nine. Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. Latest results after eight holes of the final round match between Trump Morton, P. Gildersleeve, and Bill Paris, who is substituting for Judge Hooker. Gildersleeve is two down. Well, may the best man win. <laughs> Am I away? Go ahead and pop. What are you getting down in East for, Uncle? You gonna pray? No, my boy. This is the ninth hole. I'm taking no chances. I'm gonna sight this putt very carefully. Come on, come on. All right, all right. One side, Leroy. Uh, take that pin out. Uh, quiet now. Uh, sighted putt sank same. <laughs> <laughs> well, looks like I'm going to win this hole, Ferris. Not if I sink this 25-footer. It'll be a tie. Brother, if you sink that putt, I'll buy you a lunch. It's a deal. Hold your breath. Oops. 
Come on, Fatso, let's go to lunch. <laughs> Well, Ferris, another piece of pie? No, not for me, Pops. Light lunch is best when you got another nine to play. Light lunch, three pieces of pie. Well, maybe I guess you're right. Mr. Gildersleeve, can I show you some French pastry? Uh, no, thanks, Garçon. Light lunch today. Uh, you got it right there with you, though, haven't you? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, that little chocolate house looks pretty good. <laughs> What's inside of that? Just a light filling, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, fine. You can give me the chocolate house. Uh, yes, sir. Which one? You might as well give me both of them. <laughs> Oh, hello, Judge. What do you want? I just wanted to make sure you're eating your head off as usual. Well, Mr. Ferris, do you think you can beat him worse this afternoon than you did this morning? Oh, sure. I didn't have the feel of my clubs this morning. Hear that, Gildy? I ought to shoot better than 37 on a dinky little nine-hole course like this. No, just a minute, Ferris. You can't come to Summerfield and knock our golf course. You're right, Gildy. Oh, well, take it easy, fellas. It's a cute little course. If you like croquet. Um, croquet, yeah. nothing. I'll have you know that Walter Hagen played this course, and he said it was wonderful. The Hague said that? Yes. He said I've never played on anything like it in my life. <laughs> Those were his exact words. They sounded better even when he said them. Well, I still say if this is a good course, I'm Bobby Jones. Well, you listen to me, Jones. Oh, uh, Ferris. I'm just sore enough to make you eat those words. I'm too down to you on the first nine, right? I'll bet you $50 that I win this match. Did I say that? Fifty dollars? Hey, Uncle, you off your stick? Yeah, I must be. No, by golly, I said fifty dollars, and I'm going to stick to it. What about it, Ferris? It's a bet, Pop. I never hope to make fifty bucks any easier. Come on. It, uh, wait till I eat this last roof. <laughs> Here comes Marge. Maybe she'll bring you luck. Uh, quietly, Roy. Ferris is about to drive. <laughs> How's it going, Leroy? Uncle Mort just bent his shirt, and it's already hanging out. <laughs> Never mind that shirt. Give me that driver. All right. Head down now. Left arm stiff. Oh, nuts to that. Slam it. <laughs> Wonderful, Uncle Mort. What? I needed food. That's all I needed, food. <laughs> Your attention, please, ladies and gentlemen. Latest results on the final round match between Gildersleeve and Ferris. Gildersleeve has staged a great rally, and the players reached the 18th tee all even. They're playing the deciding hole now. And once more, <laughs> may the best man win. You know something, Unc? I think Paris has been cheating on the last two holes. Cheating? Oh, no, my boy. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Still, he's a cornet player. <laughs> yeah, I know for a fact he forgot to count a couple of his shots. He did? Why, that's terrible. Hurry up, Fatso. Let's get this over with. All right, all right. Go ahead. It's your shot. Uh, give me that club. <laughs> ah, there. Right smack on the green. Pop that butterball. Yeah, butterball. Now, now don't let him get you going, Unc. Here's your club. Yeah, all right, my boy. Here goes. Look out! <laughs> now, see here, you deliberately did that to make me miss. I did not. I was talking to my caddy. If you weren't such a little fellow, I'd knock the suppings out of you. I mean, if you weren't such a big fellow. <laughs> Quit squawking. Let's get going. Uh, move over, Leroy. Okay, Unc. Don't worry. I know a way to fix him. What's that? It, never mind. Let me shoot first. <laughs> Uh, Gosh, Unc, you're only six inches from the pin. Yeah, come on, Leroy, Marjorie, we'll win this thing yet. Yeah, what were you saying, Leroy? If he's going to cheat, we can take care of him. Oh, no, nothing unsporting, my boy. Can't have anything like that. Are you sure it'll work? <laughs> Don't you worry, Uncle Mort, just leave it to me. Yeah. Well, Pop, looks like you'll be home in five, but if I make this putt, I'm down in three and the match is over. Yeah, I can't deny it, Ferris. It's only a six-foot putt. Uh, Want to concede it? Concede? Brockmorton P. Gillis leave concede? Never. There's a principle involved. What principle, Unc? Fifty bucks. <laughs> That's the spirit, Uncle Mort. Well, have it your way, kids. The cup means nothing to me, but all oh, that cash. <laughs> Hand me my putter, son. Do it now, Leroy. Now. Okay. I don't want to walk yeah. without yeah, yeah. you. Quiet. I told you I can't stand that song. Quiet. The boy is just musically inclined. <laughs> Go right ahead and putt. Uh, darn kid. 
joke. <laughs> All right, I missed it. But if I sink this one, I still win. Oh, yes, I can still lose. Hey, go ahead. I don't want to walk with a house. Listen, I told you I don't like that song. Now cut it out. Sink the pot, sink the pot. Okay. I don't want to walk. <laughs> Another miss. Say, Ferris, if you miss once more, maybe I'll win. Don't huh? worry. Watch this one. Yeah. That's no fair. I didn't make a sound. No, but I thought you were going to. <laughs> Hey, if I make this putt, I win, don't I? Phil, quiet now. <laughs> you victory. Oh, 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 How do you like my trophy, Bertie? My, it sure looks handsome up there, Mr. Gillsleeve. Just what the mantle needed. But I thought they were going to give you a cup. Well, none of the clubs are giving cups anymore, Bertie. The government needs the medal for scrap. But this is a very valuable Ming vase. It's gorgeous, all right. Yeah, you should have seen how I want it, Bertie. I was lying about 50 feet from the hole, you see? Yes. <laughs> Here, give me that club. All right. Yeah, thank you. I'll show you. I took my trusty number five iron. I swung it easy like this. Oh, good night, everybody. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Bingman speaking for the makers of Packset and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Have you discovered the speedy way to make swell macaroni and cheese? These days, clever women make that favorite dish without any fuss of grating cheese, without any bother with blanching and baking the macaroni. They simply open up a package of the product called Kraft Dinner. They cook the special Kraft Dinner macaroni quickly in boiling water, and with a Kraft grated, which also comes in each Kraft Dinner package, they sprinkle the cheese flavor through and through. Presto, the dinner main dish is ready in only seven minutes cooking time. But the best part of it is, Kraft Dinner macaroni and cheese is extra special good. Fluffy, light, and drenched in cheese flavor. When good cooks discover this seven-minute way of making macaroni and cheese, they say never again to the old-fashioned slow method. And Kraft Dinner is a money saver as well as a time saver. So tomorrow when you're shopping, get ready for quick, tempting main dishes of macaroni and cheese. Ask your dealer for Kraft Dinner. The program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. That presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the makers of Fab Set present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. <laughs> We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Homemakers, when unexpected guests stay for dinner or between meal refreshments are in order, are you equal to the occasion? Well, whether the occasion calls for just the snack or for the main dish of a hearty meal, you'll find Pab Step is mighty handy to have around. You see, Pab Step is the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred different uses. 
Fab Set slices so neatly and spreads so easily, it's grand for sandwiches or appetizers, or to serve with fruit. Fab Set makes luscious, smooth cheese sauces that turn vegetables, leftovers, or chicken or egg dishes into real party treats. Fab Set is just right for cheese omelets, rabbits, or souffles. Yes, and Fab Set is nourishing. It's a fine energy food and easy to digest. So always keep a package or two of Fab Set on hand. Whether your dealer has it in the convenient round, flat package. Remember, just ask for Fab Set. P A B S T dash E T T. Fab Set. The delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. Let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who has risen this morning with the conviction that all's right with the world. After a warm shower, a half dozen knee bends, a brisk shave, and a hearty breakfast, he stepped out onto the front porch to enjoy a cigar and survey his property. Uh, uh, October. I tell you, Marjorie, there's no finer month in the year. Just breathe that air. It's wonderful. Uh, feel that nip in it. Makes you want to get out and do things. Doesn't it, Leroy? Such as what? Uh, <laughs> October. Harvest time, frost on the pumpkin. Brown October ale. The smell of burning leaves. I love October. Uh, look at that maple tree in Mrs. Ransom's yard there. It's like a beautiful painting. Uncle Mort, I believe you'd like any kind of a tree if Mrs. Ransom was sitting under it. She is? Where? <laughs> <laughs> I was speaking figuratively. Oh. Well, let me reiterate, Marjorie, that Mrs. Ransom to me is nothing but a neighbor. You believe in the good neighbor policy. Yes. We were discussing trees. Look at our own lovely elm. Look at the color of those leaves. Oh, it's glorious. Yeah, and you know what's going to happen to those leaves? They're going to fall on the ground. That's the first law of nature, my boy. Yeah, and I'm going to have to rake them up. That's the second law. <laughs> Leroy, never let me hear you say that about a tree. Okay, I think I'll go over to Piggy. Did you ever stop to consider what a wonderful thing a tree is? Leroy, I asked you a question. Did you? No, Uncle, I'll do it the minute I get back. <laughs> Come back here. You do what? What you said. You weren't listening. I'm listening, Uncle. Miss Piggy's waiting for me. We're going to dig a fort. You dig a fort? You can do plenty of digging right here, Leroy. Just stick around. I have something to tell you. Uh, both of you. Uh-oh. What is it? Well, I bought a tree. Huh? You bought a tree? Certainly. What's so amazing about that? Everybody ought to have more trees. Why, one of the happiest recollections of my childhood is an old cherry tree we had in our front yard at home. I fell out of it once and broke my arm. <laughs> you must have had a jolly childhood, Uncle Moore. Yeah. What wouldn't I give to be back there now? <laughs> to be a kid again. And break the other arm. <laughs> Yes, sir. There are two things every boy ought to grow up with. A dog of his own and a cherry tree. Do you mean that, Uncle? What? About the dog? Yes, no, but I mean it about the cherry tree. <laughs> the tree I bought was a cherry tree. How did you come to get sold this tree, Uncle Moore? I didn't get sold it. I bought it of my own free will, fully dressed and in my right mind. <laughs> well, where are we going to put it? Where are we going to put another tree here? Well, uh, uh, you don't understand, my dear. This is a very fine tree. It's a... They call it a giant ponderosa. Holy smoke, how big is it? Well, the man says they grow 30 or 40 feet high, higher than the house. What man, Uncle Moore? The man that sold it to me. He showed me a picture of it. Oh, you haven't seen the tree? Why, of course not. I hope you didn't pay him for it. Well, I, uh... Come on, Uncle, how much did he stick you for? Twenty-two fifty, and he didn't stick me. Twenty-two <laughs> fifty? Wow, you must have bought a redwood. Uncle Moore, did you ever stop to think how many cherries you could buy for twenty-two fifty? Oh, uh, you're very helpful, both of you. But the tree will be arriving today or tomorrow. We've got to decide where we're going to put it. Now, I thought maybe right out here in the front. Now, Lord, this is the only sunny spot left in the whole yard. That's good. Cherry trees need sun. It'll give us some nice shade out here. We can hang a hammock under it. Hey, that wouldn't be bad. Just lie here with your mouth open and let the cherries drop in, uh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, we might not have more than a few cherries the first year, but after that... Oh, uh, Bertie. Yes, sir? How are you on cherry pies? Well, I haven't had any complaints so far. Oh, uh, then warm up your rolling pin. Uh, Leroy, do you like cherry pie? Are you kidding? 
Then get the shovel. Oh, I like coconut custard better. Get the shovel anyway. <laughs> Enough. Well, you've hardly scratched the surface there, Leroy. That isn't deep enough for a geranium. Gosh, I've been digging for half an hour. Here, give me that shovel, Leroy. I'll spare you. Yes, you show him how it should be done, Bertie. You've got to put your foot on it and give it the old heave hole. <clears throat> yeah, that's right, Bertie. Heave hole. <laughs> Oh, you're doing fine. I'm going to have to stop pretty soon, Mr. Gilfleet, and get lunch. Is anybody hungry? I'm not. Well, don't you think it's deep enough now, Uncle Morris? It's up to our way. Well, you've got to remember, my dear, this is no two for a nickel cherry tree. This is a giant ponderosa. Yes, I know, Uncle and Morris. And these but... things have roots. They've got to spread out. Heave ho, Bertie. Looks like I'm dug in for the women here. <laughs> Heave ho! <laughs> Am I selling you or you selling me? Yes, Leroy. While you're resting, give Bertie a hand there. I, I don't want to suggest anything, Uncle, but how are you with a shovel? Uh, I'm saving myself, Leroy. So I know that. Uh, I'm saving myself for the hard work. We've got a long way to go yet. These giant ponderosas, you know. Heave ho, my boy. But it's up to my chin, Uncle. Huh? Chin up, my boy. Heave ho. <laughs> Yes, Bertie. It's getting dark down here. <laughs> you don't think maybe we can bound for our mother? <laughs> You're getting there, Bertie. You're getting there. We struck a pipe or something down here, huh? Mother Morris. Wait a minute, Leroy. What is it, Marjorie? Trade office calls. The tree's there and they're sending it out. Oh, fine. Well, we'll have to get busy here and have everything ready. Hey, come on up, Bertie. Yeah, I'm sure if I can get up. Uh, uh, look out. You're starting a landslide. Leroy, give her a boost there. Grab hold of the shovel, Bertie, and I'll pull. Oh, oh. <laughs> Great day in the morning. I sure am glad to be out that hole in the ground. Now give me a hand, up. Okay. One, two, three. Oh. Yeah. There you are. Thanks, Uncle. Now, Leroy, while you're resting, I want you to take that shovel. Well, here comes Mrs. Ransom. Mrs. Ransom? Oh, give me the shovel. <laughs> Break down and go to work, Uncle. Go dig your fort, Leroy. <laughs> Give me the shovel. Uh, good afternoon, Mrs. Ransom. Uh, lovely day. Just glorious. Hello, Leroy. Hi, Mrs. Ransom. Marjorie, honey, you're looking just sweet. Thank you. Yeah, just doing a little landscaping here. I saw you. I saw you out the window, and I declare to goodness I was just consumed with curiosity, so I came right over willy nilly. Well, glad you did. Where's Willy? Oh. <laughs> Careful, don't fall in that hole. Oh, what rock, Mountain? Mr. Gildersleeve, did you go and dig that great big hole? Uh, well, I had a little help. A little, he says. <laughs> well, it's a lovely hole. But what are you going to do with it? Make a swimming pool? Uh, no, we're going to plant a tree. A tree? Oh, Strock Mountain, then you did remember. It should remember what? Well, what we talked about under the maple tree the other night. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> I love trees, don't you, Marjorie? Yes, you can't go wrong with a tree. <laughs> you know, Chalk Mountain, the boys back home used to have the prettiest customs. They used to carve the girls' initials in the trees. Sometimes they even put a heart around them with an arrow through it. Silly, isn't it? <laughs> Leroy, go dig your fort. I'm getting to like it here, huh? Well, here comes somebody else. Looks like Mr. Peavy. It is. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Yeah, uh, hello, Peavy. Oh, doing a little digging, I see. Yes, doing a little digging. Mm, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I do a little gardening myself when I can. Uh, Peavy, uh, you know Mrs. Ransom? Oh, yes. Yes, Mr. Peavy and I are old friends. Yes, I had the privilege of selling Mrs. Ransom a back brush a few days ago. Uh, how's it working out, Mrs. Ransom? Well, I, I hardly know that this is the place to discuss it, Mr. Peavy, but it has a tendency to tickle. Well, they come that way from the factory. You have to work them in. <laughs> Mr. Stevie and I have one of those brushes. We've had it almost ten years, and we think the world of it. We wouldn't part with that brush for almost anything you could name. Uh, well, I'm glad you're happy with it. Hey, um, here comes the old goat. Leroy, that's no way to talk about Judge Hooker. Hello, Gildy. Hello, you old goat. <laughs> Mrs. Ransom. Oh, my, this is an unexpected pleasure, Judge. Hello, Leroy, Marjorie, Peavy. Uh, Quite a little gathering. What's going on here? Mr. Gildersleeve is having a tree planted. Well, what is this, Arbor Day? Oh, I wish I could stay for the ceremonies, but I've got to tend to my marketing. Oh, must you go? Yes, but when I come back, I expect to see a shady bell right where that hole is. Goodbye now. Uh, uh, goodbye, Mrs. Ransom. Goodbye, Mrs. Goodbye. Ransom. Goodbye. <laughs> goodbye, Mrs. Ransom. You can have the shovel back now, Leroy. <laughs> What's the excavation for, Gildy? Are you going to plant this tree or bury it? No. <laughs> What kind of a tree is it? It's a cherry tree. Any objections? No. Of course, they don't live very long, but they'll probably live as long as you will. <laughs> Listen to me, you old goat. A cherry tree was good enough for George Washington, and George Washington was good enough for me. You tell him, Uncle. Why, every house in this country ought to have a cherry tree. I hope this tree will be an inspiration to you, Leroy, to follow in the footsteps of George Washington. Do you understand what's expected of you? Yeah, you want me to chop it down? You know. <laughs> My kid. He knows his history, Gildy. That's more than you do. Uh, yeah. Hey, um, oh, here he comes. Uh, who? The express man. Maybe he's got the tree. Oh, no, no. It would take a bigger wagon than that, Leroy. They'll have to send it out on a truck. All right, up here, though. Oh, yeah. he's stopping here. Yeah, maybe it's still down at the freight office. Maybe they couldn't handle it. After all, a giant Ponderosa at 2250 Mr. Gildersleeve. Gentleman right there. Yeah, something for me? A sign here. Wait a minute. I was expecting a tree. They telephoned me from the freight office. You know anything about it? You sign here. But what am I signing for? I bought this tree from a fellow who came through here a week ago. Sign here, please. All right, I'll sign. But what about the tree? I paid a lot of good money down. If it's all the same to you, I'd like to know what... Oh, no, no, no. You went and signed in the wrong place. I'll have to erase it. Just erase it. Well, you got me so darn excited. Now, listen, brother. Would you mind telling me... Bottom line there. The bottom line. Your hand's shaking, huh? Yeah. Now, would you mind telling me what you're delivering, if anything? Tree. The tree? Where is it? Under my arm. Take it, will you, bud? That little twig? (laughs) Good, isn't this awful? The great shoulder sleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. But first, you homemakers have a big job to do these wartime days. Yes, your job is to see that your families get the foods that help make them strong. So you'll want to know about a food that adds extra nourishment to meals in any number of easy, appetizing ways. That food is Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred different uses. Yes, Pabstet offers many quick, delightful ways to add variety and extra nutriments to your menus. One way is with the smooth, rich cheese sauces that Pabstet makes. Just melt Pabstet in a double boiler. Stir in a little milk and season. And you have a grand golden cheese sauce for vegetables, leftovers, all kinds of nourishing food. Pabstet cheese sauce is mighty tasty, mighty nutritious, too. Because Pabstet is a nourishing, digestible energy food, rich in milk protein. And it helps provide vitamin A and the important milk minerals, calcium and phosphorus. So serve Pabstet often. Remember, it's Pabstet the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. Now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve and his cherry tree. The neighbors have left, and for half an hour, Gildersleeve and his nephew have been filling in the mighty hole they just finished digging. Alas, poor Leroy, I knew him well. Never mind the ham, Leroy. Keep shuffling. 
First we shovel it out, and then we shovel it in. Yeah, that's life, my boy. It seems a shame to fill up a ditch like this, Uncle. Huh? Would have made a swell elephant trap. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to trap the fellow who sold me this tree. That Johnny Appleseed ever comes through here again, I'll hang him from the top of it. You couldn't hang a midget from it now, Uncle. <laughs> All right, keep shoveling. You know, Uncle Morris, I think this tree's going to live. Oh, really, Marjorie? Mm-hmm. I've been soaking its little roots and water. Oh. Look, there's some green there. By George, you're right. Look at that green. Water, that's all it needs. Let's get it in the ground quick, huh? Leroy, scoop out a little bed for it. Okay. Uh, a young tree will stand transplanting better than the big one, you know. Yeah, that's right, my dear. Uh, stick it in the hole, Marjorie, and Leroy, you fill around it. Hold it straight, Marge. There. Uh, you know, all that digging we did will probably help us. Plenty of cultivation, that's what these trees need, and plenty of water. Yeah, now pat the earth around the little roots, Leroy. That's right. Don't pat it too hard. These giant ponderosas are very delicate. <laughs> you got to cultivate them and water them. you got to tend them like a little baby. Hmm. Nice little tree. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we ought to take it in the house nights to keep it warm. <laughs> Very funny, Leroy. Go get the hose and drag it over here, will you? We've got to give this a good soaking. Don't you think we ought to use a medicine dropper? A medicine <laughs> Go get the hose. Okay, okay. Ah, <laughs> oh, they just like to kid you, Uncle Mort. You are funny, you know. Oh, you too. <laughs> Let them laugh. We're lucky to get a tree like this for twenty-two fifty. dollars the hose! Well, drag it over here. Oh, well, turn on the water. We'll squirt it from there. Here, give it to me. You go turn it off. Don't squirt it too hard, Uncle Morris. You'll knock the tree over. Go ahead. Turn it on, Leroy. It's on! Stand back, Marjorie. Here oh. it comes. Uh-huh. Turn it on all the way. I've got to turn it on as go. Oh, look at that. Is that guy next door taking a bath again? <laughs> Nothing comes out. Look at that dribble. Oh, you can make it go farther than that. Stick your thumb over the end of it, Uncle. Well, I'll try it. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Leroy, you knew it would do that. You didn't have to squirt yourself in the face with it, Uncle. I'll wipe you off, Uncle Moore. Yes, never mind. By George, that's the last straw. That's summer field for you. You try to plant a tree, you try to beautify the place for a little, and then what happens? No water. Bertie's been complaining about the pressure all summer. Well, she should. The water situation in this town is a disgrace. It's a fire hazard. It's a menace to the public health. And uh, it leaves a ring in the bathtub, too. <laughs> I'm going to go out and do something. Come on, Hooker, open up. I know you're in there. All right, Gillespie, what do you want? I'm very busy. Uh, Judge, have you used any water lately? I never touch the sun. <laughs> you come all the way down here to ask me riddles? I mean it. I'm serious. We can't get any water at my house. We can't get any pressure. It's a disgrace. Well, don't complain to me. Complain to Clanahan. He's the water commissioner. Uh, what's the use of complaining to Clanahan? He just sits down there at the waterworks on his fat salary playing pinochle. <laughs> While the town goes dry, the man can't even plant a cherry tree. Don't holler at me. I don't play pinochle. Well, that's nothing to do with it. You might at least ask a visitor to come in and sit down, Hooker. I don't want you to come in and I don't want you to sit down. I'm busy. Now, Judge, look. I've written a letter to the indicator vindicator about this situation. You have. Uh-huh, and I'd like to read it to you. No, 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 no. I'm positive it's a fine letter, Gildy. And you must be sure to send it to the newspaper. But if you want to get action with a politician like Clanahan, you'll have to get out and blast. It blast? What do you mean, Judge? You want to get up a petition. Go around and get people to sign it. A petition? You're right. It's the voice of the people. Oh, that's wonderful, Judge. I'll get up a petition that'll blow his ears back. I'll write a petition that'll go down in history with the Missouri Compromise. Or was it the Mississippi? <laughs> Floyd. Morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. You're next. Be with you in about two minutes. Thanks, Floyd. I won't require your professional administrations this morning. I shaved myself. But I've got a little thing here I'd like to have you sign. Well, the wife says I'll sign anything. What is it? Uh, you use a lot of water here, don't you, Floyd? Now, I've got a petition. I'll read it to you. A quote. It's to whom it may concern. 
We, the undersigned taxpayers of Summerfield, believing that the water situation in this town is a crime and a disgrace, X-ray, X-ray. and a stench in the nostrils of civic pride, do hereby petition the town council. Yes. What's hissing? Are you shushing me? The guy in the chair under the towel. This Sorry. Are you working on me, Ranger? Uh, uh, yes, sir. Be right with you. Right, get this towel off me, Trey. Yes, sir. Oh, hello, Clanahan. <laughs> I read your letter in the indicator last night. Did you? I used your water to shave with this morning. I'm just getting up a little testimonial about it here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I couldn't possibly sign a thing like that. Mr. Clanahan here is one of my best customers. I'm sorry. Come back later. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way you feel about it. Goodbye, Floyd. I'll be seeing you, Mr. Clanahan, if you're around. <laughs> <laughs> You know yourself the water in this town isn't any good. It's not even fit to bathe in. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I bathe in it regularly, so does Mrs. Peavy. All right, it's fine to bathe in then. Well, no, I wouldn't say that either. It's a little slow coming out of the tap, and it's kind of brown, and it has its peculiar taste. Well, in other, in other words, it's pretty bad water. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Look, Peavy, I'm not asking you to sign the Magna Carta. It's just a little piece of paper asking for water. Yeah, I understand. Peavy, out in my yard, I've got a little cherry tree. A little tiny cherry tree. Pushing its tender shoots up through the parched earth, crying for water. Are you going to deny that little tree lit life? Well... Sign here. <laughs> I wasn't born yesterday. Look here, Judge. You're the one who told me to get up this petition. Sure I was, but I'm not crazy enough to sign it. Why, well, I'd as soon sign my own death warrant. I'll be bringing that around yet, you old goat. <laughs> A fine, upstanding judge. Well, you know how this town is run, Gildy. It's just too bad. I'd like to see somebody throw Clanahan out. Somebody else, not me. Yeah. That's your final word, is it, Hooker? I'm sorry, Gildy, but that's it. Very interesting. This is going to be very interesting. To whom? To a certain lady who shall be nameless, Mrs. Ransom. All right. If you're going to play dirty, give me the paper. I thought you'd see the light, Judge. You're worse than Clanahan. I'm doing this against my better judgment, you understand? You never want to trust that anyway. Thanks, (laughs) Judge. <laughs> Come in, won't you? Come right in. Yeah. Now, don't tell me you've gone and brought me something again. Well, not exactly. I brought you a little paper to sign. Oh, my goodness. I do hope it's nothing legal. Well, it's, it, it has to do with the water situation. Oh, dear. Is it bad? If, hadn't you noticed? It, it's terrible. There's no hydraulic pressure. Oh, there you go. I just don't know what you're talking about when you talk about things like that. I'm not a bit mechanical, you know. Oh, well, you don't have to understand it, really. All you have to do is sign it. It's a petition. Petition? Is that anything like a subpoena? Uh, Well, not really, no. Because I never did know what a subpoena was. My my husband, Beauregard, was a lawyer, you know, and I never did understand him from the day I married him. Oh, but then he never understood me. Oh. But we understand each other, don't we, Strachmartin? Oh, brother. <laughs> Come into the parlor, won't you? Now, let's don't talk about petitions and pressures and chemistry and all that. Let's talk about us. Oh, well, I'll tell you. I've got to get this petition in before the meeting of the town council tomorrow. Oh, pooh. All you men think about is business. I know, but let's get it signed first, and then we can... Uh, uh, go on from there. <laughs> well, I'd love to sign a truck, Morton. Really, I would. But Beauregard told me I must never sign anything without getting the advice of a lawyer first. Oh. Uh, don't you reckon maybe I ought to consult Judge Hooker? Uh, Hooker? Uh, no. Frankly, I don't think the judge would understand about this. You don't? No. You see, if, if this petition is... Uh, well, it all started with that tree I planted. 
Our tree, Leela. Our little tree. Oh, Trot Martin. You're sweet. I'll sign it. I'll do anything you say. Uh, wait. Here's my pen. <laughs> After all, you're my air raid warden. I guess that makes it legal, doesn't it? <laughs> Absolutely. There. To Croc Martin with love from Leela. Uh, huh? <laughs> Aren't you pleased? Well, if... Uh... I mean, it's all right the way I autographed it. Oh, the town council will love it. <laughs> <laughs> With love from Leela. <laughs> What's that noise? What time is it? It's only six o'clock. What's going on out there? Hey, look, wake up. Leroy, what's that racket outside? There's a gang of men digging in the front yard. In the front yard? Who told them to do that? Six o'clock in the morning. I'll find out about this. Hey! Hey, out there! Oh, it's you, Clanahan. What do you think you're doing? Your complaint about the water, didn't you? Certainly I did, and I'm going to complain about it again. You said you wanted action, didn't you? Certainly I did. Well, you're getting it. Wait a minute. Where's that tree that was there? What tree? Oh! <laughs> No, Leroy. Uh, what's the picture? Oh, it's super, Unc. It's called Here We Go Again. Here We Go Again? I never heard of it. You never heard of Here We Go Again? Well, I've heard of it now. It's got Sidney McGee and Molly in it. Oh, my little chums. Well. And Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. Well, for heaven's sake, that sounds great. Here's a dollar. Take your friend. Wait a minute. There's a guy in it called the Great Gildersleeve. Never heard. Oh, that's me. What am I saying? Wait a minute, Leroy. I'll get my hat and go with you. Good night, everybody. Here we go again. <laughs> music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Bingman speaking for the makers of Tab Set and inviting you to be with us again next week at the same time for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. A word for all you thrifty women who are trying to keep the food budget on an even keel. The product called Kraft Dinner is just your dish. For Kraft Dinner gives you the economical way, the quick way to make delicious macaroni and cheese. Fluffy, tender macaroni, drenched with cheese goodness. With Kraft Dinner, you make it in just seven minutes cooking time. You see, every Kraft Dinner package contains a special fast-cooking macaroni and an envelope of Kraft grated so you can sprinkle in the cheese flavor in a hurry. And say, the family will go for this thrifty, speedy macaroni and cheese. They'll tell you it's as good as any you ever baked in the oven the old-fashioned way. Why don't you get several packages of economical Kraft Dinner tomorrow? Have it on hand in the pantry shelf. A main dish ready in seven minutes is such a help these busy days. Tomorrow, ask your food dealer for Kraft Dinner. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. K presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the makers of Parquet Margarine present each week at this time Harold Perry is the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. 
But first, I want to give you some facts about a food that's becoming more important than ever these days. That food is nutritious parquet margarine, the delicious economical spread for bread made by Kraft. So, here are a few simple facts that may explain why thousands of American families are using parquet margarine three times a day, at the table and for cooking, too. First, parquet is a wholesome vegetable margarine made from carefully selected American farm products. Second, parquet margarine is a highly nourishing food, one of the best energy foods you can serve, and a reliable year-round source of important vitamin A. Third, parquet is the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. Its flavor is delicate and appetizing. It's entirely different from old-time margarine. One taste will prove that to you. So for all these reasons, get acquainted with economical parquet margarine now. Tomorrow, ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve. We find him in the land of Nod, sleeping the sleep of a man who has put his car up on blocks, bought his full quota of war bonds, and saved four and a half pounds of bacon fat. While outdoors, Jack Frost has been preparing a little surprise for him. Not what do you want? Do you see what I see? I don't see anything. Go away. But, but look outdoors. Look out the window. Ooh, daylight. Take it away. <laughs> no, no. Get up and look. Look at the trees. Look at the ground. Ooh, daylight. It gets all over everything. <laughs> but I'm trying to tell you, Uncle, it's been snowing. Well, tell Bertie or somebody. Don't come by. Did you say snowing? If you don't believe me, get up and look. It can't be. It's 30 days past September, April, June, and... Here's a handful of it on the windowsill. Look. By George, it is snow. Snow in October. Why, it hasn't snowed in October since the blizzard of 88. And that was in January. <laughs> look. You can see your breath, huh? Ooh, it must be freezing. You're darn right it's freezing. The moment is down to 25. And you know that hole that Mr. Clanahan dug in the front yard? Yes. The snow's filled it up. You wouldn't know it was there. Oh, my goodness. The water pipes will freeze. Yeah, they will. That Clanahan's a fine water commissioner. I've been after him for six days to get that hole filled in. Ooh, listen to that wind. You can close that window, will you, Leroy? Come on, Unc. The house won't get any warmer till you get up and start the furnace. It, Leroy, I wish you wouldn't drag in these unpleasant truths so early in the morning. <laughs> Well, come on, get up. Don't stand there staring at me. Go down and tell him I'll be right down. If tell Bertie to keep the coffee warm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, go back to sleep if you want. But Bertie's making buckwheat cake. Yeah, I don't. Give buckwheat cake? Oh, buckwheat. One side. Gang away. <laughs> the floor is cold. Where's my bathrobe? Where's my bathrobe? Bertie. Oh, I slept in it. <laughs> Never mind, I found it, Bertie. Hold the buckwheat. More coffee, Uncle Mark? Uh, thank you, my dear. Uh, pass your cup, will you? Hold it still. It, I can't. I'm shivering. I'll hold it, Mr. Gill, please. Ooh, that's worse. Grab at somebody. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm all over goose pimples. <laughs> Why don't you go put a sweater on, Bertie? I got on so many sweaters now. I can hardly bend at the elbow and my teeth chattering like a pair of dice. Yeah. Marjorie, take a look at that thermometer there, will you? I can tell you from here, Uncle Mort. It's cold. Yes, we'll have to do something about this. While you're up, my dear, hand me a cigar, will you? What do we do? All sit around it and warm our hands? <laughs> <laughs> no, Leroy. We go out to the garage and we bring in some firewood. And I do mean you. Oh, me and my big mouth. Uh, I'm going to call up Clanahan right now before those water pipes freeze. Better put your rubbers on, Leroy. That snow is wet. Oh, I don't need any. It, put your rubbers on, young man. Hello. It, I want to speak to Commissioner Clanahan. He won't be in? The fine water commissioner he is. 
And you can tell them I said so. The commissioner is not expected in today. And if anything happens to those pipes, it's on him. Oh, Leroy, close the door. As soon as Leroy comes back, I'll go down and see if I can start old Vesuvius. Uh, Bertie. Yes, sir? Uh, Bertie, have you ever had any acquaintance with a furnace? <laughs> oh, I know how to work it. You just fiddle with that little doohickey out in the hall. But that was last year. Last year we were burning oil. With coal, there's a little more to it. Oh. It's nothing difficult, you understand. I think you'd be very good at it. Thank you. <laughs> Anybody who's as good as you are with a shovel. Oh, the shovel. <laughs> well, that comes into it. <laughs> but it's not all shoveling. Well, I don't know about that. I know how to run that doohickey. I ran it last year. It, that doohickey is called a thermostat, Bertie. I wanted to speak to you about that. As I remember it, you ran it last year at about 80. You said 70. Yes, and I used to set it at 70. But the minute I got out of the house, you sneaked it up to 80. Well, sometimes it gets colder than others. <laughs> now, this is serious, Bertie. This year, we got to save fuel. The temperature is going to be set at 65 degrees, and that's where it's going to stay. 65? Maybe it's going to stay, but I ain't. Oh, you wouldn't leave us, Bertie. Yes, ma'am. I can't work in those 65 degrees. I'll go on away from here. Oh, now, Bertie. I'll go for some work for somebody else, if I have to. Uh, calm yourself, Bertie, and just remember this. If anybody offers you more than 65 degrees this winter, they're traitors. Huh? <laughs> you don't want to work for traitors, do you, Bertie? No, sir, not me. Well, remember that. The government says we've all got to help save fuel, Bertie. And the way to do it is to hold the temperature down to 65 degrees. Besides, 65 is warm enough for anybody. 65 won't hatch no eggs. <laughs> no, but it'll keep you on your toes. It'll keep you from falling asleep at the broom. <laughs> <laughs> well, if the government says so, I guess that's the way it's got to be. But if it's all the same to the government, I'm going to buy me some woolies and throw myself into them. <laughs> now I'm going to start looking at fur coats. Fur coats? Oh, brother, there we get into inflation. <laughs> oh, that's Leroy. Huh? He's probably got his arms full. Yeah. I'll let him in. Yeah. Oh, close it, Leroy. Close it. Here's the wood. Where do I put it? On the dining room table would be very nice. Wise guy. Quick, move the fire screen, Bertie. There. Can I light the fire on? Uh, before we do that, young man, let's get down to the cellar and start the furnace. I want to teach you how to take out the ashes. Holy smokes. Do I have to do all the work around here? Oh, no, no. I don't see what you had to go and change the furnace to coal for anyway. The oil was working all right. There wasn't any ashes. You didn't have to get up in the morning and shake it. It never went out. It was swell. It, it was swell, all right. It was a comfort and a convenience. But we're going to have to give up our conveniences, Leroy. There isn't, there isn't going to be enough oil to go around this winter. That's why we're burning coal. It doesn't have to come so far, so it's easier to get. Well, it's no easier for me, I can tell you that. Look here, young man. You want to help in this war, don't you? Well, sure I do. I go right out and join the Navy. They'd let me. Why, so would I. Me too. Did I say that? <laughs> I think we all want to help. But I'm too old to join Leroy, and you're too young. We've just got to help in the only way we can, and here at home. So remember, every time you carry out a load of ashes, you're in the fight as much as the next man. Well, how about you getting in it too, Unc? Huh? Even me. <laughs> I'll get up in the mornings and wrestle with the furnace if it kills me. And I don't have to tell you, young man, when Uncle Throckmorton gets up off his pants, this country is really all out. <laughs> Put it there, Unc. Yeah. Let's go down and shake the insides out of that furnace. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> The heat's beginning to come up. Oh. I'll have it as warm as toast here in a jiffy, Marjorie. Now remember, Uncle Mort, 65. Yeah, that's as warm as most toast. The only, the only trouble is if this cold snap lasts three days, we'll be out of cold. I'd better call up and order some more. Yes, you better. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. I should have done this before, my dear. Hello? It's Summerfield Coal Company. I want a ton of coal delivered to my house this afternoon. In a week. That's a fine way to run a coal company. What's your name? Clanahan. Well, this is Gildersleeve. No wonder you're such a rotten water commissioner. You spend all your time peddling coal. Well, now you listen here, Clanahan. I want a ton of coal delivered to my house before the day is over, if you have to bring it yourself. And furthermore, I want that hole in my front yard filled in. Water commissioner. If my pipes freeze up, I'll sue you. Uh, I guess I told him. Hello? Why, you... He hung up. 
What did he say, Uncle Mort? Yes, nothing fit for ladies' ears, my dear. Wasn't even fit for mine. Where's Leroy? Oh, he's over shoveling off Mrs. Ranson's walk. Oh, Mrs. Ranson, eh? Maybe I ought to go help him. He doesn't need any help, Uncle Mort. He's getting paid for it, you know. Oh, say, I wonder if she's got any heat over there. I wonder what kind of a furnace she's got. <laughs> I really couldn't say, Uncle Mort. I wonder if it's been converted. It'd be terrible if it hasn't. Terrible. Yeah. Maybe it's been converted and she hasn't got any coal. Oh, that would be just as bad. Yeah, it would. Or maybe she's got coal and doesn't know how to start the furnace. Uh-huh. All alone there with no man in the house. Yeah. You know what she ought to have? Yes. Yeah. A man. Uh, no, some firewood. Maybe I ought to call up an order or something. Huh? Don't you think you ought to find out whether she's got any first? Oh, that's a great idea, Marjorie. I'll go over there myself and find out. Uh, thanks for the tip. Oh, no, don't thank me. We're going anyway. Uh, where's my overcoat? Oh, here it is, right in the closet. But not tight now. You know, I think I'll take her a few sticks of firewood just in case. I'll take these logs Leroy brought in. There goes our fire. Oh, uh, my hat. Put it on my head, will you, my dear? He likes you better in your air raid helmet. Uh, I'll have the hat if you don't mind. You don't have to put it on at such a rakish angle. Put it on straight. Oh, you look sweet that way. There you are. I'll open the door for you. Uh, thank you, my dear. Over the river and through the woods to Grandmother's house we go. Hey, Uncle. The horse knows the way to carry the sleigh to the white and drifting snow. Hey, Mark, where's he going? He's going next door to warm up Mrs. Ransom. <laughs> The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. Meantime, plenty of energy is mighty important these busy wartime days. For hard work, yes, and for hard play. Of course, energy comes from the foods you eat. So it's important that you know which foods provide the most energy. Now, one of the very best energy foods you can serve, and one that's economical too, is delicious parquet margarine made by Kraft. That's a good thing because... Parquet margarine is a three times a day source of important food energy. Parquet is a grand tasting spread for bread, rolls, or toast at breakfast, lunch, or dinner. It's a real flavor shortening for baking better tasting pastries, cakes, and cookies. Parquet is grand for pan frying, too, because it doesn't spatter or stick to the pan. And besides furnishing energy, every pound of parquet margarine provides 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So, why not give delicious, economical parquet margarine a try in your household? Remember, it's parquet. B-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now, let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Like an angel of mercy with an armload of wood, he trudges up the walk to the Widow Ransom's door. Where whom should he meet but... Hooker. Gildersleeve, what mischief are you up to? The same mischief you're up to, Horace. I merely came over to make sure Mrs. Ransom has enough heat. Yes, yeah, so did I, and I've got some logs here to prove it. I... I brought her a hot water bottle, so there. Uh, why don't you just go home, Judge? I'll take care of this. Oh, no, you won't. Why, Horace. It's Horace. Good morning. <laughs> Martin. <laughs> yeah. Aren't you sweet to call? Come in, won't you? After you, Throckmorton. You said it. Step inside so I can shut out that dreadful wind. Uh, uh, won't you let me take your things, gentlemen? Allow me to hang them up. Oh, thank you, Judge. Why, Throckmorton, what fish you brought me? Wood for your fireplace. For my fireplace? I declare you're the most thoughtful man. Uh... I brought you something, too, Mrs. Ransom. It's in one of my pockets here. Yeah, the judge brought a hot water bottle in case his gout gets bad. <laughs> well, hot water bottle, nothing. Blackberry cordial. Huh? Blackberry cordial. Oh, I just love it. The, it's my favorite. You sneaky old... How did you know it was my favorite? You didn't say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I haven't had any blackberry cordial since I left home. Uh, come in by the fireplace, won't you? I've been trying to start a poor little old fire here, but all I had was newspapers, and I don't know a thing about fire. Don't you worry, Mrs. Ransom. We'll soon have it blazing for you. 
Let's have those logs, Gildy. Uh, wait a minute. They're my logs. No, Horace gets to lay the fire because he brought the cauldron. Oh. I declare I don't know what I'd do without you, boy. Because I'm just about frozen to death here. I haven't any furnace. I haven't any coal. You haven't any coal? No. I just never thought to order any, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I'll tell you what you're going to do. You're going to come over to my house. You're going to have lunch and dinner with us and spend the night. If Margie will put you up. Oh, Jack Martin, you're so masterful. Oh, am I? <laughs> well, uh, I hope you have a good time, Leela. Yes, she will. It's been some time since I've enjoyed a sample of Bertie's cooking. Yeah. She's a fine cook. You're wasting your breath, Hooker. Of course, I haven't got any heat in my house either. But I dare say I'll get along. Yeah, I dare say you will. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. Rock Mountain, did you hear that? The judge hasn't any heat in his house either. <laughs> That's a shame. <laughs> I know. Let's make it a house party, yeah. shall we? Yeah. Oh, how about it, Judge? All right with me if it's all right with you, then. Oh, he'd love to have you. I know he would. Just the three of us. We can have more fun. No fudge. Fudge. We'll make fudge. And full taffy. Wonderful. Rock Martin, you think of the best party? Yes, don't I? All right, Hooker, you can come to lunch, but that's all. Too. Makes me feel like a kid again. Yeah. Oh, brother. Hop on the sled, Leela, and I'll pull you. Oh, no, I'm too heavy. You couldn't pull me. Yeah, I can pull you with one finger. Come on, hop on. Well, don't strain yourself now. Yeah, that's right. Now put up your little feet. Not you, Hooker. Come on, Hooker, get off of there. <laughs> now, boys, I don't want you to get to fight no me. And whatever you do, don't anybody try to wash my face with snow. Huh? I just couldn't stand. You would have washed my face with snow. By George, I've got half a notion to try. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, yes, I will. Oh, no, you won't. Oh, no. Come on, Judge. You hold her and I'll wash her face. Yeah. Oh, no. I'll hold her and you wash her face. Fell in Clanahan's hole. Get me out of this. Get me out of this. I'm freezing to death. Give me your hand, Judge. Tread water, Judge. Tread water. He doesn't have to. He's standing in mud. Come on, Judge. Jump. There. Oh, it's cold. Oh, Judge, you're just a mess. Now you better run right in the house before you catch your dad. Yes, come on in. Are you all right, Judge? I'm not saying Gildersleeve till I see my lawyer. <laughs> Stop your whining, you old goat. Rock Mountain. Now, Judge, you just lie in front of a fire till you get warm. He's been lying there for hours. When's he going home? Right now. Ooh, my ankle. Huh? Oh, I'm afraid I've done something to it. Oh, so it's your ankle now, is it? Yeah, I can't stand on it. Ooh! Oh, you poor child. Oh, the poor widow fellow. Wiggy, 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 wiggy. Oh, maybe that's the drugstore with the camp oil. I'll go. Hooker, you're an old fake. There's nothing the matter with your ankle, and you know it. <laughs> what are you going to do about it, Gildy? <laughs> oh, Mr. Peasley. Good evening, Mrs. Ransom. You brought the camp on? Yes, or I trust you're not feeling indisposed. Oh, no, it's for Judge Hooker here. He fell in a hole. Uh, I'm sorry to hear that, Judge. Uh, how did this happen? I was chasing. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> hello, Peavy. Oh, hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, Peavy, now the judge thinks there's something wrong with his ankle. 
I'd like to have you take a look at it and give us your expert opinion. <laughs> hmm. Thank you, eh? Yes, it has all the earmarks of a fracture. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, in other words, you think it's all right? Well, no, I wouldn't say that either. Well, what would you say? Would you say it's sprained? Well, you put me in a difficult position, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm not a physician, you know. I'm a pharmacist. All right. You've got a license, haven't you? Well, I'm a notary public. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than nothing, isn't it? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> you, you've got me a little mixed up. All right, then. Forget the license. Just answer me yes or no. Is there anything wrong with the judge's ankle or isn't there? Well, if you want to know... Remember, uh, Mr. Peavy, anything you say may be used against you. Well, uh, Come on, Peavy, I'm just asking for your frank opinion, man to man. You are a man, aren't you? Well, now I would... Neither would I! Good night! <laughs> <laughs> all right, Hooker, you can stay to dinner, but that's all. <laughs> Grace, it's 11 o'clock. 11? Oh, shank of the evening, Leela. Why, Marjorie isn't even in yet. I must get my beauty sleep. You couldn't be any more beautiful than you are, Leela. Yes, yeah, that's true, Judge, but brother, is it corny? <laughs> now, Trot Morton. Huh? But I really should be starting for my little old trundle bed. Yes, yeah, so should Hooker. Oh, I think I hear Marjorie outside. Yeah, shut the door, my dear. Well, Marjorie, did you have a good time? Oh, wonderful. An old-fashioned play life in October. Mm, certainly has put roses in your cheeks. <laughs> yes, my dear. You look pretty enough to kiss. In fact, you look as if you had been. Oh, well, good morning. With sharp eyes, you have. Yeah? Well, I've got an early day tomorrow, so if you don't mind, I'll say good night. Good night, Judge. Good night, Marjorie. Good night, Mrs. Ransom. Good night, honey, child. Good night, Uncle Moore. Uh, mm. Good night, my dear. <laughs> Sorry I can't drive you home, Judge, but I put my car up on blocks. That's all right, Gildy. I'll get home somehow. Oh, oh now you can't go home tonight with that ankle. Drop, Morton, you'll have to let Judge Hooker sleep in your den or someplace. What? Thanks, Gildy. Awfully sorry to put you out, old man. Yeah. Well, I should be starting to bed. Uh, could you show me my room, Drop, Morton? Uh, I could I? <laughs> let me have your satchel. <laughs> Thank you. Good night, Judge. Oh, night. don't get up. I do hope your ankle will be much better in the morning. Oh, I hope it will. You know darn well it will. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Leela. Good night. Uh. My, seems strange walking up these stairs with you, Throckmorton. Oh, uh, does it, Leela? Seems to me very natural. Really, Throckmorton? What do you mean by that? Uh, how else would we get up there? <laughs> Uh, oh, here's my room, Lena. Uh, I mean, your room. Oh, what a nice room. <laughs> yes, I put the bath towels here, and here's an extra pillow, and here's a nice warm quilt, and then in case it really gets chilly... Why? I put an electric heating pad in your bed. <laughs> well, that's just the sweetest thing I ever heard of. If there's anything else you need... Oh, I've got everything in my little bag, thank you. Oh, well, then, uh, uh, good night, Lena. Good night, Trockmorton. You sure you don't want me to tuck you in? <laughs> Why, Trockmorton, you devil, you... Yeah, I was only joking, of course. <laughs> Good night, Lila. <laughs> oh, me, what an angel. I hope I dream about her tonight. All right, Booker, let's get to bed. You take this couch and I'll take the leather. Is this enough blankets for you? I suppose so. Well, then, good night. And please do me a favor. What's that? Don't snore. I never do. Uh, Don't you lock the house up, Gildy? I have. I always go all over it before I go to bed to make sure. Yeah? Well, you're a nervous old woman, you old goat. I am not. But I know there's such a thing as burglars because I send half a dozen of them to jail every week. It, burglars? Yes, the idea. Can I turn the light out now? Anytime. Well, all right. <laughs> oh, Gildy. Yeah. What is it? 
Aren't you going to tuck me in? Oh! I'll break your other ankle, Hooker, and I'll get to bed. This idea. Old goat. Oh, isn't that awful? <laughs> Snoring already. <laughs> Listen to that. What's that? It, Hooker's got me imagining things. Ooh, it's probably in the cellar. Oh, my goodness, there's nobody in the cellar. <laughs> Come on, Gildy, you've got to be a hero. You've got to go down there and face it. My gosh, it is a burglar, all right. He's trying to get in that cellar window, right over there by the furnace. Uh, but I'm ready for him. When he comes through, I'll hit him with his poker. Yeah. Uh, Aesop, quiet. Shh, quiet, cat. Uh, Aesop, go away. Shh. Oh, here he comes. Oh! Landline! Help! Yeah, what's going on here? Oh! You wanted cold, didn't you? Landline! You've been after me all day. You and the whole town. Well, here's your cold. You can dig yourself out in the morning. Oh! Oh! <laughs> There's something I'd like to say to all our listeners. We were lucky here in Summerfield. We had an early cold snap before the real winter set in to remind us to get ready for it while there's still time. Now, you've heard that there's going to be a shortage of fuel oil this winter, and you've probably also heard people say that there's nothing to it but a lot of talk. Well, I got the dope from the government, and this is it. Ninety-five percent of the fuel oil consumed in the East used to be shipped by tanker. Now we have to ship our oil by rail. It takes 280 tank cars to carry as much oil as one ship. So you figure it out for yourself. We haven't got enough tank cars to carry all the oil where it's needed or anywhere near all. There's no shortage of oil. It's a shortage of transportation. That's why the government is telling you to convert your furnace to coal if you can. They're just trying to keep us warm, folks. And if we got any sense, we'll get going right now and do what they're telling us. Have our heating plants checked, insulate our houses, put on weather strips, anything that'll save fuel. If you haven't got the cash for it, you can borrow it from the FHA. It's really an investment. Not only in improving your house and keeping your family comfortable and healthy, but you'll get some of it back in savings on your fuel bill. And you'll know that you're doing something to help our Army and Navy win this war. If that doesn't give you enough of a glow to keep you warm throughout the winter, remember, it's going to be a heck of a lot colder in Russia. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Kingman speaking for the makers of Parquet Margarine and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Some foods may be getting scarce these days, but good wholesome cheese and other dairy foods are plentiful. And just think of the tasty, satisfying main dinner dishes they'll help you make. Macaroni dishes, rarebit, souffles, sandwiches, fish and egg dishes with cheese sauce. Yes, and dozens more. With cheese dishes becoming so important in your menus, you should know about Pab Step. Yes, Pab Step, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred different uses. Pab Step is a very special cheese food in many ways. Pab Step slices so neatly, spreads so easily, it's grand for sandwiches or snacks. Pab Step melts and blends so smoothly, you'll prefer it for cheese sauces, all kinds of cooked cheese dishes. Pab Step is nourishing, too. It's a fine energy food, rich in milk nutrients and easy to digest. So stock up on Pab Step now. Your food dealer has it in the distinctive round, flat package. Remember, it's Pab Step, P-A-B-S-T dash E-T-T. Pab Step, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs> Presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the 
Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from The Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Likely as not, you've all heard and read a lot about margarine lately. You see, margarine is a wholesome spread for bread our government recommends in our national nutrition program. But if you haven't tried margarine for the last few years, you'll certainly be pleasantly surprised when you taste parquet margarine, the delicious vegetable margarine that's made by Kraft. Parquet margarine is made to the same high standards of flavor and quality as Kraft's other famous food products. Parquet's flavor is so delicate and appetizing, you'll be proud to use it as a spread for bread, a flavor shortening for baking, and for pan frying, too. Just try it once and see if you don't agree that parquet margarine's delightful, satisfying flavor is just bound to please. And another thing, parquet margarine provides important nutritional elements, vitamin A, and food energy we need every day. So don't just ask your food dealer for margarine, ask for parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who has been carrying on a feud recently with the water department. Two weeks ago, he got up a petition complaining about the water pressure. But all the action he got out of Commissioner Clanahan was a large hole dug in his front yard, which has been there ever since. This morning, we find him at the barber shop, where he's gone to carry his fight to the people, while Floyd takes a little off the sides. <laughs> Yes, sir. I told him, Clanahan, I'll give you exactly 24 hours. I said, either you get that hole fixed up, I said, or I don't pay my water bill. That's telling him. What did he say? He said, you don't pay your bill and I'll turn off your water. That's telling him. What did you say? I said, the press is so low now that I wouldn't know the difference. I said, go ahead and turn it off. That's telling him. What did he do then? He turned it off. <laughs> yeah, that'll fix him. Yeah, but what am I going to do for water? Oh, come in, Mr. Peavy. You're next. Oh, I see you're busy, Floyd. I can come Oh, around. no, no. I'm just finishing up with Mr. Gildersleeve here. Won't be a minute. Sit down. Take a load off your feet. Well, uh, oh, good morning, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, hello, Peavy. How's the drug business? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Gildersleeve, it's been a little slow. But then it always was. I guess I can't complain. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that cold spell we had last week must have boomed things for you. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, there were a lot of colds, people all over town coughing and sneezing. Yes, there were, and we did have a little flurry in cold remedies, but then the soda fountain fell off. <laughs> <laughs> well, things are bad all over. Yeah, what's the use? Government's going to take everything we make over 25000 a year anyway. Now, I'm not going to kill myself. Yes, would you like a little something on it, Mr. Gildersleeve? What do you got, Floyd? Oh, you know, Wild Root, Lucky Tiger, Ed Penards. I've got them all. I've got a new one, too. Roses of Picardy. If Roses of Picardy. Mmm, that sounds nice. Yeah, smell it. Mmm, give me a little of that. I put some on Mr. Peavy the other day, and he had a lot of nice comment on it, didn't you, Mr. Peavy? Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> the time you put that on me, Mrs. Peavy made me sleep in the guest room. <laughs> you might have told me before he got it on me, Peavy. Gentlemen, gentlemen. Oh, morning, Judge. Good morning, Judge Hooker. Hello, Floyd. Peavy. Well, Gildy, I suppose you're feeling pretty good. Uh, pretty good about what? About Clanahan. The way I feel about Clanahan, I could be arrested. But don't tell me you haven't heard. Heard what? Clanahan's quit. He quit? Yep. He turned in his resignation last night. So the town is now without a water commissioner. It was without a water commissioner before Clanahan quit, too. You're right, Gildy, and you deserve all the credit for getting rid of it. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. You got up the petition. Of course, I outlined it. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, yes, I did. But I don't want any credit for that. No, I can see that. I signed it, remember? So did I. We all did. But our friend Gildersleeve here is the one who circulated it. He gets the credit. Uh, of course, you know who they're talking about for water commissioner now, don't you, Gildy? No, who? Oh, come on, don't be modest. What do you mean? Use your head, Gildy. Who is the obvious man for the job? 
Why, of course. It isn't official yet, so I wouldn't say anything about it, but the town council's meeting tomorrow afternoon, and they tell me it's just a formality. But, Judge, I don't even know that I'd want the job. I mean, I haven't even thought about it. I mean, Floyd, get this thing off of me. Hey, wait a minute. Aren't you going to... I haven't got time. Here's a dollar. Keep the change. Uh, Dude, where's my coat? What's your hurry, Commissioner? Holy smokes. He never tipped me more than 15 cents before. <laughs> you know, some people will believe anything. <laughs> what do you mean, Judge? Yep. You can fool some of the people some of the time, and you can fool some of the people all of the time. But Gildersleeve fools himself. <laughs> you mean Mr. Gildersleeve isn't going to be water commissioner? Well, don't tell me you fell for it too, Peavy. Yeah. <laughs> some people will believe anything. But I think Mr. Gildersleeve would make a very good commissioner. What's that got to do with it? This is politics. What do you think Clanahan resigned for? Well, he has his coal business and the hay, grain, and feed. And the hardware and half his brother's plumbing business. Yes, and he also has a son-in-law that he's sick of supporting. Yeah, Harry Holzapple. You watch. Day after tomorrow, Harry Holzapple will be water commissioner. <laughs> Uh, nothing, my dear. It's nothing, really. But you've been running. Uh, not particularly. Uh, be calm, my dear. I am calm. What is it? Uh, sit down. You better sit down, too. Oh, I'm quite all right. I think I will sit down, though. <sighs> now, tell me, my dear, what have you been doing with yourself all morning? Uncle Mort, what is it? Oh, that. It, well, Marjorie, I have a little piece of news for you. You and Leroy, where is he? Oh, he'll be back in a minute. Now, what's the news? Well, it isn't official yet, but Judge Hooker says it's practically in the bag. What? What is? Marjorie, how would you like it if your old uncle were commissioner of the waterworks? Commissioner? You mean... Uh-huh. Wonderful. Uncle Moore, that's wonderful. It's, uh-huh. it's wonderful. It's not as wonderful as all that. Oh, <laughs> yes, it is, and you deserve it. You did the whole thing yourself. Oh, Uncle Mort, I'm so proud of you. Mm. Well, public service has its compensations, I see. Leroy! Leroy, come here, quick! What's up, Marge? Oh, you're back, on Leroy, Uncle Mort's going to be water commissioner. Yeah. Well, Leroy, did you hear me? Uncle Mort's going to be water commissioner. What does it pay? <laughs> Leroy. I haven't the faintest idea what it pays, young man, and furthermore, I don't care. I've been asked to serve the community, and I intend to serve it to the best of my ability. I wonder what it does pay. <laughs> Oh, Bertie, come here. I'm coming. Yes? Bertie, guess what? Oh, I'm no good at guessing. Uncle Moy's going to be water commissioner. My goodness. If I'd known that, I'd have baked a cake. It's, well, it's not too late yet, Bertie. Oh. oh, you're going to have to do a lot of things, Bertie. When you answer the phone, you're going to have to say, Commissioner Gildersleeve's house. Excuse me, Miss Marjorie. Residence. Oh, yeah. residence. Yes. Yeah. And we must see that the laundry puts more starch in his collar. Hey, wait a minute. I can't stand stiff collars. That makes no difference. You're an important man now, and you've got to dress the part. You can't wear that baggy old suit another day. But this is my best suit. It's your only suit. Well, I can't wear more than one suit at a time. <laughs> I know, but you shouldn't have to go to bed every time you have it pressed. <laughs> You're going to be a busy man. Uh, you're right there, my dear. You don't want people saying there goes Mr. Gildersleeve, the worst-dressed water commissioner in town. No, but the well-dressed man today isn't the man with pleats in his pants. It's the man with shiny elbows. In another few weeks, you aren't even going to have elbows. Uh, uh, I think you ought to go out and buy a new suit, Uncle Moore. Well, maybe you're right, my dear, but it'll have to be for the duration. And another thing, you ought to have a decent <laughs> photograph taken for the indicator of indicator. Oh, what would they want with a photograph of me? Do you think I ought to have a profile or a full face? <laughs> How about a panorama, Uncle <laughs> very good, Leroy, very good A little fresh, but we're overlooking things today oh, Come on, Uncle Moore, we've got a million things to do Let's get started now, Wait a minute, there's one thing first Remember, all of you, this is not official yet So not a word to anybody Bertie? Oh, not a word uh, Marjorie? Not a word uh, Not a word uh, okay. <laughs> Now, uh, just slip this jacket on for size, will you, Commissioner? Uh, commissioner? Oh, well, of course, that isn't for publication yet. Uh, oh, this isn't the kind of suit I had in mind. I thought maybe something like a cutaway, something more official. No, I'm sorry, but cutaways are out of uh, government regulation. Uh-oh. Nobody wears cutaways anymore anyway, Uncle Moore. The young lady's right. I personally wouldn't be caught dead in one. Uh, well, 
How about something double-breasted, huh? Dark blue, maybe, with a pinstripe. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, but double-breasteds are out, too. The regulations. Oh. Well, just run me up a nice loincloth. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. There's a nice piece of material. I like that one. Let me try that one off. Uncle Moore, that's yours. That's the one you wore in here. Is it? <laughs> I always did like this suit. I think I'll stick to it. Goodbye. Oh, uh, goodbye, Commissioner. <laughs> Look pleasant, please, Commissioner. Uh, oh, Commissioner. Well, I'm getting kind of used to it. <laughs> uh, look this way, please. Now, a little more the other way. Now, now a little more this way. Uncle Mort, you're looking cross-eyed. How can I help it? I'm looking six different ways at once. <laughs> uh, we must try to be a little patient. Now, raise your chin just a teensy bit. A chin? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> That's better. Now, hold it like that while I fix this light. Uh, hurry up, will you? My nose is itching. There. Now, give me a nice big smile. Never mind the smile. Take your picture. Hold it, hold it. Oh, it's a beauty. You'll want a dozen for your friends. Thank you, Commissioner. Oh, Uncle Mort, there's something else you ought to have. Uh, what? Stay on the window. In the window? What would I do with a girdle? Don't answer that. Oh, not that window. This one. See? The briefcase. I don't need a briefcase. Oh, but you will. You're going to have lots of important papers. Say, I guess that's right, Marjorie. I'd better... Ah, good morning, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, Mr. Gillespie, what a small world. Uh, Why, only this morning I was trying to call you. Oh, were you indeed? Yes, I... Oh, hello, Marjorie. Hello. I was planning to invite you to dinner tonight. I'm having fried chicken. Oh, oh my. I'd love to, Mrs. Ransom. I'd love to, but... Unfortunately, my time is not my own these days. I'm having candid yams. Oh, brother. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, Leela. Pressure of official business, you know. Oh. Well, I think I'll just run in here for a minute, Uncle Mort. Will you excuse me, Mrs. Ransom? Certainly, darling. I'll be back in a minute. All right. Well, Throckmorton, if you're so frightfully busy, I guess you shouldn't be wasting your time with me. Oh, Leela, you don't understand. There's something I want to tell you, but I, I can't just yet. Well, you can always confide in me, Throckmorton. Oh, thank you, Leela. Uh, it has to do with a matter that's been uppermost in my mind for the last few weeks. Well, I can't imagine what you're talking about, Throckmorton. Well, I can tell you this much. An important decision is going to be made tomorrow that may affect my whole future. I can't imagine what that would be. Well, I'll give you a little hint. Uh, think of water. Water? Uh-huh. Lots and lots of water. Thousands of gallons a minute. Do you begin to understand? I think I do. Will you and I be there? You and I? Where? Niagara Falls. Oh! The Great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. If you're up on your nutrition ABCs, you know how important vitamin A and food energy are. Yes, we all need food energy and vitamin A. They're both mighty essential to good nutrition. So you'll be glad to know that an economical source of both these food elements is delicious parquet margarine, the wholesome spread for bread that's made by Kraft. Yes, parquet margarine is one of the very best energy foods you can serve. And throughout the year, every pound of parquet margarine contains 9,000 units of vitamin A, making it one of the most reliable year-round food sources of this important vitamin. Besides, in flavor and texture, parquet is entirely different from old-time margarines. You'll agree after one try that parquet is the margarine that tastes so deliciously good. So tomorrow, sure, ask your food dealer for a pound or two of parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, the nourishing economical spread for bread made by Kraft. And now let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. After a sleepless night and a morning spent at the library reading up on waterworks, he approaches the eve of his expected triumph in a spirit of humble dedication to service. With the special meeting of the town council only an hour off, he's preparing a statement for the indicator vindicator. Uh, read that back to me, will you, my dear? Uh, that last. Oh, um, when interviewed, Mr. Gildersleeve said, 
This honor comes to me as a complete surprise. Uh, yes. Uh, but I am prepared to say at this time that I propose to give to this community. Yes. Uh, what was I going to give it? Oh, yes. A clean administration, clean management, and clean... Uh... Clean water. Clean water. Yeah. <laughs> Have you got that, Marjorie? Yes, go ahead. After a preliminary survey, I feel that I can say without fear of contradiction that no city, town, village, or hamlet from Maine to California can boast a finer, healthier, more nutritious tap water than Summerfields. Uh, let's keep it that way. Good. Now, we've got to hurry this down there if we want to catch the paper before it goes to print. I'll take it. I'll go on my bicycle. Give it to me. Oh, wait till I address the envelope. Uh, don't forget to put the photograph in. Here. Which one do you like best? They're all terrible. It's, oh, I don't know. I don't think this one is bad. It looks like Victor Mature with a mustache. Uh, <laughs> well, perhaps there is a resemblance. I can't help that. <laughs> hurry up and pick one, Uncle. I've just about got time to get down there. Oh, dear. I can't decide. I think it's between this one and me pounding my fist and the one where I'm pouring a glass of water. Uh, maybe that's better for Water Commissioner, that little tie up there. Too bad he didn't get you in the bathtub. Uh, <laughs> Remember, Leroy, see that it gets to the editor. Don't give it to anybody else. Insist on giving it to Mr. Powers. Okay, I'm... Oh, sorry, Judge. Where's the fire? Anybody home? Oh, yes, come in, Judge. Hello, Gildy. When are you going to get around to taking your screens off? Gosh, I don't know, Judge. I've been pretty busy here lately. I guess I'm going to be a lot busier. Doing what? Well, water commissioner's no part-time job, you know. Water commissioner... Oh, as a matter of fact, Gildy, I uh, uh, wanted to speak to you about that. Huh? I wouldn't say too much about that if I were you. Oh, I'm keeping it quiet. But I wanted you to know, Horace, that I'm grateful to you for what you did. We all are, Judge. Wait a minute now. I didn't do anything. Oh, I know. You'll deny it, you old son of a gun. But somebody put in a good word for me with the town council, or I wouldn't have got this appointment. Gildy. All I, I want to say is, Judge, I hope I'll get a chance to do as much for you sometime. It was sweet of you, Judge. It, it really was. Oh, yes. No. We've had a lot of scraps together, Horace. But when you come right down to it, well, I'd go to bat for you any time, and I know you would for me. You've proved that. I wish you'd listen to me, both of you. Just a minute. I'd like to show you something first. A little statement I got up for the indicator vindicator. You know, a sort of a speech of acceptance. I sent it down there with my photograph. Oh, my goodness. Did you make a carbon copy of that, Marjorie? I'd like to show it to the judge. Oh, I'm sorry, but Leroy took the only copy down there. You haven't sent it to the paper already. Why, of course. I would make tomorrow's edition at the same time as the announcement. You've got to stop him. Why? Yes, why? I don't know how to say this, Gildy. I blame myself. I really do. But I, I wouldn't count on that appointment too much, old man. Why not? Because you don't stand a chance of getting it. But you said yourself... Why, you told him, John. I know, I know, and I could bite my tongue off for doing it, but I I never thought you'd take it that seriously, Gildy. You mean the whole thing was nothing but a joke? I'm afraid that's about the size of it, Marjorie. But I can't believe it. You wouldn't deliberately... Gildy, I'm sorry. No, oh, that's all right. <laughs> well, if you'll excuse me, I... I guess I'll... get at those screens... Uh, excuse me. Judge Hooker? Don't say it, Marjorie. You can't do that to my uncle. You're right. You're absolutely right. I'm a mean old man and I hate myself. Believe me, I, I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have had it happen for the world. Well, you're going to do something about it. Have you got your car here? <clears throat> right outside. Oh, we've got to stop Leroy before he gets to the paper with that statement. The, the whole town will be laughing. All right, come on. I'm going 35. We're, all... <laughs> We're almost there. Right down the block. There's Leroy. Ooh, my rubber. <laughs> Leroy! Leroy! Oh, we're too late. I know we are. Did you deliver it, Leroy? Yeah, sure. Give it to Mr. Powers himself. Oh, dear. Why? What's up? Well, I can't explain now. I haven't got time. But hurry home, Leroy. Uncle Mort needs you. Judge, you wait right here. Marjorie, where are you going? I'm going in to see the editor. I'll come with you. No, you won't. You've done enough. All right, Marjorie. Just as you said. Where's Mr. Powers, Alfred, please? Ride straight ahead. Well, come in. 
You're Mr. Powers, aren't you? That's right. I'm Mr. Gildersleeve's niece. And go ahead and laugh. Well, now, sit down, sit down. Take it easy. Oh, I know it all seems very funny to you. Have you read it? Yes, I've read it. Well, I won't try to explain how it happened, Mr. Powers. It was a mistake, and I, I guess it seems pretty silly to you. But my uncle doesn't know very much about newspapers, and neither do I. Mm-hmm. He was just trying to do the right thing. You see, somebody told him he was going to be appointed water commissioner. Well, I thought nobody wanted it but Harry Holzapple. Harry Holzapple. That's just what's wrong with this town. It's, it's full of Harry Holzapples. There aren't enough people in it like Uncle Mort. They're all trying to figure what they can get out of it instead of what they can put into it. Maybe you're right. And I'll tell you this about my uncle. He's a good guy, and, and he really would make the best water commissioner Summerfield ever had. Because it, it means a lot to him, and, and the town does, and, and he's interested in it, and he studies about it, and he just... Uh, now, wait a minute. And another thing. Do you know he got up a petition all by himself? And... I know. I know all about that. Gildersleeve's a good man. Of course he is. And I'll tell you something else Now, wait, about young him. lady. You don't want to tell me. You want to tell the town council. Oh, I just wish I could. Well, they're meeting over at town hall right now. But they'd never let me in. Well, they'll let me in. Power the press. Well, come on, I'll get my hat. Leroy, when I think of the countless errands I've sent you on, and how few of them you managed to complete successfully... <laughs> Why did you have to deliver the goods this time? Gosh, I only did what you told me. I know, but you ought to warn me when you're going to do things like that. <laughs> oh, how can I face these people? How can I face Mrs. Ransom? How can I even face Peavy? What am I going to do? Well, you could always join the foreign legion. <laughs> this is no time for quips and sallies, young man. Well, you asked me. Yeah, but I know what I could do. I could join the army. Are you kidding? Not a bit. Service of my country, the uniform, they couldn't laugh at that. No, I couldn't. Why, George, I'll do it. I look like a million in that uniform in 1917. You look like ten million now, Uncle. <laughs> Good afternoon, Sergeant. Lieutenant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Is this where you join the army? Well, that depends. Is this for yourself or for a friend? Myself. I want to enlist for immediate duty overseas. Oh, I want to see the world, huh? Why don't you try the Navy? Oh, Lieutenant. I am a captain. Eh, pardon me. <laughs> I've been recommended to the Navy, Captain. I'd like to join up. I see. How tall are you, mister? It, five feet, eight and a half. And your weight? 230. Gross or net? <laughs> That's in my shorts. Who recommended you to the Navy, mister? The Army. Oh, they did, eh? Well, why don't you go tell it to the Marines? <laughs> Oh, General? I'm just a sergeant, Bart. <laughs> What's on your mind? I'm thinking of joining the Marine Corps. I, I want to see some active service. What gave you that idea? Well, it's a long story. My nephew suggested the Army, but the Army suggested the Navy, and the Navy suggested the Marines. I see. How about it? Do you think you could consider me? I'm afraid not, Bud, but I'll tell you what we will do. What? We'll consider the nephew. Oh! How'd you come out, Unc? Not so good, huh? 5F. <laughs> Five that? What's that? Flat feet, fat, flabby, and 44. <laughs> oh, well, you don't want to feel badly about it. You tried. Yeah. You know, Leroy, I don't suppose any man ever thinks of himself as old, even when he's 80. But I realize it today for the first time. I'm old. Oh, you're not old, Dunk. You've got a lot of good mileage left yet. 
<laughs> no, they don't want men like me, Leroy. It's the 18 and 19-year-olds. They've got the courage and the pep and the endurance. It's a young man's war in a young man's world. I ought to turn myself in for scrap. <laughs> oh, now, don't talk like that, Unc. I know. How would you like to go to the movies? There's a swell bill at the Majestic. No. What's playing? Eagle Squadron and the Battle of Midway. <laughs> you go, Leroy. <laughs> I don't want to go, Unc. I'd rather stay here with you. Uh, Mr. Gillespie, I made some of that special coffee cake you like. Could I give you some? Uh, no, not just now. Thank you, Bertie. It's hot right out of the oven. Uh, you might leave it, Bertie. Perhaps Leroy would like a piece. No, thanks. Leroy, what's the matter with your uncle? What's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, Bertie. Everything's fine. I don't know what's come over everybody in this house. They ain't sell no coffee cake. Uh, you know what I think, Mr. Gillespie? What? I think you're worrying too much. I think it's that waterworks. You ought to give it up. Yeah. Bertie. <laughs> Bertie, go bake a cake. Doggone, I don't know. Things are so different around here. They ain't the same. Oh, there's Marjorie. Uh, Leroy, don't say anything to her about the, you know, the army. Okay. Uncle Marge. Uh, in here, my dear. Hey, Mr. Powers. Uncle Marge, you know Mr. Powers of the indicator. Oh, oh, yes. I uh, just came over to congratulate you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, Commissioner. And to thank you for that little statement you sent us. Oh, that. Mm, I don't think Uncle Mort understands. We've, we've just, just come, come from the from town. town. <laughs> what are you telling? Uh, we've just been to the meeting of the town council, and I'm delighted to report that your appointment went through without a single dissenting vote. You mean that I'm... He's water commissioner? Yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> oh, Uncle Mort, I'm so glad. Water commissioner. Commissioner of the Waterworks. I don't mind telling you, Mr. Powers, this means a lot to me. It means a lot to Summerfield. And I want you to know that the indicator is back of you 100%. Oh, thank you. Uh, have some coffee cake. Uh, have a glass of water. Well, don't care if I do. If water, Commissioner, wait till Judge Hooker hears about this. The old goat, he wasn't so far wrong at that. You know, he said I was the obvious man for the job. Oh, you were. Well, you think so, too? Certainly. The only other candidate had just been drafted. <laughs> You've had a pretty big day. I really think you ought to go to bed now. You're right, my dear. I guess I'll take my book to bed with me. What is that book anyway, Unc? Uh, the Lives of the Presidents. The Lives of the Presidents? What are you reading that for? I just wanted to confirm an impression. I have a distinct recollection that in 1874, William McKinley was water commissioner of Buffalo. <laughs> Good night, everybody. program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Bingman speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to be with us again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. What could be more satisfying for the main dish of an autumn meal than that hearty old favorite macaroni and cheese? Yes, tender macaroni drenched in cheese goodness. It's filling, nutritious, and easy to make if you use Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred different uses. You see, Pabstet is just right for cooked cheese dishes because it melts so smoothly and blends right in with other foods. Pabstet is equally useful for sandwiches and snacks because it slices and spreads so easily. And besides being full of luscious cheese goodness, Pabstet helps provide important food values for your meals. Food energy, milk protein, the milk minerals, calcium and phosphorus, vitamin A, Pabstet has them all. You'll find hundreds of ways to use Pabstet for nourishing, time-saving meals. So serve it often. Your food dealer has it in the handy round flat package. Just ask for Pabstet, P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T. Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. This program reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> yeah. The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. I'm sure you've all noticed how everybody has pitched in since last December 7th, working harder than ever before. No, it didn't take us Americans long to see we had to work to win. Yes, and hard work burns up lots of energy, energy that has to be replaced by the food we eat. So I'm sure you'll want to know about a wholesome energy food that your family is sure to like. That food is delicious parquet margarine. The economical spread for bread made by Kraft. And it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, Parquet is a reliable year-round source of important vitamin A. Yes, Parquet margarine is mighty good for you. And you'll find it's mighty good tasting, too. Parquet is the margarine that tastes so deliciously good you'll really want to serve it. So tomorrow, ask your dealer for a pound or two of Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who stands this morning on the threshold of a new career. He comes down to breakfast with a spring in his step and a light in his eye, for this is the day of his inauguration as Water Commissioner of Summerfield. Ready now. Here he comes. And don't forget to bow. Good morning, Commissioner. Oh, good morning, slaves. Marjorie, Leroy, good morning, one and all. Leroy, pull out the commissioner's chair for you. Sure, right this way, commissioner. Uh, Thank you, my boy. Won't you sit down? No tricks now. (laughs) No, sir. Uh, Well, there we are. Uh, What's this in front of my place, a nosegay? For your buttonhole. Oh, that was sweet of you, my dear. Or did Leroy pick these posies? Are you kidding? <laughs> you better start right in, Uncle Mort. Bertie's making waffles. Waffles? Yes, sir. Coming right up. Oh, Bertie, you're psychic. Yes, I think I must be. The things that go on. Uh, what things, Bertie? Well, I dreamt a dream last night, Mr. Gilsleeve, and I sure wish you'd explain it. Uh, what was it, Bertie? Well, I dreamt there was a globe of the world, and then I saw Mr. Wilkie running around in like mad. Well, you've been reading the newspapers. Go on. And then I saw Miss Roosevelt, and she was running around the world, too. Yeah? And what is it you don't understand, Bertie? Who is trying to catch who? (laughs) Oh, Bertie, you better let the international situation ruin those waffles. Oh, my goodness. Uh, I spent a very interesting and profitable evening myself last night, children. How? Well, to prepare for my new post as water commissioner, I took the encyclopedia to bed with me. And do you know, I found some things in there I never even knew before. Oh, you probably just forgot them, Unc. What were you looking up, Uncle Moore? Water. Do you know, Marjorie, that three-fourths of the Earth's surface is covered with water? Really? I think you better drink your orange juice, Uncle Moore. The waffles are waiting. Yes, sir. Three-fourths of the Earth's surface, water. What do you think of that? Too much water. (laughs) There's no such thing as too much water. Water is very important. Did you ever stop to think, young man, where Columbus would have been without water? I don't know. Home and bed, I guess. He'd have been high and dry, and you and I wouldn't be here today. You won't get to the office today if you don't stop talking and eat, Commissioner. Oh, you're right, my dear. Bertie, if those waffles are ready, I am. Coming right up, Miss Gilfleeve. Water, yes, water is very important. People don't appreciate water. Here you are, Miss Gilfleeve. Bertie, do you know what James Watt couldn't have invented the steam engine without? No, sir. Water. Is that a fact? Absolutely. It's lucky they gave him some. <laughs> You know what I think, Commissioner? I think you've got water on the brain. Yes, yes. All right, you can laugh, young man. But water is one of the most important things in the world. Now, you take Robert Fulton. Invented the steamboat, 1807. Couldn't have done it without water. DeWitt Clinton, Erie Canal, 1825. Water. Ponce de Leon, the Fountain of Youth. Water. Balboa, the Pacific. Water. The Monitor in the Merrimack. Water. Uh, Bertie, bring me some more water. <laughs> yes. Uncle Mort... 
don't want to change the subject. Yeah? But can we have a weenie roast today? Who's we? Me and Piggy and the gang. We're going on a hike. Well, I guess so. If it's all right with Bertie. Gee, thanks, Unc. You picked kind of a hot day for a hike, though, didn't you? Well, we didn't know it was going to be so hot. You'd never think it was the middle of October, would you? Well, we usually get one late hot spell, my dear. And by the way, speaking of heat, do you know how many days a camel can go without water? And speaking of water, Uncle Mark, do you know what time it is? Oh, my goodness, i got to be going. I can't be late the first day on the job. Don't forget your flowers, Uncle Mark. Yeah? Huh? Here. Let me put them in your buttonhole. Oh, oh, thank you, my dear. Oh, and your tie's crooked. It is? There. And what about your handkerchief? They're right in my pocket. Oh, it should stick out a little. Oh. Now, you look more like a water commissioner. Oh, thank you, my dear. Well, you're all set, I guess. Uh-huh. Good luck. Yeah, good luck, Uncle. Uh, thank you. What is it? Have you forgotten something? No, I was just wondering. Wondering what? What on earth does a water commissioner do? <laughs> Good morning, Mrs. Ransom. Are you leaving so early? As a matter of fact, I'm not early. I'm late. Well, I won't keep you then. I just came over to wish you success. Oh, thank you. And to bring you flour for your buttonhole. Uh, oh, but I see you've already got one. I guess some other gal... There's right? always room for one more. Uh, flour, I mean. <laughs> oh, well, I brought you a bachelor's button because you're such a dyed-in-the-wool bachelor. Well, I may be dyed-in-the-wool, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> yeah, I gotta go, Leela. I gotta go. Oh, wait a minute, Trot Martin. Let me put this flower in your buttonhole. Oh, thank you. Oh, uh, Leela? Yes, Trot Martin. Did you know that a cubic foot of water weighs 62 and a half pounds? <laughs> Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, uh, hello, Peavy. I'm in a hurry. Got to get down to the office. I'd like some cigars. Oh, I guess we can fix you up, Mr. Gildersleeve. You want the usual, I suppose. Yes, the perfectos. I'll take three. Uh, how have you been? Well, to tell you the truth, Mr. Gildersleeve... Not I... so good, eh? Well, I'll tell you what to do. You want to drink more water. More water? Yes. Everybody ought to drink more water. Half the troubles of this world would be eliminated, Peavy, if people drank more water. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> It's true. You can take all those medicines you've got there and pour them down the sewer for all the good they'll do. Water, that's the thing. You ought to drink ten or twelve glasses of it every day. Well, no, that's a lot of water. Best thing in the world for you. I'll tell you something, Peavy. Do you know that the human body is 90% water? Is that a fact? Absolutely. 90% water. Well, then I don't see why we should drink any more. <laughs> I haven't got time to argue with you, Pete. Those are the facts. You can take them or leave them. Uh, how much is that? Thirty cents? And one is thirty-one. Have you got a penny? Yeah, that darn penny. No, I haven't. I don't want to leave you with the impression that I have anything against water, Mr. Gildersleeve. I usually take some with every meal. So does Mrs. Peavy. It's all right, all right. <laughs> Give me my change. I'm late now. You understand. It's just that I believe in moderation. Peavy, you'll die of moderation. Well, now, I wouldn't... Goodbye, Peavy. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Well, Peavy, what's the matter? Pardon me, could you tell me where the office of the water department is? Mm, right down the hall. You see where that fellow's painting the name on the door? Oh, yes, much obliged. Oh, and it's my name, too. <laughs> name on the door and everything. Water department, Throckmorton P. Gildas. Talking to me, son? Uh, no, 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 I was just admiring your work. Oh, well, it ain't art, maybe, but it's a living, sort of. Yeah, so just one thing. I'm afraid you've made a slight error. Maybe you could do it better. Oh, no, no, no. I have no fault to find with your technique. It's the spelling. There's another E in Gildersleeve. Well, don't tell me. This is the way she gave it to me. But I have to... This is the way she gave it to me. I've got it on a piece of paper. I got it on a piece of paper, too. My birth certificate. I don't know about that, son. This is the way she spelled it. If you got any complaints, you'll have to take it up with her. Her? Uh, who's her? Oh, old hatchet face inside. Uh, Boy, I've met some bossy dames in my time. Even married one. But that old battle axe takes the marbles. <laughs> uh, we'll soon see who's running this department. Can I get through here? Uh, don't smear it now. Uh, oh, uh, miss, uh, madam. I'll be with you in just a moment. Oh, excuse me. You'll find an application form there on the counter. Just fill it out. But I don't I'm want to... I'm sorry, that's the rule. No service without an application. <laughs> you don't understand. My name, name is... Name on the first line, please. Last name first, then first name and middle initial. 
Look, is this the water department? That's right. There'll be a deposit of $2, which will be deducted from your first month's bill. My dear woman, do you see this door? Oh! Oh, no, you went and spoiled it. <laughs> Sorry. You see that name? Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve? That's me. Oh. Oh, uh, won't you come in, Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, thank you. If you'll follow me, I'll show you to your office. Well, nice little layout here. It's small, but cozy. I beg your pardon? I said it was cozy. Oh. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself. I'm Miss Fitch. Oh, how do you do, Miss Fitch? I've been 33 years with the water department and never missed a day. That's a shame. I think you ought to get a day off. <laughs> hmm. May I assure you of my every cooperation? If there's anything you want, please ring for me. I've cleared out the desk. You'll find a coat closet wash basin in there. The phone works on a buzzer. I go to lunch at 12.30. Oh, Miss Fitch, just a moment. Yes? Uh, who's the old geezer in the picture there? He was Summerfield's first water commissioner. Oh. <laughs> Funny-looking old coot, wasn't he? <laughs> he happened to be my father. You. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. The picture probably didn't do him justice. Well, it wasn't all that it might have been. Uh, uh, Miss Fitch? Yes? Don't leave me alone in here. I'm afraid I don't understand. I'm new here. I don't know the first thing about this. Uh, what do I do? Do? Yes. Now that I'm commissioner, shouldn't I be doing something? Mr. Clanahan never did. He always left things to me. I always suspected Clanahan of that. I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. If my services are not satisfactory, I shall be glad to tender my resignation. Oh, no, I didn't mean that. You're perfectly satisfactory, Miss Fitch. You're wonderful. It's just that, well, if I'm commissioner, I think I ought to be doing something. Going over the bills or something. Well, it's never been handled that way. But if you insist, I've been getting up a list of the delinquents. Uh, delinquents? Uh, you mean people who haven't paid their bills? Yes. Oh, let's have a look at that. That ought to be fun. <laughs> I'll bring it in. Uh, thank you. Where is he? Where's Gildersleeve? Just a moment, please. Did you wish to see someone? Yes, and there he is. Gildersleeve. Hello, Judge. How did you get in? I walked in. Gildersleeve, I want an explanation. Judge, you've come to the right place. What do you want explained? We explain anything. I want to know why my water was turned off. Oh, well, we'll have to look into this. Uh, water turned off, eh? You know darn well it was turned off. I'll have to take this up with our Miss Fitch. I'll ring for her. Uh, sit down. I don't want to sit down. All right, stand up. I don't want to stand up. <laughs> You don't have to put on this act with me, Throckmorton. I know what's back of this. It's spite, pure and simple. Now, Judge, there isn't an ounce of spite in my whole nature, and you know it. Yeah, you're just like every other small-time politician. The minute you get a little authority, you start making a petty nuisance of yourself. I'll tell you what's wrong with you, Gildersleeve. You're drunk with power. Did you want to be, Mr. Gildersleeve? Oh, yes, Miss Fitch. Uh, have you that list of people who haven't paid their bills? Yes, right here. Uh, you're sure you're not just a teensy bit delinquent, Judge? Are you accusing me of not paying my bills, Gildersleeve? Such a thing as libel, remember? I'm not accusing you of anything, Judge. Let's look at the record. Of course, there might have been some mistake. Not with our Miss Fitch. I mean, it might have slipped my mind. Oh, starting to crawl, eh? <laughs> Let's see. E, F, G. Oh, here are the H's. And lo, Judge Hooker's name led all the rest with $11.86. Is that right, Miss Fitch? That's right, Mr. Gildersleeve. And Mr. Clanahan's last instructions were to stop service on all unpaid bills. Oh, Clanahan. That explains it. No, Judge. The $11.86 explains it. Well, get somebody over there and have the water turned on right away, will you? Be glad to, Judge, the minute you pay up. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Gildy, I haven't got the cash on me. It's Saturday. The bank's closed. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put a check in the mail Monday. Good. We'll be glad to resume service as soon as we receive it. <laughs> you mean you're going to let me go without water all weekend? Sorry, Judge. It's got to be on the line. But you know my credit's good, Gildy. It was an oversight. I'm sorry, Judge, but this is a public office, and I propose to discharge it without fear or favor, especially where you're concerned. All right, Gildy. I won't forget this. The man is drunk with power. <laughs> the old goat. I guess that'll teach him a lesson. Did you mean what you said, Mr. Gildersleeve, about no favors for anyone? Uh, of course I meant it. Absolutely. If they don't pay up, shut off their water. Why? Because, well, <laughs> have you looked at that list under the G's? Under the G's? <laughs> under the G's. Oh, my goodness, Gildersleeve. <laughs> The 
great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. If your food budget has a way of getting out of line these days, don't despair. If you're resourceful, you'll find a good many foods that save you money, yet meet your requirements of flavor and nourishment, too. One of these economy foods, surely, is wholesome parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread made by Kraft. Using parquet margarine is one economy your family is sure to approve. They'll really go for parquet's delicate, appetizing flavor when you serve it as a spread for bread or rolls. They'll appreciate the extra flavor parquet adds to baked and pan-fried foods. Besides, parquet margarine is an economical source of important food elements. It's a wholesome, nourishing energy food. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. Yes, you can economize wisely when you use parquet margarine. So why not give it a try in your household? Tomorrow, sure, ask your food dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. And now let's get back to the great gilder sleeve. After a light lunch at the Idle Hour tea shop, he returns to the town hall ready to pitch in for a good afternoon's work. Well... Don't you take Saturday afternoons off, Miss Fitz? Not when there's work to be done. That's the spirit I like to see. By George, I think you and I are going to get along. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> you know, I, I was thinking during lunch, Miss Fitz, there's a lot of changes that ought to be made around here. They seem to have been started already. What do you mean? There are some people in your office. People? Women. Uh, women? Two of them. Two? They walked right in. They said they knew you. Well, I can't imagine. I don't know any women, do I? How about putting the desk over here? Well, how about Kitty Connor facing the door? What is this? Just try it. Oh, Uncle Mort, help us move the desk, will you? Yes, you're so strong. We can hardly budge. Uh, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What's going on here? We're going to fix up your office for you, Uncle Mort. We've got it all planned. Yes, it needs a woman's touch, Throckmorton. It really does. Now, you take that portrait there. It's... That's simply got to go. I mean, it's too ridiculous. It's quiet. It's her father out there. You no, know, my dear, if that portrait goes, I go. I'm not kidding. She'd throw me right out. <laughs> Come over here and sit behind the desk, Uncle Moore, so we can see how you look in the corner. Uh, look, I've got work to do here. Oh, it won't take a minute, Throckmorton. Come on, ma'am. Uh, That's a good boy. Yeah. Oh, I think he looks wonderful in the corner. Don't you, Marjorie? Yes. <laughs> yes, he does. I think we ought to let him stay there. And now climb up on the desk, will you, Tark Martin, and hold this material up beside the window. Now, really, I've got more... Oh, now, it won't take but a jiffy. Marjorie and I shopped for this chintz all over town, didn't we, honey? That's right. Oh, I think it's just the smartest thing. Uh, now, climb up. Uh, That's right. Uh, and hold it up high. Uh, is this high enough? <laughs> Yes, Miss Fitch. <laughs> Mr. Powers of the Indicator Vindicator this evening. Oh, my goodness. He probably wants to interview me. Let me get down off of here. Let me down off of here. Let me give you a hand, Mr. Gildersleeve. Oh, hello, Mr. Powers. <laughs> Doing a little fancy work? Yeah. <laughs> Up to Daisy. Uh, Mr. Powers, uh, you know Marjorie, my niece. Uh, oh, yeah, well, yes, indeed, uh, yes. Uh, and Mrs. Ransom. Well, how do you do, Mrs. Ransom? How do you do? Oh, I think newspapers are so fascinating, Mr. Power. <laughs> <laughs> I've been intending to subscribe to your publication right along. Well, uh, always glad to welcome a new subscriber. <laughs> Yes, yes. Oh, but somehow every time the boy comes around, seems like I haven't got my handbag with me. Oh, is that so? Well, I'm sorry you have to be going, ladies. Yes, we really must. Oh, must we? And Miss Fitch will show you out, won't you? Gladly. <laughs> Bye, Bye. 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 Goodbye. 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 That's a great girl, that niece of yours, Mr. Gildersleeve. She's got a lot of stuff on the ball. Yeah, she's a fine girl, Marjorie. Uh, who's the, uh... Um... Oh, she's a friend of the family. <laughs> oh, I see. A friend of the family. Yes, neighbor of ours. Hmm, neighbor. It, right next door. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I'll tell you what I dropped around for, Mr. Gildersleeve. Uh, cigar? Uh, no, thanks. You don't mind if I... Oh, of course not. Go ahead. Uh, here's a man. Uh, thank you. Uh... 
I suppose you want an interview. Well, I... Well, you've heard the old saying, Mr. Powers. A new broom sweeps clean. I propose to get rid of all the dead wood and inefficiency here and run this department without fear or favor for anybody. That's fine, Mr. Gildersleeve. I'm glad to hear that. But I came over here with something else in mind. Oh, what's that? Has it ever occurred to you, Mr. Gildersleeve, that the reservoir of this town offers a beautiful opportunity for sabotage? Sabotage? By George, I never thought of that. The state highway goes right by there, you know. Why, it'd be the easiest thing in the world to heave a dead cat out of a car or something. <laughs> You bet it would. Yes, sir. I've been trying to get something done about guarding it. You know, only the other day, a man passed me on the street with a very suspicious face. Hmm. It was about 5.30. I was coming home to dinner. And I don't know. He just looks suspicious, that's all. Is that so? Well, I finally got Charlie Gates interested. Ed Charlie Gates? The uh, chief of police. Uh oh He's coming out to the reservoir later this afternoon to look over the ground. And I thought if you weren't too busy, maybe you'd like to come along. I'll get my hat and be right with you. Uh, Miss Fitch. If anybody asks for me, I'll be out at the reservoir. Very well. Uh, on second thought, if anybody asks, don't tell them. It's a military secret. Oh. You see how easy it would be, Chief. Up around the next bend here, the road isn't 20 feet from the reservoir. I know that. You don't have to tell me that. Just a question of man. I haven't got the force to do it. Well, maybe we ought to call for volunteers then. You know, like fire watchers. Yeah, water watchers. Wait a minute. Stop the car. Yeah? Huh? Why? What's up? There's somebody down there right now. What? Well, he's right. Four or five of them. Right down by the walk. In the reservoir? Where? I can't see him. Hey, where are you? Don't move. I got you surrounded. Yeah. Go get him, Chief. I'll stay here and guard the car. <laughs> They're running for it. You'll never catch them. Huh? Uh Uh-oh. One of them jumped in the water. Drag him out of there, Chief. Drag him out. He's got him. Can you imagine that? Polluting the reservoir. (laughs) He ought to get ten years for that. He certainly should. I'm going to see that there's a penalty for this if there isn't one already. Say, it's only a kid. Huh? And he's naked. But they're all kids. I bet they've been swimming. Uh, Swimming? Let go of me! Let go! You can't do this to me! I have to lose this reservoir! Leroy! Get your clothes on, young man. Uncle Mort, you think they'll put me in jail? Will they? How will they? You're in jail, young man. This is the police station. This is what is known as the clink. (laughs) I know, but will they lock me up? I can't say. The chief himself doesn't know yet. He's gone to look up the law. But, But you deserve to be locked up. Gee, it wasn't my fault, Unc. They dared me to, the other kids. They said I was scared. That's no excuse, and you know it. Yeah, I know it. People drink that water. Do you realize that? Do you? <laughs> yeah. Well, why'd you do it, then? Guess I just didn't think. Yeah, uh, I guess you didn't. You ought to know better than to go into the water at this time of the year anyway. It's a wonder you didn't freeze. I did. That's why they dared me. Yes. Well, dare or no dare, young man, this is a very serious offense. It's terrible. I just don't see how you could do such a thing to me. My first day in office, too. What'll people think? My own nephew. What'll the newspaper say? I'm sorry, Uncle. I don't know why I did it. I guess I'm just no good. Oh, now, now, Leroy. (laughs) (laughs) They ought to lock me up. They ought to... Hey, Uncle, they can't give me the chair. (laughs) No, no, Leroy, it's not a capital offense. But it's pretty bad. Particularly in wartime. You mean they might stand me up and... <laughs> now, calm down, young man. Calm down. I'm going to have all over the juvenile court, Mr. Gildersleeve. The penalty for that seems to be $25 fine, 30 days in jail, or both. Both? Uh, that's ridiculous. After all, it was nothing but a boyish prank. Yeah, that's all it was, a boyish prank. Be quiet, Leroy. Quiet. I'm sorry, Mr. Gildersleeve. I don't make the laws here. I just carry them out. Uh, of course. You're yeah, quite right, Gates. Well, uh, when does the juvenile court open? Well, as a matter of fact, we haven't any juvenile court. Judge Hooker hears the juvenile cases, and he doesn't sit till Monday. Judge Hooker? Well, <laughs> I know him well. Sure. <laughs> we know him well. Yes, uh, quiet, Leroy. Judge Hooker is one of my best friends, Chief. I'll get him right down here. May I use your telephone? Right there on the desk. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) Judge Hooker, the old goat. I'll get this thing straightened out right away. Yeah. Hello, Judge. This is Gildy, your little chum. How you been? How's your golf game? Say, I'll bet you're shooting down those low 70s now, you old son of a gun. (laughs) Oh, Judge. 
Uh, by the way, before I forget, we're in a little trouble down here. Now, I wonder if you could run down for a minute at the police station. And no, no, it's nothing at all, just a little boyish prank. But judge, have a heart. You wouldn't let him hold him here all weekend. No, no, it's Leroy, not me. But thanks, judge. Here you go. <laughs> I object. The court is prejudiced. Quiet. Turning off the court's water has nothing whatever to do with this case. Nothing has been said about turning off the court's water. No, but I know what you're thinking. (laughs) (laughs) And let me say this, Judge. I propose to conduct my office without fear or favor. I ask no favors, and I give none. Hey, don't take it easy. Be quiet. I shall be pleased, pleased to have the court's water turned on. Again, as soon as the court pays the eleven dollars and eighty-six cents it owes, and not before. Is the gentleman quite through? Uh, quite. I should like to point out in the first place that the court is not on trial here. <clears throat> Young man, you plead guilty, do you not? Yes, Judge. I mean, Your Honor. The evidence is quite clear. In this case, as in so many others that come before this court, the fault lies not at the door of this innocent minor. But with those entrusted with his upbringing. Why, you... (laughs) Quiet. It's hardly to be expected that a child of his tender years, brought up in such a deplorable environment, could escape entirely unscathed. Oh, you old goat, that's libel. Quiet. Yes, yes. You, the circumstances, young man, I fine you $25 in costs. What? However... I will suspend the sentence on the fine. <laughs> well, that's big of you, Judge. But not on the costs. It costs? What's that? My time and inconvenience in coming down here. What does that amount to? Exactly $11.86. Take it and turn on my water. Oh! <laughs> I'm going to have to do something about Leroy. I've noticed that he's been getting awfully fresh lately. But today he broke the law. I wonder if maybe Judge Hooker was right. Perhaps I haven't spent enough time with the boy. Perhaps I ought to get to know him better. There's only one thing. If I knew him any better, could I stand him at all? (laughs) Good night, everybody. program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Bingman speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. Chilly autumn weather calls for hearty meals even if you haven't all the time in the world to prepare them. That's why it's mighty handy to have a package or two of Pabstead around. Yes, Pabstead, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred different uses. You see, it's no trick at all to whip up rare bits, souffles, all kind of cooked cheese dishes if you use Pabstet because it melts so smoothly and blends right in with other foods. You like making sandwiches and snacks with Pabstet, too, because it slices and spreads so easily. Altogether, you'll find countless ways to use Pabstet for tasty, time-saving meals. Nourishing meals, too, because Pabstet is a reliable source of food energy. Milk protein, the milk minerals, calcium and phosphorus, and important vitamin A. So keep Pabstead on hand. Your food dealer has it in the distinctive round, flat package. Yes, tomorrow ask for Pabstead. P-A-B-S-T hyphen E-T-T. The delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. This is the National Broadcasting Company.
Kraft presents The Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time, Harold Perry as The Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. We'll hear from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Of course, when it comes to food, flavor is mighty important. Yes, flavor is what tempts the appetite, makes you want to eat all you need. But important as good flavor is, good nourishment is even more essential. So you want to be on the lookout for foods that fill both these requirements. Yes, and do it with economy, too. One such food certainly is wholesome parquet margarine, the delicious, nourishing spread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet's flavor is something pretty special. Thousands of discriminating homemakers agree it's the margarine that tastes so good. And in addition, Parquet margarine is wonderfully nutritious. It's one of the best energy foods you can serve. And every single pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So for flavor your family will go for, and for nourishment they need, serve them delicious, economical Parquet margarine every day. Yes, when you go to your food store, make it a point to remember Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. And now, let's join our friend, the great Gildersleeve, who has just put in a full week down at the water department and comes home ready for a weekend of well-earned rest and relaxation. Will he get it? Stay tuned to this station. Hello, Uncle Mort. Oh, hello, Leroy. How do things go at the office? Go? All right, I guess. Here, take this chair. Aunt Hugh must be tired. No, no, sit still, sit still. Oh, I don't need it. I was just doing a little studying. Studying in the afternoon? Well, I was just trying to get a little ahead. Yeah, yeah. The evening paper's right by your chair there. Can I get your slippers, Uncle Mort? This isn't Father's Day, is it? By the way, when I came up the walk here, I almost fell over the rake. I don't suppose you have any idea how it got there. Oh, gosh, Uncle, I'm sorry. That was careless of me. I must have left it there when I was raking the leaves. Raking the leaves? Did you rake the leaves? I don't recall having said anything about raking leaves. No, you didn't, but I could see they were piling up, and I knew you'd be tired when you got home. Yes. Um... By, uh, by the way, Unc, uh, when you get time... Yes? I got my report card today. There's no hurry! Uh, I'll, uh, I'll just leave it on the mantel here. No, give it here. I don't have to get it signed till Monday. Give it here. Okay, here it is. Gee, I'm going to go put the rake away before somebody falls over. Wait a minute, Leroy. I'll be right back. Arithmetic, grammar, geography, deportment. Leroy! I was calling Leroy, my dear. Yes. Tell me what on earth to do about Leroy. What do you mean? I just got his report card. How did he come out? 4F. <laughs> Look at that darn thing. I don't know, Marjorie. He won't study. He gets into trouble. Maybe I ought to send him away to military school. Oh, no. Well, he needs somebody to make him toe the line. You know what I think he needs, Uncle Moore? What? I think he needs you. What do you mean? Well, I think he needs the understanding and companionship of an older person whom he respects. That's not me. Of course it is. He has a funny way of showing it, then. Every time I say anything serious to him, all I get is, are you kidding? Oh, well, you know he doesn't mean anything by that. He just has a chip on his shoulder because he always feels he's in the doghouse. Well, he usually is. I know, but think. When you were Leroy's age, didn't you ever bring home a bad report card? Oh, brother. <laughs> You're right, my dear. I guess I haven't been fair to the boy. I was thinking just the other day, I ought to try and spend more time with him and pal around with him more. I think it'd be wonderful for him if you did. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to start in right now, and I'm going to devote the whole weekend to him. I'll make a pal out of Leroy if it kills me. <laughs> Come here. What? Don't 
forget. Well, we've called him all over the neighborhood. He's hiding. That's what he's doing. Wait till I catch that kid. You were going to make a pal of him now, remember? Well, I can't make a pal of him until I get a hold of him, can I? <laughs> Leroy? Looking for me, Uncle? Come in here and sit down, young man. I'd like to have a talk with you. Uncle Mort? Uh-oh. Uh, come in and sit down, will you, Leroy? I'd like to have a talk with you. <laughs> Uncle Mort would like to have a talk with you. Yes, sit down, my boy. It's not my fault. The teacher doesn't like me. I don't know why she just got in for me. I didn't do anything. Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Let's not forget about, just forget about that report card, shall we, Leroy? Huh? I mean, after all, a lot of us get bad report cards. Let's just let bygones be bygones. Are you kidding? Leroy! <laughs> well, he started it. Let's not use that expression anymore, shall we, Leroy? Let's find another one. Okay, Uncle. Uh, Leroy, I've been thinking. You know you and I ought to get to know each other better. I mean, break down and be pals. What do you say? Okay, by me, Uncle. Uh, yes. I wonder if we couldn't find a better word than okay, too, huh? Uh, shall we try? Okay. Let it go, let it go. <laughs> Yes, I think we ought to try to do more things together, you and I, Leroy. You know, go off by ourselves and get away from some of these women around here. Oh, all right, I'll leave, Uncle Boy. <laughs> yeah. hey, come here a minute, my boy. Uh, sit down here beside me. I'll sit over here. Uh, all right, anywhere. You know, Leroy, I, I'd like you to think of me as a human being. Well, I try to, Uncle. <laughs> Yes, I, I think the first time I ever realized my father was human was one time when he took me duck shooting. That's why I thought you and I ought to go on some sort of a little expedition. You mean we're going duck shooting, huh? Well, no, but I thought we might go to the Museum of the Historical Society. Oh. <laughs> Have you ever been there? No. Have you? Well, they tell me it's very interesting. Lots of, uh, well, you know, historical stuff. What do you say? Couldn't we go duck shooting? Would you rather go duck shooting than go to the museum? Are you kidding? Oh, <laughs> Sorry, Uncle. Yeah, well, that's all right. As a matter of fact, Floyd, down at the barbershop, was telling me he goes duck shooting out of Skinner's Pond. I bet there's a million ducks there. Yeah. Floyd's got a blind there. He might even lend me his dog. He has a very fine bird dog. Can we go tomorrow, Uncle? Well, it would mean getting up awfully early, Leroy. Four o'clock in the morning. I don't care. I'll get up at two. You get up at two and you're going to go alone. <laughs> okay, four o'clock. How about it? Can we go? If you'd like to. And if Floyd lend us his dog... Young, you're swell. <laughs> yes. I've decided this is going to be your weekend, Leroy. Anything you want to do, we'll do. Oh, boy, you're super, Unc. I'll tell you what. We'll go duck shooting in the morning. Yes. When we get back, we'll play touch football with the gang. After that, we'll go out to the zoo. And uh, there's a carnival only about two blocks from there. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll go to the movies. Uh, and, uh, and in the evening, we'll go to the basketball game. Uh, and if there's any time left, we might even go to your museum. Are you kidding? <laughs> Yes, yes. What is it now, Leroy? Why do they call this thing we're sitting in a blind? Because only a blind fool would get up at four o'clock in the morning to sit there. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, hold the dog, Leroy. Down, Senator. Sit down, boy. Oh, stop licking my face, Senator. <laughs> Leroy, hold on to him. You're the custodian of the dog, you know. Okay, Uncle. When do I get to shoot? Shoot? Later. Quiet, quiet, Senator. Quiet. You'll scare the ducks. What ducks? Oh, they'll be coming. Yeah, any of them come over. Remember what I told you. Well, they ought to be here any minute. We've been waiting for two hours. Two hours is nothing in the life of a duck, young man. They don't come over on schedule, you know. <laughs> they usually come over about dawn. It's so cloudy, I don't know how we're going to know when dawn is here. Oh, easy. You just wet a finger and hold it up. <laughs> Uncle Mort, you couldn't pass the test for a Cub Scout. Yeah, yeah. Joke, Leroy, joke. Oh, Hey, you know what? It's beginning to rain. You don't have to be so happy about it. Ah, <laughs> oh, cheer up, Unc. It's wonderful weather for ducks. Yes. Oh, my hands are cold, my ears are cold, my feet are wet, and so is my cigar. Yeah, that's duck shooting. Pass me that thermos of cocoa, will you? Sorry, Unc, we've drunk it all. Oh. Well, I guess there's nothing to do then but sit here and wait for death. <laughs> Look, Uncle. Where? Look at Senator. He's sniffing the air. Just trying to find out which way the wind blows. That's a Senator for you. <laughs> no, look. Yeah? He's sniffing up. I think he smells something. Yeah, he's pointing. Leroy, that's a very fine dog. I wonder what he sees. Oh, he can sense him long before he sees him. Now get ready and watch the way I do this. When do I get 
have to shoot them. Later. Remember, you always get them on the rise and always shoot a little ahead of them. So they run into the bullets? That's the idea. How do you train them to do that? <laughs> quiet, Leroy, quiet. Ready. There. Here's Duck. Where? I don't see it. No, I mean Duck down so I can aim. Oh, what are you aiming at? Off there. It looks just like a speck now, but it's coming this way. Isn't it, Senator? <laughs> yeah. Um, that's a P-38. You. <laughs> Oh, I'm certainly glad you told me. Boy, if you'd taken a shot at him, he'd come right down here and... me. I just just did that to show you, my boy. You can't be too careful in handling a gun. <laughs> well, we might as well relax again, I guess. Come on, Senator, relax, boy. <clears throat> Funny, he's still pointing. Probably frozen stiff. <laughs> no, I think he's pointing at the decoys. Huh? Hey, um, could I take a shot at one of them? At the decoys? You may not. Well, how about if we put a tin can on a stump thing? We came out here to shoot ducks, and we'll shoot ducks or nothing. <laughs> oh, look out. Here comes the ducks, Leroy. Hey, it's my turn. Let's go. Don't shoot the dog. Oh, I got one. I got one. Look at him drop, Leroy. <laughs> That's no fair. You said it was my turn. You know, it's funny. You'll sit out in the duck blind for hours, and you're cold and wet, and you wish you hadn't come, and you get one duck, and everything's changed. Oh, it's the most wonderful feeling in the world. Yeah, but how are we going to get the duck, Unc? He's dropped in the swamp. Don't you worry about that. You just watch Senator there. He'll find it. Yes, sir. There's not a prettier sight in the world than a well-trained retriever in action. You'll see, my boy. He'll pick that duck up in his mouth and bring it back here without harming a feather. I think he's found it, Unc. Yep, he's got it. Good boy, Senator. Good boy. Now watch him bring it back. Hey! He's sitting down! Hey! He's eating it! Come back to you! Oh! Bring back that duck! The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. But first, maybe you're the questioning kind of person, the kind who has to be shown. If so, here's a test that should interest you. A test that will prove how good-tasting parquet margarine is. Yes, parquet margarine, the economy spread for bread made by Kraft. Now, here's all you do to make a real test of parquet margarine's flavor. Take fresh-from-the-oven bread or rolls or toast that's piping hot. Then spread them thick with parquet margarine and see for yourself how deliciously good parquet is. You see, heat brings out the taste of any food. It's a really severe test of flavor. You'll find Parquet's flavor is delicate and mild, just right for a spread for bread. So let this simple test convince you and start serving your family Parquet margarine tomorrow. And remember, Parquet is an economical source of important food values. Nourishment, food energy, vitamin A. So tomorrow, sure, ask your dealer for Parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. After a long, hard day in the duck blind, he comes trudging home with wet feet, a sore shoulder, and the mangled remains of a duck to find that it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, hello, Water Commissioner. I see you've been in the water. Oh, you here, Judge? Glad to see you up so bright and early, Commissioner. Yeah, funny how you always get in here in time for breakfast. This time we fooled you. I had mine at 4 o'clock. So I heard. Marjorie told me I had a little bite with her. Yes, so. I think it's a fine thing you're doing for Leroy, Gildy, devoting your whole weekend to him. You're going to get a lot of satisfaction out of it. Am I? You bet you are. What wouldn't I give for a boy I could make a pal of? I'll lend you Leroy. <laughs> Do you know what he's got planned for this weekend? What? Five hours in a duck blind was just a warm-up. Right now, I'm supposed to play touch football. This afternoon, there's the zoo and the carnival. Sounds like fun. Fun? Why, there's ten miles of walking at the zoo and another five miles at the carnival. Besides getting sick on the loop the loop Then tonight, a basketball game and somewhere we squeeze in a double feature. <laughs> what am I going to do, Judge? Well, you'll just have to go through with it, I guess, Gildy. You can't let the boy down. No, but I can get sick. Oh, there's nothing the matter with you, Gildy. No, but there's going to be. Oh, boy. What is it, my dear? Don't say anything about it, Judge. Leroy's looking for you. Leroy, oh, yes, I know, I know. Hey, Al, in here, Leroy. Where are you? I thought we were going to play football. 
football. Now, Leroy, it's raining. A little drizzle. They never call a game off for that. Sure, what's a little drizzle? You keep out of this, Judge. <laughs> Perhaps you'd like to go out and play with the boys. I'd be delighted to, if it weren't for my gout. Well, so would I. If it weren't for the cold, I think I'm catching. <laughs> oh. oh, you promise. Now, Leroy, you can't ask Uncle Mort to go outdoors if he's catching a cold. You're absolutely right. Uh, uh... That's you. <laughs> Better try that one again, Gildy. That wasn't so good. Okay, you go mind your own business. I was just going, Gildy. I was on my way. But take good care of yourself, old man. Marjorie, I'd make him go to bed if I were you. I was thinking of that. Not a bad idea. I may do it. Best thing in the world for a cold. Bed, a hot mustard plaster, and a good stiff dose of castor oil. You. <laughs> With that thought, I'll leave you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Judge. May drop in a little later to see how your patient's getting on. <laughs> see that you don't, you old goat. Come on, Uncle Mort. Upstairs. Yes. I hope you won't mind, Leroy, if I do go upstairs and lie down for a little while. There's been a lot of this going on around here. Besides, now that I'm water commissioner, my health is a matter of public concern. I owe it to the town. I owe it to you. And take care of myself. Uh, You understand. Sure, we understand. Now, go ahead, Uncle Mort. You get right into bed, and I'll come up in a minute and see that you're comfortable. All right, my dear. If you think I ought to... uh, I may see you later, Leroy. Yeah, take it easy, Unc. Who does he think he's fooling? There, you comfortable now, Mr. Gillespie? As comfortable as I can hope to be, I guess, Bertie. Now, you've got your book, you've got your magazine, you've got the radio beside your bed. Is there anything else you can think of? Uh, No, my dear, thank you. Don't bother about me. I'll be all right, I hope. I'll leave this little bell on the table so you can ring it if you want anything. Oh, cute, isn't it? Thank you, Bertie. You go ahead. I'll make out here somehow. Try to get a little sleep now, Uncle Moore. Yes, you do that, Miss Gilsey. I will if I can. Oh. Uh... Yes, Uncle Moore? Uh, what was it now? Oh, yes. Uh, I wonder if you get me a glass of water. Oh, right away. Yes. You want to drink plenty of water for a cold. If the water commissioner doesn't drink it, who will? <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Bertie! Yes, sir. Did you ring? I was thinking, Bertie. I guess I ought to... Well, I guess I oughtn't eat anything too heavy for lunch. Goodness, Mr. Gillsleeve, it ain't time for lunch yet. I know, but how long will it be? Well, it's only a little after ten now. Oh. Well, maybe just a little glass of that V8 vegetable juice, huh? And some crackers and some cheese. I don't know if you ought to eat all them things, Mr. Gillsleeve, if you're sick. Be quiet. Here comes Marjorie. Here's your water, Uncle Boy. Oh, you're too good to me, my dear. You shouldn't be doing all these things for me, really. I wonder if you'd bring me a box of Kleenex and put it beside my pillow. Yes, Uncle Moore. And ask Leroy if we'd bring me some cigars, Optimos. But don't make a special trip for it. Yes, Uncle Moore. Uh, Bertie, you know what I think would be good for my cold? What's that? You remember those little butterscotch pecan tarts you used to make? There'll be none of that, Uncle Moore. Oh. Bertie, you come out of there. Yes, ma'am. Doggone ain't nobody can enjoy being sick like a man. <laughs> they want more service. It... <laughs> service? Here I am, flat on my back, and that's the kind of sympathy I get. <coughs> Hello, Marjorie, honey. Oh. I hope you don't mind me just walking right in like this. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Anson. It's her. I won't stay but a minute. Judge Hooker told me about your uncle's illness, and I just had to run right over. Well, that was nice of you. I don't think it's anything very serious. Oh, it isn't, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll just peek in for a second if you think it's all right. Oh, please do. I know he'd love to see it. Oh, I wish I had a comb. That's right, Martin, you poor boy. Oh, oh, Leela. Did you get a nasty bug? Is, uh, hmm? No, it's nothing, really. I feel better already. Now that you're here. Oh, you. I wanted to bring you over some calf's foot jelly. Oh, fine. I'll eat it with my lunch. (laughs) But I didn't have the faintest idea how to make it. Oh, well, it was sweet of you anyway. (laughs) So I brought you a box of (laughs) Zuzus. It 
was the only thing I could find in the house. Oh, thank you. Zoo zoos. <laughs> now, just put it under my pillow where I can get at it. Oh, I think it's just terrible you getting sick like this. I can't tell you how disappointed I am. I was hoping for you to take me to the Halloween party at the country club. Oh, uh, party? Oh, it sounds wonderful. I just love bobbing for apples, don't you? Yes, I'm crazy about it. <laughs> And I suppose they'll play post office and silly games like that. I can think of worse games than post office. <laughs> if you only hadn't gone and gotten sick. Oh, well, I dare say I can get somebody else. Huh? A Judge Hooker or somebody. Uh, uh, Leela? Yes? What time is that party? Eight o'clock. Oh, but goodness, what difference does it make now? I think I can make it. Oh, I wouldn't dream of letting... No, I'm feeling a lot better already. It was those Zuzus. I think by 7.30 tonight, I'll be all right. Oh, but truck, Martin. I'll be there at 8. I can only find one cigar. Oh, thank you, my boy. <laughs> well, Shark Morton, I mustn't tire you. I do hope you'll get well soon. And I will. Don't worry. Goodbye, now. Say goodbye, Mrs. Ransom. Bye. I'll uh, be seeing you. How you feeling, Unc? Oh, a little better, I think, Leroy, but none too vigorous. Well, maybe when you've had some lunch, you'll feel more like going to the zoo. Uh, uh, I wouldn't count on that. Uh, you have to watch these things, you know, if possible complications. Oh. Now, Leroy. It's Marjorie, what have you got in that glass? Just orange juice. Yeah, you can't fool me. Oh, Uncle Mort, don't be a baby. How do I know it isn't castor oil? Because we haven't any. Oh. I had to send out for some. Mm. <laughs> Besides, I'm not going to give it to you till the doctor gets here. Doctor? Well, what do I want with the doctor? Oh, just to be on the safe side. Possible complications, you know. Huh? I think you ought to have your chest examined. I think I ought to have my head examined. Right in here. I brought you a visitor, Uncle Moore. Oh, hello, Peavy. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. I thought Mr. Peavy might cheer you up. Yeah, I'll try. Well, you're looking a little peaked, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> Nothing much the matter with me, PB. What's that you got there? Uh, castor oil. Yes. <laughs> you mean all that is castor oil? Sure, I brought you several varieties so you could pick the one you like. <laughs> PB, all castor oil is the same and you know it. Well, no, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> there's the regular and the tasteless and, and there's this new number. It's got raspberry flavor. Very nice. Phoebe, are you trying to tell me that you have some castor oil that tastes like raspberries? Well, I don't think it would fool anybody. <laughs> I guess not. Well, what about the tasteless variety? Is it really tasteless? Well, uh, not entirely. A tasteless castor oil is kind of a trade expression like easy payment plan. Easy payment plan. <laughs> well, come on. It's Pettibone to see you. Yeah. Yes, the invalid in here. Hello, Gildersleeve. Uh, hello, Doctor. Afternoon, Peavy. Nice weather. Yes, it is, Doctor. Of course, it rained a little this morning. But in general, the weather has been very good. <laughs> but then, of course, that's bad for business. If you look at it that way... It's really been quite discouraging, but I look for a change in the near future. <laughs> Mrs. Peavy's knee twitched this morning, and that generally means a spell of real pneumonia weather. Goodbye, Mr. Gildersleeve. Goodbye, Peavy. <laughs> well, Gildersleeve, I see you finally got what's coming to you. What are you talking about? Yes, sir, I've been telling you what would happen if you didn't cut down on your smoking and your eating. And your age can't act like a 12-year-old, you know. How do you know I'm sick? You haven't even taken my temperature. I took it two years ago. <laughs> If you'd taken my advice at the time, you'd be a well man today. I am a well man. Here, feel my pulse. I know your pulse like a book. I hope you're going to take this collapse as a warning, Gildersleeve. It collapse? It, the doctor, I, aren't you even going to look at my tongue? Don't need to. Now, you listen to me. How many cigars have you been smoking? I cut down, Doc. How many? I'm down to 12 a day now. <laughs> From now on, no more than three. I can't live on three cigars a day. Oh, yes, you can. And with the diet I'm going to give you, you'll love it. Uh, diet? Yes, sir. Breakfast, dry toast and tea, no cream or sugar. I'll starve to death. Lunch, hard-boiled egg and plain lettuce salad, no oil. Uh. Dinner, one lamb chop, no fat. One potato, no gravy. After a week of that... No Gildersleeve. <laughs> Nonsense. You'll like it. Well, I'll call you in a day or so. And incidentally, it wouldn't do you any harm to get some rest. I'm going to ask your niece to keep you in bed for a couple of days. Oh, no. Oh, yes. 
As my father used to say to his patients, take care of your body, my man. You'll never get another one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother, how did I get into this? How am I going to get out of it? It's almost eight. Yeah, you had better hurry, my dear. Are you sure you don't mind being alone? Alone? Not at all, my dear. Solitude can be very enjoyable at times. Are you sure Leroy is gone? Yes, he went to the basketball game. At Birdie, too? Yes, she's out for the evening. Uh, then run along, my dear, and have a good time. Good night, Uncle Morris. Good night. Holy smokes, I got about three minutes to get dressed and get over to the Widow Ransom's. Where are my pants? Ooh, I can't find my pants. Oh, here they are. I thought it was a coat. Oh, what's that? Marjorie coming back? You get into bed quick, fatso. Is that you, my dear? No, it's me, Uncle. Leroy, what happened? Did you forget something? No, I didn't forget anything. What are you doing back here? Well, you remember what we talked about last night, Uncle? About what? About you and me being pals. Oh, yes, of course I do. Well, I just wouldn't feel right about going off and leaving you here all alone when you're sick, Uncle. Uh, you shouldn't feel that way, Leroy. Well, I do. After all, you didn't get to go to the zoo or anything. So I decided I'd stay here and keep you company. Uh, that's very touching, my boy, and I appreciate it. I really do. But I wish you'd forget about me and go to that basketball game. Oh, I can see a basketball game any time. Uh, I, I heard a joke today, Unc. Would you like to hear a joke? Maybe to cheer you up. Well... What's black and white and red all over? Give up? <laughs> very good. I haven't heard the answer yet. A newspaper. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> Leroy, will you go to that basketball game? You like that? Here's another. What is it that'll go up the chimney down or down the chimney up that won't go up the chimney up? Leroy, I'm in no mood to sit here and listen to corny riddles. Well, now you're beginning to sound more like yourself, Unc. You must be getting better. Yes. I was beginning to worry about you there. Uh, young man, you might as well know there's nothing whatever the matter with me, whatever. I know that. What? I'm getting up right now, and I'm not going to any basketball game. I know that, too. Huh? I know where you're going, and I know who you're going with. Oh, you do, eh? Then what are you doing here? Well, Unc, um, how about a little advance? Yes. Leroy, this is blackmail. <laughs> but I'm glad to pay it. At least now we understand each other. <laughs> Awake, Leroy? Yeah. How'd you make out, Uncle? Oh, I had a very enjoyable evening, thank you. There's one thing I'd like to know. What's that? There was a car parked in front of Mrs. Ransom's house when I got there. I know, Judge Hooker's. Yes. Was it you, by any chance, who let the air out of the judge's tires? Well, Halloween, you know. Leroy, that was not a nice thing to do. I only hope I can do as much for you sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Frank Bingman speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. If someone in your family carries a lunchbox to work or school, here's something you should know. Yes, you should know about smooth spreading, easy slicing, pab steps. The delicious golden cheese food that makes sandwich making as easy as ABC. Pabstet slices so easily and spreads so smoothly, it's grand for sandwiches and snacks. Pabstet is topped, too, for cooked cheese dishes because it melts and blends and toasts to perfection. Or you'll find all kinds of ways to add delicious cheese goodness to your meals if you keep a supply of Pabstet around. Pabstet makes your meals more nourishing, too. It's a reliable source of food energy. Milk codeine, the milk minerals, calcium and phosphorus, vitamin A. And Pabstet is as digestible as milk. So keep Pabstet on hand. Your food dealer has it in the distinctive round, flat package. Yes, tomorrow ask for Pabstet. P-A-B-S-T dash E-T-T. 
Pabstet, the delicious golden cheese food of a hundred uses. This program has reached you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. presents the great Gildersleeve. <laughs> the Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you Bing Crosby every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton. <laughs> from the great Gildersleeve in just a moment. Well, popcorn days are here again. And if everybody in your family likes popcorn as much as I do, you don't want to miss this bet. The next time you pop up a big crispy bowl full, do this to make it extra good. Drench it with plenty of melted parquet margarine. Yes, parquet margarine, Kraft's delicious spread for bread. Parquet makes popcorn extra tempting because it's so thrifty you can use all you want. And good... Oh, say, you'll relish that delicate parquet margarine flavor. It's as delicious melted over popcorn as it is spread on bread or rolls. And remember this, parquet margarine is wonderfully nourishing. It's an excellent source of food energy. And every pound contains 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So for table use, yes, and for baking and pan frying, too, remember delicious economical parquet margarine. Now, at the top of tomorrow's shopping list, write down Parquet, P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet, the margarine that's made by Kraft. Now, on with the show. As it must to all men, the first of the month came last week to Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, and with it, Bill's. For five days, they've lain unopened on the desk in his den. But this morning, we find him shuffling through them for a hasty glance at the bad news before rushing off to the office. Uh, bills, bills, bills. Look at them. Phone company. A lot of calls we didn't even make. Summerfield Light and Power. Ooh, the robbers. <laughs> Peavy's Drugstore. Soda's 45 cents. Leroy! Oh, he left the store, it's lucky for him. When he comes home, you tell him I want to see him, Marjorie. Yes, Uncle Moore. Bill's. Bill from Dr. Pettibone. Well, he didn't lose any time. <laughs> Hogan Brothers after me again. Oh, we got to quit buying all this stuff we don't need. It's unpatriotic. A1 Grocery. Ooh, I wonder how we came out on that. <laughs> Oh, I won't pay it. Bertie, Marjorie. What is it, Uncle Bertie. I'm coming with trouble. Bertie, what did I tell you last month? Tell me? Yes. Last month? Yes. Me? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that grocery bill, Bertie. Eight dollars more than the last. Well, that's the way it is, Mr. Gilsey. I know, but why is it? I thought we agreed to hold the grocery bill down, Bertie. Yes, yeah, so we agreed, but the A1 grocery didn't. <laughs> well, you have to realize, Uncle Mort, that prices have gone up. They're going up every month. Yeah, you take eggs. I remember when you could buy eggs for 39 cents a dozen. Now they're getting so the hens won't even do nothing left. They cough them up. It's what? <laughs> yes, well, we've simply got to cut down somehow, Bertie. Because if we don't, we won't be able to buy our war bonds. Do you want that to happen? No, of course not. Bertie, do you? Not me. Got to get them war bonds to keep Hitler from getting up. That's right. Takes bonds and taxes to beat the axes. You're right, Bertie. <laughs> Got to give up our armaments to lick the Germans. Absolutely. Got to pour in the dollars to hit my holler. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. You've got the right idea, Bertie. But we can't do all that if we don't save our money and cut down our expenses. Yes, but how? Oh, I'll tell you how we can cut them down. Yeah, how, Bertie? I'll take that leftover veal we had last night and make stuffed peppers. You can stuff a pepper with almost anything. Yeah. So I've discovered around here. <laughs> thing like that can be carried too far, though, Bertie. Now, Uncle Mort, if we're going to cut down, you're going to have to make sacrifices at the dinner table. Yeah, but you've got to think about morale, too, my dear. <laughs> morale is very important. And I don't know of anything worse for the morale than a stuffed pepper. <laughs> 
Well, now, I wouldn't say that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Bertie, I was thinking of cutting down in other ways, too. I thought one way I could cut down would be to take my lunch to the office every day and eat it at my desk, like Donald Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take care of that, Bertie? Oh, sure, I could. What does Mr. Nelson eat? Well, I imagine he has sandwiches, two or three, or four or five. <laughs> uh, cream cheese and jelly, probably, wouldn't you say, Marjorie? Oh, undoubtedly. And sardines. A fish, you know, is brain food. He's got all those priorities on his mind. <laughs> sardines we got. Uh, and maybe a piece of pie to keep up his energy. He has to handle all those people. And anything else you think would be nice. How about some pickles? Oh, Nelson is very fond of pickles. He'd have to be to take on that job. <laughs> well, I'll go make lunch right away. Uh, you know, Marjorie, I've been thinking. There's another way we could save money. What's that? If we stayed at home more in the evenings. You know, people burn up their tires and their money running around looking for a good time when they can have a better time at home. How? Well, the way people used to in the old days. You won't believe this, my dear, but I can remember spending whole evenings at home. Doing what? <laughs> Well, I'm willing to stay at home if I have we to. We had fun. Sometimes we'd sit in front of the fire while Papa read aloud to us from a good book. Oh. Or we'd pop corn, maybe, or play parcheesi. Or sometimes we'd gather around the piano and sing. We had fun, my dear, and we didn't have to keep putting nickels in the piano either. Well, I, I love to sing. Everybody does. People ought to do more things like that. Oh, my goodness, I'm late. i got to get out of the waterworks. Hey, Bertie, where's that lunch? I ain't finished it yet, Miss Gill, please. Well, bring me what you've got. i got to go. That's what this country needs, my dear. More quiet evenings at home. We'll have to try it sometime. Yeah, stay at home. Save money. Save tires. Keep out of trouble. Strengthen family ties. We'll do it tonight. Uh, no, tomorrow night. <laughs> Nothing like a brisk walk in the sunshine. Oh, here comes old Sawbones. Uh, hello, Dr. Pettibone. Hello there, Gildersleeve. My, you're looking fit. Fit as a fiddle and ready for love. Glad to see you followed my instructions. Your instructions? I threw them out of the window the minute you left. I never felt better in my life. It won't last. Ugh. I'll tell you a secret, Doc. I just learned how to live. Yeah, how's that? Cut down. Stop running around nights. Stay at home. Most wonderful feeling in the world. Build a nice crackling fire and spend the evening in front of it with the kids around, telling stories, playing games, singing, laughing, and along toward the end of the evening, a little snack of some kind. Oh, it's wonderful. You make it sound mighty attractive. How long have you been doing this? We're starting tomorrow night. <laughs> I'll be seeing you, Doc. Oh, good morning, Judge. How are things at the waterworks? I'm just on my way down to find out. Fine day, isn't it? Yeah. Why so cheery, Gildy? Well, I'll tell you, Horace. For the first time in months, I'm at peace with my conscience. How did you ever manage to square that? <laughs> <laughs> we decided to cut down over at our house and put every spare nickel in the war bonds. How are you cutting down? Well, from now on, no more going out nights. For instance, tomorrow night, Marjorie and Leroy and I are just going to build us a nice, cozy fire and spend the entire evening popping corn and roasting chestnuts. Chestnuts. I haven't roasted chestnuts since I was a kid. Sure. People forget about those things. We'll have some donuts, probably, and cider. I love it. And we'll play games and sing songs while you're down at that lodge meeting paying out your dues. <laughs> For what? The whole evening won't cost us a penny. I envy you, Gildy. I really do. Uh, think it over, Judge. I think I've got something there. Uh, hello, P.B. I'm in a hurry. I just dropped in to say I got your bill this morning. And hereafter, if Leroy comes in here and tries to charge anything, don't let him have it. Hmm, just as you say, Mr. Gildersleeve. <laughs> if he gives you an argument, tell him from now on he's frozen. Very well. <laughs> While I'm here, you might as well let me have a couple of cigars. Oh, oh certainly. Uh, did you say only two, Mr. Gildersleeve? Uh, yes. I'm trying to cut down expenses. You ought to cut down two, Peavy. Well, now, I don't know about that. <laughs> Everybody should. Save your money and put it in war bonds. You know a good way to save money? What's that? Stay at home nights. You do too much running around, Peavy. Well, now, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> We all do. It's a fact. I'll admit I enjoy a good motion picture now and then. So does Mrs. Peavy. 
And for a while there, we did go several times a year. <laughs> but after Ruth Chatterton retired from the films, we slowed down again. Uh, uh, my goodness, look at the time. I can't stay here arguing with you. I've got to get down to the waterworks. Ooh, my cigars. Oh, yes. Uh, shall I wrap them for you? Uh, no, no, no. I'll just stick them in my pocket. I've got to rush. Well, I'd be glad to wrap them for you, Mr. Gildersleeve. Never mind. I'm always glad to wrap any purchase, however small. Oh, Peavy, give me those cigars. <laughs> Good morning, Miss Fitch. How are we this morning? I'd say we were a little late, Commissioner. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I try not to make a practice of this. Well, let's get down to business. Yes. Have you got anything to report? Why, no. Everything's going all right. Is the water flowing nicely? All the mains in good condition? <laughs> Pressure satisfactory? Yes. Well, I guess that takes care of the waterworks. <laughs> oh, any money coming in? Yes, collections are just about as usual. Good. Glad to see everything running smoothly. Uh, Miss Fitch, I wonder if I could ask you to do a few things for me. That's what I'm here for. Thank you. If you're not too busy, I wonder if you'd go out sometime today and buy me a Parcheesi board. A Parcheesi board? Uh-huh. I don't know what you have in mind, Mr. Gildersleeve, but I do not play Parcheesi. <laughs> oh, no, I wasn't going to play it here, you know. Dear me, no, perhaps I ought to explain. I think you might. Well, as you know, I have a niece and nephew living with me, and I decided I ought to do a few things to, well, make home more attractive to them and... Uh... Keep them out of pool rooms. Yes, and... And juke joints. <laughs> and you think Parcheesi is going to do that? Well, I thought of some other things, too. I made up a little list of things on the way down to the office. Yes. You might take this down. At first, a, a corn popper. A corn popper. That's for popping corn. I guess that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, some popcorn. That's for the corn popper. Yeah, you guessed that too, didn't you? <laughs> uh, and I must order some firewood. You can't pop corn without fire. <laughs> And we better get some cider. Uh, popcorn makes you awfully thirsty, you know. And some donuts to go with the cider. Uh, did you think of anything else? Bicarbonate to go with the donuts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good. Uh, I was going to get some games. We've got the Parcheesi. Uh, you'll be wanting bean bags. Oh, I don't know. Do you think they like bean bags? If they like Parcheesi, they'll like bean bags. <laughs> I think we might pass up the bean bags. <laughs> How about dogs? Darts? Mm. Not with Leroy. He got some darts last Christmas and I couldn't sit down until New Year's. <laughs> There'll be no darts. Oh, the piano. I forgot the piano. Piano? Uh, Miss Fitz, do you play the piano? Well, <laughs> I uh, once learned McDowell to a wild rose. <laughs> <laughs> Get your hat quickly. You've got to come out and help me buy a piano. Uh, just a minute, Mr. Gildersleeve. Do you mind if I ask you something? Oh, of course not. Have you the slightest idea what you're doing? Uh, 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 certainly. I told the children they could spend a quiet evening at home tomorrow and like it. And by George, they're going to like it. I've got to put this over, Miss Fitch. I'm going to make it the darndest, quietest evening you ever saw. Let's go buy a piano. <laughs> well, Greg Gildersleeve will be with us again in a few seconds. But first, I'm sure you wise homemakers don't just shop for food these days. You shop for good nutrition for your families. And that's why you all should know about parquet margarine, the delicious spread for bread that's an economical source of important food elements. First, parquet margarine is one of the best energy foods you can serve. Now, that's important. We're all working harder these days, and we need plenty of wholesome energy food. Second, parquet margarine is a reliable year-round source of vitamin A. Now, that's important, too, because vitamin A is one of the essential vitamins. And best of all, parquet margarine helps provide these necessary food elements, not just once a day, but three times a day. Parquet tastes so good, you'll want to serve it as a spread at all your meals. You'll want to use delicious parquet margarine in your baking and pan frying, too. So, for all these reasons, ask your food dealer tomorrow for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y. Parquet margarine made by Kraft. Now let's get back to Summerfield and see how the great Gildersleeve's quiet evening at home is working out. 
There's a pleasant fire roaring in the grate. Aesop the cat is curled up asleep on the hearth, and Gildersleeve is about to try an experiment on his nephew. Well, Leroy, this is what I call living. You do? Yes, yes, sir. Here we are, snug as a bug in a rug, no cover charge, no traffic jams, and I'm about to read you one of the greatest books ever written. A classic by Sir Walter Scott. What's the name of it? Ivanhoe. Never heard of it. Well, it's a great story. If you've never heard of it, you should be ashamed of yourself. Oh, yeah? If it's so good, how come they haven't made it into a picture? Yes, yes. I dare say they have, and they probably will again. But I'm going to read you the book. Oh, gosh. Oh, can't I wait and see the picture? You'll spoil it for me. Spoil nothing. <laughs> you hear a great masterpiece, just the way it was written. And you'll thank me for it someday. Now, listen. Okay. Let's see here. Find the beginning. Oh, here. Ivanhoe, Chapter 1. In that pleasant district of Merry England, which is watered by the River Don, there extended in ancient times a large forest covering the greater part of the beautiful hills and valleys which lie between Sheffield and the pleasant town of Doncaster. Are you kidding? <laughs> Leroy! Uh, the remains of this extensive wood are still to be seen at the noble seats of Wentworth, Warncliffe Park, and around Rotterham. Why, Uncle Moore, reading aloud. What a wonderful idea. Oh, you think so, my dear? Yes. May I listen? Of course. Sit down here by the fire. Hmm. I'll start over so you won't miss any of the story. Oh, gosh, Uncle, have I got to hear all that again? <laughs> Two sentences, Leroy. You can stand it very easily. Of course you can. What's the book, Uncle Moore? Ivanhoe. Oh, <laughs> what do you mean by that, my dear? Nothing. Just... Oh. You must have meant something. I know. You keep out of this. <laughs> have you ever read Ivanhoe, Marjorie? Well, I tried to read it, Uncle Mort. I tried when I was in high school. You tried? That's ridiculous. Once you get into it, you'll be on pins and needles. Well, Uncle... Leroy, you listen to it whether Marjorie does or not. And if Marjorie has any regard for my wishes, she'll listen too. Now... Go ahead, Uncle Mort. Good. In that pleasant district of Merry England, which is watered by the River Don. And second Eumaeus strode hastily down the forest glade, driving before him, with the assistance of fangs, the whole herd of his inharmonious charge. Well, that's the end of the first chapter. First chapter? It should be the end of the book. <laughs> what do you say? Shall we have another one, children? It gets even better as it goes on. Um, let's save it, shall we, Uncle Moore? Yeah, so we'll have something to look forward to. <laughs> as a matter of fact, it's nearly 8.30, and I just remembered I have sort of a tentative date with Doug. Uh, but Marjorie... It's nothing definite. He just said if I wasn't doing anything. But do you call this not doing anything? We don't have to read if you don't want to. I, I, I brought all these little games. Well, if you're going to feel badly about it, I won't go. Well, gee, I don't like to insist, but I thought we agreed we'd all stay in tonight and just have a quiet evening at home. I know. Maybe Marge could ask them to come over and I could ask Piggy back. You don't think it would work with just the three of us, huh? And I thought it would be nice if we didn't have anybody in but just, you know, spent the evening together. Well, Uncle Lloyd, if that's what you want, that's what we'll do. Won't we, Leroy? Okay, sure. Well, I don't want to force you. No, I think it'd be nice. <laughs> I think it'd be fun. Oh, Marjorie, you're a sweet girl. How about me? Aren't I sweet, too, Uncle? Yes. You're sweet, too, my boy. Come on, let's give it a trial, shall we? You can't tell. You might even have a good time. Uh, Leroy, you get out the Parcheesi board. Uh-oh. Who's that? Oh, Bertie's out. I'll go, Uncle Moore. Yeah. Hello, Marjorie, honey. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ransom. Won't you come in? Well. Well. <laughs> I can't stay but a second, but your uncle said I must drop over and see the new piano. Hello, Throckmorton. Uh, hello, Leela. <laughs> hey, glad you came. Hey, Leroy, take Mrs. Ransom's coat. Oh, I can't stay but a second. Oh. Uh, just throw it anywhere. Your uncle told me about the wonderful evening he had planned for you. I'll bet you all are having more fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, where is the piano? A piano? Uh, right in here in the living room. <laughs> Must I close my eyes? Well, if you'd like to. There. Now you can look. Oh, I think it's just lovely. It's a Wembley. <laughs> I declare it just makes my fingers itch. Oh, well, try it. Go ahead. May I? Oh, it has a gorgeous tone. 
Yeah, you'd never know it was second hand, would you? <laughs> Uh, play something, Leela. Oh, I could. Oh, yes, please do. Well, I'm terribly out of practice. We'll never know. Uh, go ahead, play something. Well, I'll tell you. I'll play Trock Martin if you sing. Oh, I can't sing. Please. Sure, you can, Uncle Mort. Pretty please. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. Uh... Why do you want me to... What do you want to play? Well, uh, what do you want to sing? Does anybody mind if I go to the movies? Yes. <laughs> you stay right here, young man. Yes. How about the road to Mandalay? No. No, I know a better one. Uh, oh. Oh, I do you love me. Uh, Leroy. <laughs> yes, Uncle? Out in the kitchen, you'll find some donuts. Uh, suppose you go out and get them, huh? Donuts? Yeah, and some popcorn and the popper, and bring those. Okay, I'll... Well, shall we start over again? Uh, just a minute. Uh, Marjorie. Yes? Uh, suppose you go out and help Leroy, huh? <laughs> Would you mind? Of course not. Uh, good. <laughs> now. Why do I love you? Why do you love me? Why should there be two happy as we? Can you see the why or wherefore I should be the one you care for? I'm a lucky boy. You are lucky too. All our dreams of joy seem to come true. Maybe that's because you love me. Maybe that's why I love you. that, Leroy. Why do I love you? Oh, why do you love me? Why should there be two happy as we? Hooker! Well, why should there be two? Why shouldn't there be three? <laughs> Who right ahead is beautiful? <laughs> Who let you in, you old buzzard? My, my young friend, Leroy. Hello, Leela. Hello, Joe. Yeah. Well, I thought you were spending the evening alone, Gildy. I was till you butted in. I just this minute arrived, and I can't stay but a second. Oh, don't go on my account, please. There's always room for one more, isn't there, Gildy? Yeah, there always seems to be. <laughs> well, thank you, Leroy. I'll take two. They're small. Uh, why beat around the bush? Take the whole platter. <laughs> well, that's generous of you, Gildy. I hope you don't mind my dropping in like this. When I got to thinking about what you were doing over here, nice, quiet evening at home, it sounded so good to me, I just couldn't stay away. Nice, quiet evening. Look at it. I talk myself into it, and I guess I've talked myself right out of it. <laughs> quiet, everybody. Hey, quiet, please. Now, quiet. Quiet, Rock Martin has a poem. Oh, do let's hear your poem, Rocky. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to have a quiet. It's very dramatic. Uh, uh, uh. It was a balmy summer evening, and a goodly crowd was there, which well nigh filled Joe's bar room on the corner of the square. <laughs> <laughs> uh, answer that, somebody. Uh, Marjorie, will you? I've got Hello there, young fellow. Is your uncle at home? You know darn well I'm at home. <laughs> well, if it isn't Teddy Bone, come on in, Doc. Join the happy throng. <laughs> How are you? Yeah, Hello, Judge. Well, well, Mrs. Ransom. Yes, but I can't stay but a second. <laughs> Excuse me. How are you? I'm slipping. <laughs> Just thought I'd drop in, see if you're taking care of yourself. Well, popcorn. Would you have some, Doctor? Thanks. 
Matter of fact, I didn't have anything to do this evening, Gildersleeve. So I decided I'd just combine business with a little pleasure. Fine. I suppose I'll get a bill for this. <laughs> Great kidder, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Great idea you've got here, Gildersleeve. I don't know why people go running around when they can spend an evening at home like this. <laughs> Mr. Gildersleeve was just about to do a recitation for us. Oh, good. Have you ever heard my imitation of Harry Lauder? A room for oh, Just a minute, Doctor. <laughs> if you don't mind. Yes, Mr. Gildersleeve first. Uh, now, quiet, everybody. Uh, uh, it was a balmy summer evening, and a goodly crowd was there. The crowd's getting bigger. <laughs> Come in. Oh, excuse me. Uh, come in, PB. I hope I'm not intruding, Mr. Jones. <laughs> Mrs. Peavy had to sit up with his big friend this evening, and I thought I'd. Never mind the to... alibi, PB. Come on in. Make yourself at home. You know everybody. Give the man some popcorn. Yeah, here you are. Uh, Leroy. Yes, Uncle. You better take your bicycle and go down and get some more donuts and some cider. Again? You have to. Here's some more money. Boy, this is going to break us. Uh, Why, please, everybody? I have an announcement. Why? Doc has an announcement. Uh, Mr. Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve, our popular singing water commissioner, will now give his famous recitation, The Paste on the Barroom Floor, uh, following which he will offer to wrestle any man in the crowd for $5. Uh, Come on, Gildersleeve. <laughs> no, I don't want to do it now. Oh, come on, Gildy. No, I'm all out of the mood. Oh, please, Throckmorton. I'm dying to know how it comes out. <laughs> <laughs> it was a balmy summer evening. All right, who is it now? The cops? <laughs> Miss Fitz, come in. Well, I, I didn't know you were giving a party, Mr. Gildersleeve. Neither did I. <laughs> I worked late at the office, and I had to pass here on the way home. You don't bother to explain, Miss Fitch. It's open house here. Liberty Hall. Come on, come on. Give Miss Fitch a donut, somebody. Oh, I got a suggestion. The judge has a suggestion. I think we all vote a thanks to our friend Gildersleeve here for a great idea. Why don't we meet together this way every Saturday night? Great idea. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not my idea. After all, as Gildy says, why spend your money when you can stay at home and have an evening and fun and jolly like this, and it doesn't doesn't cost a penny. Doesn't cost who a penny? Piano, popcorn, part cheesy, eight dozen donuts. What do you say, folks? Next week, same time, same place. Just a minute, Hooker. Yes, Gilman. I've got something to say to all of you. You've invited yourselves in here, you've eaten my donuts, you've drunk my cider, and you sat by my fire and played my piano. And now, by George, you're going to listen to me. All right, Gildy. What is it, old man? It was a balmy summer evening and a good crowd crowd. <laughs> Well, folks, I muffed it again. Um, I was trying to do the right thing, but I let it run away with me. It's a good idea to stay home, I guess, but I didn't have to go out and buy all that stuff. That's what makes inflation. We all know that. People are making more money today than they've ever made. And there are fewer things to buy it with. If we all rush down to the store with our money in our hand and start bidding against each other for the few things left on that counter, prices will go zooming up. We've seen that happening already. That's why they're urging us now not to buy anything we don't absolutely need, but to make our old things do. If there's money burning a hole in your pocket, sock it away in war bonds and stamps. Well, I'm a fine one to be telling you this. Buying all that junk I did, I could kick myself. But I'll never do it again, folks. I swear I won't. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Original music heard on this program was composed and conducted by Billy Mills. This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company and inviting you to tune in again next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve.